for the bell to chime, letting us know that the torch has been lit, and I actually think we are cutting live now to Rick of the Imperium Ludum, making his way down the holy cobblestone streets of Kuzbekistan, torch in hand. He will be going up against some fierce competition this weekend by the Daisy Baby Bitch Champion CJ. We can only hope for a competition of the ages. Wow, what an honor truly to be here to witness this week's events. I'm so happy to see that Rick is participating in the Kuzbekistanian tribute to not caring about your appearance whatsoever and just wearing what is comfortable. Amazing. It's a lot better on TV. Hello, my name is Tori, and today I will be the commentator for the Nidhogg event at the games. <laughs> uh, this event is run like a four-man tournament with two semi-final matches followed by a bronze medal match and a gold medal match. Each match is best of three, so whichever participant scores two points first is the winner. All right, so first up we have Jeff and John representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook <laughs> and you betcha stand respectively. So let us um let us get on to it. Okay. Sizing it oh, okay, nice uh throw. Oh, okay. So John is uh just going for it. Okay, okay. Um, alright, okay, flip, throw sword, very nice. Okay, oh, okay, alright. It looks like John is really just trying to outrun Jeff at this point. There's not very much actual fighting happening. And okay, that is one point to John. He is the winner for that round. Very nice, very good, good strat. Okay, all right, okay, John again. Oh, okay, the first bit of bloodshed. Oh, all right, very nice, a jump kick, okay. John once again, just kind of going for it. All right, oh, Jeff, very nice with the stab. Okay, <laughs> John is just, okay. <laughs> Jeff is using John's previous strat, it seems, to just, uh, just keep running and try to outrun the opponent. Okay, very nice with the stab. Oh, wow, the sword throw, very, oh, okay, well, you tried your best. Very nice, very nice. Final screen, okay. Wow, all right. One point to Jeff. Very, very well done, very well done. Okay, all right. Starting off strong, okay. Very nice, Jeff, with the, with, oh, another stab. Good job. Okay, oh, all right. Sword throw from John. Oh, okay, we got a fist fight going on. Okay, very nice. Very nice, very nice. Oh, wow, okay. We're back with John, we're back with John. Okay, looks like he's just, again, trying to outrun Outrun the opponent, okay, with a with a um, jump kick. Very nice, very nice. We have a little action going on, very nice. Okay, oh, 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 wow. A nice, a nice, oh, so close. That was a very nice um, evade from John, using the cliff as a, okay, wow, very nice. 
Jeff has a, has a, oh, okay, they both have swords now. And Jeff is in the lead. All right, oh, okay, Jeff still has it. Oh, okay, it's back to John. Just trying to run. Okay, they both have swords, very good, okay. Oh, another neck break from Jeff. All right, okay. Very nice, okay, nice maneuver. Looks like John is just trying to catch up. Very nice, okay. Oh, will, will Jeff be the winner of this round? Very nice with the stab. Interesting and very nice. So I believe that, oh, okay. All right, we're back at John, we're back at John. So I believe that Jeff actually had a little bit more practice than his counterparts with this game. But um, John's holding his own very well. All right, wow, very nice. I, I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought this was gonna be an easy, an easy Jeff win, but John's really, John's really um, holding his own. All right, very nice, okay. Oh, we almost had a tumble from John, but he saved it. Oh, okay, aw. So close. Jeff was guarding the door. There was nothing he could have done. Okay, very nice. He's back at John. Okay, oh. Very nice, okay. Oh, jump kick. Disarm him, very nice. Okay, it's back at John. We're still at John. Ooh, okay. Very nice, okay. Nice, nice. Sword throw, with the, leading up with a stab or following up with the stab, rather. All right, is is it gonna be John? Is John gonna be... Okay, we're at the final, final stage. Oh, if Jeff doesn't, oh, and, and Jeff, we're back at Jeff. Okay, let's go. All right, we're gonna fist fight. Okay, we're still with Jeff, we're still with Jeff. You never know what's gonna happen, folks. <laughs> Oh, okay, oh, okay, all right. And Jeff has it again. Things got a little dicey, but it's, it's, all right, okay. And Jeff's a going, he's running. Oh, John with the sword throw, took him out. Okay, we got a, all right, throw in some punches. Mm, Jeff is blocking the door. Nice strat. Oh, but John didn't fall for it. Very nice. Okay. Oh, ah. Uh, John with those pitfalls. He really, he really doesn't see them coming. <laughs> All right, we're back at Jeff. Oh, okay, we're back at John. Okay, we're back at Jeff. All right. Wow, you never know what's, oh, okay. John using those pitfalls for his advantage. Okay, and John's going. Oh no, it's back at Jeff. Wow, it's a <laughs> bloody battlefield. Wow, okay, it's back at Jeff. Seems these two are evenly matched. All right. Oh, okay, oh, oh. <laughs> John again with those, with those pitfalls. You never know. Okay, all right, with the sword throw, all right. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Is John gonna do it? Oh, oh, John did it. John advances to the finals. Very nicely done, very nicely done. Okay, so that was very well done for both parties. Incredible, the, the swordsmanship unmatched <laughs> very riveting you never knew who was going to prevail um <laughs> you never knew what was going to happen so there were a lot of times when it was jeff who was advancing and then it was john and, and it was they would fight off a bunch and it was very um engaging and interesting to watch and i was on the edge of my seat the entire time i never knew who was going to who was going to advance so Next, we are going to head to the second semifinal match, which is CJ versus Sarah. And um, CJ is representing 
Daisy Baby Bitch territory, and Sarah is representing Impermium Lidum. Okay, all right, we're off to a strong start. CJ's in the lead. Okay. So I believe the the strongest stat. Oh, okay, Sarah, you you tried your best. It was great. You're really doing it. It seems the the pro strat to this game is really just outrun your opponent. Okay, Sarah's got it. Sarah's got it. Let's see if she can make it back to her final stage and win this game. All right. Tuck down. Okay, CJ's back at it. Oh, okay. And it's back to Sarah. Oh, okay. Back to CJ. All right. Okay. And CJ's again just trying to outrun. Oh, okay. And Sarah's got him. Oh, and CJ's got Sarah. <laughs> Oh, okay, very nice, Sarah. Jump kick. Okay, and CJ's got it once again. And it looks like CJ has gotten that match point. Very nicely done, very nicely done. All right, round two. Let's see if it's gonna be, okay, Sarah's got it. Okay, and it's back to CJ with the sword throw. All right, let's see if it's gonna be another Another CJ win, or if Sarah will, will even the playing field. All right. Okay, very nice, Sarah. Oh, and CJ's got it again. Okay, very nice, very nice. We got a little fist fight action. Okay, and it's back to Sarah. Very nice, with the jump kick. Oh, nice dodge. Okay, and Sarah's still at it. Okay, and it's back to CJ. All right, and CJ's just going. CJ's just going for it. Okay, oh gosh. Will Sarah be able to win a point? Oh, nope. And CJ's, CJ's advancing. And CJ advances to finals. All right, that was a faster match than the previous one, but that does not mean that these two are inferior in any way to the prior match. I think CJ just had a little bit more of a upper hand with the strats than Sarah did, but they both played very well. Now we are on to the bronze medal match, which is Jeff versus Sarah. So I'm very interested to see who will come out on top in this round. Very well done to both, to both parties. Very well done. Okay. Back with Sarah and Jeff. Jeff leads with, with the uh, flying jump and then the stab. Very nice. Jeff, again, seems to be just running for it. Okay, and Sarah stabs him. Very nice, okay. All right, Sarah's once again stabbing. <laughs> Always stabbing. Okay, Sarah's using the pro strat of running. Okay, okay. Sarah, it seems to have picked up some of the pro gamer strats from her, from her counterparts and she's just running. Oh, wow. Okay, Sarah made it. Sarah made it. Very nice, very nice. Okay, oh, and Jeff takes it over. Okay. All right, so Jeff is trying to advance and then Sarah's back at it. Okay, so Sarah's once again. Okay, Sarah, all right. Sarah comes out on top. Oh, okay, uh, and then gets stabbed by Jeff. Okay, so Sarah stabs Jeff. Very nice, very nice. Will Sarah be able to win a point. Oh, nice dodge. And Sarah garners a point. Very nicely done, very nicely done. So, round two for the Sarah Jeff match for the bronze medal. Okay, all right. So, Sarah and Jeff have one death each. Now, uh, two deaths each. Very nice, okay. Sarah's, Sarah's getting the points now. Very nice, Sarah. Nice dodge. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh! Juked him. Okay. <laughs> so Jeff is back with Sarah. Okay, Jeff is advancing towards his side of the map. Okay. All right. So Jeff has kind of gotten a, gotten a handle on the situation, it seems. And Sarah has once again bested him. 
Okay, and we're back with Jeff. All right. Okay, so Jeff is once again just making a run for it. And Sarah's stabbing. <laughs> okay, so we're back with Jeff. Okay, and Jeff is running. He's trying to outmaneuver very nice with a stab through Sarah. All right, stand off, stand off. <laughs> All right, Jeff with the flying kick just runs pet right past her. Very nice. Another flying kick from Jeff. Very well done. Oh, okay, and they just uh, run right past each other, and Jeff wins a point, evening the scoreboard. Okay. So whoever wins this round will win the bronze medal. So Sarah is currently um, in the lead, I guess. All right, so Sarah's running for it. We're following Sarah. Oh, okay, and then Jeff stabs her while guarding the door. Very nice strat. Okay, and Sarah's back at it with the uh, stabbo. Okay, Sarah's using the throwing. Very nice. Wall climb, okay, and Jeff guarding those doors again. Very nice, very nice strat. Okay. Okay, once again. Okay, very nice. Jeff is really just trying to run for it. Only really fighting when, when uh, Sarah gets in the way. Okay, all right, and Jeff is once again just going. He's just going. All right. Let's see. Oh, okay. And he kicks her off. Let's see if... Oh, and Jeff, very well done, is awarded the bronze medal for Nidhogg. What a beautiful display. That was a very evenly paced match. Um, they both did very, very well. Love to see all those different strategies coming out to play, guarding the doors, dodging, you know, just ignoring the other person entirely and just kind of going for it. We love to see it. It's it's riveting to watch. I am, again, on the edge of my seat watching this. <laughs> okay, so now we are going to go to the gold medal match between CJ and John. Now, I know everyone is very excited to see this. Um, to find out who the, the top dog is going to be. So uh, without further ado, let us get into it. Okay. Okay. So just kind of, okay, okay. We're, we're with John right now. Okay. He pulled off CJ's head. Very nice. He's climbing the walls. Okay. Oh, CJ trying to use the, uh, the Jeff strat of blocking the doors, but it didn't seem to go very well for him. Okay, once again, John maneuvers over the door blocking strat. Very nicely done, breaking the neck. Okay, we're still with John. Okay, and CJ's, CJ's got the advancement. Okay, and it's back to John. Very nicely done. Okay, once again, just kind of going. Just, oh, okay, and wow, one point to John. Very nicely done. The, the running strat seems to be the one to go for. <laughs> Okay, oh, and wow, once again, John is uh, first right off the bat and with the neck breaking and all of it. Oh, okay, and it's back to CJ. And uh, yeah, CJ's just running. Oh, okay, very narrowly avoided the spitting blade. Very nicely done. Okay, now John using the door blocking strat to his advantage. They're just kind of facing off. Very nicely done, John, throwing the sword. Nicely done, nicely done. Very nice, okay, flying kicks, flying kicks, and just jump right over him. Okay, and John again with the neck breaking. John seems to be aware of the pitfalls at this point, which is uh, very, very good. Okay, so we're back to CJ. Back to CJ. CJ is advancing to his side of the map. Okay, and uh, oh, and he now breaks John's neck. Very nice. Ah, John with the, the throwing sword. Oh, and the door strat. Ah, but I was 
CJ was no match. Very nicely done. Oh, 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 and John with the breaking of the neck. And again with the breaking of the neck, we're back to John. John is advancing and lures CJ right into that pitfall. Very nicely done. John with the, um, uh, flying jumps with the jump kicks. Oh, and CJ just narrowly gets John and John takes it back. All right, so John is advancing. A little fist fight here. Okay. They both throw the swords. Oh, but John gets his back and is, is running towards his side of the field. Okay. Oh, and John breaks CJ's neck once again. Again with the flying kicks. That seemed to be John's preferred method of... Wow, very, very nice. Okay, so CJ is awarded the silver medal. And John is awarded the gold medal. So, in first place, John. Second is CJ. And then bronze is Jeff. And unfortunately, fourth, but definitely not least, is Sarah with no medal. However, she did put up a great fight. You betcha Stan has one gold medal. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory has one silver medal. And Tierra de los Hermanos Hook has one bronze medal. So it's a great start to You Betcha Stan just right off the bat with one gold medal. A, a good a good start to both Daisy Baby Bitch Territory and Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with silver and bronze medals respectively. Imperium Lidum is right very close fourth. We never know what's gonna happen. Thank you all very much for joining me for this Nidhogg event for the games. I look forward to seeing you again soon and I look forward to seeing the outcome of the other games that we are going to witness here. Um, the next event is skateboarding, so I'm going to hand it on over to them and I hope you all have a very nice day. Hello sports fans, my name is Seedude and welcome back to the games, where our four teams are battling it out to see who are the high flyers and who are just the hangers on. That's right, today we have the skateboarding event in what is quite possibly the most well-known skateboarding arena in video games, The Hangar from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, brought to you today from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 on the PS5. Our teams today have two minutes to get the highest score that they can, and they've had three practice rounds to figure out their strategies. But let's not keep you hanging any longer because it looks like our first competitor, John representing you Betristan, is ready to go. In three, two, one, go. Okay, now the name of the game when getting points in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is to try and get as many combos as possible. You can see in the bottom of the screen the times ones and times twos. Those are what you're looking for. Multiple tricks stacked together. An unfortunate crash right near the start here from the You Betcha Stan representative. But yes, times three, you want to try and get as many combos as possible to try and get the highest score possible. And that is the name of the game here today. Now, our teams have had three rounds to practice this. Ooh, another unfortunate halfpipe crash there from the You Betcha Stan representative. We have had three rounds, each team, to practice their tricks, their skills, their strategies. So we're going to hopefully see some high-level game. Ooh, unfortunate crash yet again. The grinds do not appear to be working out for John here. We're going to hopefully... Ooh, trying to get some uh, rotating flips happening there. Not quite landing them. We are a minute in, into our two minutes. So 15,000. Hoping to see some higher points happening there. Ooh, yes, these grinds do not appear to be working out for you, Betchistan, today. Which is unfortunate, as they are a very good combo extender. If you're trying to get the highest points possible. So let's see if we can maybe get something happening from John here. As we hit the 30 seconds remaining. Ooh, falling off the grind. That balance bar can be quite a bit tricky to get going. With 20 seconds left, can... Represent oh, a successful grind. Excellent plays, excellent plays. Less excellent plays, but no time to hang around. We've got to keep going. Thankfully, this game is rather quick to get you back up on the board. Five seconds left. Can we get any bonus points? That's looking like a no. And that 
is time. 21,569 points is the score to beat right now. Some unfortunate crashes from John on this run. The grinds did not want to cooperate. The wingtip hang time early into the run definitely helped him, showing off the potential for environmental multipliers to really help boost that score. Now let's see if our second competitor, Jeff representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, can put some of that knowledge to use in 3, 2, 1, go. Both competitors looking to start with a grind on that half pipe. Jeff unfortunately crashing right at the start, ooh, twice in a row, still getting the points from that second one though. So not all is lost. And ooh, already starting through with some environmental bonuses, breaking through to the second area of the hangar. Not something that we saw John do at all. Another unfortunate crash there. Grinds do not appear to be cooperating uh, completely, at the very least, for anyone today. Getting some excellent starting points here. We're only 30 seconds in and we are almost over three quarters of the way through John's entire score. Another unfortunate crash there, but he is collecting the letters, which I'm not sure how much those will actually impact the points. But I suppose we will just have to wait and see. Some excellent combos here from Jeff. Getting some times fours. I think I saw a times five earlier as well. Making some excellent use of grinds and various other skateboard tricks to extend the combo. Jumps into grinds, into grinds, into unfortunate crashes, but that would have been worth 12,000 points. So you can definitely see why they're worth going for these extenders. The balance bar does get harder to control as you do more and more grinds, so it is a bit of a balancing act, no pun intended. Almost 30 seconds, just over 30 seconds left until the end of the run, getting some excellent points, some unfortunate crashes, but that is the name of the game. 25 seconds to go. How is he going to finish things off here? Actually, ooh, a very nice combo. Thankfully getting the points before the crash. Yes, Jeff is doing quite well at extending these combos here. A time six. Very, very well done on Jeff. 10 seconds left. How much more can he do in the time remaining? Unfortunate crash right at the end here. Is that going to be the final score? Manages to get that 8,000 just before the end for a final score of 67,603. An excellent score to beat over tripling John's score. Jeff managed to put those environmental bonuses to excellent use with the early chopper hop breaking through to the second part of the map. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows as there were some pretty big crashes that cost him quite a few points. Let's see if our next competitor, Rick representing Imperium Ludum, can avoid some of those pitfalls as he makes his way to the starting line in 3, 2, one, go. Rick keeping with tradition as everyone goes for that first trick. But Rick actually managing to land it for an early start at 5,700 points. Breaking his way through to the second map, following in Jeff's yeah. wheel steps. And making his way back to the first part of the map yet again with some excellent starting points here. 30 seconds in, surpassing Jeff's score at this point in time. And, ooh, another unfortunate crash. I don't think anyone's going to be able to avoid them today. But again, that is the name of the game. Now, Jeff was managing to get some bonus points by breaking through to the second part of the map by actually jumping over where the glass was. Not something that we're seeing Rick do. We'll see whether or not that impacts the final standings. But, ooh, getting some little bit of a wall ride there, it looked like. I'm not quite sure. I would have to go back and check, but it did look quite good. There he is, managing to get the chopper hop that time. Not quite getting a very large combo off of it, but interesting to see that he does know how to do that. Less than a minute to go. He's looking on track to beat Jeff's score. Some unfortunate crashes, not quite getting the large combos that Jeff was getting, but more consistently landing the points. Ooh, an excellent time eight for 15,000 points. I think that is our largest scoring trick so far and 14,000 following it up a very strong showing by Rick here and there's still 30 seconds left in the run we've already seen him overtake the first place with 75,000 points and then crashing immediately after but if he's already got first place then the only one he has to worry about is our fourth competitor let's see how much he can cement this lead with 10 seconds left on the clock going for some grinds over the half pipe Getting an extra 1,000, just a just a cheeky little 1,000 there to finish things off. And that 
his time. 82,242 points. A very impressive showing by Rick of Imperium Ludum. Rick was a lot more consistent with his tricks on this run, with very few crashes, but no one is immune to the whims of fate, taking a fairly big crash early on in the run. But that didn't keep him down for long as he proceeded to get the highest scoring combo we've seen all day, cementing Imperium Ludum at the top of the scoreboard. Our final competitor for the day has the goal in their sight, as Felice of the Daisy Baby Bitch territory makes their way to the starting line. In 3, 2, 1, go. Felice breaking with the tradition that everyone else has gone for, not immediately going for the halfpipe. An interesting strategy, as they appear to be going straight for the second half of the hangar, not quite making it over. But that does still appear to be the plan as they take a very quick track into there, getting a nice quick 3,000 points there, very nicely done. Unfortunate crash on the quarter pipe there. And another unfortunate crash right there. Seems to be taking longer to get back up onto the board. That was something that I had assumed was automatic, but there does appear to be a button press involved. It appears to be going for some cheeky little 180s, but not quite sticking the landing. Seems to be trying to get on top of the helicopter. Perhaps trying to turn it into the Felicopter, but not quite getting the height necessary. I'm not even sure if that's a thing you can do. Maybe you can grind along the little fins? Rotors? That's the word. That's the word I should be looking for. Rotors. Ooh, heading back into the first half of the hangar now. Let's see if this can fare a little bit better for the score. 45 seconds left on the clock and only at 6,000 points. Got a long way to go if you want to beat Rick's score of 82,000. Unfortunate crashes. 30 seconds on the clock, 6,000 points on the board. Gonna need one heck of a comeback if they want to get the gold medal. Ooh, starting off with a grind, finishing off with a crash. Unfortunate there. 13 seconds. We're gonna need to see something quite massive if there's going to be any medal ranking for the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Three seconds left. It's looking like that is time. Lee started off strong with that early grind into the second area of the hangar, but unfortunately didn't seem to have any luck stringing combos together. And with that, the skateboarding event is over, and the final standings are as follows. The Daisy Baby Bitch territory gets a very nice score of 6,869 points, while You Betcha Stan takes home the bronze with 21,569 points. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook takes a bit of revenge after yesterday's fencing upset with the silver and a score of 67,603 points. And your winner of the skateboarding event with the gold medal and a score of 82,240 points is Imperium Ludum. Congratulations to all of the competitors in today's event, but that is all the time I have with you today. I've been your host, Seadood. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell if you want to catch the rest of the games, and come back tomorrow for the triathlon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and esteemed guests to the first 23rd annual D-Pad Summer Games. I'm your host, Hypermode, and today's event will be the triathlon. Representing the four nations today are Bebel of Imperium Ludum, John from Yebechistan, Lindsay from the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, and Jose from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Our athletes will simultaneously trek across the beautiful and dangerous lands of Hyrule. They'll start off in the Korku Chide Shrine on Eventide Island. From there, they'll swim to shore and make landfall on Loshio Harbor. After making landfall, they'll ride their master cycles through a complex path, taking them across various landmarks in Hyrule, ending at the Proxim Bridge. Once there, our athletes will abandon their master cycles and complete the rest of the race on foot. The race ends once the athletes cross the treacherous Hyrule Field and cross the front gate of Hyrule Castle Town Ruins. Alright, it seems like our athletes are ready atop uh, the entrance of Korgu Chidesh Shrine. And they're off. Once again, our, our representatives here today are Bebel of Imperium Ludum, John of Ubechistan, Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, and Jose of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. 
All of our athletes here are gliding in the same direction with uh, Jose having used the, the uh, column of air to propel themselves a good deal higher and easily gliding above the Bokoblin camp uh, below. Seems like they are waiting for a cue and Lindsay is the first to, uh, to hit the water followed closely by Jose. Uh, Bebel and John are, are deciding to ta spend a little more time gliding over the water rather than swimming, an interesting tactic. We'll see if it does them any favors. Now, aside from John, it is the first uh, game. This is the first game for Bebel, Lindsay, and Jose. John, of course, has, has participated in both the skateboarding and fencing games from the previous uh, two days, and he has a medal to show for each of them. Our players here are dodging a couple of Octorok rocks. Unfortunately, Lindsay takes a hit, but that does not seem to be stopping her. They continue to swim. Uh, their goal right now is to swim north around Cape Kales and eventually make landfall on Locio Harbor. Thus far, Ubechistan and Ludum uh, and Imperium Ludum both have two battles to their name while Tierra de los Hermanos Hook and Daisy Baby Bitch Territory only have one. I'm sure all of them are just as thirsty for their gold as anybody else. Here our athletes are by necessity taking a stamina, or, or consuming a stamina item. Uh, such a swim would be impossible otherwise. They, uh, they, would, they would drown and respawn back in the shores of Eventide Island. So far, all of our athletes are very, very adamantly tanking those Octorok hits. Thankfully, they have a lot of health and armor to their name, so this shouldn't pose too much of a threat for them. It seems like John and Bebel's gliding strategy has proven to, to have paid off as they have made land uh, the first landfall at the first leg of this of this uh, swim and John opts once again to repeat the strategy and using Rivali's Gale to cut down on the swimming Bebel is presumably right behind him followed by Lindsay and then Jose. John and Bebel are fastidiously making their way towards Locio Harbor. John seems to have a uh, a pretty commanding lead at the moment thanks to his use of Rivali's Gale. Bebel is not far off behind, and once again, Lindsay and Jose seem to be about neck and neck in this first third of the triathlon. John is using, once again, Rivali's Gale to gain a little bit of height to avoid as much swimming as possible, ironically, given that since swimming is unfortunately a good deal slower than gliding. And it seems like Bebel is going to be opting for the same strategy. We'll see if Lindsay and Jose do the same. Bebel does not, uh, opts not to use Rivali's Gale, or perhaps is unable to do so, and continues to swim anyway. Lindsay and Jose are making up uh, are 
fast approaching the the rocks that uh, Be that Bebel and John have jumped from. John and and Bebel are slowly round, rounding the corner. And John once again using Rivali's Gale to gain a bit of height. Jose opting to shoot the Octorok in his way. Decides not to shoot it, and instead decides to press on forward. That Octorok got what was coming to them. John is arriving to the second set of rock, or I'm sorry, third set of rocks. And is now swimming and making a mad dash over them using a bit of a glide. Jose you, uh, is, uh, is also making use of Ravali's Gale to cover a good bit of distance. Bebel here has a, a Lazalfos to deal with, but John has arrived at Loshio Harbor and is now on his master cycle. He'll be heading northwest towards Fearley Plateau. He has a solid lead now compared to the three other athletes. But will but there's still plenty of time left in this triathlon. Anything could happen. Hyrule is a highly dangerous and treacherous land. And there's still plenty of opportunities for our other athletes to make time. Bebel is almost at Loshio Harbor. With Lindsay and Ch and uh, and Jose following closely. John unfortunately takes a bad spill off of his master cycle ahead hitting a tree but gets right back on it he's having some difficulties uh, gaining control of the master cycle going through these woods at high speed of course is very treacherous and uh, as we can see, uh, it's not the Pacoblins that will be your, your biggest threat here. Now, Bebel has made it onto Loshio Harbor, but he, while, while he's summoned his Master Cycle, hasn't... Uh, now he summons his Master Cycle, and he is off. Jose also fast... Uh, just behind, uh, just behind Bebel, summons, his, uh, summons their master cycle, and they're off to the Furley Plateau. Lindsay's is almost at 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 Loshio Harbor. Now John jumps off of his master cycle and once again employs a little bit of gliding to help him navigate some of that more tricky terrain. We'll have to do a little bit of climbing to get back up on, on the path. Lindsay has has arrived at, at Loshio Harbor and has summoned her Master Cycle and is now off as well. All of our athletes here having a fairly... fairly safe route so far. John once again employing the, the hang glider to maximize speed and avoid obstacles. Bebel, Lindsay, and Jose clearing the, clearing the forest area with a lot more ease and grace than John. Oh, but Bebel takes a bad tumble off a cliff. That's gonna, that's gonna cost him some time. Jose 
taking a pretty tricky ride across some of the steep mountainside cliffs. And uh, killing a poor bird uh, in the process. Uh, we don't endorse that here at the D-Pad Summer Games, but... We understand that our athletes uh, often have to do what they can to complete the race. Bebel has, has successfully dealt with a a uh, goblin on horseback. Thankfully, that did not. Oh, but it seems like the like the goblin is back for revenge and has dealt uh, Bebel some pretty bad damage. The Bebel thankfully has uh, a fair, some fairies as insurance. John makes an explosive entrance into a goblin camp. While Bebel here is climbing up a a fortified wall and is back on the master cycle. Jose is crossing a river bridge, nearly running over a pedestrian. This uh, this seems to be a pattern of Jose's behavior here. And Lindsay is making her way through a field full of guardian uh, wrecks. No doubt foreshadowing to an area later in our triathlon. John is back is back on on swimming, oddly enough. And uh, once again, employing that Rivali's Gale to give him some some altitude to help him cross this river over here. John still has, has quite the commanding lead with Bebel, Bebel and Lindsay being relatively close. And Jose seems to be pretty close to, uh, to, uh, to where John is currently. Athletes are now headed towards our, our next checkpoint is going to be after the Dueling Peaks. John seems to have... And John has reached the end of the, pro, of the Proxim Bridge. And he is now on foot. And Jose is seems to have gotten, uh, gotten ahead of him. Bebel and Lindsay are fast approaching the Proxim Bridge. They still have an opportunity to catch up to, to John and Jose. While John and Jose have a, a lead on both Bebel and Lindsay, they also must cross Hyrule Field, which is filled with many treacherous guardians that have killed many a hero before them. Lindsay has dismounted, uh, has dismounted her bike, and Bebel is has just um, uh, is just about to dismount his. And now all of our runners are on foot. This is the final leg of the race, and we'll see who will be the first to cross the gates of the Hyrule Castle Town Ruins and get that gold medal. Jose's got a couple of uh, of skeleton bacoblins behind behind them. John dodging a John, uh, dodging one of the Sh chic ninjas, I believe.
Our athletes here are getting very close to uh, to the finish line now. With with Hyrule Castle drawing ever ever closer. At this point, all of our athletes are, are are free to take whatever route they feel is quickest for them to get to the goal. All of them opting to avoid any sort of combat where necessary. John and Jose look to be neck and neck. It's difficult to say who's in who's on first, uh, given their, their different routes. But based on the distance between them and Hyrule Castle, it's going to be one of them taking the gold and one of them taking the silver. Though that said, there. Lindsay and Bebel are still hot on their heels, and anything could still happen. And we could see an incredible mix-up. Now Jose here looks like he like they were about to use the time uh, the time stop ability. But instead, they need to dispatch one of the ninjas. John dealing, unfortunately, with one of those deadly guardians. And dispatching him with a bullseye. Excellent shot there. Now, that will have cost him a bit of time. Now... Jose masterfully dispatching that Guardian using the Time Stop mechanic, along with a Bullseye. But John has another guard, and now John has, to, has another Guardian to deal with. Lindsay also in the middle of combat with a Guardian, along with Bebel. All of our runners here are now face-to-face -face with one of the deadliest machinations of Hyrule. John seems to have dispatched his. And it seems, but it seems like Jose is about to take the gold. This is the... This is the first gold for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. And their third medal along with silver for skateboarding and bronze for fencing. John is at the steps of the gate, securing his silver medal, despite being almost lit ablaze by the Guardian. Now it's all up to Bebel and Lindsay to see who will take the bronze medal in the triathlon. Bebel is employing a little bit of, of tree climbing to avoid the laser sights of the Guardian's uh, laser cannons. Unfortunately, taking a nasty hit. But Bebel is, a, is at the feet of the gate of the Hyrule Temple ruins, of the Hy excuse me, the Hyrule Town ruins, and crosses it to secure the bronze. Unfortunately, Lin uh, Lindsay was met with a game over. This will cost her quite a bit of time. But thankfully she is not that far from the gates of the Hyrule Town Ruins. She's exacting a little, a little bit of, uh, of revenge on this, uh, on this Guardian, making sure it will not impede her from the rest of the race. Pulling apart each of its legs, completely immobilizing the machine. 
And now she's off, making a final sprint towards the gates to complete the triathlon. She's employing a serpentine maneuver to avoid the laser sights of the of the Guardian, and is doing so quite deftly. And is now using a little bit of that uh, of the hot air to get herself a little bit of, uh, a little bit of extra height. And now she is in the home stretch. There, between uh, her and the end of the triathlon is just one last guardian. She successfully uses a tree to block its laser cannon, and well, it is now looking like she is once again dismembering the guardian, rendering it immobile. Fortunately, she takes a nasty spill from the Guardian. And is thankfully revived by Misha's Grace. The Guardian is now dismembered, and she has but a few feet to complete the race. And with that, our athletes have successfully completed the D-Pad Summer Games Triathlon. Jose and John were neck and neck for most of the race, but ultimately Jose took the gold, with John taking silver. Bebel and Lindsay both made an admirable showing, with Bebel taking the bronze in the end. Thanks to Jose's performance, Tierra de los Hermanos Hook is now tied with Yabechistan, with one gold, silver, and bronze medal each. Imperium Ludon is in third, with one gold and one bronze, and the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory is in fourth, with one silver medal. The four nations will still have plenty of opportunities to win medals starting with tomorrow's event, baseball. That's it for me. Thank you for watching the first 23rd annual D-Pad Summer Games. This is Hypermode, signing off. Good morning, afternoon, evening, or middle of the night, friendos, and welcome back to our continued coverage of The Games. I'm Teddy, aka Evil Hippie, and I'll be your host for our next event, Tecmo Baseball. In this event, we will play two semifinal matches, the losing teams will compete for the bronze medal, and the winners for gold and silver. Each match will be a nine-inning game of fairly standard baseball rules, with the team having the higher score at the end of nine innings being declared the winner. The controls are not intuitive, and the manual has lied to us, so we've allowed our competitors one inning each to get the idea, and the rest they'll have to figure out during the game. On to our first game between Rick of the Imperium Ludum controlling Boston and Peter of Terrera de los Hermanos Hook piloting the visiting Detroit and up to bat first. And first pitch is a strike. And while we're going over this, we'll let you in on some of the basics of how the game works. First, the pitcher and the batter need to each make a decision as to what kind of pitch or which kind of hit they would like. Ooh, we got a strike out already. Throwing straight strikes here. It's five strikes in a row. Six strikes in a row, two batters down, setting up for a great first inning for the pitcher from Boston. Oh, that is eight strikes in a row, one more for a perfect inning. Oh, and with the ninth pitch, contact was made, though it was a foul. Looks like Peter's getting his eye in. Oh, and I was wrong. Anyway, so once the pitcher and the batter have locked in their pitch and hit respectively um, the pitch is thrown and the batter tries to hit it um, you can sort of control what where the pitch is going or where your batter is standing whether you're forward in the box or back in the box there we have a breaking ball um, this forward and back the general advisement is to not go too far forward or too far back that's still lots of strikes are setting up for potentially a really deep pitchers duel in this game And the pitch. Oh, look, swung three times before that pitch even crossed the plate. Two down in the bottom of the first. Mm, we have a positioning duel and a strike. 
Oh, he swung ahead of time. If this was real baseball, he would have already gotten the strike there. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the first inning. Official time, one minute. Actual time, slightly more. Oh, throwing heat from the pitcher from Boston. Way early on that swing. Oh, another three-pitch strikeout. Oh, ball's in play, and he's out at first. Oh, another foul. Looks like Peter's starting to get his eye in. Curse of the commentator there. Fight! There's no actual fight, unfortunately. Bottom of the second. Oh, trying to trick him up with the curveball. Another strikeout, both of these pitchers. Hmm? Seems like Rick still hasn't got his eye in yet for this game. Move up. Oh, there it is. Swinging early. Coming up on five straight strikeouts for the pitcher from Detroit. And, ooh, again, two swings before the ball even crossed the plate. And there it is, six straight strikeouts. Here we are, top of the third. Detroit up to bat again. Oh, trying Rick's tactic of stringing three times before the ball crosses the plate. Or once well after it's crossed the plate. And guess what? Another strikeout, folks. These pitchers are lights out. That was... Should have been a ball. That definitely was a strike. Oh, it's in play. We may have a base runner here. Makes it to first with plenty of time and decides to sit there. So the next thing we should probably talk about is base running and fielding. Um, with base running, you have to tell which base you would like to go to, whether that's first, second, third, or home, and it will attempt to make it there. Um, the problem is, at least from when I was playing this game, is that it's all from the perspective of the pitcher. So down is for second base, but by the time you're in fielding view, home plate is down. All right, yeah, that's a very, very high foul ball. Um, with fielding, it's much the same. Uh, one tap will throw it to the cutoff man, or the person in the best perspective to catch the hitter at the top of the inning. Oh, and there we go. Top of the third down, one base runner, but we finally have someone in play. Another strike from the hot pitcher from Detroit. Oof, that is seven straight strikeouts. Oh. Sizing each other up again. Swing and a miss. Oh, Rick puts a ball in play. It's a nice dribbler to the wall. Oh, he has figured out the base running controls. Has moved on to second comfortably. We got a little bit of a lead. We'll see if they've figured out how to steal or have the gall to steal. Strike one. Oh, that was behind him. And ball one. The first ball we've seen thrown all day. Oh, he grooved one right up the plate. And that is to the backfield wall. Runners on the corners. Oh, he's moving to second. And I think we have our first run scored. one nothing Boston. And throw it to second base just to be safe. Psyching each other out with a little shuffling. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two. Oh. Strike out. No longer needs the double play. It wasn't really an option last time up anyway because someone was on second and not first. Can he get himself out of this jam? Oh, as an... Fly ball. Oh, and it drops in for a bloop single. All the way to the back wall. The runner from second will score. Runner stays safe on first base. Probably safe. And again, throw it to first just to be sure. Little bit of a lead. Oh, checking the runner. 
Swing and a miss. Strike one. Swing and a miss. Strike two. Oh, he's stealing. Strike three. End of the inning. Two runs for Boston. Up two nothing. Top of the fourth. Ball's in play. And he's out. Peter had his eye in before, but after that long inning, has he lost it? It swung afterwards. Ooh, this one will go right up. Oh, nice run in from the center fielder. Robbed him of a nice base hit. Swing and a miss, strike one. This one could go all the way. Home run! Charging around the bases, hand in the air, his team there to congratulate him, performing what appears to be a very rude gesture, and we're back in it. Another swing after the ball is crossed the plate. Oh, an attempt at a bunt. And that will do it for the top of the fourth. They make up one run. Let's see if they can maintain this one run deficit. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Curveball, but he did not fool him with that one. And it, once again, goes all the way to the fence. Sitting on first, just to make sure he's safe. This one's in play. Little seeing eye single. Runners advance, but stay where they are. First and second, nobody out. And immediately throws the pitch. And another seeing eye single that goes all the way to the back wall. No, advance your runners. You can do this. Oh, now he's running back. And he should be out. But he said Sate is... What? He's in... Activated his cloak of invisibility? Okay, so if we're playing actual baseball here, he was... Out? Okay, good. He is out. That was very confusing. I didn't realize that the cloak of invisibility and not announcing an out was a thing in Tecmo Baseball, but apparently it is. Oh, and with one strike, another seeing eye single to the wall. Runners advance. No, you could go home. Run home. All right, bases loaded. And a little bloop bunt. It said safe, but the runner was out at first. Runners advance and score one run. 3-1 Detroit. Excuse me. 3-1 Boston. Foul ball. Strike two. Now they say about real baseball, if you want to enjoy the game but not waste your whole day, you watch the first three innings and you watch the last three innings. Hopefully this game will be a little bit shorter than your average baseball game. We shall see. Strike one in the top of the fifth. Boston adds one to their lead. Two strikes. These two long innings for Detroit on defense have really ruined Peter's timing. Oh, and Rick is just rapid fire throwing pitches. Late again. Two outs. Very early. You can do... There it is. Starting to get time back in. We've made contact, but a foul ball. Oh, right up the middle. Can the center fielder? No, he cannot charge this time. Immediately throws to the cutoff man, holding him at first. Strike one. Strike two. Little pop-up, and it lands for a base hit. Runners staying at first and second, just to make sure that everything is going to... Oh, and Runner tries to sneakily advance to third, and he's caught in a pickle. Tecmo is number one. Droid can't claw anything back, still down by two. Boston up to bat. Oh, we fooled him with that curveball on the outside. Ooh, right up the middle, strike two. Oh, this ball's in play. Can the left fielder? No. Running into the corner. The runner is held at first for safety. That left fielder has a cannon. Excuse me. Right fielder. 
Checking the base runner. There will be no shenanigans. On to Will's baseball diamond. Oh, another bloop single. Runners stay put. Nope, the runner from second advancing to third. And he makes it safely, sliding for no reason other than he wanted to make the laundry guy's job a little bit harder. Nope, and this is infield fly rule should be in effect. No double play possible, but it lands anyway. The run scores. The runner can't decide if they want to advance or not. He is advanced. They're holding it second and third. Really scared of this center fielder's throw. And the runner from third scores. And going to third. Oh, and he is out. All in all, two runs score in that shenanigans is what I'll call them. Right back to the pitcher. Throws it to first for the easy out. Two outs now in the bottom of the fifth. Foul ball. Seeing eye single. Makes it all the way to the outfield, but he throws it back in, holding the runner to just a single. Throws it to the pitcher to make his job easier for throwing the ball back to the catcher. We have no pitch clock in this game, so they are holding. It's a staring contest. They are trying to psych each other out. A batter is wiggling his butt, and oh, foul ball. Timeout. Looks like he's going to the bullpen. He's bringing in fries. I like mine with ketchup or barbecue sauce. Let's see how this lefty can do. Right back to the pitcher. Tested early. Makes the easy out at first base. Boston gets two runs there in the bottom of the fifth. Bringing their lead for up to 5-1. to one. Detroit's got some work to do. Oh, there's some solid wood on the ball. And it lands for the bloop single. Again, just making sure that he is staying on that base. And we have a steal. Can he make it? He can. Ooh, very close on that one. Oh, and he get all of this one. The runner advances to third. He's going for home. Ill-advised. Seeing eye single through the infield, through the outfield, all the way to the wall, and the runners hold at first and second. Looks like Peters starting to get his groove back. All it takes is one swing of the bat, and this game gets a lot more interesting. Oh, he got a lot of that one. Three run bomb into the stands. Running around the bases, taunting with his finger in the air. Again, a rude gesture to his team as he passes. And we're within one. Not sure if that was a bunt or a very slow swing. Two strikes. Oh, just missed. I just realized that Rick's pitcher is named Dick. And just as I realized that, it appears that he may be going to the bullpen. Oh no, we are having a pinch hitter. Never mind, we're not having a pinch hitter. Or adjusting in-game settings. The pitch, and a foul. Can the catcher get to it? He's trying, but it's in the stands, ruining someone's peanuts. Oh, good hit. Outfield gets it, holds him to just a single. Way on the outside, but swinging anyway, just for posterity. Makes contact here, but I think... No, it lands for the bloop single. Really quick fielding on the part of Boston here. It seems that they have gotten their act together, and there are no extra bases happening from fielding blunders. That hit him on the chin. Big inning for Detroit, clawing back most of their deficit. Still trail by one. 
Can they hold it that way? Wow! He really wants him to back off the plate with that chin music. Ooh, nice throw. We're doing the fadeaway swing. Oh, he made contact with the bunt. The pitcher gets it. Makes the easy out to first. Not so easy, that one, actually. You gotta realize you need to charge. Oh, nice pitch. Right up the middle. Tried to fake him out with that one. And he did. He swung way early. Foul ball. Another foul ball. Oh, this one will get out of the infield and all the way to the wall. I was going to say that was going to be the longest hit single I have ever seen, but in this case, he manages to get the double. All right, runner on second. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Ball. Ooh, nice catch by the pitcher. No, you got to throw it to second. To second. You need to throw it to second. There it is. Okay, and after that little debacle... Detroit holds Boston scoreless in the bottom of the sixth, and they're still only down by one. Here we are at the top of the seventh inning. This time a staring contest initiated by Boston. Lauren will have none of it. This is why we have implemented a pitch clock in real baseball, folks. But this isn't real baseball. This is better than real baseball. This is Tecmo Bowl from the games. And if you're just tuning in, I'm your host, Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie. Oh, this is the reason for the pause. The pitcher couldn't handle it. We're bringing in Robert, another righty who throws heat. Oh, Two strikes really fast. Oh, that is a quick out once Robert got in the game. Still throwing smoke. Oh, mix it up this time. Oh, two straight strikeouts. Great pitching from Boston here. They really want this game. Oh, rapid fire strikes. Oh, he didn't fool him with that one. Bloop single right over the infield, all the way to the wall. A very, very well hit single. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two. Can the pitcher get it? Gets the fly out to end the inning. Detroit still trailing by one. Boston up to bat. Strike one. Swing and a miss. Oh. Oh. Just beats the runner. Psyching each other out with a little bit of shimmies. Gets the foul. Shimmy, shimmy. Swing and a miss. Ooh, good hit on that one, and it makes it to the wall. Holding it first base. These base runners, not taking any chances here today, folks. A mid-level staring contest, swing and a miss, strike one, strike two. He was fooled him on that one, inside curveball. Well hit ball, makes it through the infield all the way to the wall. Runner advances to second, and then mysteriously holds there. Throwing it home for no shenanigans. Safe. Double safe. Just checking on both base runners to make sure they aren't going anywhere. Oh. Strike one. Strike one. 
Bloop single. All the way to the wall. Could have scored here, but out of sportsmanship. Wants to keep the game close. Or once again, it's that crazy base running controls. We'll never know, and Rick will never tell. Foul, strike one. To the pitcher, to first base for an easy out. Lots of base runners, but weren't able to put any across the plate. Still 5-4 Boston. Swing and a miss. Robert still throwing absolute heat. Just dominating the strike zone. Oh. Mix it in with the curveball every now and again just to keep the batters guessing. Two quick strikes. Three quick strikes. Robert is knocking down this Detroit team. Batter after batter. Three quick outs. A 1-2-3 inning for Boston. Oh, we're not bringing in the big wood. Not yet. We don't need to. If anything, we need to make a defensive substitution. You are leading in this game, Boston. Foul ball. Fries is trying with all his might. And once again, another seeing eye single that makes it all the way to the wall. But still, only good enough for a single. Runner on first has a mild lead. And the swing. Oh, could have been a double play had the fielders been in position, but they were not. Turns out it's a single. This has been the safest base running I have ever seen in all of my one day as a broadcaster for Tecmo Baseball. Fry is getting his eye in. A good shot. Oh, once again, a bloop single over the infield. It makes it to the wall. Base runner has no idea where he's going. He should be going to third. He was trying to go to second. But the fielders knew. Threw him out at third base. We'll go around the horn. Why not? A common victory or morale-boosting activity that baseball teams will do. The catcher will throw the ball around the horn. Third base to second to first. And then back to the pitcher. I don't think it was on purpose, folks, but we'll find out. Stay tuned to our continued coverage of the games. After this, we will have the other semifinal match. And then following that, we will have our medal matches. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Oh, we're changing pitchers. We got to bring in the closer. And Wesley gets the ball with an ERA of 1.67 and a great left-handed delivery. A pop-up. Catches him for the out. Oh! Guess Tecmo Baseball doesn't have an infield fly rule, for if this was actual baseball, he would not have been able to get the double play. Strike one. Strike two. Strike three. We're now two outs away from Boston taking this game. Strike one, Robert, with his patented fast pitching style, rapid fire, confuse the batter as much as possible. Two outs, he is three strikes away, two strikes away, one strike away, and that's the ball game. Boston beats Detroit in our first semifinal match, and advancing to the gold medal round is Rick with the Imperium Ludum. What an excellent match we had here, folks. You could tell that the controls were definitely getting to our competitors. Base running is definitely an acquired skill. Fielding almost has acquired a, I wanna say skill, but in this game, you don't really have that much control. Pitching and batting were great. And returning here to Tecmo Baseball, we have our second semifinal match between Dustin of You Betcha Stan and Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Dustin will be playing Milwaukee, and Lindsay will be piloting Cincinnati. And without any further ado, let's get into the action. Milwaukee up to bat first. And once again, these are two people who have had one inning each 
of control with this game. This takes some figuring out. And once again, we have this game starting off much like the first, with a strikeout. It is decidedly easier to just throw a swing than it is to miss a pitch. So that's why these strikeouts are happening very early in these games. Oof, two straight strikeouts. Six pitches, two outs. And first contact made on the eighth pitch of the game and a foul. Starting very much so, like our first semifinal match. And we have our first staring contest. The shimmy and another foul. One, two, three inning for the Cincinnati pitcher. Cincinnati now up to bat. Oh, makes contact with the first pitch and sends it all the way to the wall. Fielding and base running are next. These skills also take a bit more to pick up. I'd also like to point out again that down directs the ball or the runner to second base. Oh boy, this pitcher really doesn't like stealing and he wants it known early. Oh, a little squibbler right back to the pitcher, and the pitcher decides to go to second and not first. Two runners on for Cincinnati here in the bottom of the first. Oh, that pitch looked like it hit the batter in the head, but Tecmo Baseball is vicious. Oh, another good contact. It's going back. It is out of here. Three run home run for Cincinnati in the bottom of the first. This is the best start we've had to a game since, well, it's the second game we've had. Oh, more good contact. A seeing eye single that makes it all the way back to the wall. I must say, these two have definitely picked up the controls better than our first two teams. And as I say that, the commentator's curse comes in, and we have all kinds of swings. Early swings, late swings, just hold the bat out there and let him hit it with the ball. But still, the tactic seems to be working as Cincinnati is up 3 to nothing. Milwaukee back up to bat. Two straight strikes. The shimmy duels are back. Oh, this is the longest foul ball hit we've seen yet today. Swing and a miss. Little early on that one. Again with the foul, these pop-ups going straight back. Another one. The only good thing about this is they're too far for the catcher to even think about attempting to get it. Eh, swing and a miss. Still trying to nail that timing. And we have a little... Oh, that bounced on the ground. Unforced error by the pitcher allows a base runner. We got a runner at first. The batter moonwalking in the box. Pitcher in the case ready. And we have a steal. First base runner with two outs. Size to get the steal on. Aggressive style, but that's what's going to take to get back in this game. Oh, stealing third. Manages to get it on the hit and run. It's not even a hit and run. He was off with the pitch. We have the makings of a comeback. The double steal is on. And it lands. Oh, and he's going for third. Go home. He's going home. Oh, this is a disaster. Oh, almost caught in a pickle, but manages to make it back to second base. 
Milwaukee makes up two-thirds of their deficit, now down by only one run. Uh, we have a steal of third and a strike, I believe, was the call on that play. Moonwalking in the box. Pitcher checks the runner. Pitcher checks the controls. Batter returns to moonwalking. Oh! Strike two. Oh, swing and a miss, strike three. Cincinnati gets out of that jam, only giving up two. Has a chance to make back some more insurance. Strike one. We saw this in the last game, too, that when you sit on the pitching for a while, you lose the timing of the batting. Quick innings by Milwaukee here on the pitcher are going to have to be imperative to them being able to maintain that wonderful rhythm they were building up at the end. Last inning. Last half inning. Strike two. Oh, and a quick 1-2-3 inning. Let's see if they can get back onto their run-scoring, base-stealing ways. It starts by getting somebody on base. Pitching inside. Doesn't want the batter to be able to get a hold of a lot of it. Jam him up by on the hands. Cannot hit the ball as hard. Not sure if Tecmo Baseball actually accounts for this. You're getting some real-world physics added in with your video games. Ooh! A wonderful hit over the head of the infield. What is the, is the shortstop doing way out there? The outfield gets it. And throws home. Alright, we have a runner safe on second. Let's see if the steal is on. The steal is on! This has been You Betcha Stands. M.O. from the beginning. Let's see if they have the audacity to steal home. Wisely, they wait at least one pitch. Swinging like that, it seems like the steals are the only way they're able to advance runners. Commentator's curse. We have a wonderful hit. Crushed it to deep center field all the way at the wall with an easy stand-up double. Oh, makes it look like going for the triple. Just taunting the other team. Cincinnati's pitcher here. Looking over his shoulder. Oh. And through the infield all the way to the outfield. But the runner from second. And with some hesitation from the outfield. Easily scores. Runner retreats intelligently back to first base. I bet you I know what's going to happen. The runner on first is going to steal. Would you look at that? The hit and run. Outfield doesn't know where to throw it. A little bit of a shimmy duel and the pitch delivered. It was a strike that was behind the batter's head, practically. Two strikes in a row. Again, going way, way inside with these pitches. I believe that a strikeout, and that base runner never attempted to steal after I said something. Every time I say something, the opposite happens. The cartridge will reset. It didn't. This has proved true. We have a quick out again. Milwaukee. Throwing smoke, just trying to get out of these innings quickly to keep up their base stealing and run scoring ways. Little synchronized dance there by the defending team. Oh, we have a bloop single. Base runners holding still, just being sure that they aren't going to get thrown out. These base runners are precious. The go-ahead run is at first base. With one out, we could sacrifice to get these players over. 
Not anymore. A strikeout like that is not going to do you any good. Runs should score here, but the outfield is quick to the ball and throws it in. I'm not sure they would have had time to score from there. That was good base running. Oh! Milwaukee manages to pitch their way out of that jam, having the bases loaded, but absolutely no one scoring. Foul ball. The previous inning was a lot longer than their other innings Milwaukee had pitching. Let's see if this affects them. Jammed him up inside, but managed to get the seeing eye single, and it makes it all the way to the back wall. The runner runs all the way to second. It seems that Ubecha San has definitely got a handle on how to run these bases. Swing and a miss. And that runner is off from second and easily into third. The pitch. Swing and a miss. Runner on third with one out. It'd be a shame to not score any points with this. And we have a little bloop inside hit, but no one wants to get it. Nobody called it. Oh, and look at that. The cheeky single turns into a double. Oh, you're not going to get the triple out of that. Just trying to keep the infield honest. Even the music got a little cheeky after that play. Oh. Caught stealing that time. With that aggressive base running strategy, it is a wonder that they haven't been caught out yet. Contact is made, and this time the pitcher calls it and manages to get the out. Tecmo is number one. With all that commotion, still only scoring one run, but extending their lead. Milwaukee up 5-3. to three. We have a deep fly ball that lands just in front of the center fielder. A very long single. The slowest curveball ever, but for a strike. Timeout is called. After throwing so many strikes, we need to change pitchers. Now Tom has been brought into the game. And Tom throws heat. Look at that, 92. The previous pitch was 96. Oh, but a seeing eye single makes it through the infield. 99 miles an hour. Tom is not screwing around, but then can slow it right down to 60. Easy outs from the ace from Milwaukee. Foul back to the backstop. Way inside and gets the strikeout. Milwaukee maintains their two run lead going into the top of the fifth. And timeout is called. We need a new pitcher. The first one was letting too many people steal base. Robert the righty is coming in. And the pitch. Way inside for a strike. Another strike. Didn't even swing at that one. Strike out. Robert is a tricky pitcher. These pitches seem to be going all over the place, but they are very deceptive. A pop out that the catcher just rips the mask off and stares at.
Robert just as pensive as our previous pitcher. Trying to stare into the soul of the batter. Apparently missed the soul that time, because that ball is long gone. Home run for Milwaukee. Extend their lead 6-3. to three. Rude gestures. His team with their hands out like, why? Why the rude gestures? All you did was score a home run. Swing and a miss. Strike one. This ball is hit a lot and bounces out. Entitled. I believe what they mean to say is ground rule double. Entitled. That is an interesting translation. This game was released in June of 19... Excuse me. January of 1989 for the Nintendo Entertainment System exclusively in the North American market. Not sure what's happening here with the ball. It's still way in the back there. The outfield is running for it. We have one run scoring. We have two runs scoring. I distracted myself talking about the release of Tecmo Baseball and some shenanigans happened there. There seems to be some confusion and anger over the previous play. Cincinnati will have to put that aside themselves and hopefully Manage to bring it back. The score eight to three on another really long foul ball. Pop up the catcher, the pitcher. Excellent fly out there. That's exactly what I need. One out at a time. Get out of this jam and move on to the next inning. Not sure where the shadow of this ball the was lost in the lights, I believe, is what baseball players say when they miss a ball. Wow, but manages to throw him out with an absolute cannon to third base. All right, we're out of that jam, Cincinnati. Let's get some... That was squarely on the chin. How was that a strike, Tecmo Baseball? Oh, three quick strikes. Tom's nice long rest seemed to have done them well, but this is a really well hit ball for a single. Base running is key. Aggressive base running so far has worked out really, really well for Milwaukee. And aggressive pitching, it seems, because that's two strikeouts. Ooh, the rapid fire pitching did not work out there. We have runners on first and second with two outs. Really slow ball. Really quick strike. Oh, and just like that, another strikeout. And Milwaukee manages to squeak their way out of that inning. Now up to bat. Let's see if the tricky pitcher Robert can fool Milwaukee. We have a batter shimmy. Swing and a miss, strike one. Riveting stuff this, but I'm afraid that if I talk more about the history of Tecmo Baseball, that something equally insane will happen and I will miss it. Strike two. We've slowed way down here, folks. We're hoping to make sure that everything is very precise and crisp. That last inning was a little messy. The pitcher doing a little dance. And the pitch manages to not have psyched out the batter and the ball makes it all the way to the backstop. A very long single. 
But this is all Milwaukee has needed is one base runner to cause all absolute chaos on the base paths. They wait at least one pitch. We're changing pitchers. The tricky pitcher, Robert, no longer useful. And it has to be Rick, the left-hander. Again, another strike off the face. And that's an out. I just realized that Rick came in with a strike already pitched. Once again, if this was real baseball, that would not be possible. And that's four quick strikes from Rick. Oh, jammed up on the inside, but this is going to make it over the shortstop's head. The runner from first advances all the way home with a standing triple. Oh, he's going for the inside the park home run. Oh, but they threw to second. Okay, everybody's safe with a standing triple. Which is what that play should have ended up as. And it drops in, the run scores. And in with another, going for the inside the park home run, and ooh, caught in a pickle. Safely back into third base. Score is now 10 to three, Milwaukee. Putting on a base running clinic here. The stare down, the pitch jammed up on the hands. Can get underneath it, no. Entitled. And once again, entitled means a ground rule double. And with that, fly out to the pitcher. Cincinnati finally gets their way out of that inning, but allows Milwaukee three runs. Scores 11 to three going into the bottom of the sixth. Oh, and a quick short hit makes it to the outfield and safely in with the single. Swing and a miss, strike one. Strike two. Oh, and swang way too early on that one. Oh, it was too fast and one medium that time. Oh, ball sees its way all the way to the back fence. No, keep running. The fielder should keep running and the base runner should keep running. But everyone's safe. First and second with two outs in the bottom of the sixth. Swing and a miss. And a chopper down the third base line makes it all the way to the fence. One run scores. Going for the second run? Did not get the second run, but at least clawed back one. Still down by seven. Milwaukee leads 11 to four here in the top of the seventh. Little shimmy and a shake from the batter and strike one. This pitcher tried to call it from the catcher once again. The catcher has a better angle on that ball. Let them get it. Oh, the steal is back on the menu. Rick must not have been paying attention while in the bullpen. Didn't realize how much Milwaukee has been stealing in this game. And a pop-up. This one is the pitcher's. That the pitcher is now in the shortstop's place, and a run manages to trickle in. Milwaukee leads 12 to four. We'll step back and a pitch. Not sure if that was a steal or a hit and run, but they made it. Matter trying to psych out the pitcher with their shimmy. The swing, way too early. A 
way inside, but again, swinging way too early. Oh no, Rick seems to have found the sauce. <laughs> Commentator's curse once again. This has got to be the fourth or fifth time this has happened. But there it is with a standing... Nope, did not make it the triple. But one run does manage to cross the plate. Milwaukee has a nine-run lead, 13-4. to four. And a bloop single that's now about to be a bloop double makes it all the way to the fence. The runner holds at second. Timeout is called. We got to move on to Tom. Tom taking his time for that first pitch. But it's in there for a strike. Strike two. Strike three. Seventh inning stretch. It was there and now it's over. There are very little breaks between innings for this, folks. This commentary has been fun. And I hope you've enjoyed us so far. Long foul ball. Cincinnati needs to find some of that magic. The bunt. But the pitcher runs it down for out number two. Out number three. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two. A well hit ball. Can the outfield get over in time? No, they cannot. Bounces against the fence and in with a standing double. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two, but the steal. A strikeout, but managed to steal third. Now the pitcher's getting their shimmy on. Strike two. A pop up. Oh, and a nice long run. Throw it in. The runner needs to tag up. We have a shimmy duel. Another fly ball, but this one manages to land just over the infield's head. Another run scores. We now have a double-digit 10-run lead for Milwaukee, up 14-4. Hit and run. And again, that shadow is very difficult to see when the ball is going up the first baseline. One run scores. Another run's coming in. Crosses the plate safely. Two more runs score. Milwaukee now with a 12-run lead. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Deep, deep pop-up over the backstop for a foul. Strike two. An angry shimmy. A pop fly. Pitcher gets underneath it this time to end the inning. Three more runs cross the plate. Milwaukee up 12 runs, 16 to 4. Milwaukee now bringing in the closer. Hoping for a six out, not really a save. Maybe that wasn't the best choice because the first pitch is hit all the way to the backstop. Man, can Conrad throw some smoke though? 
three quick strikes for the out. Again, hitting the batter apparently counts as a strike as long as they swing. Two of those makes for another out. Oh, a well-hit ball up the middle makes it all the way to the back fence. Runners cannot advance. Stuck on first and second. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two. Oh, a heartbreaker for Cincinnati. They really needed to get some runs out of those base runners. And here we are at the top of the ninth. Cincinnati needs to get out of this inning quickly to try to get their comeback on. A deep, well, deep for the pitcher at least, pop-up manages to get the single. And the quick steal puts the runner on second. Perspective in this game is difficult, but this one is clearly foul. And another foul. Looked almost exactly like the previous one. A pop up the pitcher, Kenny. Yes, they got it. Oh, and an out because the runner had to tag due to the fly out. A lucky out there for Cincinnati. And this quick pop up can the. No! Runner is going for second. What are they thinking? Pitcher is dancing on the mound. Foul ball. Runner has to come back to first. Swing and a miss. Strike two. Runner is off, but again it's foul. This is a pop-up. But it manages to bloop in. The runner advances. And crosses the plate safely. The lead is extended by one. 17 to 4 Milwaukee. Cincinnati really needs to stem the bleeding here. Minimize the damage to hope to have a chance to come back in the bottom of the ninth. Only two pitchers left. Terry, it's your turn. Terry just going for the headshot, but manages to get the strike. Didn't work that time. And finally, the strikeout. All right, 13 runs to make up. Let's see if it can happen. Big contact and a home run. That's what you need to start off a comeback. A huge home run to set the tone. Rude gesture. Why are you giving us a rude gesture? That home run was the last thing Dustin needed to see out of his pitcher. We're bringing in Bill. And Bill gives up a home run to deep center field. That's right, I hit one home run. A rude gesture. Swing and a miss on the pitch that was way outside. Now kind of inside, and really inside for out number one. Two more outs and Milwaukee puts this game away. Strike two. Oh, a very short ground out to the first baseman. Cincinnati's down to their last out. 11 runs to make up. Oh, hit right on the hip. And... And a pop-up to the pitcher to end the game. And with a commanding 11 run lead, Milwaukee piloted by Dustin of Ubechistan 
beats Cincinnati, piloted by Lindsay from Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Well, that was it for our semifinal matches. We're now headed on to the bronze medal match. Up to bat first, we have Cincinnati, piloted by CJ, the substitute coach in for Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Facing him across the diamond, piloting Detroit is Peter for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Let's check in with the action. Little bit of shimmy to start this off, and a first pitch strike off to a fantastic start. Strike two with an extremely late swing. And extremely early swing for the first out. Now, so far, each competitor has taken approximately eight balls to find contact, but CJ manages to find it in just four. Fantastic, but still ended up with an out. Peter continues to throw heat, mixing it up a little bit. Oh, and really mixing it up. Two and a half swings before that even made it to the plate. An easy one, two, three inning. Now up to bat is Peter, piloted by Peter for Detroit. Little shimmy and a real fast inside strike. Strikeout seemed to be the name of the game here early. Peter just swinging at anything that comes his way. No, he hasn't been playing for a little while. That last match took a little bit longer, but my god, where has the timing gone? Late swings, early swings. And with one more strike, that's the end of the first inning. Cincinnati back up to bat. Strike one. Continuing the strategy that's been doing him well so far, just throw heat. Oh, this ball's in play. It's going back. It bounces at the wall. No entitlement. And a double. Solid base running here by CJ. Checks the runner. No free bases here. Two quick strikes. Strike three. Checks the runner again. Saw what happened last game. Doesn't want the steal a palooza. Strike. I think that was a bunt. It's hard to tell with Tecmo Baseball. Oh, we have the rare ball. I think that's probably had less than 10 this in higher two matches prior to this. Oh, and Bazoff can't make the throw. Little lead from third. I mean, trying to steal home doesn't matter. Seeing eye single makes it all the way to the backstop, and a run scores for Cincinnati. And the batter is in with a nice easy stand-up double. Foul way back over the backstop. Trying to steal third. Can't get the throw in time. Strikeout seemed to be the name of the game, but still allows one run. Cincinnati up, one nothing. Going to the bottom of the second. A distracting shimmy and the pitch. No shimmy and still a strike. Makes contact. A little seeing eye single all the way out to the outfield. Runner smartly holds at first base. The batter even got in on that shimmy action, but still missed the ball. 
Good contact is made. This ball is back. It is out of here. Two run home run for Detroit. Leading the charge with that angled finger in the air. And my favorite portion, the rude gesture and his team confused at said rude gesture. Detroit now leads two to one with no outs in the bottom of the second. Ball, that should have been a free base. That clearly hit him. That was also a ball, but he swung anyway. Ball two. Right up the middle. One down in the bottom of the second. Jammed him up on the hands, but this one might drop in for a hit, and it does. It keeps rolling. It makes it all the way to the fence. Runner decided he wanted a nap instead of running to second base and stays at first. Definitely a ball. No arguments here. And the runner is off. Foul ball will make him come back. The pitch was a strike, but the steal was on. Runner safely at second base. The double play has been eliminated. Trying to steal third. And does steal third. But the batter is out. Not sure if these are short swings or bunt attempts. But they don't really seem to be working. And two steals doesn't really amount to anything, but still scoring two runs on that home run shot, Detroit now leads Cincinnati 2-1. to one. And we have good contact on the first pitch of the inning, makes it all the way to the fence, and the runner attempting to get into second base, but wisely retreats. Oh, the extreme slow ball. Strike three, you're out. Working our way back up the speed here from the pitcher, Will. Haven't really seen those 90 mile an hour balls that we were seeing in the first couple of innings. Still managing to throw solid strikes. There it is. One runner reaches base, but that's about it. To the bottom of the third. Timeout is called, and then uncalled. Fun fact, only one player can actually call the timeout. I believe the pitcher or whoever is player one. And then whoever needs to make their change gets to make their change. We now have Robert pitching for Cincinnati. Two quick strikes on the board from Robert. And there's a third for the first out. Robert with that consistent 80 to 82 mile an hour. Right at belt level and over the plate. Good for a second out. Keep swinging late like that and you're just gonna strike out. Three quick outs to the top of the fourth. Foul to the backstop. Strike two. The extreme slow ball, but manages to make contact on the second swing. Not sure how that's legal, Tecmo Baseball. Well, the batter is into second with a stand up double. And a little blooper. Can the pitcher get it? He can. And tags the runner. 
Could have just thrown it back to second base, but chasing him down is more fun. Foul over the max stop. Strike one. More contact to the shortstop. Throw to first. Ooh, and just beats the runner. Not the cleanest inning, but still gets out of it without allowing a run. To the bottom of the sec bottom of the second. Bottom of the fourth. Thank God we're on the fourth inning. These games are fairly long. And I'm only so funny. A quick first out. After making this pitching change, Cincinnati has been lights out. I was half expecting to see a home run there based on my commentator's curses so far in Tecmo Baseball. And just like that, we're one strike away to getting out of this inning. Manages to miss the matter. Going from an 0-2 count to a full count. 3-2. There it is. You gotta throw that last strike. And another clean inning. Cincinnati back behind the plate. Down. 2-1. to one. And timeout here is called. We're bringing in the Lefley, the, the Lefley, Wesley. Oh, and Wesley's throwing heat. It says 82, but it looks more like 182. And this one manages to stay fair and goes into deep, deep outfield. Runner easily makes a double. Oh, the steal is on. Going to third. In safely. The tying run is on third. The go-ahead run is at the plate. Three strikes and you're out. Looks like they were going to check the runner, but didn't. This one may stay fair, and it does. It drops in fair. Cincinnati ties it up 2-2. And the runner holds up for a nice RBI double. Going for third again. This time, not in time. Well, the runner was not in time. And three quick strikes. Cincinnati ties it up. We're going to the bottom of the fifth. Strike one. An extremely slow ball. An extremely slow strike. Mixing it up nicely here. A little back and forth, and a nice pitch for the out. The slow ball seems to be working. It's confusing the batters from Detroit. Still very confusing. Sticking with the slow ball strategy. This hit, though, manages to make it all the way to the fence. The outfield scrambling to get it. The runner, again, feeling like a nap instead of getting the double. But they were saving their energy for a nice steal. And then an ill-advised run to third, but manages to make it in safely. Very strange base running, but hey, you've got a runner on third.
trying to steal home. Doesn't work when the batter swings and strikes out. Tied going into the top of the sixth. Strike one. The Lefley Wesley is still pitching effectively. 74 mile an hour strike for the out. Nice little bloop shot over the infield. Makes it all the way to the fence. Going to leg out the double. Trying to steal third. In time. Shot if it stays fair. This could be deep. And oh, it almost bounces over the fence. But Cincinnati takes the lead on the runner crossing the plate. Cincinnati up 3-2. Foul ball. Steal of third, very difficult in actual baseball. Seems to be extremely effective here in Tecmo Baseball in the games. Checking the runner. Would they be bold enough to attempt to steal home? Detroit taking no chances. Strike one. Another very long foul. And this one is a liner right over the top of the infield. Content with a single and the run scored. Cincinnati now up 4-2. to two. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Little bloop shot. Can the pitcher get underneath it? They can. Gets out of that inning, but allows two runs. Cincinnati now up 4-2 to two, to the bottom of the sixth. A very long shimmy from the pitcher, followed by very short shimmies from the batter. Foul ball. Way outside, but swinging anyway. Needs to make up those runs and knows you can only score runs when you put the ball in play. Or if you get walked four times in a row. But seeing as we haven't seen a single walk all afternoon, evening, morning, or whenever you're watching this, I don't think that's likely. Strike for the out. Timeout is called. Going to another pitcher. This time, Rick. The lefty. That said 78, but it did not look 78 miles an hour. But a seeing eye single. The outfield manages to get it and throw it in, holding the runner to just a single. Off with the pitch, though, and into second base. Didn't need to slide, did it for the style points anyway. Strike two. Strike three, you're out. Steal amounts to nothing. Cincinnati still up four to two. Top of the seventh. An easy out. Timeout is called. We're going to go to another pitcher. Bringing in Mark, the righty. Excellent slow ball by Mark for strike one. And strike two. If 
foul way back. The catcher not even going to attempt to try to get to it. Another one. This time the catcher eh, felt like a little bit of a run. Gets the strikeout. A pop-up. The pitcher runs in. Gets the quick fly-out. 1-2-3 inning for Detroit. Now up to bat. Need to make up some runs here. Ball one. Strike one. Four pitch strikeout. Route number one. Contact's made. The ball's in play. Makes it all the way to the fence. No, what are you doing? Now you're caught in a pickle. Which, for the longest time, I thought was the official name for that play where you're stuck between two bases. I believe it is a rundown officially, but Pickle is so much funnier. Three strikes, you're out. And some silly base running costs them a base runner and potentially a run, but Cincinnati's still up, four to two. Top of the eighth. And the slow ball for the strikeout. Mark here mixing up the speeds nicely. That one hit him. Three strikes and you're out. Two quick strikes. This ball's in play. Can the outfield make it? No. Bounces at the fence. In with a standing double. Checking the runner. Runner's off, though. And gets caught stealing third. To the bottom of the eighth. Detroit still trailing by two. Swing and a miss. Strike one. The slow ball. Strike two. Froze the batter with that one for the first out. Ooh, just barely missed that one. Balls in play. A dribbler past the infield. All the way to the fence. For another long single by Detroit. See if Detroit's aggressive base running style that has gotten them into trouble continues here. Two quick strikes. Three quick strikes for the out. The ball is in play, but throws home for some reason? All runners safe. The go ahead run is at the plate for Detroit. The double steal is on? Ish? Maybe? No, you have to run back. We have a double rundown? I'm not even sure what just happened. But Detroit gets out of that inning not having scored any runs. They will have three outs left to try to catch up. Let's see if Cincinnati can put on any insurance. Strike one. Foul for strike two. 
All Detroit can hope for here is a nice quick inning. But it does not look like Cincinnati is going to give that to them. A long fly ball makes it all the way back to the fence. But the runner comfortable with the single. Time is called, going to our third pitcher. Excuse me, our third relief pitcher, well, our fourth overall pitcher for Detroit. Oh, and the pitcher John is throwing smoke. 90 miles an hour on all three pitches for the quick out. A hard foul to the backstop. The stare down, the psych out, and a short chopper over the infield makes it all the way to the fence. Cincinnati is trying to leg it out and manages to get the double, but now the runner is going home and is caught. Two down in the top of the ninth. Detroit doing well, trying to get out of this inning. Not allowing any extra runs to be scored. Still have their work cut out for them. Strike one. But the steal. Strike two. Strike three. You're out. Detroit gets out of that inning. Not allowing any additional runs. Has to make up two. They have three outs to do it. And Cincinnati bringing in the closer. And it's David. And David throwing 85 mile an hour heat for strike one. 86 for strike two. And 85 again for the first out. Two outs left. Detroit needs two more runs. Again, Tecmo Baseball is ruthless, and oh, someone actually got hit by a pitch. In all of my minutes of casting Tecmo Baseball, I did not know that was a possibility. Strike two. Down to their last out. The tying run is at the plate. The runner is off with the pitch and steals second safely. One strike left and Cincinnati wins bronze. And our bronze medal winners, Cincinnati piloted by CJ for team Daisy Bitch Baby Territory. Excellent job and congratulations on your bronze medal. It's a fantastic game. We saw some very interesting things there. Apparently, you can actually hit the batter. Did not think that was possible. Maybe it's the batter doesn't have to swing. Who knows? We're heading into the finals. And it's Dustin of You Betcha Stan versus Rick of the Imperium Ludum. Let's get into the action and this gold medal match. A couple of test swings and a little bit of shimmy. And a very tricky pitch for strike one. Strike two, Rick is not pulling any punches. And a quick strike out. Another strike. Foul ball, the catcher's chasing it. Can the catcher make it? No, it lands in the stands. But gets the strike out anyway. Shot foul down the first base line. Strike two. An easy 1-2-3 inning for Boston. Now up to bat. Wow! Dick is throwing smoke. That first pitch was 97. And the last two were 90 miles an hour. Good lord. And then slows it right down for the 62 mile an hour strike. Absolute pitching clinic here from Dick. 
Or is it Dustin? Could be the pitcher, could be the coach. But another quick one, two, three inning. Now we're in the top of the second. I like the pace. Bounces it in for a strike. Strike two. Quick strike out. Throw in heat. This one is hit well. It's deep. It bounces. Bounces off the fence. The runner going for a double and gets it. Trying to catch the runner. Mm. Checking to make sure the steal is not on the menu. Forcing the runner to dive back. Ooh, shot man. This is to make it past the shortstop and all the way to the fence. A run will score. And the runner wanted a double, probably could have made it, but ends up getting thrown out at first. But still, the run counts. Another fly ball. Lands just over the head of the infield. For a nice, easy double. It's too bad that base runner got caught out at first. They probably could have scored there. Foul ball. And a quick throw to first to record the out and get out of the inning, only allowing one run. Boston up to bat. Quick shimmies, but a strike. A pop-up. The pitcher's trying to get underneath it. It's still sailing. Going for the ill-advised double. Oh, trying to get out of this rundown and manages to make it to second base. It's those fielding controls getting people in trouble. Advance the runner. Sacrifice. Can't decide where to throw it. Manages to throw it to first for the out. But the runner crosses the plate. We got a tie ball game. Bloop shot over the infield all the way to the fence. And the runner holds it first. Nope. The runner moves to second. Throw to the cutoff, man, at third. Foul ball. Boston manages to tie it up. Milwaukee back up to bat. Top of the third. Tries the tricky pitch and gets the pop out. Right up the middle for strike one. And strike two. Strike three are out. I love the pace of play from these two competitors. Oh, a great catch for the flyout. Quick top of the third, moving to the bottom of the inning. Strike one. Strike two. Little bloop single. The go-ahead run is on first. Got caught trying to tag up. Gets the double play there. Steps on first for the third out. Tecmo is number one. Milwaukee back up to Matt. Top of the fourth. The bunt is ineffective. Rick telling his pitcher to mix it up in terms of speed and delivery time is effective for a strikeout. Foul ball. And a quick strikeout. Boston back up to bat. Well hit ball. Drops just in front of the outfielder. Trying to leg out the double, but returns to first. Strike one. 
Strike two. The steal is on. Manages to get the steal, but the strikeout anyway. The double play is not really an option with a runner on second. Oh, and a home run down the first baseline. You know what that means. Charging around with the angled finger in the air. Making rude gestures at your whole team. Why are you making rude gestures at us? Boston leads by two. And the hitting continues with a seeing eye single, potentially a double. Oh, and doesn't really make it. Another blooper makes it to the fence. Once again, trying for the double, and this time also does not make it. Tecmo is number one. Despite those two attempted doubles, Boston still manages to score two and is leading this game three to one. Ooh, a rare miss from the Boston pitcher. This would look like a routine pop-up. I think the shortstop managed to flick it in the air further. Oh, manages to catch the runner, attempting to leg out a triple. Excellent fielding by Boston. Well hit ball, the center fielder throws it to first, holding the runner. A long foul. A lucky souvenir for a fan. Oh, Almost caught the runner trying to steal there. Can they turn the double play? They can! And Boston gets out of that inning. Milwaukee making a pitching change to Conrad. Oh, and the first pitch ends with a seeing eye single. Makes it past all the outfield to the fence. And the runner safely into second base with a double. Strike one. Three swings before it even crossed the plate for strike two. And a quick strikeout. Conrad throwing heat. Quick strikeout, but steals third in the process. A long foul down the first base line. And a long foul over the backstop. And the pitcher makes the easy out at first base. Going to the top of the sixth, Milwaukee trailing by two. A pop-up. Can the pitcher get underneath it? Yes, with a diving catch for style points. Maybe we'll see that one on SportsCenter. And a quick throw to first base for the out. Hard hit foul. Strike two. Strike three. Boston back up to the plate. Fly ball makes it all the way to the fence. The runner holding it first. Throwing a second. Strike one. Strike two. Oh, through the gap. Stuck in a rundown. Where's the ball going? Oh, called out at third. Ball hit to deep center field, and it is out of here! Two-run home run for Boston. Charging around the bases, finger in the air like you just don't care, and obviously doesn't care because of the rude gestures. Boston now leads 5-1. to one. Foul ball, not sure why wasting the energy to run down to first. Just a practice for this bloop single.
And now a seeing eye single. I think the runner advanced to third. It's really hard to tell. Yes, they did. One run scores. The runner who was on first was caught in a rundown, but manages to retreat to second base safely. And a fly out to the pitcher who throws it to first for the double play. Three runs cross the plate, bossing up six to one. Top of the seventh. Oh, manages to make it out of the infield. Still only a single. This time the third baseman gets it and turns the double play. Excellent fielding here by Boston. Two quick strikes. And a really well hit foul. Strike three, you're out. Double play was crucial there. Gets out of the inning, not allowing any runs. Boston back up to the plate. Well hit ball lands just outside the infield. The steal is on and safely slid into second. Well hit ball over the infield, makes it all the way to the fence. The runner on second, easily able to score. Boston now leads 7-1. to one. Seeing eye single, will the runner, the runner is attempting to score. And slides into home safely. Oh, this is a hitting clinic. Runners on first and second with one out. Over the head of the infield, all the way to the fence. Runner is trying to score from third. And the runner trying to advance from second to third. And in safely. Runners at the corners. Boston up 9-1. to one. Another hit. And another run scores. Deja vu all over again. Runners at the corners, but up 10 to 1. This time, the runner is called out at first base, but it was only the second out. And Milwaukee manages to get out of that inning, but not before letting in five runs. Boston has a commanding 11 to 1 lead. Boston decides to change pitchers to Lorne, throwing 99 miles an hour. And now 64 miles an hour, trying to be elusive and confusing. And is so for the quick strikeout. Oh, we got a pop-up. Can the second baseman get underneath it? No. Manages to run all the way to the fence. And the runner is into third with a standing triple. Strike one. Strike two. Strike three, you're out. Lorne being, continuing to be elusive. Swung way too early on that. Luck to get a piece of it and fouls. But strikes out anyway. Boston still up 11 to 1. Looking to tack on some more insurance runs. Milwaukee. Offs to go to the closer, hoping to stem the bleeding. And Mark is throwing, excuse me, Tom is throwing absolute smoke. One quick strikeout, and now this pop out can the. Oh, the shortstop can't get underneath it. Into second. Heading on to third. And slides safely into third base. Swing and a miss. Strike one. Strike two. Three strikes and you're out. Sacrifice fly is no longer a possibility. Two swings before it even crossed the plate. And attempting to steal home, but it doesn't matter in the strikeout. Milwaukee crucially gets out of that inning without allowing any more runs. Has to make up ten here in the top of the ninth. 
strike two. You're not going to do it like that. Oh, only two outs left. Foul ball. The slow speed tricked them there. And again. Oh, that's two quick outs. Milwaukee down to their last out. Manages to get a hit on that one, and it's going to land. Yes, rolling all the way to the fence. The double is for sure. Not attempting the triple. Lorne needs to settle down here and get a nice, easy knockbacker right to the pitcher, who throws it to first for the easy out. And that's the ball game, folks. Boston with a commanding 11 to 1 win, and Rick of Imperium Ludum wins the gold medal. The outcome from Tecmo Baseball we have no medal. Peter, representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. The bronze medal goes to Lindsay and CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. The silver, Dustin from You Betcha Stand. And gold goes to Rick of Imperium Ludum. Let's look into our current medal standings. We have Imperium Ludum on top of the charts with two gold, no silver, and one bronze. You Betcha Stan with one gold, two silver, and one bronze. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with one gold, one silver, and one bronze. And Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with zero gold, one silver, and one bronze. The individual medal count? should hopefully be on your screen at this point in time. Rick has a commanding two gold, no silver, and no bronze lead over John, away from Jose, Jeff, CJ, Dustin, Beeble, and Lindsay. There is a shared bronze medal from this event, shared by CJ and Lindsay. Our next event will be surfing. Thank you very much. This has been Tecmo Baseball, and I have been your commentator, Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, day, or whenever you are watching this video. And thank you once again for tuning in to the games. Welcome back to the games, everybody. Uh, today is a beautiful day in Kuzbekistan. You got that right. Yeah, so we are looking at surfing today. Surfing is going down. The sun is shining. The clouds are... they're, they're, they're partly? Yes. yes, yes they are, I would say that. Yeah. And, and the water is moving. Yes, yes it is, which is uh, very fortunate for our competitors today. Uh, so for this event, um, each of our competitors will be performing tricks for our judges with the highest total score winning the competition, as competitions go. We are your hosts, Ween and... Squishy. And we are part of Ape Arcade, and uh, thank you for having us today. So, I believe we see our uh, competitors lining up right now. It looks like they're getting ready to start. Who's up first? We have... First up is Jose, and they will be representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. So let's see how well they do. And they're off. Now, if I'm correct, this is very deadly for the Pikachus that are out on the water. Am I correct in thinking that? Um, yes. Well, it might be more deadly for the people that are in the water with the Pikachus. Uh, water conducts electricity incredibly uh, oh. well. Ooh. Oh, we got it. That Miss. was a, uh, that's a big wave, buddy. All right, landed that one. Okay, it seems our our friend here, Jose, has gotten their, uh, Again, their the method down. It. Yeah. Have, oh, there it is. Right. Spoke too soon, I guess. Yeah, we definitely did. You can't, you can't celebrate. What's the saying? Don't count your chickens before they uh, Pikachu's. Because before they do flips on the water. <laughs> so far, so good. A couple Waves of are coming. Opportunities over there. Uh, another wipeout. It's all right. I'm sure there's a participation reward somewhere. <laughs> yep, everyone gets one for attending the Olympics. That is correct. Oh, is this Pikachu going to make it to land is my question. I mean, they, they always make it to land. <laughs> In one way or another, <laughs> yeah. that Pikachu will make it to land. Dead or alive. Oh, it looks like we're coming to a close on the first run. A couple of uh, non-so-confident waves over there, but... Oh, speeding. Speed and... Demon. It's coming hot. Oh, sure. okay. Oh, okay, all right. That face means they feel confident. Yeah. That was a great run. So, 
that was uh, that was Jose's run. He was representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Uh, kind of a solid start there. Yeah, yeah, you know what? First run, not bad. Yeah. We have a score of 2,300 to beat. We, uh, we're rooting for you, buddy. All right. All right. Next up, we have John. He is representing Ubechistan. You betcha. And he's gearing up. He's getting ready to go right now. And he's in the water. Let's see how well he does. Right off the bat, Ooh. three small waves, but he managed to catch the last one. Couple spins. Ooh, got a couple rounds of that one. Ooh. Not bad, not bad. John's definitely got some form here. He's He's got a method. The dedication you can see in the eyes. It's all about those backflips. Oh, and, and we got our first wipeout. All right, but quick recovery. Oh, another wipeout. It's those really high waves. Yes. You can't see them behind you, and they're going to take you out. Yeah, you don't know how, how high you have to jump for those. But it seems John is oh. coming back from this strong, a little bit long under the water there. Well, I'm feeling pretty good so far about this run. Yeah. All right, definitely landed that one. That's... It's gonna win him some points. Now, if you could add a dab in there, I think we could bump these points up even higher. Yeah, some some performance for the judges. Looks like we're coming to a close on another great run. That was an incredible run by John. Let's see those scores. Ooh! Oh! oh. Hey! All right. So John doing incredibly well for his run. Uh, that was that was a pleasure to watch. Right, I, I must say the bar has been raised. Will it continue to raise the whole time? We will find out. We'll find out. Uh, so next up we have Rick. He will be performing his run representing the nation of Imperium Ludum, and I, I have some high hopes for Rick. Let's see how well he does. I'm, I'm predicting a, a giant whiff on this run. The biggest whiff. But we'll see. Again, the score to beat is 3,885. That is an incredibly high score. Let's see if Rick can do it. Rick's health is going down very fast. But again, Pikachu out on the water. It's expected. Yeah. They have short arms. They can't swim for long. So far, it seems to be, uh... Rick might be crushing it. We haven't seen a wipeout from Rick yet. It seems he's definitely got his method down. He he seems to know just the right amount of turns to do in the air. He's getting some incredible air time. It, if you look closely, it looks like he's also doing his taxes. That's yeah. how good he is. It, believe it or not, Rick was actually... Um, he wasn't a part of the practice run. He was donating his practice run time to uh, teach the locals of Kuzbekistan how to surf and fish. Ooh, very lovely. Very lovely. A little bit of showboat, but we will take it. Incredible landing at the end there, and Rick has totaled. Uh, we for it. We are. And for we the got judges. a new high score. Five thousand and twenty-seven. Incredible job. Who, who could beat that? I don't know, but my money is on you. Betcha, Stan. You betcha, Stan. Uh, finally, we have police, and they will be uh, performing. On behalf of the proud nation of Day, uh, excuse me, um, children, please cover your ears for this one. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Wow. You know, I actually got back from vacation in there. Not a whole lot of dogs. Hmm. Weird. That is weird. All right, let's see how well they do. All right, there's Felice on the water. And it big wave and right down. from the oh. start. And first wipe out right off the bat. All right, Felice hasn't quite landed. Hey, okay, okay. so go. far so good. They are really good at going up and down the wave. That's that's what it's all about. That is the first step of surfing. Well, actually, the first step is getting in the water, but you know. Well, you know what they say, if you don't wipe out once, you never know what it feels like. You have nothing to fear. Exactly. Fear is what drive is driving these Pikachus, because they will die if they don't get a medal. Is this correct? I thought it was electricity. All right, and... another wipeout by Felice. Uh, the judges are not really looking so amused right now. A couple of jumps on the waves, but no tricks, unfortunately. Ah, uh, but we do like to see a wipeout from time to time. It's That's the true. effort that matters. Yeah, 
that's gotta stand for something, right? But do you think they're gonna be able to beat the high score, which again is 5,027? Unfortunately, it's not looking so good for them right now. Based off their HP, will they survive the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe the judges allow uh, them to go below 1,000 HP. 1211, good year. This is. This was a great run by Felice, I must say. Um, but it's entirely, it's entirely up to the judges to decide on that. So, that was the end of our run uh, for a surfing, for the surfing event. Thank you very much for joining us. It looks like Rick did, in fact, take the gold. Uh, right. Coming in silver is John. Uh, bronze was Felice. And, unfortunately, Jose did not get a medal. But uh, that was a, an incredible event, nonetheless. Very exciting, and I was happy to be here to see it. Yes. Um, if so you look at the medal stand-ins, it looks like if I had to put my money on any team, I would bet on you betcha stand that they would win. You betcha, you better betcha stand that they better win. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. We've been Ween and Squishy of Ape Arcade. And we have a Twitch and YouTube channel. You can find those links presumably in the description down below. Uh, and next event is Martial Arts. Take care, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another day and another event for the games. Today, we are going to be playing Street Fighter II Turbo for the Martial Arts category for the games. This event begins with a round robin, very straightforward, where each of the four competitors will be fighting against each other in a standard best of three match, what you would expect from a fighting game. After this, the two competitors with the best record will fight each other in the finals, a best of three, best of three. Whoever wins two full matches first will take home the gold today. Without further ado, the first competitors today are Dave, representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook versus Lindsay of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. With that all said, let's commence the games. Starting off, it looks like we have Dave playing as Ryu and Lindsay playing as Doll Sim. Doll Sim having fantastic range and wonderful moves, but we got some Hadoukens already looking pretty good, getting a little bit of damage in. Dave knows exactly what it takes to win here in Street Fighter 2 Turbo. More than half the HP is gone. Fantastic damage coming from Dave. And an easy first game going to Dave. Dear De Los Hermanos Hook, looking fantastic as we go into the next one. We'll see how Lindsay is able to represent the Daisy Baby Bitch territory in the second game. Dalsim, a character that has fantastic range and lets you play from a distance, but with Dave and all these Hadoukens, it's hard to find your footing. And Dave looks like they're about to take the second game, winning them the first best of three. Ryu, the main character, coming out on top as we move in to the next set. Looking back on that last game, what you can see from Street Fighter 2 Turbo is just how unrelenting damage can be if you get in on your opponent and make sure that they don't have time to catch their footing. Dave showing a very prominent first set of the day. Next up, we are going to be seeing more from Dave from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook versus Dustin from You Betcha Stan. Let's go ahead and see how this next set plays out. Dave continuing to represent Rhea. We have Dustin with the Zangief. A nice grappler able to put out heavy damage and so far putting a dent in Dave's HP. This first game looking to be in Dustin's favor. But now Dave is back on the Hadouken train to see what happens. That's a fat grab. And an easy first game going to Dustin taking out the previous champion. Let's see how this second game goes. You can win a game, but if you can't win the set, then you cannot win the event. A fantastic start from Dave, almost looking like a perfect game. And almost might have been, but Dustin getting a few of these small hits in, but Zangief's damage is nuts, so. Small foot coming out from Ryu in order to genuinely clutch out that next game. These sets continue to be very fast paced. If you blink, you miss it. Game three, what are we seeing? Both of them spinning like crazy. Good grab. Not too much damage. Another grab. 
Look how much damage this is doing. This is Zangief's game. Ryu finding a whole lot of hits, jumping in, coming from above. Not too many guards that we've seen so far. And now a little bit of de the defensive not coming out in time. Dave is able to get in, find a few pokes, and win the second set of the night. Only one more competitor for Dave to go through. We're going to be able to see if he can clutch out a fat 3-0. Game two of that last set is exactly what you like to see from the games. An incredibly close nail biter that could have seen Dustin winning that set, but unfortunately, not the case. And Dave, the reigning champion, is going to be up 2 0. Before we move into the next set, let's take a look at our current standings. Dave is sitting at two wins and zero losses, with both Lindsay and Dustin sitting at one loss apiece which makes sense as we move into our next fight where we will see Lindsay representing the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory versus Dustin representing Ubechistan. Let's go to see how these two competitors fare off against each other. The game starts and we see a swap from Lindsay going over to Vega. Quick attacks, you got that nice blade, blade hands coming out. And so far we were seeing a very nice start from Lindsay, but now as soon as Dustin gets in, we're seeing something a little similar to what we saw from the Dave games. Once the opponent gets in on Lindsay, unfortunately the game plan starts to fall apart. Though Lindsay does show a very fantastic start. So we're gonna be able to see if Lindsay can get a fantastic start in this next game and hold on to that lead so that we will see a game three. But let's find out what happens. Dustin already trying to jump in, finding a good low hit there. Zankeep got a few quick hits of his own. Vega in the corner, able to get out. Look at these, these small hits coming in, but Vega just does not have the damage to compete against Zangief. With only a sliver of HP left, you get a grab, and that is absolutely going to do it. Dustin winning his first set of the day. Look at that score, beautiful. Looking back at that last set, we are starting to see some of the habits forming from these players, which is what's going to make this next set that much more interesting, as we are going to see our first game from Rick representing Imperium Ludum versus Lindsay of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. This will be Lindsay's last game and last chance to secure a win in today's event. So let's see what happens with these two competitors. Vega coming out again with Rick representing Ryu, which means that we might have two Ryus here in a future set. Let's see what happens. Again, the damage output on Ryu is excruciating, and Vega not able to keep up on these quick hits, getting a few pokes in, but will it be enough? Lindsay holding on by the skin of her teeth. So good, are you gonna be able to win the game? A hot Duke coming out, the first of Rick's. You win. Not the same play style, a brand new player here contending in Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Round two, fight. Oh, and Hadouken to start it off. It's like, you saw how I won last game. Why don't I show you again in case you missed it? Ooh, getting knocked down, but that is okay. Holy cow. Rick, <laughs> that was actually a nuts combo. Take it had to have been more the health bar in order to secure that set and the first win of the night. Before we get into our next set, let's go in and take another look at today's current standings. Unfortunately, coming in at fourth, Lindsay has been eliminated at zero wins and three losses. After that, we do have our next three competitors. We have Dustin coming in at third at one win and one loss. Rick and Dave both undefeated. However, Rick sitting at one win and Dave sitting at two wins. Going into our next fight, we're going to have Dave representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook versus Rick from Imperium Ludum. We're going to see how these two competitors who have not lost a set today fare against each other. Who will walk away from this best of three? The victor. We have a Ryu Ditto. Let's see how it goes. Let's see how hard it is to keep up. All right. So far, just going right back and forth. We're seeing a few Hadoukens. We're seeing a few Shuryukens. We got those bunt inputs unlocked. Dave about to secure this win real quick. Hadouk is not enough though. But hey, that flying kick. You jump in the air, you think you can get to me? Not so. Dave 
more than half his health still on the board looking pretty going into this next game this is a very important set rick wants to win this game to almost secure his sitting in the finals similar to dave if dave wins this then dave absolutely is moving on to the final round a very very important set here we're looking very even from these two competitors a lot of jumps Hitting low, but good guards on the low. Up close, Hadouken doing a fair amount of HP. Dave about to take it with the Hadouken. It is no longer just a dream. Dave will be moving on to the finals as Rick has one more chance to prove he has what it takes to compete in the final event. For clarification, even if Rick had won that last round, there was no guarantee that Rick would have moved on to the finals. As if Dustin had won this next set, then that would have been a three-way tie. Looking back at that last set, we are seeing just the powerhouse that Dave is. It is not just the character. It is not just Ryu. That is not where the strength is coming from, as when we see these mirror matches, you can see just how skilled and talented these competitors are. Moving on into our next set, we have Rick from Imperium Ludum versus Dustin from Ubechistan going to be competing. Whoever wins this set will be moving on to the finals and the loser will be walking away with the bronze medal for the games. Let's go ahead and see how these two players fare against each other. We've got another Ryu versus Zangief set. Immediately, Dustin's just walking in. That is actually crazy, no fear. And with Rick in the corner, you're seeing just the kind of powerhouse that Zangief can be, and it is not looking good for Rick. It is not looking good for Rick, as Dustin shows off the power that he has, the skill that he has in these games. Rick is going to have to make some major adjustments going into this next set. Hopefully, he doesn't put himself into the corner, but immediately with that back jump, a little scary. But we are seeing Rick get a few more hits in. Rick playing a defensive game, not a retreating game as we see him continuing to push buttons and pressure Zangief. Good projectiles, good hits. I actually like the adaptation coming in from Rick. You need one more hit. Are we moving to a game three? We are. And again, a beautiful sure you can. I loved seeing what changed between those two games. Although there was still that bit of retreating from Rick. It wasn't retreating, it was defensive. It was smart, it was skillful. And I skinned the same start going into game three. We see Rick play just a little bit defensive before he moves on to the offense. What is Dustin going to be able to do? Dustin holding in, pressing a few buttons, getting these hits off. And Rick now in a terrible spot. One grab, one big hit from Zangief is absolutely going to take the cake. And it will. Dustin is going to be moving on to the finals. And Rick will be taking home the bronze medal today at the games. What a fantastic closing set to the round robin. Let's take a look at the current standings. We have Lindsay in fourth, going 0-3 in today's event. In third, we have Rick going 1-2 and taking home the bronze medal before we reach the finals. Dustin going 2-1, only losing to the current victor, Dave. However, the previous matches do not matter at all now. As moving on to these finals, there is only one thing that matters, and that is taking home the best of three, best of three. Whoever can win two sets first will be winning the gold at today's event. To reiterate, here are your finalists. We have Dave representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook versus Dustin representing Ubechistan. I cannot wait to get into this final set I hope you all will join us as we watch Dave versus Dustin in a best of three, best of three. We're seeing a set that we are no stranger to today. Ryu versus Zangief, both humongous powerhouses. A fantastic grab out of that dizzy. But it's almost looking like it's not going to matter unless I eat my words. Commentator's curse, a dead even game. Good use of the invincibility frames on that spin. Not going to be enough. Dave taking the first game, showing exactly why Dave won the first round robin. A lot of proficiency here in this fighting game, in this martial arts category. All right, clanking with each other in the air. 
Taking a second to get up, and Dave just unrelenting pressure, knowing exactly how to space these projectiles in order to get in on his opponent. However, sometimes, so long as you're in, all that matters is how much damage you can do, and Zangief is a beast, tying up his first set 1-1. Zangief, incredibly happy for himself, able to win that game. Knowing just how important it is to take this first set. Let's see what happens. Love the retreating aerial. God, and trying to just get these hits in when you're getting up. Very good. Beautiful invincibility from Zangief. Just getting through these projectiles with a hitbox of his own. Fantastic. Oh, but that Hadouken. Dave's bread and butter. Going to be winning him the first set. However, one set is not enough to cut it. You have to win two sets. Oh, when you hear that theme, you know something's up. Let's go. This theme goes with everything, and so do these two players. Let's see who's able to win this second set. First game, looking hot for Dustin. But immediately, just showing how quick this game, the tables can turn. Good grab, a little bit of damage, but not enough. Fantastic knowledge. Ryu going low on that Zangief attack. No matter how much of vulnerability you have on the top, you are still vulnerable on the bottom. You gotta watch your legs. And now, it cannot be understated, Dave is one game away from winning the event, but with half of his HP gone, you'd be surprised to think that this is gonna be this, the tournament winner. Dustin looking hot, taking that game, no questions asked. Move on to the next one. Ooh, you saw that quick skip on the points. They're they're not, you know, waiting around. They're like, let's go. We gotta get this last game going. Wow. Brutal. We almost saw a perfect to end out the night, but now Dustin trying to surmount a comeback, but it might not be possible, and it is not. Dave, your champion. The gold medal winner for the martial arts event and for Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Cannot say congratulations enough to Dave for winning tonight's event. Congratulations. Following up that feat is Dustin taking home the silver, Rick taking home the bronze, and Lindsay walking away with no medal today, but just having a good time. This event was such an exciting one. I love getting to see these players playing this fighting game, playing this age-old classic here in Street Fighter 2 Turbo. It was great seeing the habits that these players formed, what worked, and then able to see a little bit, a little bit of adaptation from different players in order to say, okay, how can I counter what this other player is doing? If we had more games, if we had more time, I would love to see these competitors come back and retread this territory. Because that's the amazing thing about fighting games, right? Is that some competitors come in here to mash buttons, but all competitors here today had knowledge, had something to say, and were able to work around their opponents. And that is what makes today's The Games so incredible. Before I leave you all today, let's take a look at where the medals lie. In the lead, Imperium Ludum holds three gold and two bronze medals. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook holds two gold, one silver, and one bronze. You bet you stand following up that with one gold, four silver, and one bronze. And finally, the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory holds zero gold medals so far, one silver, and two bronze medals. On the individual medal count, we have Rick in the lead with three gold, one bronze, John with one gold, two silver, and one bronze. Jose with one gold, Dave with one gold, Dustin with two silvers, Jeff with one silver and one bronze, CJ with one silver and one bronze, which is a shared medal with Lindsay. We have Bebo with one bronze, Felice with one bronze, and Lindsay with the previously mentioned shared bronze with CJ. And with the event out of the way, I cannot thank you enough for watching today's event at the games. I want to say this entire idea is such a fantastic idea. I love the idea. I'm about to say idea three times. I just love it. I think it's so cool. I think everything that the D-pad does is pure gold. And I hope that everyone watching today has been enjoying the event so far. The idea of bringing all these different YouTubers in for this huge event, fantastic. The idea of doing this event in the first place is already fantastic. God, it's, it's, a, it's such a fun relay race. I mean, it's just, it's just fun. 
It's fun. It's fantastic. I love it. Once again, my name is Ian from Born Losers Gaming. I hope that I will see you all again someday. And the next event that you all will be viewing will be cycling. I hope you all stick around. I hope that you are excited. And I hope that I will see you all next time. Welcome, everyone, to day seven of the games. Bringing us back to the stadium, our contestants are revving up their engines in preparation for today's cycling tournament. The event is pretty straightforward. Each competitor will run the final course in Excite Bike. Whoever has the best time at the end of the course takes home the gold. I think we're about to begin, and I do believe that our first rider for today's event is going to be Dustin from Ubechistan. And off we go. Looks like Dustin is catching up for a small amount of lost time at the beginning, but, but slow and steady does win the race. See, the key here in this event is to not overheat your bike and to keep an eye on that temperature gauge, which it looks like Dustin may be uh, taking a ride on the wild side today. Um, we'll see if it costs him his time. So far, he's currently in... Ooh, it, not looking good. Close to last if he keeps wiping out like this. I, I don't know if he's currently being lapped or not, but this is somewhat embarrassing if I do say so myself. Maybe he should check in with his pit crew on the field if he is going to run into somebody. Are we going to check? Are we going to check that? Do we have any medical professionals on the field who's going to look into uh, Mr. Teal Boy? He ran into him again. Uh, this, this is now bordering on unsportsmanlike uh, competition, sir. I don't know if we can give a red card on the field or a demerit. Usually we uh, vet our athletes before we let them on a professional team and run the course. Um, I guess we are beginning to see just what quality of athlete you betcha stand is uh, providing us for the games this year. Oh, wow. He is just not having it with the teal rider today whatsoever. Alrighty. Time, 147.15. Let's log that on the board. A few thoughts on that last one while our, our next racers are, are teeing up. I think Dustin did all right. He is uh, he, he rode the temperature gauge uh, relatively smoothly. Uh, he was able to recover from a few uh, pitfalls here and there. Um, but the fact that he absolutely bodied several of the other contestants while they weren't even on their bikes, just full force, full throttle, into their bodies with his bike. I, I don't know if we should uh, continue his participation in this event. Uh, I, I have to put my professional opinion out there uh, that we should probably get a doctor on the field after this one. And it looks like they finished preparing the field for the next race. Next up, we have Dave from a country that I'm going to butcher the name of. So for prosperity's sake, Dave from Hookland. And we are off to a hot start. Dave is running hot. All right, let's see if this bites him in the ass. And it did almost immediately. Okay, but he seems to be doing pretty all right with this. Uh, okay, second wipeout, not so good. But he is, I'll be honest, he, he, okay, he's now wiped out as many times as Dustin did, I think. But he is taking over these leaps and bounds with grace, to be honest with you. Did he just lap everybody? Okay. Okay, Dave. Okay. All right. Showing the competition what you're made of. I respect that. See, that's what we're trying to see in the games here. And he just hit the teal guy again. This is like the third, the third time. Well, not you, but get, what, what is up with you guys and the teal guy? God, this is a. Uh... This, this, this is a bloodbath of a competition that we are running here. All right, looks like Teal Guy had a bit of a, a bit of a revenge. He's kind of tired of being uh, absolutely destroyed on the field. But Dave's making some good time. Okay, let's see. Dustin finished at 147. 
We're at 120 now, so Dave still has some time to make it to the end. I'm not exactly sure how long this course is, but okay, 127 puts him puts him currently ahead of Dustin. I think Dave had a good run. I respect that run. What I don't respect is the continued abuse of the teal rider. I believe Dave's performance today can be attributed to the gold that he took home from yesterday's martial arts tournament. I think he's riding that energy high right now, and, and that is probably what pushed him to do his best today. Next up, we have the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory Champion, CJ. Off to a bit of a slow start again. CJ is slowly crawling his way back to the front though. Ah, oh, almost making it over the river. He he seems to be watching the temperature of his bike more than he's worried about the speed. Ooh, which, which bites him right in the ass as the purple rider takes him from behind. But, slowly catching up, making okay time. If he doesn't stop wiping out the teal rider again! Oh, why do you guys keep doing that? That is, the, it's the same guy! over again and over again all right all right but you know what i wouldn't expect any less from the baby bitch territory champion uh if there's anybody to to be known to do that have this behavior on the field it would be cj so can't really be mad though i, I gotta say not making the best time here not if he keeps trying to cheat. Only making it to the first lap at 105. He has a lot of ground to make up if he wants to try to take a silver. Ooh, 115, 116, slowly making it to Dave's time. Seven seconds left. I don't know if he will. 25, 26. Okay. All right. We are now past Dave's timestamp. So we're still in silver territory. Could, could, could easily make this in the last 10 seconds, possibly. Though we only have second se seven seconds left to be able to beat, to beat Dustin's. All right, a firm, a firm hold in third place. We, we will have to see how this pans out after our next contestant. So CJ's obviously the worst one we've seen so far um he just didn't have it in him i feel to uh make the decisions he had to make on on, on the course but we still have one more contestant there is still the opportunity to take home bronze but that decision will be made by our next contestant sarah representing the imperium ludum all right, let's see if any more fouls will be played on the field. Sarah seems to be playing by the book of our previous contestants and running straight into the teal rider, uh, almost inevitably eating shit herself because of that decision. But taking it solid, slow and steady, Sarah seems to be taking the course in stride, um, wiping out just like her predecessors so far. Nothing we haven't seen before. Though we are at the 30 second timestamp, haven't yet made it to the first lap. Taking another dive in the field. I want to know who uh, put a camera in the in the moat going around the track. That is uh, most certainly not healthy for the our, our equipment and a, a very bad use of our budget here. Uh, second camera in the river. <clears throat> we <clears throat> should talk to production about this. Because uh, clearly we spent all of our uh, all of our budget on bikes and moats, and it looks like we are now at one minute, slowly creeping up on Dave's time of 127, hitting lap one at 108. So we have, she has a a, a bit a bit of of track to catch up on here. Let's see, at 120, we are seven seconds away from Dave's. So far, first place, first place marker. 127 marks past Dave. Wiping out thrice now in the same spot. Sarah, you you have a 
quite quite a bit of track to catch up on. This is not looking good for the Imperium Ludum. Uh, today does not seem like to be their day on the bicycle field. At 1.47, we are now past Dustin's timestamp. Still, still have a chance for making bronze. But we will have to see. The slow and steady approach does seem to work, though. We saw it work for CJ. We've seen it for plenty of contestants in the past. It, it helps not wipe out so much. So, okay. CJ, I stand corrected. Um, this was the, uh, the, the worst one out of today. Sarah had a stronghold at the beginning, but, but sadly um, seemed to get uh, washed up with the other riders in their collisions and the constant abuse of the teal rider. Um, sadly seemed to take the brunt of the wipeouts um, in today's event. But still a solid, solid competition all around. So today it looks like gold goes to Dave, silver to Dustin, bronze to CJ, um, and whatever constitutes as a participation award to Sarah. If I am reading our numbers correctly, this leaves Hookland with three golds, one silver, and a bronze. The Imperium Ludum with three golds, no silvers, and two bronze. You Betcha Stan with one gold, five silvers, and one bronze. And the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with zero golds, one silver, and three bronze. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Day 7 of the Games. We hope to see you back here tomorrow for another glorious competition. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the great video game competition that cannot be called what it is because of copyright reasons. I am Retro Roulette's very own Anthony, and I am joined by... None other than Sam, a part of Retro Roulette as well. Yes. We really need to get you, like, uh... Like a more creative name. <laughs> <laughs> I like just being known Sam. as Sam. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> just that's Sam. how I am in the server. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, we are the hosts of the prestigious and incredibly popular uh, Retro Roulette YouTube channel. And uh, by incredibly popular, I mean we've got a thousand subscribers that I'm pretty sure we're sub for sub. But anyway, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's get started here. Um, <laughs> Let's not waste any time. Let's just jump right in. Let's do this. All right. So we are going to be commentating Link's crossbow training, the archery event. So each competitor will be moving through three stages in the final level of Link's crossbow training. Shooting targets gets you points, and hitting targets consecutively gets you a chain combo multiplier. Naturally, highest score wins. And looks like the event is starting. Our first uh, competition, your co competitor, yeah, that's the word I could talk. The first competitor is Geoff. And, wow, we're off to it. He comes out of the gate swinging. And by swinging, Oof. I mean shooting. Be shooting, swinging. Being sure not to Same. hit any of the goats. He is... Taking out the Bacoblins on top of the goats. It racks up four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh. eleven. Wow, what a streak! Oh. Third, twelve. It ends oh, at Jeff. twelve. Nasty. Nice. <laughs> is it Jeff or is it Geoff? I've, I've always wondered about the spelling of this name. But, uh. Either way, we apologize. Yeah, either way, we're sorry. <laughs> uh, five, six, seven. Another eight, takes out a red one, nine, ten, eleven. And it breaks out eleven. He's got another streak going already. Taking out several oh. goblins. A few slip past. Missed that guy on the right. Yeah, it, was, uh, it got a little ugly there. But he's got a strong start. Bam. And... I never thought I'd see the day where we had uh, parachuting the goblins, but hey, here we are. And I'm terrified. Oh, five, three four, seconds. three, two, two one. <laughs> one, and that is the end of the first round. All right, so wow, what a strong first round. That is exactly the lead you want to take. You yeah, left absolutely. With 
15,947 points. Yeah, it's, What do you think about that, Ant? That is going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, we're going to head over to the next run. John. John from Ubechistan. Let's see it. All right. You, you should always start with the pots. Get you them extra points. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So he tried shooting the goat, but then quickly realized you cannot shoot the goat. And I am now crying. <laughs> hey, I don't know about you, man. Mutton's delicious. <laughs> Yay, barely. All right, he's racked up five, six, seven. All right, so remember the score to beat here is 15,947. Presently, he's sitting comfortably Let's... at 3,965. There's one, two, three, four. Streak ends at four. And he takes out a few of the ones on goat back. But it seems that he's struggling to uh, actually keep up with the uh, the uh, previous competitor. Most I've seen on this score is, I think, six or seven. <laughs> Here come the parachuting bacoblins. That's right, Amp, but it could be anybody's game. We shall see. All right. Three, two, one, and... Final score, 9,875. Geoff takes the lead. All right, and now we got Sarah from Imperium Ludum. Let's see if Sarah can beat them out. All right, good luck, Sarah. She starts off strong, immediately takes out the first and second Bacoblin on goat back. She's at three, four, five, six. Got a strong multiplier going. Oh. Yeah, she took a hit, so that was minus 100 points there, and then minus another Ooh, 100 points. Took another hit. Oh. <laughs> that is going to set her back, but let us see what she can do. Yeah, you never know. She, you, she might get a 20 hit combo and take the uh, lead. It's anybody's game at this point. Oof, and another hit. Almost got that red one at the last All second. right, and she's moving into the final phase of the, uh, the course. 7,600. Seven, make that 700 points. Five, six. Five, four, three, two, one. And doing better than John, her score sits down at uh, 1,000, one, I'm bad at numbers, uh, I think that's 11,165. <laughs> so still behind Jeff, but better than John. So Sarah takes the silver. All right. So yeah, she, she took a couple nasty hits, but she managed to break John's score. And that just goes to show you, it could be anybody's game. And now we're about to head to the next run. Which is by CJ from Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Oh, oh. Now let's a go. Bad word in that title. <laughs> mm, bad word indeed. All right. Let's see what CJ's got. Immediately right, starts by shooting the pots. the pots. Takes out the first. Bacoblin. Trying to shoot the goat. Come on. What are you guys doing? Don't do that. <laughs> Unless you want to make muck. Uh, all right, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, oh. nine, oh. 10, 11, 12, 13, oh. 13. Oh. All right. Oh, what a what combo. A c -c 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 -combo. <laughs> all right, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, wait, nope. I miscounted. Oh, it it started at some oh. point. Eight, nine, ten. Another ten hit combo. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Uh, okay, I think it broke at twelve, actually. It just moves so I, fast, you don't even yeah. know what's up and what's down. His score is already at 12,629. 
as of me talking. But uh, he's just now going into the final phase. His score to beat is 15,947, and it's looking like he just might do it. He has eight. <laughs> he just wrapped up another eight hit combo. <sighs> Three, four. And oh, he just misses oh, it. He just misses wow. it by wow. a mere 103 CJ. points. But CJ, you almost had it. You almost convinced me. I, I was a believer, <laughs> man. I was a believer. I thought, I, I thought he, was, he came out swinging and he was going for it. <laughs> But as of right now, we got Jeff still sitting at 15,947 points. Which brings us to stage two of the archery competition, Sacred Grove Defender. And we got Jeff up first, so let's see if he could come in as strong as last round. Ooh. We find ourselves now in the I just want to say, Grove? in the real game, in the real game, this was my favorite level. Yeah, the Sacred <laughs> Grove, right? Just gotta say, yeah. Nine hit combo, 10 hit combo, 11 hit combo. Somebody has been practicing 14 hits, 15. Wow. There is no off season for Jeff. <laughs> Five, six, seven, make that eight hit combo. And bam, he oh, takes he out the skull kid. And now he's firing. Oh! <laughs> Grabbing that auto will help him greatly in the last leg of this competition. Plowing through him. All right. All right. And sitting so. comfortably with a score of 31,012. So it's 31,012. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's the that's where Jeff stands at GF or Jeff. I, I really wish I knew how to pronounce that name. Um, as where he sits uh, after the second round. Yeah, that's a, I'm, I'm good at this. I promise. Um, all right, <laughs> and then we have CJ, Sarah, and John um, following up afterwards, and we're about to just jump right in. Let's see CJ. Go for it, Sam. Uh, actually, uh, according to what I see here on the screen, this is going to be John's oh, run. Oh, okay, pulling a. John from You Betcha <laughs> Stan. a fast one on me. Yeah, maybe I... Let's see. <laughs> no one told you. We flipped the script. Man, those bones breaking. Really reminds me of home. All right. We got a seven-hit combo, but breaks. Another seven-hit combo. Takes out the Skull Kid. And he's going full automatic. Ooh. <laughs> Treating this like a genuine rail shooter in a great old American arcade. <laughs> Ooh, one of the uh, the skull thingies is red there. I wonder if that means it's worth more or anything like that. But, uh... Ooh, and he gets a 5,000 point bonus. And settles with 14,000, and I actually couldn't see the rest of it, but uh, he is now in second place, right behind Jeff. Uh, the current standings are Jeff with 31,012 and John with 24,459. Next, we're going to be seeing Sarah, and after that, we will see CJ. Let's uh, let's queue it up here, Sam. Play it again. I got Play it again, Sam. I got <laughs> <laughs> right, I will. And I just got to say, John really, really did some impressive maneuvers there. Kind of piggybacking off of what Jeff was doing, hitting them automatic shots. That's exactly what you want to see in this Absolutely. Round. Let's take it to Sarah. All right. Good luck, Sarah. She's pacing herself very carefully with her shots. Five, Bones six, seven, eight. Grace. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15! Four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, whoa! 14! Just goes full automatic and just mows him down! 
Like she's the heavy from Team Fortress 2. <laughs> I like her take no prisoners attitude. I really do. Well, you need it if you're gonna come to these games. And Imperium Ludum wants that one bad. Okay, and we finished with 18,003 points, which brings her to 29,168. Trumping John, but behind Geoff. So we shall see how CJ does. All right, let's do this. All right, he starts strong with a nine hit combo. Nope, make that an 11 hit combo. Possibly more. 12, 13, 14, 50, 60, 17. Takes three. There's no danger here because CJ can hit. Yes, he can. I have a hawk on this one. And then a ten hit combo. One second left and finish this with 9,501. And, uh, he is, uh, he actually managed to make it into third in this round. So, the current standings now, uh, at the end of this, uh, second round is, uh, Jeff still in the lead with, uh, 31,012 points. Sarah with 29,168, taking second place. CJ now in third with 25,345. And John, uh, trailing behind with 24,459 points. Uh, I hate to be that guy, but, um, after the first two rounds, I think it's pretty safe to call that I think Geoff is, uh, gonna keep this going. That said, he could flub it up in the third round, so we'll see. So the final stage, uh, will be the Fossil Stalord battle, and we're gonna be starting with Jeff, or Geoff, and, um, we will see how this goes. This is, uh, this is it. If you're gonna turn it around now, now's the time to do it. Or, if you're Jeff, don't drop the ball. Let's do this. <laughs> and we know Tierra de los Hermanos Hook is looking for that win. And Jeff is looking to take it, but we shall see what he happens. He is hungry! Now, don't let this adorable creature fool you. This final stage is really something to be reckoned with. There's a lot of moving mechanics. You really got to be on your game. That's right, Sam. Ooh... Look at that, those red sparks flying out of its mouth. It oh, is, maybe no more onions for dinner. It is pissed off. Sure is. Okay, so... Huh. Looks like he has to figure out where, what points he needs to hone in on. And it looks like we're going with the uh, classic Nintendo boss design choice of weak points in the palm of the hands with a primary weak point in the face. G. Nintendo Tried has never done a boss like that before. <laughs> no, they have not. All right, and he has a five-hit combo on the head. Ooh, and he takes Ooh. a hit. Minus 100 points. Four, five. Let's see how that affects the it's a Perfect five hit combo on the hand. The hand goes down. Oh, but he takes another hit. And then another perfect five hit combo on the hand. Let's see if he can nail it on the head. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The important thing to remember here is the name of the game is accuracy. That's right. It's not about speed. Although when you think about it, speed and accuracy are going to kind of go hand in hand in this one. Because the more accurate you are, the faster you're going to take this thing down. He gets a four hit combo and... 
takes a nut. That takes a hit on that last orb. Of course, it's always that last orb, isn't it? Two. Oh, but he fails to follow up on the combo. Five, four, three, two, one. And finishes with 5,600 some odd points. And that puts him... All right, so... Uh, well, we'll see how where that puts him, actually. Obviously, it's going to look like he's leading right now. But... The score to beat is 36,647. And we're coming up with John uh, from You Betcha Stan. They want that win, and John's been trailing closely behind. So we'll see if he uh, if he can take it. Let's do this. Let's see. So right out the gate with the... Uh, with the uh, little pellets that this thing shoots out of its mouth. He takes them out relatively easily. Gets a three hit combo on the left hand. Shoots only the orbs like little he Wonder absolutely Ball. needs to. That's a good strategy because they don't really uh, go towards the total combo, I don't believe. Gets a five hit combo on the right hand. And gets a three hit combo on the head. These little flying guys can distract you from the main mission, which is what makes them so deadly. Alright, he just seems to be uh, loose cannoning it, which is not going to help him for his accuracy, but he does get a four hit combo on the left hand. He makes quick work of those orbs. One, two, three, four, five. Five hit combo on the right hand. And the head comes down. Basically bringing it within point blank range. 10, 11, 12 hits. Oh, a strong combo. To Very end. strong oh. combo. All right, now we're seeing something new. It's some kind of super attack. The super means nothing to John as he clears out all the flying skull heads. All right, 10 seconds on the clock. Let's see, can he put it to bed? He's going for it. Five, four, he's hungry. It doesn't matter about the combo anymore. It is about finishing this thing. And he's and strong with 10,685 points. Woo. All right, that was <laughs> that was a crazy tense one. That Star Lord was coming for him, and he didn't care who knew yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And John has uh, landed at the very least in second place uh, in these final standings because he did not accumulate enough points to actually take Jeff, but he came close. All right, so next we've got Sarah uh, from the Imperium Ludum. Imperium Ludum. All right, Sarah, good luck. Good luck, Sarah. And I think Sarah is somebody who is patient and got the eye of a marksman, so I have faith that if anyone could take this, she could. Oh, and immediately oh. contradicting what Sam says by taking a 100-point hit. Finishes with a three-hit combo on the right hand. You gotta be Ooh, quick. Lost the chance. This is probably a lot harder than it looks when you think about it. Five hit combo on the left hand. And it goes down. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Stellord regrows its uh, two arms. Fires a bunch of pellets. She takes another hit. She's going to need about another 5,000 points to get to where she needs to be. And she Ooh, takes another taking hit. Taking another hit. All right, and she brings the head down for another combo. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. 
All right, here come the pellets. Man, those pellets. All right, she misses the opportunity to finish off the hand. And three, two, one, and that's time. 4,415 points, which will land her in third place. So she has fallen behind John and Jeff. So let's see where CJ uh, CJ ends up because CJ could either take this or place within the top three. We'll see where it lands. Yes, and I just want to say, uh, Sarah taking her time with that crossbow. I, I know that accuracy matters, but you do got to be quick against the Stow Lord. He is, he is an angry man. Angry Skelly Lord. So uh, let's see what CJ does. Starting off strong with a five hit and decimating that right arm. He's going to need to start off strong because he will need 11,000 points to beat off Jeff. Does not take the hit like I would thought he was about to. Ooh, struggling a little bit there, but... He gets it. All right, and left hand down. All right, accuracy to the wind with that one, but I think he's trying to get more hits off because uh, there's probably some kind of big bonus if you actually manage to uh, take it down. Yep, and that's going to be his best bet if he wants to catch up. He seems to intentionally Ooh. allow it to get close, so that way he can uh, bring it within point blank range, which will make shooting a little easier, I think. It just stinks because this thing's animations are very slow, which can work against the competitors. Because it's all about trying to sure take, uh, give, deal as much damage as you can, as quickly as you can. And he takes three pellets to the, uh, to the body there. Five hit combo. Bam! Seven oh. hits and fast. <laughs> that was nice. All right, we're seeing this uh, strange attack again. Ooh, but he takes a hit. All right. And, and that is game. game. 7,180 points. That will put him in last place, unfortunately. So, the uh, I think it's time for the uh, the award ceremony. Sam, how do you want to do this? You want me to do a little uh, triumphant music? Here, here I'll, uh, I, got, I got one for you. In last place with no medal, CJ, ranking in at 32,525 points. Taking home the bronze is Sarah with 33,583 points. With the silver, we've got John with 35,144 points. And the winner! Being consistently number one with the exception of that last round. Taking home the gold is Jeff or Geoff. Uh, and the final score is 36,647. Well done, sir. Very impressed by everyone's performance. There was a lot there that honestly... I'm very impressed by not an easy event. Archery is very difficult. I give it up to all the competitors. You did yeah. your country's proud. I've actually, uh, I've actually played the uh, th that game before. It, it is not easy. It is. It, it looks like it is, but it, everything moves a lot faster than than you think it was. And you also got to deal with the Wii's uh, you know, spotty motion tracking or whatever it is. So it's it's not easy. So uh, it really. Hats off to all competitors here. You did a lot better than either of us could have. Very, very true. And that puts all of our countries at for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. They currently sit at four gold medals, one silver, one bronze. Imperium Ludum has three gold and three bronze. Ubechistan sits at one gold, 
six silver, and one bronze. This makes it their sixth consecutive silver medal. Wow. Good job. And then finally we have Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with zero gold, one silver, and three bronze. I am excited to see the rest of these events play out. This is just uh, this is just very exciting. And uh, again, congratulations to all competitors. Uh, Sam and I had a blast commentating for you all today. Be sure to check us out at uh, youtube.com slash retro roulette and on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv retro underscore underscore roulette. Very much so. And we're also on all the socials at the same retro roulette. And we are very much looking forward to the next event, which is tennis. So this is Retro Roulette. Anthony and Sam signing off. Signing off. It's been real, everybody. Bye bye Welcome back, sports fans, to our semifinal matches for tennis. That's right. We're very excited. We have two semifinal matches for you, leading into our bronze medal match and then finally our gold medal final. We are happy to have Coolbekistan hosting this event by our ambassador, Ben Mooney. We'll be starting up with Dustin from Ubechistan versus Sarah from Imperium Ludum. Very, very much looking forward. Why don't we hop into some Pong? Let's hop in. All right, the serve has... Oh, oh, Sarah getting him on a quick serve. Early points, early points for Imperium Ludum. Very good. She's known to have a strong serve. This is true. We have a stronger return from Dustin this time. Ubechistan is a strong competitor in these games. They are not to be trifled with. This is true. They always turn up. They always turn up. Oh, oh. there we are. There we are. We've evened it up early on. Oh, oh. and a sneaky second point. Oh, oh almost, she almost. almost had it. Dustin almost with the repeat. Oh, oh and his third point. Ubechistan oh, won his strong fourth. lead early on. A fifth. fifth. Sarah is a strong competitor, but she's known to get in her own head. This is true. This is true. And after the strong serve, I was expecting her to go strong, but it seems like Dustin has taken the court. Even the mightiest of competitors can let uh, let the show really get to them. All right. Sarah seems to be regaining her composure. Here we are. There we are. And a nice second return. point. And it's also important to note that these are competitors operating at the top of their game. They've gone through several rounds of intense competition to get there, to get themselves here. Months and months of oh, preparation. Oh, I thought Sarah had that one. Costly mistake. Here we are. Nice even returns. This is, this is sort of the Pong equivalent of a smooth backhand is what you're seeing here. And for those of you watching at home, uh, these games are being played on a legit Atari 2600. Yes, um, the games have spared no expense in bringing us this wonderful machine. This is true. This is not emulation. This is one-to-one -one original equipment. Very, very exciting. Now, Pong is actually one of the original sports to ever be played. I did not know that. Is that true? It is true. Very exciting. It is very true. A factual, true fact. Thrilling information. Dustin with a large lead. Ubechistan is really showing up in this game. Another point. They're up to 12. Dustin really playing the angles here. Sarah having some difficulty countering some of these more aggressive maneuvers. He definitely seems to have a strategy of sending her to the edges. This is true. Make, uh, keeping her out of her comfort zone, I think. Making it difficult for her to get back in the zone to send the ball back his way. Not a lot of time to calm down and really, really recenter yourself. Dustin playing very close to the center, however, at all times himself. He's definitely in control of this match. And another one for you, Betchistan. Letting the letting the stress of the moment perhaps cloud some judgment. Ooh, that very was an nice. Excellent stop. save. Excellent save, Sarah. Eleventh hour. It's important to note that uh, regardless of score, these are two very high level competitors. On any given day, any score is possible. And we also can't... Ooh. Another point for you, Betchistan. We also can't let the play get into our heads. Any lead can easily be regained. This is true. This is true. There's no such thing as an insurmountable lead when it comes to Pong. Strong return. Solid. Sarah is known for her strong returns and her strong serves. Defensively, really, really on the back foot now, however. Mm-hmm. Dustin is a strong defensive game. He's known for his endurance and going long matches. 
Could be time perhaps for Sarah to play slightly more aggressively. Earn back some of that ground lost early on. Take a little more of the court. They take ownership of that center space. Dustin now, mastering the space. And as you'll see, they are, pl they are playing on the traditional Pong court, which is considered both grainy as if a TV connection. This is very true. This is a classic tube television style look. Uh, if, you, if you've played any classic... Ooh, and another point to you about to stand. Costly loss. Uh, if you'd played any classic Atari or in television style games on a tube television, you'd be familiar with this sort of... Um, and grain. another one to you betcha, Stan. Sarah is really starting to sweat. Dustin is ever closer to the 21 point mark, as is traditional in Pong. The first. Return first of. The first point in quite a while for Sarah. The first player to 21 is the winner. Is this true? We're approaching possibly a. an aggressive, aggressive blowout. lead. Not, however, ruling out a possible bronze. For Imperium and another Ludum, one for your betcha stand. Oh, costly. Exactly, there's always the oh. bronze match. And we are one away from your betcha stand moving on one point to the away. next round. Oh, oh, devastating loss. Oh, and Sarah has let it by, meaning you betcha stand will be moving on to the gold medals match. This is true, this is true. Uh, very unfortunate loss uh, on the part of, uh, on the part of Im Imperious Ludum. Uh, however, this is the sort of thing that you, you can expect to see in this level of competition, you know, this is... Uh, a lot of it is a mental game. It's true. And uh, Sarah has largely. been playing excellently up to this point, and there still is a possibility of a bronze medal in her future. This is true. Everyone can still go home with a medal at this point. Uh, however, it will be Sarah moving on to the bronze medal match and not the gold medal final at this point. Heading now into our second semifinal. We have Peter from Diera de los Hermanos Hook versus Lindsay from Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. This will be a strong matchup. match. Looking forward to hopping in here. Oh, and a strong serve from Lindsay. That's a point to Daisy Bitch Baby Territory. One point out of the gate. This is what you like to see. Oh, Two and points. another point. Lindsay playing off strong right at the start here. Similar to our first match, we have some strong scoring occurring one sidedly almost immediately. Oh, and it's gone past Lindsay's defenses. Costly error. Excellent return by Peter. Important to remember also that the players are playing with the classic controls. Difficult, difficult to control. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a game that requires some skill and a lot of practice. This is not the modern day D-pad that many players might be used to. Mm -hmm. But of course we spare no expense in getting the classic aesthetic for our games. This is true. As, uh, as Olympic athletes, these players want to be operating with the most traditional version available. Excellent rebound. Peter is really, really favoring his left hand. Tremendous angle. Oh, oh. and another point to Daisy Bitch Baby territory. Peter's really going to want to, there we go. Really going to want to earn back some of that lost ground. Try and keep the point situation a little closer than the previous semifinal match. Yes, these two seem to be very evenly matched. They are going tit for tat in this one, and it's still early. Anyone's game at this point. Peter seems to be trying to take control of the court. Ah, nice as if, toss. As if his movements will add more power to the ball. Very true. Also aggressively trying to put some spin on the ball, as you'll see him rapidly moving up or down as he connects with the ball. There we are, see? Powerful, powerful lobs back from Lindsay. Playing these angles as aggressively as possible. In immense return from Lindsay. <sighs> Lindsay is known for... Ooh, and we have another point for, for three Peter. three all. Three all in this match. Lindsay is known for her powerful returns, but Peter is known for his fancy footwork. He is definitely a player of speed. This is true. You have a, a master of deception versus an, an impenetrable brick wall of defense. I'm really loving Peter's strategy of sending that backhand spin back at Lindsay to confront her strong defense. Absolutely. You'll notice the high-end players really tend to... And another point for Daisy Bitch Baby territory. Ooh, another 
The high-end players really tend to play the paddle close to the center, allowing it's, themselves as much space to move as, as possible. That's true. It's all about controlling the court. It's all about controlling the court and making sure you have enough time to get to the ball as it comes towards you. Absolutely. Oh, Ooh, a costly error. Very close, Repeater. That was a very close one. Once again, a mental game as much as a physical one. Getting out of your own way can be the difference between victory and defeat. Another strong return by Peter. I'm really enjoying his, his methodology here. It's true, there's a great deal of, ooh. Oof. Once again. Just slipping right by him, just right through his underarm. Those final moments of deciding whether to stay still or to, to move can really cost a player a point. Now, of course, each one is wearing the traditional Pong colors. We have Peter in Pong white and Lindsay in Pong black. I believe that before the match, they got to choose which color they wish to wear. Um, and I believe Lindsay went for the black, leaving white for Peter. This is true. Excellent spin on the ball. Ooh, Ooh. effective. Effective. He received his point against Lindsay. Again, a lot of excellent use of angles and of playing the walls yes, the against thing, the opponent. The thing that really sets Pong apart as a very skilled game of Masters is the ability to use the walls and angles around you to trick your opponent and getting that ball by them. Absolutely. This is something that analog tennis can never quite replicate. And that's why we play Pong. Absolutely. Ooh, they are controlling the court. Going tit for tat, these two. Ow, and one slip by Lindsay. These are the moments. These mistakes. These mistakes the difference between glory and humiliation. It costs you everything on this court. Pong is a fierce mistress. The sport of kings. Ooh, and Lindsay getting one right by Peter. Very strong. Very strong. The focus on displays is truly incredible. Now, Daisy Bitch Baby Territory, Daisy Baby Bitch Territory has a long history of Pong, actually. It is a very popular sport within their country, and they have received medals at many past events. I was not aware of that. Oh, yes. It was a very large tradition in their country. Incredible. Some truly legacy-level performers. Terra Dislas Hermanos Hook is a little newer to the Pong scene, but their players have come up very strong and have been competing very powerfully in the last couple of years. Yeah, some of the bad boys of the league. Mm-hmm. Oh, Ooh, a another. costly error. Lindsay is up to the 10, just 11 points shy of a win. Can Peter match her in her intensity? We see ourselves. Playing the court well, strong back and forth. Ooh, and the bottom row. Peter took a very tricky angle there to try to confuse Lindsay. Again, these angles can be everything in this match. Absolutely. Some Ooh. sharp angles again. Aggressive overcorrection costing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook yet another point. Slight angling of the serve. Lindsay going for the lob down the court to try to force Peter to meet her. To and we meet have her a lobs. format that Peter's chasing here called the DVD screensaver approach. Yes. Really heading for those corners. Oh, a backfiring of this approach. Now, the DVD screensaver approach is a classic. The point is to try and get the ball to come directly to the corners to confuse your opponent. Yes, it's a high-risk, high-reward technique that only the highest-level players deign attempt. I believe it's popularized back in 2010, was it? Possibly even earlier, uh, some historians state that it might go back as far as 2003. And another another point in Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Currently, twice the points that Peter has. Closing in on that ever so important 21 points. Each of them playing the corner strong. Lindsay looks like she might be getting tired, or she could have Peter right where she wants her. Well, the spirit of these two competitors is nothing to scoff at, I think. Given, given the stakes at uh, play Oof. here, Ooh, and another, another point, and this another right off. Game, however, Peter, Ooh, two in a row. It's 
dangerous amount of points to lose so close together, so close to 21. Again, putting more spin on the ball. Mm -hmm, Trying to get him on the angles. That was a wonderful save by Lindsay. Lindsay responding throughout this entire exchange beautifully and defensively. All right, Peter. Oh, and Peter won himself another little goal. Again, half. Half of where Lindsay is sitting. Can he still Ooh. climb his way back up? Ooh, another point. I'm in closer to that 20 mark. It's always possible, viewers at home, it is always possible to pull yourself out of this powerful of a lead. It happened many years ago in a very remarkable match. This is true. To this day, has gone down in Pong history. One of the most clutch matches of all time, I believe. The Pongus Desmanas, I believe is what they refer to it as. Yes, yes, absolutely. Truly an iconic moment in video sports. Lindsay is going strong. She is owning the court. Peter's going to need to get more aggressive, a little more uh, active in his point scoring. Can't afford to play overly defensive now, the when thing, you're this far behind. And the thing that makes this level of Pong so fascinating to watch is that they don't use the elongated paddles like you see in more contemporary versions of Pong. This is true. Classic Pong is all about the small paddles. The brick, the classic brick. Showing your skill and your speed over the size of your paddle. Only about as wide as three to four balls can be truly a master's task. The handwork required, and another point to Lindsay of baby of Daisy Bitch Baby territory. Absolutely. Moving more carefully now, Peter, attempting. Play a more defensive game. Make it into the double digits. Lindsay's getting close, but we don't oh. want her to get cocky. And another point that is 19, just, just three shy of a win. This is looking... It's looking to be... Looking bleak for Tira de los Hermanos Hook. Ooh, Lindsay's getting powerful. She's going with more speed. We're speeding up here, as you can see. Back and forth. Two warriors exchanging blows. Only one may stand the victor. But they are still both champions at their skills. Absolutely. Champions with a paddle. Pong paddle. legends, if you will. More angles being played. Ooh, that was a good save by Peter. Oh! oh. Very close by Rare Lindsay. That miss. went right by her. Peter climbing closer to the, to the two double digit digits. Mark. Now getting a ooh, ooh and we are one away, just one away from a match point. Can ah, and Lindsay has it taken is. it. Lindsay of Daisy Bitch Baby Territory has taken the lead. She will be moving on to the gold medal match, and Peter will be meeting up with Sarah in the semi-finals for the bronze. As we head into our bronze medal match, two truly epic competitors meeting. Unfortunately, their play will not put them in contention for the gold medal today. However, the, the bronze medal is still very much up for grabs as we head now into the bronze medal match. And we've begun. Let's watch. Now, Peter and Sarah have actually competed a few times in previous tournaments. They are known to each other and considered somewhat rivals. Yes, friendly rivalry, absolutely. Um, Ooh, and Peter takes the early mark. First blood. The bronze medal match is a tough match. Peter taking a early second. It can be hard going into that bronze match. You match your one shot at gaining a medal. It can almost be a little bit more tense than even the gold medal match. There's no award for fourth place. This is true. You see, just a great deal of control. The two competitors feeling each other out. No one over committing. Oh! Ooh. And some confusion there on Sarah's side. Um, oh, wanted another. to head towards the ball, but unfortunately got a little lost and went the other way. 
This can happen to a competitor in these situations. Sarah now. Another point. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Peter. Peter really wanting to make up. And another quick. And another. Now you see, this is part of the. Uh, the mind games. Part of the mind game, and also part of the the issue that these competitors face. Peter just coming out of a match is still warm, whereas Sarah has had time to cool down after mm. her match. Oh, and Sarah takes another point. Sarah's also had time to think about the match, leading to some nerves to come through in some cases. This is true, but also giving her time to focus on a game plan moving forward. It's true. Sarah's a lot more of a defensive player, but so is Peter, who likes to control the court. We do have two defensively minded players facing off against each other now. It'll be interesting to see who chooses to go on the offense. Peter with some nice spin on the ball. Sarah so far meeting him tit for tat. They're on a very equal playing field right now. Our earlier confusion is past and Sarah is bringing her A-game. Some truly daring stops by Peter. Mm -hmm. Peter's making some tricky shots down by the wall. Getting a nice angle, hoping to confuse Ooh. Sarah and another point for Sarah. Peter really going to put as much spin as possible on the ball, at times putting himself in jeopardy, however. Ooh, that one came, came for him. The point. risk was worth it. He's at eight points now. Sarah spinning the ball herself. Ooh, Ooh and that, that spin. Was a, that was a very tricky one. Made it just by Sarah right at the wall. Again, the use of that wall is so clutch this late and this high level of this game. It's essential to recognize your distance from the wall and make sure that uh, you're not leaving a gap too big or too small. There's always room for the ball to get through, and there's always room for an angle to surprise your opponent. Reading the bounce and reading the speed, two essential player aspects. Good returns. Ooh, Sarah going tricky there. Instead of, instead of setting an angle on the backspin, sending it directly down the center. Occasionally it is a mind game. Oof, and we are up to the double digits Peter's with Peter. Made it to 10. Relatively simple exchange, feeling each other out. Sarah trying to regain control of her side. A lovely return by Sarah. Very nice volley. Again, Peter. Ooh, and another point to Tierra de los Hermanos hook. Peter really does favor the angle play in this. Yes, very, very much a, a, a spinning player. Uh, some players choose to simply fire back and forth and, and try and overwhelm the opponent with speed and directness. Peter very much choosing the, the path of, of trickery and deception. Ooh, a powerful send back by Peter. Some of these stops today have been just incredible. The speeds these opponents and players are working with are absolutely unfathomable by the non-players of this industry. This is true. Uh, watching them play opposite each other, it's easy to assume that the, the, the play is moving quite slowly. However, to put yourself into the position of these players, uh, you, you realize that they are both champions playing at the height of their game. Excellent backspin by Peter, returned by Sarah. Peter really wanting to hang on to this early lead. Oh, excellent get by by Sarah. That was a tricky shot to make. Yes, difficult read by Peter there. Not quite panning out as he would have liked. Playing very effectively here. Peter has the lead, but can Sarah bring it back? That was a wonderful shot she just made a few mm -hmm. moments back. Still being quite cautious, even this early on. Oh, close. Ooh. Ooh. We are up to 12 now. Peter Ooh, has Ooh, 13 to 13. 5. 13. Again, those serves can come so quick. It's very easy to get lost and to not be ready for them when they come. Very little time to reset no, between yes, yes. a point scored and a ball launched. As soon as a score is set, the ball immediately gets put back into play. No rest for the wicked. Playing along the top rope here. 
Again, really favoring those angles and the ooh, tricky play by Sarah. Sarah excellent, it's ooh. ooh. Unfortunately, oh, ooh, and another again. To five. Those quick serves. That tricky play was high risk, high reward, and I thought it was going to pay off for her, but unfortunately, Peter was able to make it in time. Sarah returns six to fifteen. Sarah got another point in. Just six away for Peter from taking home the bronze. Peter playing the angles again. Both players excellent at stopping the ball into a straight line when they choose to. Very difficult move to completely take the spin off a ball and send it directly forward. A pure rally happening now. Mm -hmm. These two players are both at the top of their oh, game. Oh, 16 to 6, Peter. Ooh, but coming back for stopping that serve. Very nice save on Sarah's part. Very strong stop again by Sarah. Peter, slight spin. Hanging around the top of the court as if he can read Sarah's mind and knows that the ball is going to be coming there. Seems to be more comfortable toward the top of the court than the bottom of the court. Sarah might be wise to play Ooh. more toward the bottom. Peter almost lost the ball there. Easier to, said than done, however. Having to run down the court a bit. Ooh, very tricky pass there Tremendous. by Peter and stopped beautifully by Sarah. Tremendous stop by Sarah. The one thing you don't want to do. Ooh, and you're up to 17 points. Oh, 18 to 6. Once again, say, oh. 19 to 6. Oh, Sarah. Just two points away from that bronze medal. Sarah's been definitely struggling on the quick serves. They can come so fast in this sport. You know, anyone can fall victim to this. It is uh, one of the true demons of the game, as it were. You can tell they're high-level players, though. Ooh, 20 just to 6. One away from our lead. Will Peter walk with bronze momentarily? Ooh, very tricky shot. And, and that she, will He do has it. done it. Peter of Tierra de Los Hermanos Hook has taken the bronze in this event. We have our third place. Champion. Our third place podium. He will be on the podium at the award ceremony. Sarah putting up an excellent fight. She worked very hard and made a long way to make it this far in the game, and she should be proud. Absolutely. Absolute warrior. And now, as we find ourselves moving on to our, our gold medal match, Lindsay v. Dustin, Ubechistan v. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, who will take home the gold? These are strong competitors. A rivalry as old as time. And we'll be starting now. Right now. First serve away. Dustin, powerful lobbies back and forth. Both of them playing the angles, taking their sides of the court. Always a powerful moment to see who will score first. Draw first blood, as it were. Both these competitors have been playing excellently in their previous matches. They are truly a powerhouse match. Top level competitors feeling each other out. Nobody over committing at this stage, nor should they. Now, what's really lovely to see is Daisy Baby Bitch Territory has a very large group of fans waiting in the stands, cheering on Lindsay and holding signs. Very excitable group, irascible almost. Uh, you'll love to see it. You'll love to see that kind of support for the athletes when they come out and put on such a great show for everyone. It's it's wonderful to see that level of love. It's a long way to come to watch these sports and these and these athletes play. People travel a great distance and book hotels. Some questionable, but it's they all do in it the name the of the game. Love of these the game. two just. Going. Still scoreless at this mono stage. Mono on mono. Powerful start. Neither wants to give up that first. Ooh, Ooh. and Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory takes first point, point in this match. In this gold medal strong. game. Strong. The back and forth on that one was strong and powerful. We know that Dustin is not pleased with this. However, retaining his composure, he moves to tie the score. Dustin has been playing, here's a little fun fact, Pong since he was four years old when his, I believe, cousin brought over an Atari 2600 around Unbelievable. holidays. Unbelievable. And he ties it up using those early childhood skills. 
definitely been playing for a long time. Contrast to Lindsay, who has only been playing Pong for about five or six years. A relative newcomer to the game, however, very quickly rising through the ranks and establishing herself as a force to be reckoned with. She originally this got her start in Mario Tennis before moving over to Pong. Mm -hmm. We love to see it. We love to see that crossover within the esports. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how champions play. Either, neither one willing to give up an inch. This is going to be a match for the ages. Absolutely. Neither player... Ooh, beautiful spin by Dustin. Neither player overcommitting, neither player undercommitting. Both simply waiting for opportunity to present itself and then hoping to capitalize. Dustin's playing a lot more aggressively than he was at the beginning of the match. Whereas Lindsay has taken a bit more of a defensive stance. Ooh. Ooh, and it's paying off. Dustin just scored the second point. Two to one now. Lindsay's a lot more composed in her movement, whereas Dustin is doing a lot of back and forthing on the court. Well, that early score by Lindsay seems to have, uh, ooh, a three one now by Dustin. Uh, seems to have, uh, Caused her to focus more on defensive play rather than aggressive play, whereas Dustin is very much attempting. And Lindsay takes the second point for Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Dustin uh, playing quite aggressively, comparatively. This is a gold medal match, and it's time to really show your skill and your strategy. Both of these players have been working with excellent seasons coach for the last several months, and they are very much at the top of their game and ready to fight for that gold medal win. This is what gold medal play looks like. Skillful, controlled, using powerful angles and strategy. Pong is not a game for the faint of heart. Elegant brutality, I've heard it described as. Too true. Ooh, a wonderful bounce by Ooh, Lindsay, and it hits her a point. Three to three now. Three all. Dustin, Dustin is playing exceptionally aggressively. His movement, it almost feels like he's trying to confuse Lindsay with his back and forth on the court. Almost taunting her. The mind games are very... Oh, and he Seems gets to have worked the fourth in this point. Case. The mind games are very important in Pong. The more you can get your opponent frustrated, the more you can take control of the court. It's true. I believe Kickaguard was the one who said, Pong, truly a game... Of the mind. Ooh, Oof. five to three, Dustin. Dustin has taken the lead here, but Lindsay is meeting him at every step of the way. We're not sensing a loss of control on either side of the field. Very clean lines, very controlled. Very deliberate. Ooh, a straight shot by Dustin. Again, the use of those straights can come out of nowhere and really confuse a player expecting an angle. Especially coming out of a very aggressive volley of angular play. Straightening out the ball can be truly discombobulating. Well put. Very well put. Dustin seeming to want to aim for some spin. Definitely favoring the top half of the court. Again, we've settled into some more relaxed play from both. I definitely feel like Dustin is still controlling the pace of the game with Lindsay following step for step. Well, he doesn't want to overextend himself, which I think is a smart maneuver. He's ahead. Best to hold on to that lead however he can and let his opponent perhaps make a mistake. Lindsay is standing sturdy, not giving an inch. As we've seen in previous rounds, these games tend to very quickly devolve or evolve for one party or the other. Getting into some good angle play here. Ooh, Ooh, that Lindsay. one paid off for Lindsay very well. Bringing a fourth point. Oh, and we seem to have... Ah, there seemed to be a bit of a technical glitch there. Slight delay in play. 
We have to review that further. But the ball is back in play now, and can Lindsay bring her? Ooh! Five all, tied by Lindsay. All. Oh, six and a to quick five. six on the serve. Lindsay taking the lead from Dustin. Pulling out in front. Ah! Oh, and now that we've reached the gold medal match, each player is pulling out all the stops. They are now adding. They've just decided to engage the button on the Atari controllers that allow them to shoot power shots. This is true. This is a massive game changer and how effective and how fitting for that it should only be match. enabled for the gold medal match. Eight to six, Lindsay. Nine to six, Lindsay. These power shots are extremely Nine difficult to, to pull off and take a lot of energy, so saving them for this late in the game is a smart move on both these players' parts. We Neither are nine to prepared. eight. Each one is... This has really sped up the gameplay here. They are going for the win. Lindsay up to double digits. Ten to eleven, 11 to eight. Getting Dustin on the serves. Her serves are fa powerful and fast. Eleven to nine. Dustin responds with a ninth. A Ooh, tenth. Dustin, another another point. Both players in a great Ooh. deal of danger. Twelve to ten, Lindsay. Things are really heating up here, folks. The speed has increased and the skill is unmatched. These players are at the top of their game. And Warriors, one of them. Dustin returns on an eleventh point. Ooh, 14 for, 14 for Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. With this playing, they might be able to take it right to the gold. This could happen. Dustin responds with a 13th point. Ooh, beautiful. Right directly behind Dustin's shoulder. That was a wonderful lob by Lindsay. Oh, and Dustin returns it, though. Not a lot of ground gained on either side here. Both... Whittling their way up 16 to 14, Lindsay. Ladies and gentlemen. 17 to 14. 17 to 14. This is impeccable. The speed and masterful skill with which these players are playing today. The crowd is going wild if you can hear them. Grace, 18 to 15. Grace and horror. United as one. Oh, we have another tactical glitch. Both players sizing each other up. Taking a moment. As the ball gets reevaluated and put back into play, we are back with the game. Ooh, ooh, another wonderful Lindsay. play. Lindsay is 19 to 15. Just, ooh, but Dustin, Dustin catches returns. up 16. Lindsay is two points shy of her gold medal. 20, 16, Lindsay. <gasps> One point, One and, that point is and that is it, folks. Daisy Baby Bitch Territory is taking the gold in tennis. This, I believe, is their first gold medal, the first gold medal for Daisy Baby Bitch territory being brought home by Lindsay. A massive, massive congratulations and very well deserved, truly played as a champion. As we've said once before, Pong is a game of champions and we're so happy to have watched the match end the way that did two unbelievable competitors. As it stands, Lindsay is gold, Dustin Silver, Peter Bronze. This has been a fabulous play today, everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin. My name is Ian. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's coverage of Pong slash tennis. And we will see you at the next sport. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed The Games video. My name is Ashley, also known as the Lady Sela. And what we have up next is really exciting, folks. Gymnastics. The Aquatic Games Bouncy House. Now let me just say, gymnastics is definitely one of my favorite sports in the game. So I don't know about any of you, and especially the aquatics. It must be pretty wet down there. Now, for this event, each competitor will have three minutes to score as many points as they can by performing mid-air stunts while bouncing on two large orange sponges. The highest score at the end wins. First up, we have Dave, who is representing Tira de los Hermanos Hook. All right, and we are off to a strong start. Now, it looks like hitting those shells give additional points into addition to the height. You know, I've never actually played this game myself, but it kind of seems like the only sport that you could do underwater. All right. Ooh, we got a little bit higher on that one. Oh, third shell hit. Very nice, very nice. Got some 200s up there. Oh. Wow, look at that. Elegant, very elegant. 
Oh, look at that. Tuck and roll, baby. Tuck and roll. Looks like Dave is doing a fantastic job at representing his territory. Oh, got all the way to the orange. Very nice, very nice. Look at that, 500, what? I didn't even know you could get a score that high. Was that a 600? Oh, lights out. Recovered rather quickly though. You know, these kind of athletes, you gotta be able to pick yourself up after making little mistakes like that. Oh man, he's seeing stars tonight. But look at him. Look how happy he is. It's like nothing happened. That's why they are professionals, folks. This is why they participate in the games. Now each competitor only has three minutes to get as many points as possible. We're at the, at least the 2.30 mark now. He's, look at him, putting in that extra mile. He's trying to get as many as he can squeeze in now. Back up into the orange. Look at him go, whoa, another roll, 500, I saw that. Two more minutes left. Oh, couldn't nail that landing though. It's all right, buddy. You'll get him next time. All right. That was a fantastic show. You know, regardless of his up and downs, his trips, his falls, he still got back up with that smile and kept on going. You know, that's why they are the professionals. That's why they are competing in the games. They can't let little things like then hold them up. That was a great display. Great display. Next up, we have Ian, who was representing You Betcha Stand. Here we go. Look at those twirls already. Pretty early on for those twirls. You know, it's like he has a thing for that middle shell right there, huh? He's trying to get some, he's trying to get some space between him and those orange sponges. You know, if it was me, I probably would too, because I don't know what's living in there, but they kind of creep me out. Oh. Got some more spins going on. He's got that top shell, very nice. Oh, he got multiple shells with that one. Impressive, impressive. Oh, bad landing, oh boy. Let's see how he comes back from this one. There he goes with that second shell again, I'm telling you. It's like his sweet spot. All right, here we go. Getting those swirls in again, trying to gain some momentum. Trying to get back up to the top shell. Hopefully reach that orange area. He's almost about halfway through his time now. Oh, too bad. Oh, but look at him getting right back up. Trying again, that's what I mean, man. That's why they are the professionals here. Getting those 200s and 100s like it's simple. Oh, another flop. Look at those twirls. Trying to get in those points, as many of those points as he can. It's a good strategy. Going for that second shell again. Oh, boy. With all those stars, man, he's gonna need to see a doctor after this one, I'm sure. Oh, no. You know, they are professionals, but they're they're human. Or uh, maybe in this case, amphibian. I can't really tell. But we all make mistakes, right? Important thing is that we get back up from them and keep on going. All right. Very nice, very nice. Oh, time's up, my friend. Time is up. You know, even though he tripped up a couple of times, you could see he put in his best effort. He really was trying to represent 
his territory as well as he could. And that's all anybody can ask of anybody, right? That's what the games is all for, to put in your best effort. Current standings, we have is Dave. At the top, it's 78,712 points. Second, we have is Ian, who stands at 45,188 points. Dave is in the lead by a large margin. We'll have to see who can pick up from there. Next up, we have Rick, who is representing Imperium London. Let's see how he does. Jumps right on that sponge, no hesitation. Look at those smiles, all smiles. He's getting that air pretty quickly, loving those spins. It's very nice, very nice. Oh, look at those rolls. Getting some 300s in there, very impressive. That was a 400, wow, 500, look at that. Oh, wow, he got up to the orange and everything. Another 500, he's making this look easy. Five. Three five hundreds. Impressive. What? I didn't even know you go past the orange. This is insane. What was that? Another five? What is happening right now? Okay, there's another orange up there. I didn't even know it went that far. That is insane. I'm sorry. Did that just say seven hundred? Do I need gl better glasses? I swear, I just got, oh, oh. Too soon, I apologize. Look at that question mark box. Where'd it come from? I don't know either, but it's helping him out. Oh, look at those stars, man. He's reaching for them though. He's reaching for those stars. That's what you gotta do in the games. He's getting back up there. He's trying to get the momentum again. Getting those 300s and 200s. He's making it look easy. Mm. He's almost up to the top shell again. Close to that orange once again. Oh. He's gotten those rolls. Gotta get those rolls in. Get that orange. Another 500. Very impressive. There's the box. Where'd it come from? I don't know, but it's there. Getting those tuck and roll, baby. Tuck and roll. All right. Fantastic, look at that. Oh, uh, you know, that questionable box apparently doesn't hang around forever. Oh, oh, he tripped up on that one. You know, I don't think the sponges are very, um, I would assume they're slightly slippery, no? Easy to lose balance on those. It's part of what makes this game so difficult, you know? Again. You gotta be really good at this to be in the games. And that's why they're here. They are the best of the best in their territory, in their region. Oh, and that is time for him. Now, I'm not sure if people are aware, but there are some strange, interesting rules and exceptions to this, okay? In this instance, you don't necessarily have to play out for the full three minutes. How it works is that normally it works as a stunt time attack. If you successfully perform six different maneuvers or combinations of maneuvers six times, you complete the event and the timer stops immediately. That's why the six numbers next to style are all about, it's really important to pay attention to that when you're doing these types of games. It also happened before during their practice run and he had almost a, nearly a minute left on the clock. Now that's some crazy, crazy exceptional rules. I don't know, I've never heard of anything like this, but this is aquatic rules, I don't, it's out of my hands, I don't write it. I'm not no rule maker. Excellent style, look at that dance, that's fantastic. You know, if anything, for anything else so far, I feel like he should get recognition just for the fact that he had those dance moves. I haven't seen anything like that in years, especially on an orange sponge. I don't know if I can ever say I've seen that. That was impressive. 10 out of 10 for me. Good job, Rick. So, current standings. We have Dave at 78,712 points. Rick, close, 73,763. And then we got Ian with the bronze so far, 45,188. Next up, we got Felice, who represents one of my favorites, Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Starting off slow, a lot of spins. Trying to get that height there. Looks like they might be struggling a little bit to get to get up there. You know, a slow start doesn't mean it won't be a strong finish. 
Here we go. There we go. Oh, that was unfortunate. And at first, you don't succeed, man. Try again. That's how it works. That's the only way you get better. It's just the only way you improve. Alright. Police is trying to get some height here. Very good, very good. That's a very good tactic. Get that height and spin. There we go. There we go. Felice is starting to get it. There we go. There. Oh. Right on the nose. That, mu that must have hurt. Hope Felice has some good doctors in, you know, that daisy baby bitch territory. You know, I've actually heard they have pretty good doctors over there. Pretty good. One of the highest rated in any of the most close territories that I'm aware of. It's impressive. Impressive stuff. Alright, getting those spins in there. Alright, very nice. They seem to be struggling a little bit though. To get that height. Oh. I'm telling you, those sponges. Those sponges, man. They're slippery. They are seeing stars tonight. This looks very painful. I hope they have a good chiropractor. But look at that face. Look how happy they are. That's all that really matters. Playing the games, you're just supposed to be having fun, right? Looks like they're unsure of which sponge they really want to start off on. I'm not really sure if it matters. Oh, oh, where are you going? Oh, what? Oh. There we go. Did I tell? Oh, they were so close, but the time's up. Time has to be fair across the board. All right, we got the final scores in. Gold is Dave, 78,712. Silver goes to Rick, 73,763. Bronze, good old Ian, 45,188. And Fleece, the place with the great doctors, 3,181. So as it currently stands, the medal leaders are Terra de los Hermanos Hook, Gold, Five, silver one, bronze two. Imperium Ludum, gold three, silver one, bronze three. You betcha stand. Gold one, silver seven, bronze two. This is the first non-silver since day two on the skateboarding, by the way. Daisy baby bitch territory. Gold one, silver one, bronze three. You know, I can't remember the last time I saw such thrilling aquatic gaming that was so exciting with brown frogs wearing yellow shirts and blue pants bouncing on orange sponges now that that's just icing on the cake right there folks and if you haven't checked out any of their other videos for the games please go back and check them out they're pretty good they're very entertaining i believe one of them has uh pikachu surfing who doesn't want to see that right all right everyone thank you so much for joining me in this gymnastic section of the games my name is lady sayla aka ashley it was a pleasure commenting on these games next up on the list of games we have rowing which i actually can't wait to see it was something i've always been interested in and i can't wait to see how the members of each territory fare in that one well it was lovely seeing you guys Make sure to like, subscribe, and enjoy the games. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another day and another event for the games. Today, I am incredibly proud to present to you an event steeped in determination, one where the competitors have only gotten where they are today through literal blood, sweat, and tears. Today, I am happy to present to you the event of rowing portrayed through Mario Party's Paddle Battle. For this event, each competitor will take on the other three competitors in a 1 versus 3 match in the minigame Paddle Battle. 
All four players will row as hard as they can to push their opponents to the riverbank, where they will be struck by spear guys. If they are a part of the three squad, then they will each lose a coin, rewarding the one with all three of those coins. However, if they are a part of the solo crew, then they will lose three coins, presenting one coin to each of their competitors. It is a dangerous game that we play, but that is what makes today's event so exciting. Whoever is able to steal the most coins wins, and ties are broken by fewest hits taken. With all of that said, let us commence one of the most dangerous events that we will be playing here at The Games. Our first solo competitor is going to be Jose from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Without further ado, let's begin. And we are off. Let's see how these competitors go. And Jose is off to a brilliant start, immediately putting the other three competitors up against the wall. Two spear guys so far, netting Jose six coins and a massive lead, almost getting speared himself there. Sarah, Ian, and Felice are all hurting as they are down three coins each, four coins each, and Jose is up. The commentator can't keep up. We are up a massive 15 coins, and all competitors are out of their allowance, wishing that they came into these games with a little bit more, but maybe happy that they aren't. Jose would be at a massive 30 coin lead at this point. I cannot imagine seeing a better showing. Jose, incredible. I've never seen a more incredible showing here at the games. I am not exaggerating. There is no bias here. That is what this game is about. That is what this event is about. Jose, with the masterful performance. I have tears in my eyes. That was incredible. But we cannot focus on one competitor for too long. Let us take a look at the current standings. After that brutal display of strength, Jose is hitting at 15 coins and zero hits. And our three other competitors, Sarah, Ian, and Felice, are all sitting at 10 hits and negative five coins. Will we see that raw strength and talent displayed elsewhere amongst our other three competitors? I'm incredibly excited to see. Or will Jose, as a part of the three team, be able to carry his teammates to victory, not only for themselves, but for himself as well? I cannot be more excited to get into this next round as we get into our next competitor, Sarah from Imperium Ludum. Let us see how this event goes. And she is off almost immediately getting three coins for herself, but a losing a little bit of steam. That rock is a tricky placement. Beautiful three coins moving over to Sarah as she tries to muster up more strength. These rocks, unbelievable, getting in her way, not able to keep the competitors against the wall. Losing steam, losing strength, losing three coins to her other competitors. Six coins to her competitors. You need to come back from this. Nine, almost nine coins. We need to see what happens. Is Sarah all out of steam? Did we see a sprint at the beginning of the event when we needed to see a jog as this is a marathon? And that's all the coins. Sarah leaving with no more coins in her pocket. Whether that be the other competitors or once again, Jose, I do not mean to drag on with this. It's not an obsession. It is purely noticing talent. Sarah, unfortunately, losing all coins as we go into the next competitor. Our current standings as I see them. Jose at a net positive 16 coins in one hit. Ian and Felice at negative four coins and 11 hits. And Sarah at negative eight coins and 16 hits. No matter how brutal of a run that might have been, sometimes a gold medalist pops out and lets you know who they are. And we might just be seeing more of that for the rest of this event. However, before I say anything set in stone, it is time to get on to our next runner, who is Ian hailing from Ubechistan. Let's see how Ian fares. 
Ian begins paddling, this time not full strength at once, immediately three coins going to his competitors. Will Ian be able to speed up? No, unfortunately, more and more coins being lost. That is if Ian had any left to lose. Ian trying so hard to continue paddling, but it is not seeming like it is going to be the case with Felice, Jose, and Sarah on the right side as the triple team, the three team, just unbelievable in the rowing prowess. If these three, oh my God, if it were about them being on a team, I would say they would be unstoppable. There is nothing else to focus on, but at the last minute, Finish. Ian coming in and getting three coins, putting in everything he had, everything he had into the last moments to walk away. <laughs> to walk away from that run at a net neutral amount of coins. Incredible. Genuinely. An incredible feat of strength coming out at the end. Before we move on to our final runners, let's take one last look at the current standings. Jose currently sitting at 16 coins and two hits on their head. Felice at negative four coins and 12 hits on their head. Ian, I'm sure not sure how to feel about that run. However, sitting as well at negative four coins and 22 hits on his head. And Sarah, sitting at negative eight coins and 17 hits on her head. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the most brutal games that is going to be taking place here at the games. And I cannot stress the pressure that is going through each and every one of these competitors' heads as we move on through all of these runners. Whether it be the amount of coins that they have, which is the one thing that matters, or the amount of hits that they might be taking, in case of a tie, we have no idea where the mentality for these competitors lie. The only ones that know that are the competitors themselves. However, let's not focus too much on this as we are getting into our final runner, Felice of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. I cannot wait to see how this final runner fares here in this event. Let's see. As we move in, they are off, and again, off to a massive start from the three squad. Is that gonna be two hits right at the beginning? No, it is not. Felice already losing all of their coins. We are just seeing such a massive showing whenever Jose is on the other side. I promise I am not obsessed. I am just stating the facts. Felice almost coming through, getting some of their coins back, but not making it happen. More stabs. More pain, more torture coming through off Elise's part. How many times must they be stabbed? Will they be able to get their coins back at the end? It is not looking likely. Very close. We might see it happen. We are not seeing the repeat. Unfortunately, Felice is walking away with none of their coins and many holes stabbed through their body. However, how many hits was it really? Let's calculate and tally the scores as we find out who took the gold, the silver, the bronze, and who walked away without a medal today. With all the scores tallied, I am proud to present the results. It is no surprise to me who took home the gold, not due to any obsession. I know you are, but what am I? I am happy to announce that Jose will be taking home the gold medal today at a net positive 17 coins and a mere two hits only two stab wounds they will be walking away with today. Taking home the silver is Ian, despite the mighty 22 holes in his body. They only lost three coins, and that will net him the silver medal at today's event. And in an incredibly tight third place, Sarah will be walking home with the bronze medal with a negative seven coins, just like Felice. However, Sarah only took 17 hits while Felice took 18. Before I leave today, I would like to take a look at the medal leaders. Currently in the lead is Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, 
with six gold medals, one silver, and two bronze. In second is Imperium Ludum, holding three gold medals, one silver, and four bronze. Holding third place is the second place champions of Ubechistan, holding one gold, a massive eight silver medals, and two bronze. And bringing up the rear is the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with one gold, one silver, and three bronze medals. I am so excited to have been able to commentate this event. Thank you so much for having me on. Once again, this is Ian from Born Losers Gaming, and Mario Party has been a large part of my childhood and who I am growing up. Seeing this event taking place here at the games was nothing short of a miracle and incredibly special to me. I hope you all enjoyed this event, and I hope that you all will look forward to tomorrow's event, which will be swimming here at the games. Thank you so much for watching. Hey everybody, welcome back to the D-Pad. I'm Max. I'm Lindsay. And we're from Game Face, but we're here on the D-Pad and we're commentating over the games. The games. This is the swimming category. The games. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Hudson River. It's like a swimming level. I've never been to the Hudson River. You've never been? Well, we're about to go. It's going to be very nice. I hear it's quite ass. So here's how it goes. <laughs> Uh, for this event, each competitor is going to swim through the Hudson River, defusing eight bombs that have been placed by the Foot Clan. Uh-oh! So they can... Whoa! <laughs> they can switch between the turtles freely, which really helps because this game's hard as hell. So if you lose during the run, that would be pretty costly, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get the eighth bomb, that's time. <gasps> and the turtle will say okay. Will you give me a big thumbs up? Let's let the games begin. Okay, let's, let's, let's see this. I've never experienced this. I've seen, like, a clip of it. So Dustin's starting off here from Ubechistan. So it's interesting because this is the swimming category. Uh-huh. But I don't know. Swimming? I guess they decided swimming wasn't quite as exciting as it could be. I mean, it's a turtle. All they do is swim. Yeah, that's true. That's They're yeah. pretty used to it. Is that so Michelangelo? Um, yeah, that, that is Michelangelo. Well, like, he's a party dude. <laughs> he sure is a party dude. <laughs> he looks like he's ready to party. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a good, like, frog uh, animation going on. He's doing good so far. Dustin's, yeah, I'm not, I'm he not seems like the... he knows what he's doing. Oh, I think, aren't these squiggly wigglies bad? Yeah, they're, they're electricity. They, uh, they will electrocute you. I've, I've played this run before. It's, uh... It's not super easy. This is pretty notoriously difficult. Is it what the French call ass? Uh, sure. Yes. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. But you yeah, for everything's that. electric. Everything will shock you. And um, if Dustin here fails Ooh. to get all these bombs defused within what is it? Two minutes? I believe it's two minutes. It will. What oh. the fuck? Oh, Dustin what just died. Happened? Dustin died. It's like it like almost looked like it just those. Those tentacles are mean. <laughs> I believe it's been a while since I played this, but I think the invincibility frame kind of action is pretty rough. Okay, because it, you it just, just felt like you can he die got sucked up into it practically. It's just like I'm in this screen. <laughs> oh, I'm dead. Yeah, because you can you can kind of strategize and you can switch between the turtles to not immediately die like that. Mm. But it's it's pretty tricky. Do the turtles play any differently? Uh, not in swimming the water. wise. Not in the water, to my knowledge. Okay. I believe they're all kind of doing their own thing. You'd think that Donatello would be a little floatier, cause uh, he Why? he has cause he has wood instead of like metal. Yeah, but right, he'd be floatier. I don't know about that. He'd be too floaty. This screen's rough. This yeah, is... this is this is mean. Yeah, yeah. It's... Oh, it's so mean! Oh my god, it takes you down so oh, fast. Swapping. Oh wait, oh, swapping he's... Leonardo. Okay, yeah, he's, yeah. he's learned that he was wrath. You want to swap between the turtles to not die. Sleeping, you, taking you a little nap. You get away okay. for that electricity to. Mm -hmm. Take to another little nap. There. It looks like when he uh, sits on the floor of the of the ocean or wherever we the river, it looks like he's like putting his hands under his chin and just kind of taking a little. See, he's doing it right now. He's thinking. He's, he's contemplating. Like, ah, this is so peaceful, even though it is not at all peaceful. Well, yeah. I, I mean, you gotta defuse eight bombs in two minutes. Well, it's gotta know, take a little breather. Swimming for the gold. It's. The stakes There's are no hot. air system in this, I'm guessing? Turtles don't need air. They're turtles. I don't think that's true. <laughs> but, all right. <laughs> They're Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They probably don't eat, need air, right? Maybe. I don't know. I, I see little bubbles coming out of them, but that might be the opposite. So he's drowning. 
taking a break, taking a breather. So, so with this, you have to go around to all these little boxes, right? You yeah, said each, bombs. each one of those is a bomb that you're defusing because you don't want the Hudson River Dam to blow up. Why not? Because then the Hudson River oh, going, Dam will going blow Going back to uh, switching to Raph. Raph? Is it Raph? Or, it's, not, it's not Ralph. No, it's, it's Raph. Raph. Raphael, not Raphael. Wouldn't his name be cool <laughs> if he was Ralph? Sure, I guess. I like Raph too. I kind of. I think Raphael is pretty suitable. I don't Off think Ralph wasn't one of the painters. Based off of <laughs> Ralph, <laughs> Ralph the painter, Michelangelo <laughs> and Ralph. <laughs> oh, he has twenty-two seconds. Oh, hey! Oh, Dustin makes it with a time of. Oh, so that was what one death, one like. Yeah, one death, death. A time of th three good. minutes and forty-five seconds. Yeah. Not bad. Not a bad run by a Dustin. Seemed good to me. I don't. I don't have much experience with this game or level. But the, I mean, I've heard the horror stories of this level. It's infamously and this difficult. And like that seemed pretty clean to me. Yeah, he was able to get through it pretty decent there. Three but minutes and forty-five seconds. I'm not familiar with it, so I'm I'm curious to see what the other yeah, competitors I, I are going like to show. That could be a tough time to beat. Because that was just one jet, one death. Yeah. Decent, like only swapped out once. Decent run, Dustin. Decent run. Very good. So up next. As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, we have Dave, Dave, representing Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, if I pronounced that correctly. I don't know. All right, we're starting with Raph. Raph Very good choice. One, It was my favorite back when I was a child. Is that Raph? That looks like Donatello to me. Is it? Isn't that purple? Isn't that a purple turtle? That might be purple. Pretty sure that's a purple turtle. <laughs> I don't turtle. know. I can't tell between purple and red. <laughs> <laughs> they all look the same. They're all green. So Dave goes straight I'm sorry, to the right. I'm sorry, Donatello then. Donatello was not my favorite. <laughs> I think he's the best character in this game by far. I know Is that. Is he? Yeah, because he's got a very long pole, and I think like the power. No way! Oh, stop now! No way! <laughs> it's not much no way. use Get to him underwater here. here. So, so Dave's far, so off good. To a good start here. Going pretty smooth, eh? Yeah. As long as he doesn't uh, take an accidental death at the start there, like uh, oh, just, Justin did. Just he going might be. through that electricity. Doesn't care. I believe oh. that's called a damage. Boost Switching out to Leo. Such. I'm sorry that I. I I mixed up the turtles. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's so okay. <laughs> they all look like turtles. I got through that oh. relatively on Oh, well, still hurting. Oh, switching out. Okay, now it's Wrath. Dave has experience in this category, I can see. Uh, uh huh? He definitely seems to know uh, he knows where he, Well, I feel like they all do. must know where they're going, right? Um, I'm sure they have a decent idea, but um, knowing that you got to switch between the turtles, I think, is like huge. That is pretty handy. Game. If you don't know that, you, you die. Because you can't... Like, you probably could beat this category with one turtle, but it would take a lot more patience. Yeah, you'd have to... And considering there's a two-minute time limit on it... It seems rough. like he's doing a lot of, yeah, just taking the damage and saying screw it. All right, we uh, we got Mikey. Mikey Langelo. Mikey... No. Is that his name? <laughs> Michelangelo? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Correct. Man! That is the turtle's name. Oh, God. Whoa, brain. that was Holy. very that was fast. clean. Holy moly. Well. Good run by Dave. That's going to be really tough to that beat. That is really good. How are you even going to beat that? So, yeah, like, very, very clean. Switch out to, we got to see every turtle. That's true. Dave, uh, that's obviously, I love seeing turtles swimming as a turtle in the Hudson River. Uh, yeah, multiple turtles. <laughs> multiple multiple he, turtles. Obviously not the first dam that he's uh, disbombed. And it won't be the last. Well, I mean, yeah. So up next we have Sarah representing Sarah? Imperium right. Mutum. Starting with uh, Mikey. Let's see what you have, Sarah. Diffuse going straight for the first bomb. That's a good play. <laughs> As opposed to going completely past it. Very yes. good, very good. <laughs> That's probably what I would do. As uh, someone who's not running this category, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. No. It kind of looks like... Uh, the turtle is like sucking the the water into his mouth as he. It's like it gives he's, him he's sustenance. He's eating plankton or something. <laughs> Whatever's in this river, he's eating it. It's, it's not pizza, that's for sure. All right, we're going, going up. Oh oh oh, oh yeah. Okay. Pro you're probably best not to uh not to swim by this guy. You don't want to have to come back and deal with these guys later. No, it seems just like a royal pain. You might as well just get him in one go. Okay, taking taking the damage, just. just just booting her through. 
Okay. Yeah, ca ca throwing caution to the wind. I like it. High I mean, risk, that high seems to be the way to go. As long as you know to switch now, between the turtles. Now, she's getting low. Is she going to switch? That's the thing. Oh. Oh, no. That's one turtle down. Michelangelo got caught. Goodbye, Michelangelo. We hardly knew ye. So now we're on Donatello. So the question is, will Sarah adapt and uh, just realize that you got to switch between the turtles? This is Donatello, uh, right? The, the purple yeah. looks almost red to me. Sure it so does. it looks like I didn't notice this last time, but it looks like once you defuse the bombs, they're done for good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought I thought maybe like once you die, it's like oh, oh you gotta start you, over. I thought you like meant oh. that they were some kind of magic bombs that after you defuse them, they no 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 they can come back. No 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 no. That's not it's how just it works. the whole like in a lot of video games, you die, you have to do the whole thing over. Especially in an NES game, I guess you're right. That is pretty impressive. So I guess that's that's good at least, and it doesn't lose you that time just diffusing all the bombs you've already done. Yeah, very true. Then you can kind of just focus on what still needs to be done, even if you take a death. I guess that's not. Yeah, I am curious. Okay, she, that I, isn't I, as I was fun curious if it's like, okay, did good. she know that she can switch, or is just taking the risk? Yeah, I think no, that's we're good. just. We're on. Uh, who's this, Raf? That's yep, Raf. That's Raf. Oh, those, those noodles. That is probably one of the toughest areas to you, deal. You with. You don't want to mess with a river noodle. River noodles will mess you up. Apparently. <laughs> Very mean. I'll take Taking it slow. I here. love it. It just looks like he's resting his head on his hands. Taking a little, a little breather. Even though he cannot breathe. Switching out. We Leo? got Leo. We're Leo's doing Leo. Up. He's the leader of the bunch or whatever. <laughs> Is that how it goes? I'm pretty sure that's Donkey Kong. I know him well. Yeah, that's Donkey Kong. He's finally back to kick some shell. Hey, not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Coconut right. gun? No. Not so, well, we got one more bomb? Ah, if you can count, sure. That's probably I th correct. I think there's one more bomb. I could be wrong. There's a minute left on the I'm clock very before terrible a dam at explodes. I'm very terrible remembering. So. Well, no one, the big okay. There might happens. be two. Let's see. Oh, yeah, must be go. another one. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, this one on the bottom right. Right, little, right, right, right. Little right, right. hidden away one in the tentacles. We're getting uh, past. Uh, the best time and now we're trying for silver yeah can she make it I oh think i think she, she can. can i think she can unless she's missed come on, a come bomb on, come on. you can do it oh <gasps> yeah that's, that's time that's very time good. very nice yeah not a bad run by sarah no very good it's like just one turtle death same same as the first one but did better <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Duh. Very good. Very good. I'm so good. And with one runner left, we have CJ representing the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. That is a very, very good name. It is a very good name. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> All right. We'll see how he does. Starting with uh. You know that yellow orange guy. boy. Orange yellow. Orange. It's like a cheeto yeah, he's color. A, he's a party dude. He's a party dude. I mean. What color really represents partying more than orange? Ah, uh, none of them, I think. Exactly, exactly. But does it all also represent uh, diffusing bombs really quickly in the Hudson River? That's we're gonna, we're gonna find out. We are about we are to find, find out. out. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to find out. I certainly well, hope so. So far, so good. Just for CJ's sake. There's eight bombs, isn't there? There is eight bombs. I'm. I. That my sounds memory like, sometimes. That sounds like believable information so that, that I one. believe. Oh, taking taking some tootsie so. hits, hitting the tootsies. That's okay. Sometimes we need a little ele electrocution on our tootsies. It's hard on the tootsies. It really gets us going. Like it'll, it'll move you. It uh, helps with the circulation. <laughs> the circulation of sure. turtle blood. All right. Gonna... Oh, avoided oh, the zippy. Avoided it. That's Perfect. Good. That's good. Very good. CJ's off to a good yeah. start here. Yes, yeah, so he's playing it a bit safe. Nothing wrong with that, you though. You can take it all the Nothing way. Nothing wrong with that. I got, I got faith. I got faith. Oh, took it, took a little hit, but that's okay. Just on the tootsies. He got through pretty decent. Oh no, that oh. was that was in the heart. <laughs> oh, and it looks like he knows to switch. So that's uh. That's good. So how is it gonna go going through here? Is there a current here? It looks like there is a current. That's true, actually. I forgot about that, but the yeah, there's there's currents in the in the river in this. Yeah, because I was like, it looks like he's getting pulled. I also. If memory serves me, I don't think it's as simple as it looks control-wise. Oh, I'm I'm very certain it probably is I not. I think it's one of those games where you have to like mash the button to go up and 
I forget how like descending works, but it's uh, mm -hmm. it's not it's not entirely intuitive. It takes a lot of uh, practice. All right, so looks like we passed the first one. We're going for silver. It's, it's very achievable. Absolutely achievable. So I think that is second last one. Is it just the one on the very bottom I left that we have to deal the, with? Yeah, I think it's just the Past last these one. Electric pinkies. Yeah, we're still doing good. I think we haven't even used two of our turtles yet, right? Yeah, we got lots. There, of, there we go. It's, so I think lots of health to deal. It should be a fairly straight shot, CG's right? CG's in a good. Oh wow! Very good even spot. made use of the current there. Did you see that? That was good. Got a little speed boost. Can we get past the... It's got 15 oh, seconds left, oh, and... Shot. And we're good to go! I believe that is the silver! Beautiful! Two minutes, 44 seconds. Not bad, not bad, not bad by all. Hell yeah. Well, that that's the game. That was beautiful! It's so, all been settled. We go... Gold, Dave? With one minute and 55 seconds. That is so good. That's, that's very, very impressive. Good. Good on you, Dave. Yeah. Well done. CJ with a respectable 244. Very good. Taking home the silver. Sarah with the bronze, 336. Very respectable Very as good. well. Mm -hmm. And close and fourth is Dustin with 345. Oh, Not very bad good. At all. Yeah, it's like there were two had no deaths and then two had just one. Yeah, that's the big difference in the run. Can you get through with <laughs> without a death? Definitely makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. It comes down to it. It's tough. Oh my god, it is. I'm like, I'm just looking, and I'm like, I would be terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> now that was a. I'm not a bomb diffuser, I'll tell you. Respectable all around. That was. Very good games from everybody at the games today. Good games from the games. At good the games. games. I enjoy good games. Yeah. Well done, everybody. And That's thanks for good. having us as a, as your commentary guests for Thank this you. episode of the Thank D-Pad. You. It's been a lot of fun to be here. Yeah. And I hope you enjoy the rest of. The oh. games! Yeah, exactly. Oh, we were. Dude, we, we can do it again. Okay. The rest of the, the games. games. In the next game at the games is sport climbing. So enjoy that game. Enjoy the climbing. Enjoy the climbing at the games. And the sport. Sport climbing. Enjoy it. You should. Please. <laughs> like the video. Please. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the games. I'm Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie, and I'll be your commentator for our next event, sport climbing. In this event, challenges our competitors to navigate the course in as fast a time possible. It is split into five stages, and we will be combining the times of all five stages to get an overall score. Fastest time wins. The controls are simple. Aim the arms in the direction you want to grab, and grab with either the left or right shoulder button. While the controls are simple, the gameplay isn't necessarily. And let's jump into the event with our first competitor, Lindsay, representing Daisy Baby Bitch Territory. Rough landing off the bat. Going right over left, attempting a swing. Can she reach it? No! Fall to a gruesome death. Ah, a golden rope has appeared. I wonder if that'll be important. Oh! Flipped over the spike and turned into a skull cloud. At least the music's happy. The competitors probably are not. Going for an underhanded flipping approach, and no. Oh, climbing back up. Left hand, and exploded on the spike. All right, here we are again, right over left. Swing underneath for Lindsay. Oh, she manages to make the grab on the J and popped on the spike. Right over left, this time with conviction. The swing out, excellent grab with the right hand glove. Oven mitt. Of glove. All right, the swing under. Ooh, this time staying tight, missing the spike. Not a hook around the J, and the balloon signifies the end of the stage one. Now remember, there are five stages to this level, and let's see how they do. This one looks a little bit longer, and the music sounds a little bit jauntier. Let's see how this goes. We've given all of our competitors the option of warming up, playing through the three stages of level one, as this is level two of Heave Ho. And almost makes it. Now's left as a blood splatter on Bullet Bill. 
Nice grab with the left hand. Makes a horrifying noise and turns into a horrifying blood splat. Attempting to roll off the edge. Nice deep grab with the right. Swinging up. Good solid hold with the left. Oh, manages to cling on with the right there. I wonder if the blood splatter is slippery. Apparently it is not. And now just some simple hand over hand to get to the end. Grabs onto the finish U and flips around and into the basket. New record, one minute, 10 seconds, 84. Total time, two minutes, 30 and 38 hundredths. On to stage three. Sliding off, oh, good catch. I don't know about you, but this stage seems a little bit simpler than the last two. Unless there's some kind of gimme. Nope, there is not. 13 seconds, excellent stage split. On to stage four. This one looks to be interesting. Do you go up on the underside? Do you come around to the top? Can you even grab that first cube without having to fling yourself? Let's see how Lindsay chooses to navigate. Almost, oh, so close to being able to grab that first cube. Competitor, she's resetting herself. Left hand, oh, good, there it is. A perfect corner grab with the right. Not sure if you can just hold the button. I think you have to hit the shoulder button when you're grabbing onto it, just flailing randomly with that left. Oh, and gets it. Whoa, good save, Lindsay. And the right hand. Left hand, getting into a rhythm here. This game seems to be all about, whoa, another good save by Lindsay. Amazing upper body strength being shown here. Being able to prop yourself up on just one arm left. And these blocks also look to be placed perfectly so that they cannot be spanned easily. Oh! And apparently there is either very generous or no fall damage. Climbing up again. Lindsay is persistent. Left, right, almost with the left. Something to punch herself in the head around the block. Taking an overhead approach, seeing how this works out. Make sure to cover your mouth when you cough. Getting that perfect hold with the right hand to swing over to the left. Good solid left-handed hold. Over the top with the right. Making that stretch for the left. I wonder if that bird has anything to say about, nope, just flies off. Okay. Left-handed, reaching over, over. Hugging around the cube. I love cube. Almost got that right hand in an excellent position for a good left-handed swing. Whoa. Almost. There it is with the left. Now, I don't think this can be a straight drop. I think this has to be a swing in. Let's see how Lindsay handles it. And a fling. Oh, wow, that was close. Another excellent catch by Lindsay and clears the stage. Three minutes, six seconds, and 11 hundredths. Oh, this looks like a doozy. Now, something we haven't seen yet in this game so far is a checkpoint system. It's nothing obvious, but also mo most of those levels seem significantly shorter than this one. Let's see how this works out. Right, left, getting into a rhythm.
Excellent catch with the right hand. And we're gonna go underneath the ombre colored balls. Left. All right, we'll do it again with our right. Lindsay opting for the under approach. Grabs a left. I think perhaps planning for those spikes ahead there, where you will have to take the under approach. Right hand, left hand. Excellent rhythm so far, but just misses with the grab and turns into pink miss on the bottom side of the last orb. Oh, careful on that first step. It's a doozy. Right hand. Left hand. Right hand. Expertly making our way back through this course. Setting up low again, knowing to dodge the spikes. Ooh, it looks like that last spacing just a little bit more, but manages to plant the left hand on it this time. Left, right, flailing, reaching with that right, and catching the flat block. So we saw that falling from the orbs landed on the first orb, so hopefully there is another checkpoint in here somewhere. I would only imagine so. Not needing it though, clearly having a wonderful rhythm approaching this. Short, long, long, short, long, long section. Nice grab. Setting up for a swing onto the purple fuzzy ball. Watch the spikes, Lindsay! Excellent defensive roll. Left, right, left, right. And now onto the monkey bars section. A little overcorrecting, but making sure to get a nice solid grip on that second bar. Confident grab on the third. A little bit of frustration showing here. You can do it, Lindsay. You're almost there. Reaching out with the right, left, right, left. No! Well, it seems like you start as, uh, on the left side of the screen, depending on which obstacle is still there. Excellent throw at the orange fuzzy orb. Right, left, right. Don't slip in the blood. Wonderful monkey bars approach here. Left, right, left. All that's left is a... Uh, Right-handed release and drop into the final bucket. And lands in the final bucket. Stage time of 3 minutes, 35 seconds, and 52 hundredths, and an official time of 9 minutes, 25 seconds, and 6 tenths. Overall, an excellent performance from our first competitor, Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, setting an excellent benchmark time. Let's see how our next competitor stacks up. And it is Jose from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Jose opting for a robot avatar here. Left, right, now flailing and searching left hand. Ooh, excellent throw. Careful of the spikes. Excellent job keeping yourself tight to that top surface. Rolling over the top. And lands in the J with a blistering time of 18.59 seconds. They're doing excellently here. On to stage two. Lands and immediately gets to work. I like this approach. Looking for a good swing to land on Bullet Bill, but gets exploded on the spikes. Once again, moving before they even land. A little bit less of a throw this time, Jose. Excellent grab. Swings underneath the Bullet Bill. Left, right. A searching left hand. Realizing that they will need to reach out. Excellent reach. And grabs the finish U and lands. 40.15 seconds. Another blistering time on stage two. Moving on to stage three. This one was quick last time. Rolling off the edge. Right left, right underneath. And the fling with confidence. 
finishing in a sub 10 second time of 9 minutes point four nine seconds, excuse me, point four one. So fast I can't even speak it correctly. On to stage four. This stage gave Lindsay a little bit of trouble towards the end. Let's see how Jose navigates it. Also having trouble with that very first plant, making sure to get, okay, flinging ourselves the wrong direction. Having trouble, just like Lindsay was, of finding that point on the end where you can make sure to grab that first cube. Seems that most of this problem happens to be this first cube. An excellent flying lift to grab with the left hand. Hopefully setting up to get into some level of rhythm. There it is. Oh, wonderful rhythm coming out of Jose here. Just got to catch this one. It's in a weird position. Right, left, and now we're moving back towards the right side of the screen. An over-the-top reach. Has found a technique here and is going to use it. If it's working, don't change it. Oh, you can make that reach. Okay, changing the technique up a little bit. Left hand, right hand. Bird flies away again. Showing some signs of frustration here. Liked that technique they were using earlier. Having a difficult time with this second one. And flings. Ooh, good catch, Jose. And lands in the finish, you. New record, 1 minute, 45 seconds, point seven nine. Total time so far, just under 2.55. Now remember, this is the longest stage by far in the competition. Using that monkey bars approach on our first long, short, 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 long, short, long, short section. And Jose makes short work of this first section and moving on to the ombre orbs. Kamikaze's off the first orb. And is brought back to all the way to the beginning. Oh, that's rough. Oh, we saw Lindsay fall in a similar spot. Actually, I believe she was further down on the orb. So we'll have to see how this um, checkpoint system works. Or not, if Jose manages to do this last stage clean. Err. Then the beginning. Left hand, making a much cleaner transfer to the orbs. Excellent span. Taking the over-the-top approach. Differing from our previous competitor, Lindsay. Ah, but Jose sees the spikes and realizes they need to switch to the bottom now. Excellent rhythm getting through these last two orbs. Moving back on to the long, short, long, short, short, long is a bunch of other platforms. Left, right. A little bit of style points. I like that the birds have come back. They're not to be deterred from eating their seeds. As it appears to be wintertime, that's key for birds to being able to find food. Reaching over the top, finishing off this long short section, and staring at the fuzzy spike ball. Going for an underneath swing, and pop goes the weasel right on the spikes. Reaching out, getting a good grip. Attempt number two, aims lower and lands safely on the fuzzy orb. Getting into a nice monkey bars rhythm, which is good because now they're on the monkey bars section. Good grip. Grip is key. 
Oh, skipping a bar. Advanced techniques and just flinging themselves at the end. For a stage time of 2 minutes 59 seconds point 80 and an overall official time of 5 minutes 53 seconds point 8 moving Jose into first place. Excellent run by Jose, definitely got a little cocky on a few sections but managed to find an excellent rhythm and maintained throughout puts them into first place. Let's move on to our next competitor, Rick of Imperium Ludum. Rick also gets right down to business, lands and immediately starts moving. Using the dynamics of this game very, very well, flinging himself at the J. And excellent navigation of the spike and lands in there with a new record of 13.9 seconds. Very fast time from our competitor from the Imperium Ludum. Lands and gets to work. Does a little aerial there, lands on the first cube. Gets the left hand set and grabs Bullet Bill's nose. Excellent over under rhythm and manages to get the checkpoint. 21.13. No new record. Oh, and giving us a little bit of a, a clap show. Rolling down the end. Catches with the right hand. Immediately moves the left and flings at the finish. Another sub 10 second finish of seven seconds, 0.16. Rick is flying through this course, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. I did not sure if I noticed that the first time or it just didn't happen, but that bird just dookied all over this course. Rick is not deterred. Taking a slalom strategy, moving inside and outside. Oh, uh, we haven't come up with a good name for this event. I'm going to call this the Stairway to Heaven. Or Hell. Left hand doing the fling. Whoa. Excellent save by Rick. Fling skyward. And lands in the U for a record time of 47.54 seconds. Rick is putting on a clinic here. Lands and immediately gets down to business. Going with a monkey bars approach. Again, this game is all about the rhythm. And has made it to the ombre orbs. Excellent orb transfer. He's going so fast I can barely keep up. Immediately goes for the underneath strategy, recognizing that the spikes mean certain death. Our bird friendos, slightly perturbed by Rick's presence, but Rick is not staying around for very long. Getting into a fantastic rhythm. Oh, a little bit of a high grab. Oh, but this was all planned. Now for the fuzzy orb of death. Excellent landing. Tuck and roll to get to the bottom side. And now we're right back on that excellent rhythm. Into the final monkey bar section. And makes that first grip and is able to just rip through. Looks to be skipping, nope. Yes, skipping the last three, landing in a record time of one minute, 15.3 seconds, and an overall official time of two minutes, 45.1 seconds. Rick of Imperium Ludum moves into the gold medal position. Lindsay has been bumped down to third place, and Jose sits in the silver medal spot. Let's see how these standings hold up for our last competitor, John of You Betcha Stan. Lands and gets on down to business. Oh, is unable to make the underneath swing and turns into a cloud of orange goo and a skull cloud. Oh, excellent grab on the vertical pole. Be careful of that spike. We saw what happened to Lindsay the first time. There it is. Again with the orange goo and skull cloud. You can do this. Oh. John having a difficult time getting himself settled. 
All right. Oh, careful of that spike, John. The shuffling technique is a technique we have not seen yet to this. And makes it into the finish you in 55.03 seconds. We're going to have a hard time catching Rick, but know that there's a very large gap between first and second and between second and third. Plenty of room. John, reaching for that first cube. No! Oh, and an orange geyser and another skull-shaped cloud. Excellent grab of that first cube. It's that cube to bullet build transfer that's been getting pretty much all of our competitors. Curls up over the top. Oh, and the orange geyser, but in a slightly different direction this time. Excellent save by John. The fling and the catch, skipping the cube all together. Flying on the underside of this course, just wanting to be absolutely past this stage. Just the final transfer into the U. Whoa. Excellent save, John. No! Spoke too soon, commentators. Curse. I'm sorry, John. That one was on me. We have to listen to this excellent music. Again, employing the flip of skipping the cube altogether. Slips off on the orange blood and back to the beginning. Oh no! Misses the course altogether. Back to the beginning again. Come on, John. I believe in you. You can do this. Sometime in this commentary, we have passed the gold medal time. John now playing for silver. I'm not sure if you can use the camel. Uh, camel apparently has no hitbox. But again, John now trying to catch Jose's time of 5 minutes, 53.8 seconds for silver. Let's see how it goes. This transfer is really wreaking havoc on John, and now the stage has been blocked by Camel Fart. I don't blame you, buddy. I couldn't even see it. Okay, well, it appears the fart is dissipating. The cube is slightly obscured, flying over, but pop goes the weasel on the spikes. Oh, no! Once again, falls off the starting gate. This transfer is deceptive. And was especially difficult with camel fart in your face. Hopefully, there it is. Excellent grab with the right hand. Swinging underneath. Goes for a nice high grip to make the transfer to the first cube easy. Grabs the second cube. Searching for that finish you. Oh no! Couldn't save it that time. Strong two-handed grip. Manages to catch the first cube. Oh, just grazes the spikes, but they are merciless. Oh, just slipping off. Fatigue is most likely a factor here. While you don't actually have to grip for your avatar, you do have to use those index fingers. Solid right hand grip for the fling. Gets the low fling. Swinging under Bullet Bill's nose. Oh, very careful of those spikes. Manages to catch the first cube. Had the second cube, but let go.
very carefully places the left hand on the cube. And now the right, just once again looking for that finish U. And manages to make contact with the U with the left hand and flings in. John would love to put this stage behind him. Finishes at a time of 4 minutes, 55.05 seconds. Has about 3 seconds for Jose's time. And is now playing for a bronze medal. The time to beat, 9 minutes, 25.6 seconds, set by Lindsay. Manages to get that through that stage rather quickly, just over 10 seconds. All right, a monkey bar stairway to heaven or hell. Let's see how John navigates this one. Flings almost backwards, going for a very low grip with that right hand. Manages to post up on the corner grip that our earlier competitors found was necessary to get this first cube. All right, the crux of the problem has been dealt with. Now it's just on to the up and over monkey bar section. Exploring a similar strategy to how Rick of Imperium Ludum did this. With a weaving in and out strategy. Seems to be working out so far. Definitely has a fire inside of him after that previous, excuse me, two stages ago was just an absolute moral beatdown. Reaching out with that right hand, trying to grab the cube, and does. On that penultimate cube. Onto the final cube. And can John make the swing into the, the, the finish pit? Oh! Nicks it, but falls off. And wow, that orange geyser went far. Getting right back to business. I like to see this. Don't want to let you want to beat the game. You don't want to let the game beat you. Searching with that left hand, trying to get onto that first cube. Excellent soundtrack with this game. A few little interesting facts on this game. This was a. Uh, Another title from publisher Devolver Digital, known for many, many indie games. This game is also uh, cooperative. Um, that's how I had seen it played many, many times before, um, in which the competitor, the co-optators, can link hands and fling across the stage. I bet this would have been an interesting tandem event, perhaps next year. Oh, John trying to skip the first cube with a fling up to the second. Almost makes it. Going back for seconds. Oh, and this attempt just releases a little too early and flies too far out and misses the cube altogether. Shuffling into the corner to make that nice reach out for the first cube. So close, yet so far. And gets a fist right on the end. Reaching out. So close, yet so far. Going for a fling. Oh, just misses the second cube. He's got that corner and then an excellent aerial transfer up to the first cube. Looks like he's trying to make the whole stairway in one go. One step at a time, John, you can do this. John's avatar seems to be making significantly more noise than any of our other competitors. Not sure if that is user controlled or just a thing that is happening and reflecting in the amount of effort that is required on these stages. And unfortunately, while I was not paying attention to the time, John has past Lindsay's time for bronze and is net right now playing just for posterity. I like the grit. I like the determination. We want to see a finish. And you deserve to finish, John. 
Wonder if this parrot's gonna come in here and mess things up. Apparently not. Unlike the llama asshole from the last level. Or was it a camel? I'm not sure. All I know is that it was an asshole. All right, now just the final swing into the U. Going for an over-the-top approach. And manages to land right in the middle of the U for a finish time of four minutes, 49.08 seconds. On to our fifth and final stage. Grabs the end and gets right down to business. Seems to be navigating through these cubes without much trouble. And the siding for the safer over the top route skips that cube altogether, moves right on to the next long piece. Now for the transfer onto the ombre orbs, this has been difficult, but again, skips the first orb. Trying to decide which way to go, over or under. Resets the left hand and goes for the overhead approach. Yup, continuing with our overhead approach here on the Ombre Orbs. Manages to catch Orb 4 with a nice fling over the top. Surveying the forward part of the course, realizing that there are spikes in the way and will probably have to switch to an underhanded grip. Oh, going over the top, are we attempting some kind of tricky fling? Maybe, let's see. Oh, but rolls around to the bottom side of that fifth orb. Seems really concerned about these two spike orbs. But opts to go the same route as all of our other competitors. The underside, oh, just gets clipped by the spikes of the second spike orb. Manages to scoot past the first ombre orb and onto the second. Here we are with a two-handed pull-up. Oh, but slides off. A quick bump on the first orb and onto the second. A searching right hand for the third. Double-handed catch. Again, going up and over. And now going under. Recognizing the danger that those spikes present. It's a difficult stretch, but John makes it. Past the previous orange smear, and on to the next long short section. Reaching out and grabs it. Again, going for the safe, over-the-top approach. Moves on to the cubes, and back. Back to the longs. Looked like he was grabbing his own shoulder there. John's approaching the fuzzy orb of death. Reaching out for that cube. Gets it over the top. It's gotta uncurl the arms but manages to catch on to that next long. The fling! Oh, but accidentally slides into the spikes. Unfortunate, but fortunately, there is a checkpoint right here. So perhaps a risky fling approach is acceptable. Manages to get the two-hand grab on the underside of the fuzzy orb, and then immediately gets into a monkey bar rhythm. You can do this, John. You're almost there. Oh, good save. Pausing for a moment and lands in the U with a stage time of 4 minutes, 0.97 seconds. And with an official time, John rounds out the table, 14 minutes, 50.5 seconds. 
And bringing up the medals, we have gold goes to Rick of Imperium Ludum with 2 minutes 45.1 seconds. The silver goes to Jose of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with 5 minutes 53.8 seconds. And the bronze to Lindsay of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with a time of 9 minutes 25.6 seconds. Now let's move over to our medal count. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook have a commanding lead with 7 gold, 2 silver, and 2 bronze. Followed by Imperium Ludum with 4 gold, 1 silver, and 5 bronze. You betcha Stan, the silver medal kings with 1 gold, 8 silver, and 2 bronze. And Daisy Baby Bitch Territory with 1 gold, 2 silver, and 4 bronze. Moving over to our individual medal count. It's a very long list that we don't necessarily need to go through all of. But the interesting fact on th with this event and Rick taking gold, Rick has surpassed Dave at the top of the individual medal count with four gold, one silver, and one bronze to Dave's four gold. The rest of the medal chart seems to be about where it was. We still have that shared bronze medal between Lindsay and CJ for baseball. Thank you very much for watching this presentation of The Games. Our next event will be the 100 meter dash. I'm Teddy, AKA Evil Hippie. Be good to yourself, be good to others, and have a wonderful day. And welcome back, sports fans. My name is Caitlin. And I'm Ian. And we are here at the 100 meter dash, the QWOP or QWOP, as they call it. QWOP it to me, some would say. Now you see, this event is very simple. All four runners will have 15 minutes to get as far along in the 100 meter track as they possibly can. And whoever gets to the furthest distance will win gold. This is true. Uh, the running, however, is made all the more complicated by the fact that each individual piece of the leg is controlled by a separate button. Mm -hmm. so the contestants will have to master their limbs in order to triumph. Yes, they will. Now, each contestant has had a warm-up of five minutes to practice the controls before jumping into the official round. Who will be playing for us today, Ian? Well, we'll have Rick representing Imperium Ludum, Ian, love that name, from Ubechistan, Lindsay from Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, and Dave from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. It should be a wonderful race today, a wonderful race. Very much looking forward to diving in, so let's do that right now. All right, we're gonna see as they get up to the sports, up to the start line, the countdown, and they're off. All right, everyone has got to a pretty good start. Seeing a lot of splits, everybody is- Oh, Lindsay has start over. Limbering up a little bit here. A lot of tipping over, a lot of... Um... A lot of splits, a lot of back leg slides. Ooh, Dave is currently at 2.3 meters, the furthest so far. Seeing Lindsay seems to have some excellent form. We're getting a lot of jumping uh, type actions here. Rick, too, seems to be also copying Dave's slide maneuver. He is now slowly gaining distance. Oh, and Ian, Ian, a sad backwards fall. He's back at the beginning. The ever popular walk with your knee and heel technique. You've heard this mentioned all the time in running, similar to uh, lift with your legs, not with your back. Run with your knee and your heel, not with your feet. Yes, absolutely, Ian. That is a crucial part of this sport. Oh, once again, Ian and Lindsay have had to start over. Rick is slowly climbing his way up. He is currently at four meters. He's reached four meters now. Oh, uh, but... Lindsay, unfortunately, falling backwards. <sighs> but Dave is still in the front, almost at 10 meters. Dave of Tierra de Los ah. Hermanos, hook currently at 10 meters. This race is really heating up, ladies and gentlemen. Using a technique, uh, I believe, referred to as the truffle shuffle to sort of scuff along the ground here. Ah, uh, yes, the truffle shuffle originated about 1993 from a runner named David Truffle. This is true, this is true. Taking his name, of course, from the Goonies. Unfortunately, Lindsay has had to start over once again, but Ian has found himself in a good pace. He's currently up to three meters. Rick now at 10 meters, but Dave is still far ahead with 16.8 meters. That tap, that that heel tap, you see, he's dragging himself along by the heel. Truly an incredible athlete, truly an incredible competitor. Seasoned competitor. This technique is flawless. Ah, uh, and unfortunately, Rick has had to start over again. Ah, uh, but Lindsay, Lindsay is making some lunge and oh, and she's back to the start. The splits technique again. The Van Dam approach. I'm, very, very popular. Lindsay is starting powerful with big knees forward, but unfortunately, she's losing her balance. 
Ooh, oh. and another flip. Oh, but now Ian is pulling himself forward, currently at seven meters with another truffle slide. Sliding forward, and Dave with an indomitable 25 meters. Absolutely wonderful. He is doing, he is truly showing here today, Ian. He has been running for a long time. He is known to the Olympic circuit for many years now, and he is here showing us that he can still do it. He's a multi-winner of past. At this point, it is Dave's game to lose. Unfold. However, do not count out these competitors. Each one is pulling forward. Ian, now at 10 meters, slowly gaining some space. He, we might, we might have him coming from behind. This is true. The, the the true challenge is you want the legs to work as a unit. Uh, it, it, it becomes complicated because the calves seem to want to almost explode away from the rest of the body. Uh, and you have to fight that temptation. Mm -hmm. You really need to pull yourself together and have your appendages work as one, almost as if your fingers are controlling them. A quap, as they say. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Lindsay's form appears to be the, the most practical. Uh, the, the steps take the most standard uh, seeming shape. Oh, Ooh. and another tumble backwards. Unfortunately, it backfires, but we have some competitors. Rick, currently up to nine meters. He now has a very wonderful spread-legged knee movement going on. He's pulling himself forward, and he's about to beat his own best. Ian, up to 18 meters now, really gaining on Dave. Though Dave... Dave's lead grows ever farther, 43, 42.3 meters. The rock star slide seems to be taking the the, the field by storm here. Uh, the, the slight scuffle forward. And Meanwhile, Lindsay going for the full true steps and getting some excellent steps in. However, not making it much more than four meters at a time. You see, that's a very... Lindsay is going for a very risky strategy. She knows that if she gets good full steps in, doesn't rely on a slide, she can move quickly. However, the high risk, high reward of that seems to not be paying off for her today. She has been having several backwards and forward tumbles. Oh, and Dave now arriving at a hurdle. <gasps> Dave has made it to the hurdles already. At 50, 50 meters. meters. Dave is really showing his A game today. We are only, we are barely four minutes and 45 seconds in, and he's already made it to the first hurdle. His groin has cleared. No, no, it has not. He's going to slide Attempting his... Attempting oh. the groin clear. Oh. 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 oh, oh, Dave could be in trouble. Oh. oh. Dave has... Oh. He is, just has to get his he's toe. He's dragging. Oh, no. Oh. He he's seems dragging. to be caught on the hurdle. He's caught on that hurdle. He needs to clear that hurdle if he wants to move forward. He has he's... the gold in his eyes. His ankles and will have to clear the hurdle. He has it. done it. He's cleared that hurdle. Yet he continues to drag the hurdle behind him. Can he clear the hurdle? Meanwhile, Ian, almost at 30 meters, he is making his way slowly but surely. If Dave continues to run into hurdles and lose space and time, Ian could come crawling up behind him. Dave has done it. Dave has officially left behind the first hurdle. That first hurdle is a doozy. It can drop many a seasoned performers, seasoned runners. It has dropped many. Moving forward now in a full kickboxer pose. We see him scuffling along. Unfortunately, Lindsay is still struggling near the start of the line, slowly getting her bearings, but continuing with her high risk, high reward, and it's not paying off. See, that's the issue is sometimes trainers and coaches will not train you outside of one specific method. They'll get you in one method and then you're stuck there. And if it starts not working for you, it can be really difficult to get out of that spiral. It really does become a mixed martial art of running. Absolutely. Great metaphor, Ian. Wonderful metaphor. Thank you. Let's check in on our runners. Rick in third place, currently at 32.7 meters. Ian is our second place, 36 meters now, a wonderful showing. And Dave still far ahead, 65.6 meters. Seemingly unstoppable, however, tipping backwards. Oh, his balance, he's precarious. As he gets farther, he gets more tired and he has to watch his balance. Lindsay back at the start again. She just can't seem to get a hold of it. And she's such a strong competitor too. The she form did... is there. The, the, the step, the confidence... She did so well in her qualifiers, but sometimes that gold medal run can just be a lot. It oh. all comes down to a single moment, and sometimes those moments are glorious, and sometimes they elude us. Rick is slowly gaining pace behind Ian. 
Will he overtake Ian? He's just a few meters behind. <gasps> Barely, barely, barely he's, behind he's now. hot on his tail. Rick is hot on Ian's tail. Will he gain forward? Will he overtake? They are neck and neck. They are neck and neck. We could be seeing a switch up. We have seen it. Rick is now in second place. Can he hold this lead? Can he keep up this pace? His speed from behind has been quite remarkable. He has a wide stance, giving himself a little bit more push with every single clinch. Where I feel Ian is getting a little bit stuck on his back knee, causing him to slow in pace. He hasn't lost balance, but it's definitely slowing him down. We could be seeing a bit of panic coming out of Ian right now. You'll see he's in danger of tipping backwards, uh, as I believe he's getting a little more aggressive and a little more sharp with his pulls forward. But he's overtaken Rick now. Dave, however, with the confidence of a monk. Now at 80 meters, Dave is showing us what a true Olympian is today. This pace, this distance he has made is absolutely amazing, ladies and gentlemen. I have not seen a lead like this since the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver. Truly the Usain Bolt of doing the splits and scraping yourself along a track. And Ian has made it to the first hurdle. This is a big part of the run. Can he clear that hurdle? Oh, this is where we separate the competitors from the other competitors who are unable to do the thing. Lindsay has pulled a wonderful pace. She just beat her Tremendous. best score, seven meters. Good for Lindsay. That's the best she's made so Performing far. Performing a bad leg break by the look of it. Oh, no. Will she still run? Possibly. Lindsay at the starting she's line. She's going to attempt it again. She's attempting. Ooh, bad start. Lindsay's just suffered an injury on the track, but she is pushing forward. She will not give up her dream of Olympic gold. Rick now also arriving at the hurdle, attempting to taunt it. Ian is just halfway over the hurdle. He just needs to have his groin and back leg clear the hurdle. This is a dangerous time, ladies and gentlemen. The hurdle can spell disaster. This is one of the most traditionally dangerous moments of any relay <gasps> race. Oh! 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 Ian is Ian maintaining! Ian! maintaining that balance that was so clutch the spirit of a champion rick is sliding over he's trying to form a split to help himself get over the hurdle dave on another continent approaching 100 meters oh rick is almost over the oh he's pulled it forward dave now arriving at a prompt to jump <gasps> dave is coming up to the 100 meter jump can he make it National hero. Dave has made it to 100 meters in 59 seconds. Amazing. Dave, that was fabulous. That lead is so instrumental. They're going to start him back at the beginning to see if he can do it again, but I don't know if anyone can pass that lead of 100 meters that Dave has found. The only possible way to beat that now would be to reach the end of the track and beat the 0.4 meters that Dave was able to jump into the sand. This could be a bright day for Tierra dos Los Hermanos Hook. Rick has, I believe, passed the hurdle at 55 meters, while Ian seems to be carrying it with him instead of going over top of it. Dave, having lost his original stance, now having some difficulty rejoining the fray. But after such a wonderful, a wonderful run like that, does he think he doesn't need to? He could be overconfident. It's his game to lose at this point. At this point, all we need is Rick or Ian to beat him in the long jump, and we will see who the true winner is. Well, in a way, all these competitors are winners. They've truly demonstrated the, the heart of champions. Absolutely. Rick saluting to the judges. Rick, thank you so much for the salute. We respect you. You are the a wonderful strength, competitor. The core strength to hold that pose is, is immeasurable. And to take the time to salute the audience... Those waving signs for real, Imperium Ludum. A real thank you for the, the, the fans and the support. Rick is a real hometown hero in Imperium Ludum. Absolutely. He's a large amount of family here cheering him on. It's an honor to watch him compete today. Ian is still carrying is still carrying the jump with him. He's managed hurdle. to scuff it along for about twelve meters. It slows him down, but he is still managing to hold his lead in front of Rick. Lindsay struggling through her injury, but doing her best. She wants to show everyone here today that she can run, even through her injury, and it's show us the best. Truly inspiring.
truly inspiring. Ian, once again, on the western side of the The hurdle, hurdle. seems to be giving him a lot of trouble today. Something we did not see in his practice runs. A great deal of groin trauma. Absolutely. It can be very detrimental, and if it gets up in a place you don't want it to be, that can be the end of your run. That could spell the end of a champion's day. Dave is taking his time. He knows he has the score to beat. And we are nearing our 15-minute line. So we will see. Can Rick and Ian pull it to the end and give Dave a run for his money? It now becomes the battle for silver. Ian seems to be stuck on the hurdle still as Rick overtakes him. Rick in now second with the place. pinch and push maneuver. Making good distance, really showcasing his split maneuvers. Popularized in the mid 90s, the split and pinch. Mm hmm. Was very much used by most runners for a long time before the truffle shuffle came along. This is true. This is true. A different time in this great sport of kings. Rick is currently at 68 meters. Ian slowly falling behind due to his hurdle troubles. Rick, Dave simply having a bit of fun at the at the starting line. Again, a, a small amount of showboating from our, our reigning first place competitor. Certainly no time to, to let up, but... Uh... Definitely his position to lose at this point. Rick has now reached 70 meters. Ian running close behind him. Lindsay is still working her way towards her best, her 7.4 meter best. Very good, especially with the injury she's working through. Yes, you don't often see the backward horse leg uh, on a competitor who then chooses to continue. Very brave. Very brave. We have just under a minute left in this run. Will Dave take home gold or will Rick and Ian catch up? Rick Moments away now. Rick continuing his slide. Ian still, still being hassled by that hurdle. He seems to be struggling to clear it and simply dragging it with him. Some competitors do decide that rather than risking a tip while clearing a hurdle, it is simply better to drag it beneath oneself. Lindsay, just about at her best, she may even beat... Oh! oh. And that injury giving her more trouble. The tightness in those tendons. Oh, we just have about injury. 15 seconds left, ladies and gentlemen. 15 seconds left. Who will take the silver medal here today? Rick and Ian, neck in neck. It could be anyone's race. Moments away. Two seconds. And we have it. Our gold medal champion, Dave Tira de las Manos. And Rick with the silver. Ian with the bronze. And Lindsay showed a wonderful relay today, despite her injury, gave it her all, really made her family back home in Daisy Baby Bitch territory proud. Truly champions one and all. Uh, true competitors. True competitors to the last. This is Dave's fifth gold medal in a row. He's truly making a wonderful show here. Oh, and you can just hear the crowd in Tierra de las Hermanos hook screaming his name. They are, he is making them so proud. Once again, our gold medal winner, Dave. Silver to Rick, bronze to Ian, and Lindsay. Lindsay, you have my respect for showing the world that you will run and you will fight regardless of the injury you receive on that track. This is true, this is true. Not an easy sport, not a simple endeavor, but certainly one that all of these champions have undertaken heroically here today. We are so thrilled to have been witness to this moment this in sporting history. I am Caitlin. And I am Ian. Signing off for now. We will see you at the next one. Enjoy the rest of the games. Hello, sports fans, and welcome back once again to the games. My name is Sidhu, and I'll be your first host for today's event, football. Today, our four competitors will be battling it out in a round-robin tournament to see who is the robot master of the soccer field, with Mega Man Soccer being the battleground of choice. At the end of the round robin tournament, our two highest placing competitors will battle it out in one final round to see who will be taking home the gold. But before we can get to that, we have six amazing matches to watch, starting with the first round, Peter from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook piloting the Woodman team in brown and green, and CJ from the Daisy Baby Bitch territory piloting the Ferryman team in yellow and silver. Both teams look like they're ready to go, Peter has won the coin flip, and 
will be starting us off as we make our way to the kickoff. Peter just has to decide which way he wants to pass to start things off, and with that, the game is on. Passing straight up to Ferriman and passing it down the field as we have it intercepted by Ferriman, Alekman trying to take it up the field, getting taken down by Proto Man on Peter's side of the field. Trying to pass things back and forth to get it closer and closer to the goal, not quite making it to the goal. Alekman now in strong possession of the ball. Passing it up to Snakeman, but Ferryman on Peter's team interfering. Passing it all the way down the field to Protoman. Successfully takes control of the ball, taking it down to the goal. Do we see an early goal? No, we do not. Ferryman stopping it on CJ's team and passing it up to Alekman. Who's kicking it right up the field, but Ferryman on Peter's team taking it back. Oh, Alekman intercepting once again, passing it up to Snakeman. And passing it down to Cutman from Peter's team. We are seeing a lot of back and forth in this match. Alekman taking it back to CJ. Snakeman kicking it up to an empty field where Ferryman from Peter's team is taking it back. Now this is a bit of a tough thing to do in Mega Man Soccer. Uh, you Ooh, we see a power shot from Snakeman. Not able to make it past the goalie. Snakeman's power shot... One of the few that doesn't actually knock down the opponent. Woodman passing it up into centre field with Protoman then passing it forward. Ooh, Protoman able to take control of the ball out from under Skullman's feet. No power shot means no goal today as CJ's team takes it back. Now one of the uh, problems with controlling this game is that control will swap rapidly back and forth between whoever happens to be closest to the ball, which can lead to some uh, weirdness among the players. Ooh, a high kick, but Ferriman able to stop it, kicks it up to Skullman, up to Alekman, up to no one, but Snakeman manages to take it back for CJ's team, passing it back down to Alekman, able to keep it out of Peter's hands, up to Snakeman. Are we going to see a goal? No. Snake Man stops Snake Ram from scoring on Snake Man as Snake Man kicks it back up to center stage. But Snake Man takes it back. And Cut Man from Peter's team, finally a different name, is able to take it back for Peter. But Snake Man once again. And Woodman, with one of the strongest tackles in the game, takes it away from Snake Man. But Snake Man is able to take it back and passes up to Snake Man. As he tries to score on Snake Man, but Snake Man does stop it. Stop me if you're hearing the word Snake Man too much. Fair Man trying to take it downfield for Peter's team. Proto Man able to kick it forward. Ooh, tries to go for a dive, but you can't do that if no one's in possession of the ball. Snake Man trying to score on Snake Man yet again. Oh, kicks it to Snake Man, kicks it the wrong way for CJ, but. Peter, happy to take that opportunity as it's given to him, takes it back up the field, kicks it to no one, Ferryman, kicks it away from Peter's team, and it's back to Snake Man. Always Snake Man. Ooh, Cutman able to intercept the pass between Snake Men. As Snake Man takes it up, are we going to see a goal? No, we are not. Snake Man able to defend, but not well enough as CJ gets the first goal for Ferryman's team. Well played, and without even a power shot. Nicely done. First goal, we're at about half time in the second, in the first half even. The second half of the first half. And see, we see the Snake Man Mafia taking it back down, but Cut Man passing to Proto Man, passing to Elect Man, and we're back to Snake Man. Snake Man taking it upfield. Snake Man's power shot, one of the few power shots that doesn't take down the goalie, but it will pass through players if they manage to get through there. Ooh, Snake Man actually tackling Cut Man. Seeing a lot of back and forth here, hard to, hard to keep track. Ooh, Snake Man the goalie, able to take things away from the other players. Right, Proto Man taking it all the way downfield. We're seeing a Leg Man try for a tackle, not quite getting there. Fairy Man able to stop the goal. A Leg Man taking it up the field for CJ's team. Passing up to Snake Man. Well played, well played. Snake Man able to stop the attempt on goal. Alright, back to Snake Man. P 
Peter seems to be having some trouble getting the ball back under control. Ooh, Snake Man tries to get a cheeky shot on goal, but walks too far into the goalie's box, and the goalie just gets to take it away for free. Alright, Snake Man passing up to Snake Man, Cut Man trying to intercept, Woodman successfully intercepting with an aerial kick, and another aerial kick, doing an excellent job on that defense. Ooh, Fairy Man able to get the dive. I don't know if Peter's realized that you can't dive if no one's in possession of the ball. But it does not appear to be working out. Snake Man passing to Woodman who kicks it straight up to center field. Electman trying to do the... Uh, Woodman passing, Electman intercepting but passing it the wrong way. Snake Man tackling Fairy Man, passing it under Fairy Man's feet. You hate to see it. Snake Man attempts on goal once again. Fair Snake Man stops it, passes to Cut Man, Cut Man passes to Proto Man, passes to Proto Man yet again. We're seeing an attempt on CJ's goal now. Are we going to see a goal? I don't know if Peter knows about the charge shot button, which is holding R while taking a shot. We've seen a few attempts at getting to the goal, but no power shots, which are the simplest way to get a shot on goal. Not able to tackle the goalie in the box. Can if they go out of the box, but that is very rare to actually happen. Skullman now taking it up the field. Passing into the middle of nowhere, but Snake Man, one of the faster characters, managing to get there. Ooh, Fairy Man taking it back for Peter's team. Passing up, but unfortunately Snake Man getting there first. Passing up to Snake Man again. Cut Man going for a barge and a slide, but neither able to connect. Shot on goal is attempted and missed as Snake Man stops Snake Man. Snake Man attempts, Snake Man fails, Snake Man attempts again. Not quite getting there. It's a real snake eat snake world out there. Ooh, Woodman able to take it away from Snake Man, but not getting back to the ball in time. A bit of a scuffle, but it looks like Fairy Man took it back. But it is down to Alec Man and passing back up to Snake Man yet again. A lot of attempts on goal, a lot of snake on snake action here as we see some attempted slides from Peter. They do not quite work when no one's in attempt to the ball, but it does make for some interesting television. Proto Man doing a very far kick, almost managing to get past Fairy Man for a cheeky goal. Not quite getting there. We are now back to Snake Man on Peter's half of the field, taking it all the way upfield, but not managing to score the goal. 20 seconds left in this first half. Are we going to see any changes in the score before this half's over? Ooh, up to Fairy Man, up to Proto Man. 11 seconds, kicks it back to Fairy Man, back to himself and not quite able to score. Eight seconds on the clock, seven seconds. All right, Alec Man kicking it forwards. Ooh, Proto Man managing to take it back. Are we going to see anything special in this last second? No, we are at half time. CJ is up 1-0. The colors on the minimap have changed, but the player dots have not, which is a uh, strange quirk of this game. All right, two player, still CJ, still the yellow and silver, taking it to the right this time as Snake Man takes it up the field. That's not a euphemism, I swear. Snake Man, the goalie, able to stop the attempt on goal once again. Fairy Man taking control, kicking it back to the left. Proto Man takes control, up to Fairy Man, down to Proto Man, across to Skull Man, who is able to take it back to Alec Man as play progresses back to the right. We are now back in Peter's half of the field. Nowhere not, Fairy Man kicking it back to the left. Proto Man passing down to Proto Man, gets it kicked out of from under him by Skull Man, over to Snake Man. Back in Peter's half of the field, passing up to Snake Man. Attempts on goal, failed once again. Snake Man doing an excellent job of defending, except for, you know, that one time when he didn't. Ooh, not quite able to reach, but Snake Man stopping Snake Man from that attempt on goal. Fairy Man now trying to take it back to the left, but Snake Man taking it out from under him. Woodman, one of the most defensive characters in the game, makes sense why he's in the back part of the field. Able to take it back, but. The charge shot, yet again, not able to make it through Snake Man. It will pass through regular players, but not the goalie. Ooh, attempted save by Snake Man. Are we going to see another shot on goal? So many shots on goal, but none of them able to make it through 
Snake Man taking a, a fair way out of the field, running the risk of getting it tackled out from under him and getting an easy shot on goal, but not actually running that risk. Proto Man trying to take it outside of Skull Man. Ooh, some excellent intercepts, but not quite able to make a shot on goal. Snake Man taking it back through the field. Proto Man able to take it away. Snake Man taking it back. Ooh, passes up to Snake Man. Proto Man trying to take it away. Ooh, Snake Man with a failed dive to save the goal, but it didn't quite go far enough. All right, up to Proto Man trying to take it back into the second half of the map. Ooh, Snake Man successfully passing to Snake Man. Shot on goal, failed once again. It's a, it's a rough time to be without a power shot, but it's even a rougher time if you can't make it to the goal to get those power shots. You can use the power shots to take them up the field, which for Snake Man's case would actually be the preferred method, given that it can't get past the goalie. Right, it's, it's staying on Peter's side of the field. Ooh, we could have an attempt on goal here, but Snake Man able to take it away from the other players while in the box. Woodman passing it back to center field. Ooh, Snake Man taking control of the ball. Proto Man barging to get it out of control, but there is a bit of a scuffle as no one could quite take control. Another attempt on goal. Fairy Man now taking it back to the left for Peter's team. Can we see? Ooh, no, we have Snake Man taking it out from under. All right, Snake Man once again in control of the ball. Probably the most time in possession all game. Oh, Snake Man taking very good use of that failed dive from the goalie, scoring the second goal for the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. Peter in control of the kickoff once again, passes straight to a Lek Man on the other team. Are we perhaps seeing some collusion? I highly doubt it, but it is possible. Snake Man now taking it to the right once again. Fairy Man able to take it out from under. Both characters attempting to take it from the other player, but just jumping in place as though in celebration. Snake Man kicking it up the field. Cut Man able to take it away. Fairy Man taking it back to the left. Ooh, passing up to Fairy Man, passing forwards to Proto Man. Doing an excellent job of taking it up there. Ooh, nope. Elect Man able to take it away. Snake Man passing to Snake Man. We are going very close to the goal now. A Cut Man able to take it away from Snake Man. Doing an excellent job of slaloming away from the other team. Proto Man now taking it straight down the field, taking it forward, kicking it up. Cut Man going down the field straight for the goal. Are we going to see the first power shot? No, we're not. We're going to see a pass to Proto Man but unfortunately, taking it out of the field for our first out of bounds. Peter getting a kick in with Proto Man. Where's he going to go? Is he going to go straight for goal or is he going to pass to a teammate? Ooh, he's passing to absolutely no one, but Proto Man managing to take control as we see two Skull Man attempting to dodge. Power shot takes the goal. First goal for Tierra de los Hermanos. Hook one to two. All right, CJ with the first kickoff on his side of the field. Passes up towards the goal, not managing to get there. Cutman taking control, passing to Ferriman, passing to Cutman, Ferriman, Protoman even. Protoman taking it up the field, doing another excellent job of dodging, but Skullman able to take it back with an excellent slide. Ooh, tries to pass to Protoman. Fer Skullman interferes, kicks it back up to the goalie for a free pass forward. All right, up to Alec Man, and we're back with Snake Man. He's back. He never left. Oh, passes all the way down the field to Woodman, able to take it back for Peter's control. Ooh, Fairman taking it out from under Snake Man, passes up to Proto Man, dodges Skull Man twice, three times, passes down to Fairy Man. Ooh, high pass over to Proto Man, but it goes straight to the goalie. No goals today. Ooh. Attempted shot there, but got too close to the goalie, was able to take it away for free. Ferryman takes control, kicks it up. Electman interferes, up to Snake Man. Ferryman takes control, passes down to Proto Man. This is an energetic match, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone betwixt. Ooh, Ferryman takes it back. We are now up to Electman. I cannot keep track of all of these characters on this field. CJ in control. We're back with Snake Man. Good old familiar Snake Man. All right. Another attempt on goal. Cutman interferes, passes up. Skullman takes control. Back to Snake Man. 
Attempt on goal. Ooh. The goalie able to take control, running it fairly far up the field, but no one able to take it back. Ooh, Protoman attempts to pass up to a teammate, but kicks it out of the field, and Skullman gets the kick in for CJ's team. Where's it gonna go? Ooh, passes to Snake Man. Down to Ferryman. Good interception by Peter. Ooh, passes back up to Sna uh, Ferryman. I was about to say Snake Man because he almost got there, but there he is again. Elect Man passing it straight up the field to Snake Man. Snake Man passing to Snake Man. Cut Man interfering. Up to Proto Man now. Elect Man attempting to kick it through, but the goalie has it. Passes to Skull Man. Passes to Elect Man. Passes. You guessed it, to Snake Man. Snake Man passing to Snake Man. Passing to Woodman. Good interception. Fairman kicking it up the field. Six seconds on the clock. It's looking like CJ's game unless we can see a power shot from all the way down the field. Does it get there? No, it does not. And with that, CJ has won the first match. My goodness, what a game. An excellent showing by both competitors today, but CJ manages to get the win with some excellent offense, despite both of his power shots not quite making their mark. Peter seemed to be having some trouble keeping track of where his controlled characters were if they weren't on the screen, which is unfortunately a very common problem in Mega Man Soccer. His power shot definitely came through though, managing to get his one goal on the board, though he still had one in the back pocket that unfortunately went unused. But that's only the first match of the day, we've still got most of a round robin to get through. So with our current scores, putting the Daisy Baby Bitch territory at one win, no losses, and Tierra de los Hermanos hook at zero wins, one loss, I'm going to pass things over to the fine folks over at Retro Roulette. Take it away. Well, these games sure have been firing up. The progression has been quite insane. I have really got to give it up to everyone out there who's been participating in the games. Uh, thank you to the previous commentator. Uh, this is once again Retro Roulette. I am Sam, and I am joined by Photogenic Justin. How are you today? Hello, everybody. My name is Photogenic Justin, and I'm here to commentate on the second match of this Mega Man Soccer tournament i hope you are ready to see some incredible stuff i am definitely fired up are you ready sam i am ready sir all, all right. right let's get to this next game we have rick versus cj yes rick who hails from imperium ludum versus cj daisy baby bitch territory what uh, a name <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh looks like ooh, looks like the match is about to start all right let's go okay we got the kickoff anchor starting off with the kickoff. And that okay. ball is getting passed over to Skullman. Skullman is passing to Skullman. Skullman running out to the midcourt, midfield. Okay, we got Snake Man with the ball. Snake Man Ooh, passing Snake over. Man. And I'm Cutman takes up. it. And looks ooh, like slide. Ooh, we got Anchor trying to do the slide. All right, ball to Anchor. Anchor to Woodman, Woodman to Snake Man, Snake Man getting closer to the goal. All right, oh no, okay. Needle Man right, takes Snake the ball Man and is of, uh, playing the defense. Snake Man making some questionable maneuvers, but hopefully. Oh, look at Anchor, up. yeah, Anchor trying to pick up the pace, but no, looks like Elect Man is getting the ball out there to Woodman, Woodman to Snake Man, and no, looks like Cut Man's about to take the ball to try to steal the show. Cut Man you could, at least you could say that, that uh, Cut Man is a cut above the rest. Oh, and it is out. Ooh, out of bounds. We got a corner Not kick by Anchor. And Needle Man kicks it in the goal! Woo! An impressive shot by Needle Man. Impressive indeed. Justin. Absolutely phenomenal. So that is 1-0. All right, Cutman's taking the ball, passing it over to Needleman. Needleman kicking it. Anchor's taking it. <clears throat> and Cutman's got it. Cutman's trying to do the super shot, and it's the goal! Oh my goodness. Not before oh my goodness. <laughs> Crazy right here. That was a great round. Indeed it was. So we are at 2-0 right now. Cutman taking the ball again. Hopefully Cutman can pull off another one of them super shots because that was pretty cool in that last play. Oh, out of bounds. Out of bounds. Kick in. Yep, kick in from Snake Man. 
Let's think, man. Doing Snake Man taking a second to think about what he's about to do. Oh, and oh, Cut oh, Man oh. coming in with that slide kick. What a maneuver. And look at Anchor with the ball. Come on, Anchor's getting close. All right, you can Anchor. do it, Anchor. Come on, Anchor. Impress us. Show us something cool, Anchor. We are rooting for you. Anchor. Anchor. Okay, Nita Man's going to take it. That's cool. That's cool. An Anchor grabbing it. And it looks like oh, Small Man takes it back. <laughs> yeah, we got a little bit of hustle. <laughs> but Nita Man with the ball. Pass it to Anchor. Oh, oh and that's no. not coming in handy. Needle Man kicking it in. Okay, Farrow Man's going to try to save it, save the team. Passing it to Go Skull lead. Man. Now the ball's just kind of going wherever there. Okay, Cut Man <laughs> takes it. Come on, back to Anchor. Okay, Anchor to Cut Man. Cut Man to Needle Man. Needle Man to Anchor. Oh, man. Oh, just dead a ball. Split second <laughs> too late on Ooh, that fuck. ball. The anchor could have done something really cool with that. Nah, <laughs> Anchor tried to do something. So he tried to be fancy over there, got a little bit too eager, but it wasn't enough. Anyways, back to Snake Man. Snake Man trying to take it back to the other side, trying to get the, get his team on the board. It's like Snake oh, Man trying to get it. Iceman blocks it. And we are back to Cut Man. Cut Man and Needle Man. Needle Man to Anchor. Come on, Anchor. Let's see you do things, Anchor. Okay, back to Needle Man. Oh, Needle Man just barely missing that. Oh, barely Back to Pharaoh it. Man and to Wood Man. Woodman to Snake Man, Snake Man passing down to Snake Man, Snake Man coming in, approaching oh, in ball. hot, but oh, it is man, not enough. In. Cut Man taking the ball and bringing it back. Oh, oh boy, that volley. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what they say, Cut Man is just a cut above the rest. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Cut Man's got the ball again, ball to Anchor, Anchor to Cut Man, Anchor got it back, Cut Man, let's go. Okay, Let's here's go. Needle Man. Let's go. Okay. Oh my goodness. These games Man. are ramping up. They are ramping up. Oh, oh, come on, Needle Man. Anchor. Oh, uh -oh. and there's a CJ block. is Brazilian. Oof. Oof. I really like the aggressive offense with uh, with uh, Anchor and Needle Man. They they definitely got some good uh good synergy going on over there. That's CJ on the defense. He's gonna need it. He is down two. But he is up one. Oh god, alright. Back to Needle Man. Needle, Needle Man passing it up to Look, he was trying to get it up to, to Anchor, but Skull Man got right in the way, got in between those two. He was like, nah, you are not getting that ball on my side of the court. That's not happening. <laughs> but Snake Man coming in with the super shot, but looks like Iceman saves it just in the nick of time. In the nick of time. Okay, Skull Man with the ball, passing up to Snake Man. Oh, but Cut Man with the slide just cutting right between his legs. And here comes Anchor passing to Cut Man. Oh, man. I was hoping that Needle Man would be there to, to grab that. That could have been really cool. Alas. <laughs> Alas. Whatever. Snake Man's got it. Snake Man's got some pretty good footwork going on. I'm, I'm liking what Snake Man's been doing this game. Some good fancy footwork. Very fancy footwork. Okay. Ooh, and a bump. We got a bump to Anchor. What's Anchor gonna do? Come on, Anchor, impress us. Cut Man! Cut Man over to. Oh, man. If only Needle Man was there. Okay, Anchor trying to pass it to Needle Man, but Pharaoh Man just blocks that shot. Back up to Anchor. Oh, man, Needle Man. Needle Man's in like the this wrong place at the wrong time. Tense. Oh, no, nah, that wasn't gonna happen. Nah. Elect Man nope. is being He's not very, very, <laughs> very, 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 very defensive play with, by Elect Man. Okay, we're back to Woodman. Woodman to Snake Man. Snake Man to Snake Man. Getting close, but no. Oh. Iceman is on top of that. Iceman no bringing the ball back to the midfield. Okay, there is Needle. We got Anchor. Anchor to Cut Man. Cut Man to Cut Man. Cut Man to Anchor. Anchor bringing it in. It's getting close. Come on, let's right, see anchor. something happen. Go, let's see some magic. Go. There's Needle Man. Oh, Come on, Anchor. Boy. Anchor. You can do this, Anchor. Oh, all right. So Needle Man, they try it again, and it is a block. Oh, Needle Man, it tries oh, again. Oh, oh my goodness. This is crazy. I am on the edge of my seat right now. Okay, oh, here comes Anchor. God. Oh, my goodness. And Elect Man takes the shot and brings it back. Absolutely crazy. Here. Absolute insanity. That was a crazy play. That I don't know about crazy. you, Sam, but I cannot handle this anymore. This this pressure is just absolutely insane. Dear me, oh my, the vapors. <laughs> These players are not playing any games today. Here comes Needleman with the ball. Anchor trying to recover it in the corner. Needleman taking a shot. Oh, man. But back, bring it back to Anchor. And he oh, scores! Oh, Goal! Oh. 
That's a unbelievable play by Anchor. Look at that him. He was, is happy with that one. That was impressive. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Cutman's got the ball. Cutman to Cutman. Ooh, dead ball. <laughs> dead ball. Dead ball. Here comes Snake Man bringing it in. Snake Man a Snake Man. Snake Man passing it in. But Iceman is on top of his game as always. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, man, look at you with the ice puns. <laughs> Let's kick some ice. Oh, got a nice okay. bump there. Yep. Oh, but what's going on? Okay, here comes Anchor. Come on, Anchor. All right, you Anchor, got this, you Anchor. Got? Anchor, Anchor. Okay, here comes Cut Man. Come on, Cut Man. Do your thing. Ooh, and oh, come on, Needle Man. You got this. And there it passes to Anchor, but unfortunately, that's the clock. We are at halftime. Okay, we're in the second half. Iceman, um, not Iceman, that was Cutman. What am I saying? <laughs> but Team Iceman is up 3 nothing. So Snake Man's kicking the ball. Gotta make a two point recovery on that mm -hmm. one. All right. Yep, got the little bump, bump by Anchor. Woodman with the ball. Ooh. Then comes Cutman. Cutman trying to bring it home. Some deception going on in that mm -hmm. circle. <laughs> oh, and a Ooh, nice Needle Man trying to be fancy over there. He thinks he's thinking. There goes Needle Man! Oh, 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 and he scores! Go! Good job, Needle yeah, yeah. Man. Woo! I'm amped. Okay. Oh, my go. goodness. I am like sweating over here. This is crazy. This is crazy, crazy game. All right, Needle Man, what you got? Okay, here comes Anchor. Okay, passing to nobody, I guess. Here comes Needle Man. <laughs> but looks like, oh no, Cut Man. I thought I thought Skull Man had that one. I thought so too. Okay, come on, Elect you. Man. You got this, Elect Man. Elect Man to Snake Man. Snake Man to Snake Man. Let's go, Snake Man. Ooh, not Ooh, bad. ambitious. Not a bad <laughs> shot, actually. No, Pretty not bad play. at all. But Iceman is there to block it. Iceman doesn't want anything getting past him. Wants nothing to do with that one. All right, Snake Man's got the ball. Snake Man, a Snake Man. Snake Man coming snake in man, hot. Snake Come man, on, Snake, snake man. man. Show us what you got. Oh, but oh. Cut Man was like, nah, son. I'm I got that ball. I'm going to slide through your legs and take <laughs> it. Lots of sliding in this game. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Anchor. Not bad. Going for it all. Mm-hmm. All right, Snake Man, you can do this. Oh, the, oh! Super, the super shot with Snake Man. Oh my goodness! The but Ice shot. Man is just there. It is. He's just got that wall, man. You cannot get past Ice Man. It's crazy. Ice is too nice. Ice is too nice. All right, Anchor passing the Needle Man. Oh! Ooh. Great block by Pharaoh Man. Oof! 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 Elect man with the ball. Really show him what's for. Oh, that ball. <laughs> All right. Elect man with the ball again. How electrifying. I guess you could say when Elect man plays, it's very uh, shocking. Oh, shocking indeed. <laughs> okay, Snake Man. Here comes got? Snake Man with the ball. Snake Man coming in nice. Then comes Cut Man. Cut Man trying to bring it back. Cut Man and Cut Man. Cut Man coming in. Oh, looks like Woodman was trying to oh. get that. And okay, here comes Anchor. Anchor to Needle Man. Needle Man trying to think before he kicks. Okay, Anchor to Needle Man. Needle Man. Oh, my goodness. Anchor to Needle Man. Needle Man to. Oh, my oh, goodness. I was more... expecting it. I thought oh. that was it. I was ready to scream. There was more back to back than my AT&T's <laughs> reception. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, we are not sponsored Lord. by AT&T. Not sponsored. <laughs> Nice man getting that crap out of here. Needle man grabbing the ball. Needle man to anchor. Anchor two. Looks like Woodman's about to say, oh, but cut man. Oh, Needle man with the slide. <laughs> that, that was dirty. They did not see that one coming. We're playing in the mud now, folks. Mm -hmm. There comes Needle man. Uh, Needle man was trying to do that double team with anchor again. But no, Cuts man's about to give them another shot at that. But nope, Skull Man takes the ball and brings him back. 
Oh! Last second steal by Cup Man. Oh, back to Snake Man. Oh. Oh, Anchor boy. trying to be a hero once again and take it I from a Lech Man, what. but nah. Okay, not a bad shot by um, Snake Man. But again, we got that ice wall over there. You have to do more trick up. Tri tri you got you got to do more trip up Rick's team, you know. Yeah, man, you got to burn that ice wall. You got to come with it all. Oh, oh my goodness, Anchor! Oh, 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 oh. I can't. I can't with Anchor. I cannot as well. Here comes Snake Man. Oh, cut, man. Man, I want to see Snake Man score. I feel like Snake Man's had a lot of uh, good opportunities. He wants it. He really, really, really wants it. But it's just not happening. Not happening. Not on his watch. <laughs> but man. Go oh, so the double play by I just, Cut Man. Cut Man has been just phenomenal this game. Great Cut Man collusion. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Needle Man. Needle Man to anchor. Anchor to Needle. Uh, cuts Man! Oh! Okay. All right. Very good offense by uh, Anchor. Now we're and cooking Needleman. with gas. They are now just we're doing with gas. an excellent job. Woo. Yep, Ferro Man on top of his business. Stopping Bring that back ball. Back out into mm -hmm. the center. Past midfield. All right. Here comes Needle Man coming back in. Coming in with Anchor. Saying, hey, you know what? Take we that like ball this side better. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes Pharaoh. Uh, not Pharaoh, man. That is Snake Man. My bad, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, interesting All right. maneuver he tried there. Cut Man to Snake Man. Snake Man. Needle Man takes it back. Needle Man with the ball. Can we get Anchor on that? Oh, we absolutely can get Anchor on it. Oh, <laughs> man. Cuts Man. You were just a. Hat split second too late on that. Oh, that was insane. But Cutman's trying to make up for it. Get those slides in. Back to we Anchor. We gotta make up for it because we got 30 seconds on the clock. Oh my god, 30 seconds on the clock. <gasps> Are we going to see anything crazy happen? Oh, oh my goodness. If by crazy you mean the owner of the green Lambo's car just got knocked in. <laughs> All right, corner kick by Anchor. Anchor bringing it in. Oh man, I, I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Here comes Snake Man. Snake Man trying to bring it back to the field. Come on, Snake Man. Get your team on the board. Oh, and it is out again. Oof. Gotta kick it in. We got 10 seconds on the clock. And he's got to think patiently about mm -hmm. this one. Because these next few seconds are very crucial. Could be anybody's game. All right, here comes Woodman. Woodman, Anchor grabs it, and that is time. All righty, so it looks like with that match ending, the current standards are Rick, 1-0, CJ, 1-1, one one, Peter, 0-1. Oh that was intense. Absolutely <laughs> incredible game. We saw some amazing plays by Cutman, Anchor, and Needleman. They were just on top of everything. They wanted that win. They were aggressive out there with the offense. But we also saw some pretty good plays by Iceman just putting up that ice wall. Iceman wasn't letting anything get past him. And we also oh, saw Snake Man with some real, really, really good attempts. Good effort on Snake Man as well. Wouldn't you say so, Sam? I would say so, Justin. Oh my goodness, that was absolutely intense. Intense indeed, and that concludes the match of Rick versus CJ. Now we're going to hand it off to the next commentator, and we're going to see more of this football. But thanks again for having us. This has been Metro Roulette. I have been Sam. And I've been Photogenic Justin. And we're excited to see the rest of the games. Oh, yeah. Take Stick care. around. Thank you, Retro Roulette, and welcome to the match between Imperium Ludum versus Ubechistan. I'm your host, Ween. I'm Squishy. And we're coming to you live from Ape Arcade. Imperium Ludum won their last match, so let's see if they can keep up the momentum. Alright, and Imperium Ludum starts the kickoff. Oh, he's oh. unsure which to kick it, and... You gotta check all your sides. And we're in. We're in the game. John, representing You Betcha Stan, has the ball. With Team Needleman. Team Needleman, that's right. And Imperium with Rick has Team Iceman. 
see how we how we do it. Let's see. Kind of a back and forth right now. It's hard to tell which team has the advantage. Imperium Ludum has the ball. Straight pass. Unsure where to throw the ball, but I'm sure he'll figure it out. And just a slight pass. And black hole right into the goal. And we have our first goal, not even a minute into the match. Nice shot by Impressive. Rick. You better stand with the kickoff. And an interception. Well, it's more like a uh, you betcha stand kind of just passed it right to them. But it's okay. Imperium with the lead. You betcha stand with the steal. Imperium with the steal. Oh, and we're back in you betcha stand's territory. We're seeing lots of stealing of the ball. And, and again! Another black hole. I don't think that's legal, is it? Uh, it's undetermined. Can we can we talk to a judge about this? No. Okay. All right. You betcha, Stan. Once again, passing the ball to Imperium. Didn't work for them last time. Imperium Ludum steals the ball, kicks it into Needleman territory. You betcha, Stan. Rejects the ball, kicks it back into Iceman territory. Ball is spending a lot of time in Needleman territory. And Right back into you betcha stance territory. It seems we already know where the ball's going to live. You know, the ball just wants to live on this side of the field. It it owns a home in Needleman territory, but it rents in Iceman. Ooh, nice save with Needleman. Skullman's coming up. Passes it to no one. Let's see, Imperium Ludum not gonna have it. Uh, Sphincter Man has passed it along. What, what did you just call him? Oh, S Sphinx? Sphinx Man, sorry, excuse okay, me. That, that, that's what I thought. This is a family show. Oh, who's gonna get it? Oh, it's a race! Oh. Imperium, again with the ball, circling around the goalie. Ooh. A pass to Ubechistan, who almost accidentally kicked it into their goal, but just narrowly missed. And we have our first corner kick of the match. Imperium Ludum. Some could say that was a wasted corner kick. I say, good effort, guys. You bet Stan has the ball once again, trying to get it off of their side of the field. Imperium mm. Ludum with the steal. A little tussle in the corner right there. Skull Man making a sprint. You betcha Stan making an effort to- It seems they, they had a fighting chance there, but unfortunately Imperium Ludum and their uh, adorable Iceman goalie stopped that from happening. Oh, well, looks like there's gonna be another chance at it. We're seeing some strong, strong Ooh. winds uh, slowing down our players. Skull Man throwing his skull, but it was no good. Iceman with the block. Oh, the Skull Brothers are going. Just a little tap to the ice man. And we're right back in you betcha stand. Imperium Ludum with the ball. You betcha stand stealing the ball, throwing it back into their territory. Imperium Ludum once again, keeping the ball in Needleman's side of the field. We're closing in on the two minute mark of the first half. Still can be anyone's game. We're currently looking at Imperium Ludum with a score of two. You betcha Stan still has yet to score. I'm starting to believe there's a magnet underneath the field on uh, you betcha Stan's side. You think the ball is made out of magnets? No, I think it's made out of metal. Right, that's how magnets work. Understood. And uh, head bop staying in Needleman territory. Wow. Ooh, nice save though. Can we get another shot on goal? It looks like we can, and it's not successful. Two players of Imperium Ludum seem to be having a back and forth there. Great effort, but unfortunately, you betcha Stan was able to block that goal. You betcha Stan's defenders are finally waking up. Oh, Needle Man with the save. Oh, with the save again! You betcha Stan with their incredible goalie. Give that man a raise. Well, not too much of a raise, because he's let two goals get past. Right. 
Iceman Sonification. Oh, Iceman is having a field day right now. Is it because he's on the field today? Yes, oh, you did. That's nice. You did. I'm so proud of you. And that pass was to no one. Oh! Pyrium, is he gonna get another goal? More strong winds here, slowing down our players just a little bit. You're a little bit. <gasps> and you betcha stand with the steal! Incredible. Imperium Ludum left themselves open. So you betcha stand gonna get it out of here? You betcha. You, you betcha. And they did, but it was short lived, unfortunately. Oh! What? You betcha stand passing to no one. We are in the last minute of the first half. Let's see if uh, Needleman can make a comeback. It seems that you betcha Stan is slightly disoriented at the moment. You can really feel the sheer panic coming from you betcha Stan. Well, we are talking about an Olympic game. There's a lot of pressure running on these players. Unfortunately, you betcha Stan has not made a score yet. Ooh, but they are saving a lot of goals. They have about half a minute to get the ball on Iceman's side of the field. Will we see another goal in the last 30 seconds of the first half? I believe they all downloaded some soccer software before coming on the field. Therefore, I believe Imperium is cheating. Can I prove it? Not at all. Right back at Sphincter Man. I told you to stop saying that. <sighs> I'm sorry, it's a slip of the... Please don't tell the censors. Oh, uh, sprinting. You betcha Stan really making a strong oh! effort. You betcha Stan coming in at the last five seconds. Five seconds to spare. Finally on the board. They might have a chance. Imperium with the kickoff. Ooh, nice pass. Is he going to get a goal right before half? Ooh. And that's it for halftime. Now we've got... You betcha, you betcha Stan, Stan with the kickoff. On the second half. Now, for all you people who don't know the rules of soccer, I'm talking to you, Matt. All right, listen up. After the halftime, the players switch sides. That's right. Now we are seeing Imperium Lunum on the right side of the field. You betcha Stan is on the left. And as you see, to continue my magnet theory, the ball is still on the side of the field. Touche. Skullman going for it. Ooh! Betcha Stan narrowly missed. Iceman with the dive, but misses. He's adorable. He is trying his best out there. All right, Imperium Ludum. Ball is resting, waiting for a player. Ooh! Neo man with the block. Imperium doesn't like how close they got to another goal, so they are going all out. You betcha Stan getting the ball back onto Iceman territory. The ball once again taking a break. Four minutes left of the game, and it's a close match. It, it could also could go either way. If if uh, you betcha Stan scores one more goal, we could we could definitely see this going for a while. Imperium Ludum keeping the ball. You betcha Stan having control over the ball, passing it to no one. Looks like the Skull Brothers are going to go for another shot. Ooh. Denied. Nice passing going on here. Ooh, nice pass between the Skull Brothers. Ooh. Ooh. Iceman felt like walking into the goal, but decided otherwise. A close call there for you betcha, Stan. An incredible steal from you betcha, Stan, from Imperial Ludum, who had control of the ball. We're seeing a lot more stealing. Nice defending by Team You Betcha Stan. You Betcha Stan tries to clear it out. Imperium Ludum making a desperate shoot for the goal, kicking it back over to Iceman territory. Rejected by Imperium Ludum. Balls up in the air. Let's see what happens. Now, how come none of the players have dropped to the ground and cried? Uh, the these are all men. That's why I said that. Oh, is it going to happen? Nope. Oh. Nice effort, though. Again, this could go either way. Seeing a lot of back and forth. So far, nobody has tried to shoot to the goal. 
Let's see if that changes. And blocked by the goalie. Imperium Ludum. Another shot. Blocked by the goalie. Now we're in nice man's territory. Let's see what happens. Can they get another goal? Ooh, Incredible. nice pass! Incredible! Oh. And just missed again. Nice man miss. with a save. You can really feel the emotions from you betcha stand right now. They're really trying. Got about two and a half more minutes of the game. Now this is usually where the most goals are scored in the last few minutes of any sport event. Let's so, see if it happens. We... Ooh! And wow, you must be psychic because Imperium Ludum again, another score. He seemed to be unsure of himself, but found himself and scored a goal. They were a great distraction, the two of them, to that goalie. Amazing teamwork. This makes it a little harder for you, Betcha Stan, to come back, but it's still very possible. We have a little more than two minutes left in the match. You Betcha Stan kicking it over to Imperium Ludum's side of the field. Continues to take control of the ball, and Imperium Ludum waiting by the goal to stop it. You Betcha Stan desperate for another goal. Imperium Ludum takes the ball once again. But you betcha Stan clears it out of there. You betcha Stan passes it back to their goal. A little, little confusing. Mad dash of the ball. Let's see what happens. And Imperium Ludum making some desperate attempts to get it into the goal, but you betcha Stan takes the ball, sends it back over to Iceman's side of the field. At this point, Imperium can run out the clock and they will win. Or they can go for more goals. We are closing in on one minute left of the match. Still anyone's game. Any black hole can happen. Needleman with the save again. Nice clear from you, Betcha Stan. Let's see if they can uh, continue the momentum. It seems nobody else is on the Iceman side of the field. You Betcha Stan seems to have an advantage, and... Iceman with the block. It was close. You could feel the tension. Back on Needleman side of the field, but it was short-lived. Less than a minute left to score. Two goals to tie, three goals to win. Yes, incredible. Imperium Ludum has the upper hand right now. Ooh, needle mail with the save. And out of bounds. Very rare to happen. And even rarer, a kick in. The robots okay. can't lift their arms high enough to throw the ball over their head. <laughs> it could have been a straight goal from Imperium Ludum, but unfortunately the ball lost a little momentum towards the end. But they're bringing it back. Let's see what happens. Imperium Ludum really adamant about getting this goal. A uh, needle man confused by the ball decides to let it sit there. Incredible pass and shoot, but unfortunately no score. And that's going to be a corner kick. Let's see how well they do. Imperium kicking in. Passes to him. And passes to nobody. But passes to himself. To himself. And... Oh, Needle Man with the save again! Ooh. What? <laughs> a little confrontation between goalie and player. But... You're only gonna see that here, folks. Imperium Ludum once again with the ball. Oh, this is gonna happen! Needle Man with the save! Kick, oh. Kicks right into oh. the goalie, and Imperium Ludum once again scores another goal with 15 seconds left on the clock. Now. I'm always looking on the bright side of things. You betcha, Stan. I think they could come back. You betcha. They could score another goal in 10 seconds. Let's do it, boys. They are making a strong effort over here. Uh, unfortunately, pass to nobody. Another scuffle for the ball. It's back on Needleman's side of the, the field. And... and Ludum with the ball and time out. That looks like that's game. That is game. All right, Imperium Ludum wins with a score of 4-1 to one and continues their hot winning streak. That was an incredible effort by both teams. Let's give them both credit. Yes. They did great. Excellent job to everybody. And 
We will continue this game. We'll hear from Teddy, aka Evil Hippie, for the next match. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ape Arcade, and welcome back, everyone, to the soccer tournament of the games. This is our fourth match between Peter of Tierra de los Humanos Hook and John of You Betcha Stan. Let's get into it. And Peter to kick off. And passes. Attempted slide tackle. Peter is driving down the pitch. Driving down the pitch. Good pass, good centering pass. Oh, but the slide tackle from John. Kicks it up to his forwards and gets moving. Oh, Peter intercepts, sends it back down John's way. Now we're just playing long pass. I remember doing this drill and little kickers. Okay, everyone has found the slide tackle button. Great pass by John, but no one there to receive it. Oh, but manages to get it back with the slide tackle. Passes it to his attacker in the middle of the field. Charging the goalie. Shoots. And Peter's goalie somehow teleports into the air. 1-0. John from You Betcha Stand with the lead. And the kick. Oh, little pause there in the middle, but Peter still retains control, dribbling straight up the pitch, right down the middle into the teeth of John's defense. Oh, but kicks it right to the goalie. Goalie kicks it to about midfield, but Peter intercepts. Tees it up nicely for the goalie, steals it, but the goalie steals it back. John's forward now have the ball. Beautiful centering pass. Oh, but Peter dives for the steal, but... Oh! Okay, Peter's trying to clear now. Moving back up the pitch. Oh, but the slide tackle from John passes it across. Beautiful pass. Excellent cross. Oh, but kicks it right to the goalie. But the goalie kicks it right back to John. Peter and John just passing the ball back and forth. Another excellent diving save, but can't stop the second attempt. 2-0. And the kick. Okay, driving up the middle, but another effective slide tackle. Peter gets the ball on the wing. Kicks it ahead, but John managed to pick up the dead ball. Beautiful cross. Great cross. There's no defender there. Peter's trying to get his goalie across, but again teleports into midair. 3-0. You betcha stand on top. Once again, the kick. Great centering pass. Well, that doesn't even make it to the goalie. John has the ball charging up the pitch. Crosses the 18. Oh, beautiful centering pass, but a wonderful dive from Peter. Player's got to come back to get it. Kicks it ahead, but no one's there to receive. John re-intercepts the ball. No one seems to want it, but... John will take it, I guess. Oh, missed a slide tackle there. Running away from the ball again. But Peter manages to get it. Nice centering pass. Oh, excellent block by John's defender. Oh, we're going back and forth here. Peter manages to get a kick, but again, doesn't even make it to the goal. May have been a header. I'm not so sure. Peter's got it in front, but kicks it right into the teeth of the defense. Oh! And now kicks it right at the goalie. John has the ball in midfield, charging up the pitch. Beautiful cross. Running away from the goal. Is this for the moral victory or just... Oh, excellent save by Peter. 
Hmm. Passing it ahead, dodging slide tackles left, right, and center, but manages to give it away to John. Crossing midfield. Crosses the top of the penalty box, but shoots it right at the goalie. Goalie dribbling, but gives it away. Oh, but manages to save this one as well. You can't slide tackle the goalie. Well, maybe you can. I don't know about Mega Man soccer, but in real soccer, it's bad form. Lots of crosses, but the goalie's there to stop it. Slide tackles. Peter just trying to drive the ball to the corner. Oh, but manages to clear it. But John intercepts again, crossing into the penalty area. Oh, but this shot is just short of the goal. Goalie clears it. Peter driving up the pitch, crossing midfield. Passes it ahead to one of his strikers. Nice dive by the goalie. John clears it to midfield. Oh, Peter intercepts and returns it. Back to playing long long. John crosses it just over midfield. Oh, gets his striker in beautiful position, but Peter has his goalie in an even better position. Hard to tell who has the ball sometimes, but Peter manages to clear it to midfield. Once again gets slide tackled. John kicks it ahead to his strikers. Moves it into the middle. Ah, oh, but Peter intercepts and clears it almost to midfield. Driving down the pitch again. Oh, manages to knock the defender out, but goalie catches it. Slide tackle. Oh, it's a dead ball. John manages to clear it to midfield. One minute left in this opening half. And Peter clears the ball. John on the attack again. Driving from the wing this time. Beautiful cross, but no one's there to get it. So Peter takes this opportunity and clears it again to midfield. Driving the center, crossing the penalty box. Driving at the goalie, tries to cross it up, but a beautiful dive by Peter. Clears it, but John reconnects. Passes it to his wing. Beautiful cross to the center. Looking for that angle, but Peter manages to get the ball away. Driving the ball to the wing, crossing midfield. Peter's charging up the pitch. Dead ball. Peter manages to pick it up. Oh, intercepted by John. Beautiful slide tackle by Peter. Goes on the attack again, but it is halftime. All right, everyone's had their orange slices and water. Let's go into the second half. A little bit of back and forth here to start the half. And right to Peter's goalie. Drives it to midfield. Or Peter's midfield collects it. Cleared again by John to the middle of the pitch. Drives it to a wing and begins attacking the goal. Beautiful cross. Oh, Peter's goalie is in position. Back out the top of the box. Sends it. Another wonderful cross, but a beautiful dive by Peter. And the ball is cleared. Another slide tackle by John. Coming in once again, but Peter manages to get the ball away and clears it outside. John is relentless in his attack here, but Peter's goalie seems to have picked up after those first three goals. Oh, gives it away to John in midfield. Passes it ahead, but Peter clears it. Driving up the middle of the pitch. Oh. Here's John Howes picked up the ball, but giving it back to Peter again in midfield, reinitiating his attack. Dead ball in the middle, picked up by John. 
A little bit more back and forth long balls, but it looks like Peter's got an attack together. Crosses it to the middle, tries to fake out the goalie, but the goalie's right there. Excellent clearance by John to midfield. Peter takes it back, sends it out to the wing. Is driving the end line, crosses it into the middle, crosses it again, lining up the shot. Oh, fake, but the goalie steals it and clears it. Excellent header, bounces off the wall, but John picks it up and is charging. Beautiful cross. Trying to line up this shot, kicks it to the outside, kicks it back to the middle. But Peter steals it right at the goal. Didn't clear it hard enough though. John's back. Oh, right there in the middle. Excellent dive by Peter. Good clearance again, but here comes the attack once again. Oh, loses the ball, picks it up again, and clears it past the halfway point. Ah, Peter's got the ball on the attack. Bounces it off of a defender and right to another defender. Wonderful head on, but intercepted by Peter. John has the ball, just charging the center. Wonderful cross, shoot, but an excellent dive by Peter. Another attempt at slide tackling the goalie. The ball is dead just in the middle of the field. No one seems to want to touch it. Peter searching for it. Gets it, and still waits. Pass back and forth, stolen by John, but then cleared by Peter to midfield. John intercepts and returns on the counterattack. Peter intercepts, John intercepts. Drives it forward again to this spot that no one seems to be able to find the ball. John gets it and is now trying to come in from the wing. Peter's having none of that. Peter sets it up in the box, but none of his players are around to be able to do anything with it. John clears it to midfield. Peter picks it up again, passes it forward to a striker, picks up by another striker, takes a shot, but the goalie is an easy save. John has the ball in midfield. We've got about two minutes left in this second half. Excellent save and clearance, but John picks it up again is driving the net, cross, excellent save. Oh, but intercepts it from the goalie who then intercepts it back and clears it. John has the ball on the wing, crosses it to the center, a beautiful shot, but a beautiful save. After some commotion, it's cleared back to midfield and Peter picks up the ball and is driving down John's end, but slide tackle after slide tackle, they're just trading the ball back and forth. Peter, forgetting which way he was supposed to be going, bounces it off the wall. John picks it up. Slide tackles may have something to say about that, but the ball is cleared back into Peter's end. Dead ball in the middle of the penalty zone. Once again, beautiful shot, beautiful save. John attacking again, but... Intercepted by Peter, but re-intercepted by John, and another beautiful diving save. This goalie from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook manages to clear the ball completely out of the court. I guess we'll have a throw-in, or a kick-in? A kick-in. John kicks it, lays it in a beautiful spot, but has no attackers there to capitalize. Peter re-attacks, crossing midfield, passes it forward to his advanced striker, cuts it back, Gets slide tackled. John charging down the field. But Peter, nope. I thought Peter intercepted it there, and I think John did too. Shot, beautiful diving save. The goalie doesn't know where to go. Another beautiful diving save, but John manages to put this one in the back of the net and leads 4-0. 39 seconds to go here in this second half. Peter's got his work cut out for him.
driving down the field needs to just go for the goal and put some points on the board. Oh, but John gets the ball back. Little passing back and forth. Peter needs to get some offense going now. Has the ball and is charging. Crosses it back to the other striker. Kicks it to no one. Manages to pick it up, but John intercepts. Passes it forward and buries it deep in the corner. Peter picks up the ball. Three seconds to go. John has it. He's making a charge at the goal. And that's the game. At our final score, we have John of You Betcha Stan with four, and Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook with nothing. Moving over to the current standings in this tournament, Rick of Imperium Ludum, two wins and no losses, has clinched a spawn in the finals. John, who we just saw picking up his first win, is one and one. CJ, also one and one, and Peter, unfortunately, in fourth place with zero wins and two losses. That'll do it for me, everybody. Up next, we have match number five with Ian from Born Losers Gaming providing commentary. I have been Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie. And remember, be good to yourself, be good to others, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much to Teddy, a.k.a. Evil Hippie, for bringing us that last match. Hello, everybody. My name is Ian from Born Losers Gaming, and I will be bringing you match five for the event of football here at The Games. Before we get into our next match, I want to take a quick look at our two competitors before we get into this next match. We have CJ hailing from the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory versus John hailing from Ubechistan. Both of these competitors are currently 1-1 one, one in matches. That is one loss and one win a piece. We're going to be seeing how they do against each other and who will be that much closer to a gold medal today. With all of that said, let us get back to Mega Man Soccer and let us get back to the games. All right, getting into this kickoff, we have CJ playing as everyone's favorite Pharaoh Man versus John, who's playing as everyone's favorite Needle Man. Props to you, props to you if you know which Mega Man games these two hail from. All right, getting into this, John is the second player, and we have CJ as the first. Let's see how this goes. That ball is flying. Is this a regulation standard soccer ball? Hello? Apologies for this football event. I will be calling this soccer. Uh, just a little more comfortable for myself. <laughs> just wonder if I should take that official or not. Like, should I be calling this football? It is a football event. It's fine. It's fine. We're like an hour into this video. A anything goes at this point. All right. So far, CJ lining up for a shot. That was almost a spicy kick. Goalie looking fine. Keeping track of the ball. You know, when I was younger, I was told not to get that far out of the goal. But you know what? These competitors obviously know what they're doing. They are here today at the games. Are about to see our first goal. No, not yet. But the goalie spending a little bit too much time in the dirt. But it's fine. Goalie, you know, you can pick that up with your hands. It's kind of your whole shtick. You are literally allowed to cheat. That is what your role was designed to do. Can you believe that? They made a game and we're like, yeah, we're going to let one person cheat. That's crazy, right? Ooh, good pass. An even better save on the goalie. That was actually dope. Hello? The ball sits lonely. Oh my god, a Hail Mary. Not going to happen. Not against a Needleman's team. John is here. John knows exactly what he's doing. The ball sits lonely again. Tinder date stood him up. I don't know. But John is able to reclaim the ball, pass it to a teammate. Another teammate? Let's see what the mix-up is. Oh my god, a double trade-off. Sorry, commentator getting a little excited. Is this game... Are we going to see it again? Another trade-off! Going too low with these angles. So far, we're seeing so much of John in CJ's goal, but CJ was nowhere to be seen. Luckily now, we are, of course, seeing CJ with the ball. And on the other side of the field, John's sitting pretty, able to get the ball. Are we going to have another Lonely Tinder date? No! Yes! We are having another Lonely Tinder date by ourselves. <laughs> it's fine. Oh my god, we don't even know where the date is now. She said Outback, he said Applebee's. They got very confused. <laughs> so the goal had a lightning kick. <laughs> Sorry, professionalism. Here the commentator stand. 
I will say, I feel like if I had the stats on me, it feels like John has had the ball on CJ's side almost this entire game. Good passes back and forth in the very first goal. It is not about the strength. It is about the passion. It is about knowledge. And honestly, a great mix-up going down almost that entire first half of the game to then mix up and kicking it up north. Fantastic play by John. On fire! That is not regulation <laughs> standard. Holy shit. Okay, they're fine. They're fine. Sorry. I freaked out. Or at least seeing that. I was... <laughs> Sometimes we light on fire, I guess. Sorry, it's gotten crazy since I played it as a kid. I don't think I was allowed to do that back then. Ooh, Brett, we're going to see two goals. We have a chance. A whole lot of players here on the field, but a lot of CJ's players as well. <gasps> no! One of the greatest shots we could have seen. One of the easiest shots we could have seen. Unfortunately missed, giving CJ a fantastic lease at life. And getting the ball back. Ferroman wondering, man, maybe I should have stayed in the crypt today. Going for all. Ooh, long goal, not gonna happen. Unless, unless you have a teammate there waiting for you, ready for you, and willing to pick up where you might have dropped off. We are 1 1 in this game. Two minutes and 25 seconds on the clock through this first half. Ooh, and the ball is flying. That goalie sitting idle for a second, got a little worried. Sleep at the wheel, had a long night the other night. I understand that, we all do. Especially when we get hung up on these long, on these just long lost Tinder dates, it's fine. A few passes back and forth from CJ as he just tries desperately to get it out of his side of the field. Working out just fine, but man, another Hail Mary right into John's arms. Ball moving south. Both players here ready to take a good slide, taking control of the ball. And a kick, unfortunately giving up no teammate in sight. But we are continuing to stay on CJ's side of the field. A pass, a goal, another pass, another pass. To the enemy team, but it's fine. We all play a little dirty here in the football event. Another pass to CJ's teammate. Oh my God, John trying so hard, dives everywhere. We're playing dirty today. This is what's going on. You really got to hope it doesn't land on Needleman's head, because otherwise, you know, we'll be training these balls out much more frequently. Good goalie! Able to capture that ball. <laughs> Everyone jumping around the ball, just having a great time. You know what? Sometimes I hear th at the games, it's about having fun. It's about enjoying yourself, enjoying your time. And a fantastic pass. That goalie had no idea who to look for. John's teammates all there when he needs them. I'm looking good, sitting at 2-1. Ball lonely, wondering, did I get set up? No. No, not today. All right, feeling good. Long bomb, not happening. CJ back in possession of the ball. John nowhere to be seen. Except there, John waiting, doesn't even need the goalie. Feeling good, looking better, CJ back in it again. John on the defensive. Honestly, some real phenomenal play coming from the defense of John. Now CJ also on the defense, looking good. We've seen the ball in John's side of the court for the, I think for the most we've seen all game. But just like that, John snags it back. Any teammates around? No, yes! The commentator is a liar! As we move on, 3-1 in the first half of the game is not even done. The Daisy Baby Bitch territory needing to pick up just a little bit in order to match John's tenacity, I would say. 25 seconds on the clock as we get through this game. Not much time left here in this first half. Good pass, good pass back. Even better goal. I am loving these goalies, both showing phenomenal play on both sides. Huge pass right into John's Loving's arms. And then we wait. Where are they, I wonder? Here, on time. Not out of bounds. Who's doing the throw-in? Always my favorite part. You get to pick up the ball, you go outside, boop, you throw it in. 
Kick in, lame. It's fine. Listen, I'm sorry. No bias, okay? Just saying, back in my day, right? I don't want to go on a whole tirade. I'm just saying, listen, back in my day, it was not a kick off from the side. You would pick it up with your hand. You would throw it into... Go on in halftime. Get on to that stuff later. So now we are mixing up the sides. Make sure you keep your eyes on the prize. John, as Needleman, is now on the left side. And CJ, as Freo Man, is on the right. Make sure you keep that in mind as we move on through this game. Wow, ball kicking everywhere, you see. All right, and uh, the commentator themselves also having quite a bit, actually a really rough time keeping up with what one player is on the right, two player is on the left. This is confusing me. I uh, I think that's John, John is the two player. Okay, no, C CJ has the ball. CJ moving out. CJ is Pharaoh, man, we all know this. Got a snake like heads, everyone knows that. Again, these long, what we're seeing in difference of play between these two competitors, what I'm seeing from John is that of a lot of reliance and not, I don't know if I'd say reliance, but just a lot of trust in his teammates. Put the ball out there, trust that a teammate's going to be there to finish that goal. Whereas what I'm seeing from CJ is almost that of desperation almost, despite being you know, almost because with the player one mantle makes you think that I'm in this by myself. I am player one. I am Mr. Mario. However, that is not always the case. Um, okay, okay. Am I crazy or did John almost just score on himself? Are we seeing a little bit of confusion here in the court? Or am I the commentator a little bit confused here on the court? Yo. Yo. Yeah, okay, no, no, yes. Second player is going to the right. I'm sorry, I apologize. <sighs> Major confusion here at the court. This commentator doesn't know what they are doing. There's a reason I am match five and not match one. All right, we here have another kick in. I promise I will not go off on the tirade that I did last time. I will simply wait patiently as we get into this. Kick in, looking good, and a fantastic score. A beautiful score. John, feeling fantastic. Absolutely scoring the right way. I will have you know, that is perfectly correct. I just got a little confused. <laughs> oh, it's the times that you gotta wonder, you know, wh what vibe are we going for here at the games? That of complete professionalism, or that of what you might call Freeform commentary that close to a let's play, uh, but I would not say that we are here at the games. Professionalism is in our middle name. Just because I get confused with ones and twos and lefts and rights does not mean that you do too. It does not mean that you have to spend half this game wondering why I am still talking about this. Let's get back into the game. I never finished my thought. John relying on his teammates, fantastic. Uh, CJ not able to rely on his teammates as much, just a few too many long shots. Trying to think, can I make this work? Can I make this happen by myself? Fortunately, not making it happen. John, fantastic shots, again, relying on the teammate. Are we gonna see a couple passes off? Yes, we are, back and forth. We're we gonna see, goal like a fuse, but long ass arms. Beautiful. Who's, who's, who's playing this right now? Who's on the court that's playing this track right, by the way? Love it, I'm just saying they should be commissioned more. All right, moving on, CJ, beautiful, got the ball in his hands, and by hands, I mean feet, moving forward. Again, these long kicks, that is not how you're going to win the game. You have to rely on your teammate a little more, just like John is, and John is doing a phenomenal job of showing off how well, how much your teammates can matter, but CJ back in it again. A few teammates here on the court, what are you gonna do? Unfortunately, John taking this, Fortunately for the CJ fans, if you're a John fan, you are super happy right now. All right, a little bit of dirty play, a little few slides here or there. The ball filled with helium, not sure how it gets that much height, that much air time. Tony Hawk wishes he could be this ball. And here we go, lying on the ground. Good a few passes. I have no idea who's gonna make the most of this. 
CJ's players are all over John right now, but John with a super well high pass, a kick. What was that? Was that a headbutt? Like that was crazy, right? I know you're allowed to use your head. It's just not your hands, right? Just not your hands, but still beautiful. The ball is out. CJ has it once again, despite still being in on his side of the court. And immediately, the crazy thing is I just feel like John has such good awareness of where his players are, where the balls are, and is always there ready to get the ball back on CJ's side of the field, which is the right side, which I've known from the beginning. I was just testing you three minutes ago. Did you fall for it? Let me know down below. <laughs> so stupid. Sorry. Back into this. <laughs> oh man, where uh, CJ has the ball here at the games. What the? You can do that? I'm sorry. Are you Ferroman or Snake Man? Hello? That was definitely a snake. Wait, all of these different people. Wait, hold on. Are all these different people different Mega Man characters? And I'm nine minutes in just not realizing that? Because, yeah, that was Stickman. Isn't that Electro Man? Oh, my God. Somebody's the captain and has other robot masters in their entourage. Because that's Fireman. That's why he shot a fireball earlier. <laughs> Fireman. I don't actually know their name. Sorry. I play Mega Man 1 through 3. I really need to play 4 through 6. I play 9 and 10. That's, that's nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. A fantastic save by CJ's goalie. I just freaking out. I just saw the snake about. I just thought I really didn't know what Faraman looked like. I'm pretty sure I even made fun of that that dude before. Like, <laughs> snake like head. Faraman's a little weird. Nope. Yep. That's because that's Snake Man. You freaking moron. Faraman's on the goal. Oh, and Needleman's on the other goal. With 30 seconds left on the clock, this commentator has a lot to learn going into match six. Hopefully, he does not get replaced. I will also be commentating match six. We will be seeing what happens. <laughs> you stop trying to set up my own narratives, you stupid. <laughs> all right, John, all John needs to do, John can get extra points for bragging rights, but all John really needs to do is hold on to the ball, play that patient game. We are eight seconds left in the second half, and Fairman needs to find two more points, two more seconds. Can it be done? Finally relying on his teammates a little too late as John wins that match 4-2. What a fantastic match that was. I love getting to see into the players' minds on what they're looking for, what they're working for. And to me, it makes sense that John will be moving on with a fantastic score of two wins and one loss. To go over the current standings, we have Rick at two wins and zero losses. We have John with two wins and one loss. CJ with one win and two losses. And finally, Peter with zero wins and two losses. As previously mentioned, I was unsure if I will be commentating the next match, and I have just been informed that due to my inexperience, we will be handing off the next match to the next commentator, who hopefully knows a little bit more about the football event here at The Games. I am happy to hand off the next set to Max and Lynn of Game Face, two very good friends of my own. Thank you so much for having me, and I wish the next competitors luck. Thank you, Ian, from BLG, for that lovely commentationism. Lovely. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> it was beautiful. Good work, uh, man. Good work. And uh, we are now going to be commentating over the final match of the round robin between Peter and Rick. So Peter is uh, representing Team Terra de los Hermanos Hook, and Rick is from Imperium Ladum. I'm sorry if I completely butchered those names. It's Ludum. Ludum? Probably. Well, as I said, I'm very sorry. But um, shall we get into it? Also, we're Max and Lynn from, yeah, from Game Face. Game Face. I was going to say, sorry. I, to, uh... I got so excited about the match, I just forgot who I was. I'm really oh, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Let's yeah. let's get right let's into do this. It. Let's do this, baby. There's an exciting match on the way in today's game, Mega Man Soccer. Okay. It's soccer, so, but with a Mega Man twist. So Peter is... What color? Peter is representing... I've never seen this game. 
I believe Peter is representing the left side of the court. Okay. Team uh, that Mega Man character there that I just pointed They're at. They're all different colors. Oh, man. Woodman. Woodman. <laughs> You love Woodman. I've never seen this game. So yeah, I, I believe Peter is on the left with uh, Woodman and Net, and uh, Rick is on the right. Okay. I have not played uh, Mega Man Soccer since I was but a wee lad. I have never played it. I emulated it because oh, how else would Pharaoh you play Man's this game? Pharaoh Man's here. <laughs> yeah, I know love... that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which Mega Man is he from? Three? Mm, is he? Yeah, maybe. Mega Man! Maybe not. I'm not gonna talk anymore. Needle Man! You're not gonna Needle talk Needle Man passes anymore. to uh, Spike Head Man, and then Pharaoh Man kicks the man to the man, and Cut Man also kicks. Yep. <laughs> I was, I was yep, like, that's okay. sure. That's okay, sure. Okay, I'm, I'm stupid. I should just be looking at their heads to figure out who's who. Yeah, you mean the 1P and the 2P. Yeah. So I'm a. S the traditional way to tell who, whom is yes. whom. Yes, oh yes, my yes. god! Rick just Go! Did Rick just Go! explode Woodman there? I don't know. I've played this game before and I did not know you could explode know. the goalie. So I guess it, so Peter is 1P? Peter is 1P. 1P. One whole P. <laughs> Fair. That's not going to feed you. 1P will not feed a family of Oh, you mean like mega a men. like like the vegetable. Yeah, like the vegetable. The little P. Whereas Rick, I assume, has two peas. Peas come from a pod, right? Like the peas that you eat. We are, are like... garbage at commentating, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I was. I really hope that Rick is is two p. I really hope because I'm otherwise I'm Rick butchering this. That's needle oh, man, right? Oh, going, going. Needle man's going, kicking it up to the kick? cut man that didn't want to be kicked to, and then Pharaoh man takes it with a low pass. Oh, heading over to the Shouldn't net? It be, well, I guess they're all robots. I was going to say, it should be illegal for these robots to play soccer. That's just cheating. But yeah, I don't think if they're all robots, if it's If they're all fair robots, it's, okay, it's fair, it's fair. Dr. Wily made them all with soccer in mind. We all knew but they were going in. But is Proto Man a robot? Yeah. Full robot? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> hmm. That's fair. Where's Mega Man in all this? Because Mega Man... Mega Man's a full robot, right? Uh, no, Mega Man X is a full robot. Mega Man is a cyborg, so maybe Probo Man is also part cyborg. This has nothing to do with Mega Man soccer. This is a good game of football. Did you see that sweet head move that that guy just did? That, that was, was great. very good. Loved it. One P's got the ball. Whoa. See, oh, he, my God. He, cut Man cuts. I get that it That has to be illegal. Cut Man cuts the competition. Okay. I'm like slowly piecing this game together as I watch it, so I'm really <laughs> sorry about the garbage commentary of me trying to guess. Are you piecing together how soccer works or how Mega Man soccer how works? How Mega Man soccer works, because I just noticed, I was like, the goalkeepers are the captains. Iceman yes. is in that goal. Right. And he's dead. Wow. And that's a goal and a murder. That is a beautiful goal. That was a... a, a, a hmm. I was trying to put murder and goal together and it just wasn't working. It's a mole! <laughs> He's a Merle, Merle. He, scored a, he scored a point for his team. He got a big point. That's what's important. That is. Today. So that one one and one where we got a close game. Oh my god. That is quite a that move. That is brutal. What a goal. I would not want to be what a goalie a goal in Rick. this game. That was Needle Man celebrating the murder. So currently we have. He has the bloodlust. We have uh, Peter with one point mm -hmm. and Rick with two. With two points. That's how I, that, I can count. I'm counting right now. I could count, but I'm not going to. I don't know how they do that one move where they just, like, obliterate somebody by cutting them up. Is there, that... like, a special meter? I don't see any but it, special it, meter. It must be specific to cut, man, right? That's very... That seems good. That seems mm. like a good move. You want that. I'm also curious. Ooh, can what you, a save Can by you Peter. pick the robot masters that you use on the field? Can you kick them? No, can you pick them? Oh. Like, when you pick your teams. I don't know anything about this game. I am so almost like, certain that you can. I'm curious why they picked the characters they did, or do they have, like, special skills that are really good? Same with Woodman and Iceman. I'm I like, know why Picker... Picker? <laughs> I know why Peter picked... I know why picked, Peter picked a peck of pickled Cutman. Of Woodman. He picked Woodman because Woodman's great. Well, yeah, but, like, is there any benefit to him other than him being great? No, that's all you need. <laughs> But they both picked Cutman, so Cutman must be a good one. I mean, Cutman seems great. He can cut people up. Did they ma like? Uh, did they double up on anybody else? I'm not sure. Oh, I see one Needle Man. I see a Pharaoh Man. I see a Pharaoh there Man. There does seem to be a fair Cutman. amount of Cutman. I think it's just Cutman that they doubled up on. Cutman must be offensive. 
Uh, he it? is very offensive. I'm kind of offended. Wow. What? What did he do? Was it his uh, accent in the... He's running with scissors constantly. I was always told not to do that. In the children's television show, Who I remember this? he had I, That's a, the only uh, character Igor. I don't recognize. It's the one Whom? with the needle Whoops. on his head, but not Needle Man. The so other not one. Not Needle Man. But You'll the, see him. The other Needle. That guy. No. That that's guy needle. up in the top left. Oh, I'm not he's certain gone. who he is. I'm well, not certain. he's doing a real... He's doing a damn good job. Oh, yeah. That I can tell you. He's kicking it good. Kicking he's, it real he's good. He's doing a lot of skidding. Proto Man did not bring his shield today. Uh, they That's were uh, okay. banned from soccer back in uh, back in 09. By 1906? Yes, precisely. <laughs> Shields were banned from Mega Man Soccer for... Uh, we're really doing a back and forth here. Are we gonna... Maybe, oh, just... Okay, we got it. Just sit there it? for a bit. Holds it. Holds it. Holds it. Holds it in the middle of the field. Going... Are we gonna get... Oh! 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 A beautiful whatever that move is called in soccer. Pass? Where you kick it and then the other guy kicks it. Kind of like a one-timer in The big kickaroo. But I don't know what it's a good called kickaroo. in soccer football. Oh, Woodman is on top of this. That's why they pick, That's why Peter picked Woodman. <laughs> that's why he Because he's Peter on top of him. this. In Woodman's description, it says Woodman is on top of this. Therefore, good character Ooh. to be a goalie. You want him on top of this. Yes. Why Iceman, though? Uh... He's, uh, he's slippery. He's real cold. Oh, and that makes him a good goalie because he just wants to go home and heat up. It so he's trying to get it freezes over. up the competition. Ooh, he's giving them the cold shoulder. Right, the, as uh, the unknown kicking. Mega Man Robot Master yeah. kicks the ball. Yeah, no. Pharaoh Man picks it up, kicks it over to right field. Oh, Cut Man and bringing it back in. Very nice. And Needle Man's getting there. Very nice move by Cut Passes Man. Passes to Cut Man. One of the Cut Men. Goes oh! to uh, Green. And Woodman is on top of it. Green Boy. Green Boy? Well, he's like green and blue. And I really? don't know who he is. Yeah, oh, Green Boy. We'll call him Green Boy. That works. Green Boy. He's, he's like green. He's mostly green. Pharaoh Man oh, kicking it oh, over. Oh, oh and the bounce Cut back Man by says Cut no, Man. going back to the other side of the field. Cut Man says not in my and neighborhood. And Pharaoh Man is going uh, yes to this side of the field, and Cut Man... Uh, oh, no, wait. Cut Man oh, with a very Proto strong Man. um actually from, left, from oh, right field. Iceman said no thank you. I don't want that in my net. Thank you. We're back in center. Back in center. Passing. We're passing it back and forth. Oh, Needle Man's got it. They say, "Get out of my, get off my lawn." Like the the right half of the lawn. Yeah, exactly. That they're sharing the There's, lawn. Yeah, it's kind of like they've drawn a line down the middle. A lot. It's like a joined times. lawn, but there is a line between their properties. Yeah. They, and he said, "Get off my lawn." And he says, "No, you get off my lawn," and it just happens over and over. They, they drew the line down the middle and said, "You stay on your half of the oh. apartment, and I'll stay on my." Interesting. Half. Is there no out? doesn't look like there is what is it, like always in play other than like i think it does go into the crowd a couple times but on that left side just usually there's an out you're not supposed to kick it too far in soccer do you think commentators are supposed to know how the sport works before they commentate over the sport yes <laughs> <laughs> i know how soccer works you kick it into the net that's on the other side yeah but you add Mega Man to the mix and everything goes all funky <laughs> yeah, i guess it's like they don't even have numbers how am i supposed to know who they are that's number number cut. Cut man. Number cut man. Oh, Ooh. another nice. Woodman is really actually. Kick. Both of them are just like, no, you're not getting in my net. You think the cut man would be able to do a scissor kick, right? Maybe he didn't want to conform to stereotypes. I guess so. So maybe Pharaoh scissor man. Scissor stereotypes. Scissor stereotypes. Oh. That's not me. Oh, somebody got a free ball. They're but, really excited. I bet. Oh, it's uh, it's uh, what did you call him? The Green Boy. Yeah, halftime. Halftime. to halftime. Oh, they're folks. gonna be. Oh, I oh. thought maybe there'd be a halftime show. You know what halftime means, Lindsay? What? It means we switch sides. Oh my God! Peter You're on right. the right, Rick on okay. the left. That's how. It I'm works. glad. I'm glad that I I got that right then. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was very worried. Were you going to be like? Confused? I was terrified that I was like I'm probably commentating over the wrong sides. What a fool! What a fool I am. Hey, I'm sure D the D pad could edit it in post. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> or maybe I am doing it We were wrong. making ourselves look like <laughs> big morons. No, player one. Pretty uh, pretty solid defensive game so far. For real, Z's. 2-1 uh, at halftime. We're uh, it's going pretty well. It could be anyone's game, it really. It really is. Like, the, nobody's got a goal in a while. No, they're uh, playing backsy fourth Z's, as are. it's professionally known in the soccer community. I knew that. I knew that. And you I did. I just didn't want to say it. I thought I'd let you say that. <laughs> Yep. 
Oh, intercepted. Oh, back and forth. At the goal. Some back and forth teas. <laughs> back and forth teas when, when it's closer. Oh, is it? Yeah. I don't remember what you called it. What, what did, did we call, call it? it? <laughs> what did we call it earlier? I thought we called it back and forth teas. Oh, did we? Oh! Oh, my God. Go! Big goal by Rick. Oh, Man that's, Rick. That's, that's three to one. Cementing his lead with three to oh. one. Not three to one, but three to one. Three to one. Make some noise. Come on, Peter. You got this. You can still keep, bring it back. Yeah, give him the backy minutes. forthy or whatever we call it that big, I immediately forgot. Big back and forthy. Backy forthies. <laughs> it's, it's changing constantly. <laughs> it, is, it is. I'm. It's a cutthroat game, you know. It is a Things cut man change. game. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Iceman. Iceman said, "Nah." Wasn't letting that happen. Iceman is just an ice climber. Yeah, pretty much. He's just an ice climber, and Woodman is just a man in a wood suit. Was it Nana without the uh... popo? Yeah, Popo. Is it Nana, Nana, Popo? Nana sans the Popo. Not the police officers, but uh. Na 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 na. Soccer ball. Katamari. Hey. Damasi. <laughs> I'm so sorry, the deep head. I'm sorry. We've we've soiled, we've soiled your your match. The good name of Mega Man Soccer. Is is it is there a good name to Mega Man Soccer? I hope Don't so. Don't people not? It's in the Olympics, Lindsay. It's in the Mega games. Mega Man Soccer. Olympics? It's in the games. You, we're witnessing it live and commentating. No, I want to turn it. on the Olympics and see people dressed up as these characters. You're watching it right now. You're providing. Official, it's a little pixelated. <laughs> you're providing official commentary over the games, and you don't even know it. The games. Where do you think you are right now? I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, oh no! A beautiful goal. Woo, Four to one. That's hurting. Imperial and Ludum takes a. Uh, Big lead. That's a big lead. That's a big lead. It's a big boy lead. Four two one. But Cutman's gonna gonna make it happen. Captain. Gonna slice his way to the top. He really is. He's just gonna go and just snip snip. How many Cutman jokes puns can you make? I don't row? even know if those count as puns as they did just moronic ramblings of insane people. <laughs> Shush it. <laughs> hey, I'm put me in that boat too. I'm doing my best over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's my second day. It is true. It's my second day here. Oh, 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 oh. Yubi. Needle Man. Says, oh, Needle Man just got the. There are no penalties in this game, are there? You can just do whatever did you he, want. Did he? Oh, he did. Did he? The did he? He did. Dippy. Oh, my goodness. You see this trip? They're getting nasty. They are trip oh, 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 what a save. That was a good save. Rick just was not having that. Keeping that lead. Nope. He's going for the gold, baby. Iceman is determined not to let any more goals in. Not not at one. We'll no shutout, we'll but uh I mean one is better than uh more than that. Right? Yes. Yes. Better. Yeah, better. You want less goals on your team when you play man mega it's mega. It's so mega true. Man it's soccer. like golf. In, in a No. It's, it's like not. golf. <laughs> Golf, you want a low score. You're you still, right, Max. It's you just still, like golf. You, it's shit, just like golf. It's not like golf. It is exactly like golf. You want your score higher. High scores. Exactly. It's like an arcade game. You want exactly. a high score. You want less score on your goal, like golf. That's not... Oh, oh my. Oh, man. Another big goal oh by my Rick. God. That's five to one. Rick is uh, doing real good. Rick's wrecking shop. Peter's like, no way. This isn't his first no day at the Mega Man Soccer... Get it in the hole! ...game. Get a birdie! It's not a hole, Lindsay. Get this an isn't, albatross. It's not. Get a hole in one! Use soccer lingo. Slam dunk! Soccer lingo! Slam dunk! Slam dunk! He's going for the big kick. That's... You gotta use oh, soccer, that's soccer lingo. That's football. That's American this football. This is football. American football. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a sport. No, we do have a sport. What? Is Us? lacrosse our sport? Canadians? Lacrosse and curling, Lacrosse probably. and curling, yeah. And they might not have even they're not represented here. <laughs> they're not represented at the games this year, I'm sorry to say. No, that's, that's the winter games. Maybe once they make it into Wait, Mario and lacrosse. Sonic at the the games, <laughs> you'll get some lacrosse and curling matches. I mean, yeah. Maybe. Perhaps. Doing the back and forth seas again? Or? I wouldn't mind if Mega Man Soccer came out with a sequel, Mega Man Hockey. Be down for that. What about like the Mario one? That one's pretty good. Mario never had a hockey game. Soccer game. Yes, Mario Strikers rules. Absolutely. Max loves Mario Strikers. Mario Strikers 
I shouldn't be saying this during a Mega Man soccer match, but it's it's the better game. Don't let Mega Man hear you. He'll be very mad. He will bust me, you will bust. as he does. He'll bust you right in the booty. <laughs> <laughs> the booty buster. I'll get you with the with the lemons and the booty butt. Anyway, 50 seconds left in this Mega Man soccer game here. It's pretty. That's uh, a not a lot of time no. for Peter to I get four I just want to see goals, like him get like five shots, just poof, 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 like rapid fire. Oh yeah, like in like in like in like in Mario Strikers. Strikers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the big charge shot, five. Yeah. Five balls go into the net at once, and uh, one game's comes out. Tied up. One comes out alive. What? Like golf. That's not. No. Go, needle man! I believe in you. Oh, what an interception! Ooh, that's yeah, that's what you over. call defense. Kick it, kick it, kick it, get it, get it, get it, get it! Oh go. no, Iceman! Iceman's not having it, just not at all. Come Iceman's on. a good goalie. Come on. You know, I thought that Woodman would be like the superior, the superior defense monster, but uh, Iceman knows his way maybe around. Maybe this is like goal. a. This, he's getting his up. Although Woodman, Woodman's still holding his own. Like he's he's had oh, a lot to is, deal yeah. with today. Four seconds left in the game. I think this oh, might be it. And that's game. That is the game. That's, we're getting a timeout now a for time our terrible out. commentary. And that's that's it, folks. The that's Rick it. versus Rick Peter match is over. Rick did really good. Peter also did good. I did. Rick. Wow. That was a fun game to watch. I enjoyed. Oh, beautiful. Watching. I knew nothing of it, and I was thrown into it, and I love it. I'm pretty sure that Rick and John will be facing off in the gold match. If this is false, I'm so sorry. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's how it will be going. And that match will be hosted by Hyper Mode, so I hope you enjoy the Hyper final Mode? match. Hyper Mode. Mode. Yes. Sweet. Of the soccer games. Ooh. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm sorry we know nothing of Mega Man or soccer. I know about Mega Man. I'm sorry, Less I don't soccer. know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> next one's more. We'll see you in the next one, everybody. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. That was Max and Lynn of Game Face. Thank you both for your wonderful commentary. Hello again, folks. This is Hyper Mode once again, this time covering the final match for football. Let's quickly recap how we got here. Our first match began with CJ of the Daisy Baby Bitch Territory defeating Peter of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook 2-1. Rick of Imperium Ludum beats CJ 4-0. He continued his streak by defeating John of Ubechistan 4-1. In the fourth and fifth match, John came back with a streak of his own, defeating Peter 4-0 and CJ 4-2 respectively. Rick went out against Peter 5-1 in the previous match, which means CJ will be taking home a bronze medal to the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. This leaves us with Rick of Imperium Ludum up against John of Ubechistan in one final match of football. Which one of them will take home the gold? Let's find out. And Rick, Rick's team will kick us off to start. Passing it over to John's Cutman. And, Cut, and Rick's Cutman taking uh, control of the ball, but then passing it back to John. It seems we're having a, a little bit of a back and forth here. But John's in a prime position and, oh, with a powerful cut shot, he scores the goal, dicing that goaltender to shreds. Uh, thankfully, all of our athletes on the field have been equipped with a proprietary nanomachine that can reassemble them back to tip-top shape in a matter of seconds. It's amazing technology that could help millions, but we here at the D-Pad Games Committee use this strictly for our athletes because that's just how committed we are to the spirit of the athletic competition. Rick, uh, having control of the ball again, is now poised for a goal and... Gives it right back to John, dicing up Woodman to shreds and scoring another goal for Imperium Ludum. Both teams are tied now. It seems like this is going to be a very interesting game. It could, it's still very early to call. We still have plenty of time left on the, on the clock and we're only in the first half. Now, while Tierra de los Hermanos Hook leads with most medals, Rick is the most decorated athlete of these summer games thus far, with seven medals to his name. If he can beat John in this match, he'll take home his fifth gold medal, taking the top spot from Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. John's Gemini man, man picking it up over to Cutman there. The ball is now over on John's side of the uh, field, with John taking control of it with Anchor, passing it off to his Cutman, passing it off to his other Cutman, We'll see if he can do a repeat of the last round, but it seems like Rick has intercepted the ball. 
But John has taken it back. Can he score a goal? Not yet. Now, John's got a lot writing on this game, with You Betcha Stan and the Daisy Baby Bitch territory uh, tied for gold medals. A win here could secure You Betcha Stan's third place standing. Additionally, a gold medal for John would make him the third most decorated athlete this year, narrowly edging out Jose of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. Oh, and once again, Woodman just thrown to the wood chipper by Neilman, uh, scoring another goal for Team Rick, leaving us with two to one. John, John Cutman kicks us off with Rick Cutman bouncing it right back to the center field. Anchor taking control and John intercepting it from Neil, man. Once again, we got a good back and forth here. Neil, man, poised to make a good goal. Let's see if he can do it. Blocked by Woodman. Idle ball is quickly picked back to the center field. Got a couple of chest bumps, bringing it back and forth. John has control of the ball now. He might have a clear shot for the goal. Let's see if he can take the shot. Nope. Intercepted once again by Rick. And sent over back to John's side of the field. Approaching the goal area here. Rick poised for what, I, what appears to be a clear shot. Let's see if Needleman can sink it, and he passes it to Anchor, and Anchor kicks it in for a third goal for Rick. Rick's off to a strong start so far, but it's still plenty early in the match. John has, still has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And with, a, with a, uh, a quick rolling cutter, he scores another goal, bringing us 3-2. to two. That's the thing about this soccer game, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, with these power shots, they could, you, uh, any team could turn the tide of the game at a moment's notice. Woodman blocking that goal shot. But Rick's still very much on the offensive here. With two minutes left on the clock, we'll see if he can score another goal. Or if John can wrestle the ball back and tie the score. A lot of pressure being put on Woodman there. John, I believe that was John. It's a little hard to tell. Kicking it back towards Woodman's side of the field, and then Rick taking control of the ball and scoring a fourth goal for Team Rick for Imperium Ludum. It's citizens cheering, for, cheering him from the bleachers. Looks like it's going to be a good day to feel proud to be a citizen of the Imperium Ludum nation today. And Rick scores another goal, narrow, narrowly curving, curving the ball around Woodman. The gap widening between these two football titans. With less than a minute and a half left in this, in this half, John's got a little bit of work to do to narrow that gap, but we still have one more half after this, so anything could still happen. John regains control of the ball, and he is running towards the goal. John and Rick trading the ball back and forth. And kicking it right back to center field, where Rick's anchor passes it off to his Needleman. Over to his Cutman. John trying to intercept the ball, and succeeding. But Rick chest bumping it back into, into John's side of the field. Where Woodman blocks the goal successfully. And John regains control of the ball. You know, it's funny, with how airborne this ball has been so far, you'd think I'd be watching a game of volleyball, but this is indeed a game of football, believe it or not. 
Ooh, and Woodman did his best uh, block, trying to block that goal, but Anchor ki uh, kicking it back in off the block, securing a six-point score for Team Rick over John's two goals. Now, despite their rivalry in the D-Pad Summer Games, the nations of Imperium Ludum and Ubetristan share a peaceful alliance along with several cultural pastimes. Rick and John themselves partake in their nation's time-honored tradition of taking small creatures encased in small cramped spherical capsules and fighting them to near death. It's a brutal sport that brings up a lot of ethical questions, but my god, the kids love it. We're into the beginning of the, of the second half of this game, with now Rick being on the right side of the field and John on the left. Rick still has a commanding control of the ball and almost scores a goal from halfway across the field. Since it is the second half of the game, I believe we still we have we, each team has another set of power shots they can use this round, if I'm not mistaken. Woodman kicking the ball, the ball back to center field. Rick kicking it right back to, to Woodman. If John wants that gold medal, he's going to need to fight for control of this, uh, of this ball and keep it as much as he can. He's got a wide gap to clear. We'll see if he can't do it in the next three minutes. Rick's Iceman successfully blocks another another goal. And now the ball is back on John's side of the field. Gemini, Gemini Man kicking it back to Cutman. And John picking control of the ball. But losing it to Nealman. Woodman unable to, to deal with the pressure, and Rick scores another goal, this time giving himself a five-point lead over John. And John picks the ball right back. Let's see if he can regain control of it. Rick wrestling control of it out of John. Once again, we got another back and forth with a bunch of chest, uh, chest bumps. We'll see if Gemini Man can't kick it over to Rick's side of the field. And if John can't keep control of it. Rick intercepts the ball with a chest bump, bouncing it back away from his goal. He seems to be poised kick for another goal. Let's see if he can do it. Oh. And unfortunately, Woodman dodged a little bit too far uh, too far down, leaving himself open for Rick to score an eighth goal this round. With two minutes and 45 seconds left, John John's window for victory is, is becoming narrower by the second. He will need to score at least one goal in less than 30 seconds for the remainder of this time if he's gonna if he's gonna stand a chance at winning that gold medal. Now Don has control again. Rick intercepting the ball. John regaining control of it, thanks to Gemini Man. Cut Man heading towards the goal. He seems to have an opening. Let's see if he can't score a goal. Kicks it back, hoping to pass it to another player, but unfortunately, Rick takes control of the ball once again, passing it over to Anchor. 
Anchor kicking it away from Woodman, hoping to create it. And unfortunately, John seems to have scored an own goal. This is a disastrous play for him. It is going to be very difficult for John to recover at this point. Any more goals from Rick at this point is icing on the cake. But John is not going to go down without a fight. He still wants that gold medal and he's not, he's not going to let Rick simply waltz over to a victory. John is still going to do everything he possibly can to narrow that gap. With less than a minute 15 left, we'll see what John is able to do to inch himself closer to that gold medal. John in a good position for a goal, and Iceman blocks it. And he blocks it again. Sending the ball back right down to the midfield. Rick is on his way to score another goal, but Gemini, John's Gemini man intercepts the ball and kicks it right back to Cutman. John's anchor seems to be in a good position. And Iceman blocks another goal shot, and John scores a third goal! Rick kicking us, kick, uh, kicking us off this time. With 30 seconds left on the clock, it does not look good for John. He showed a promising for a start at the first half. But this is not just any soccer, this is Mega Man soccer, ladies and gentlemen. It's difficult, it's brutal, and really pests the tenacity of your team. With seven seconds left to go, Rick is going to try to go for one more goal. Let's see if he can make it. And nope. Woodman catches the ball and told it to make like a leaf and get out of here. And that is time with a final score of nine points for Rick and three points for John. Meaning that Rick wins the gold medal for football while John takes home the silver. While our two players had an even tit-for-tat at the beginning of the first half, the tide quickly turned in Rick's favor once both teams exhausted their super shots. John fought hard to narrow the gap, but Rick's offensive playstyle eventually won out. Imperium Lodum has added a fifth gold medal to their collection, but they are still second to Tierra de los Hermanos Hook's eight gold medals. Meanwhile, Ubechistan takes home their ninth silver medal, keeping a steady third place, though there's only one gold medal between them and the Daisy Baby Bitch territory, and there's still one event left in the D-Pad Summer Games. Now I bet Rick is feeling particularly good about this victory, as he's now tied with Dave of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook for gold medals. But thanks to the additional silver and bronze medals in his collection, he takes the top spot for individual medals with a total of eight. Now folks, with football over, all we have is one final event, the marathon. I want to extend a big shout out to all my fellow commentators for their commentary in this event. To the viewers at home, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to have your pets like, comment, and subscribe. This is Hyper Mode, signing off. Hello everyone and welcome to the final event of the games, the marathon. I'm Rick, your commentator for this final event, and actually one of the runners, that'll be fun. The event itself is an any percent speed run of Sonic Mania, meaning Chaos Emeralds will not be required for any participants in order to finish. Everyone will be using Sonic only with the drop dash equipped. Time starts when everyone hits start on the file select and ends when Eggman takes his last hit. Game overs do not disqualify our runners, but you will have to redo the zone and that's gonna take some time. Our runners for this final event are actually the captains of our four nations, Rick of Imperium Ludum, John of Ubechistan, CJ of Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, and Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook. 
If this is your first time watching a Sonic race here on the D-pad, we actually have a few of these under the D-pad Rivals banner, but this is actually the first time that every runner will have the same character and the same restrictions for the entire race. So, without further ado, let's begin. On your marks, get set, go. Our runners are also not allowed to turn off any of the cutscenes or end them early. We're not actually sure if there's many that you can do that to, but if it were possible, then we would be jumping ahead. So we would need to re-stitch in the video footage to uh, make up that difference there. None of that allowed. All right, so we have our egg robos before transformation as they discover the Phantom Ruby here on Angel Island in the Angel Island zone entrance from Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And all of our runners have been teleported to Green Hill Zone, Act 1, where our race will officially begin. All right, now you might be wondering what is up with the music for this. Obviously, we're running four different races at the same time, so we wouldn't want to have four different copies of the same music all at once. So what we've opted to do is have whoever's in the lead have their music be playing, and if someone else takes the lead, we fade out to the other player. Now, generally speaking, that means that we'll be fading from the same track uh, for all of these, so it hopefully won't be too jarring, but we'll see how it goes. I believe CJ is actually out to an early lead here. Everyone's uh, everyone's getting up to. Actually, it looks like it looks like CJ and I are both pretty close at the moment. I might actually be just a little bit ahead. We're all keeping pretty close pace. John just barely behind as well. Actually, uh, has now taken the lead himself. Oh, and right there, uh, John and I have both entered into the uh, special stage rings, and CJ right behind. Normally, this would be not a bad thing. However, in this race here at the games. We're going for any percent. We don't need Chaos Emeralds. As you can see, Jeff was able to stop himself in time and avoid the giant ring, putting him into first in this very first stage. Oop, it looked like he was going for the bonus stage for a moment, but he's actually going, ooh, dear, going for some invincibility to move forward. Uh, John has opted to wind down the clock for rings. I've opted to just go for the Chaos Emeralds since it's there. CJ is also winding down the clock. I can't speak for anyone else's strategy too much. I, I suppose I could for CJ and Jeff as they were here to record theirs, but I decided for mine, if I get the Chaos Emerald, it won't take terribly much longer than just waiting out the clock. And later special stages, if I accidentally run into another one, have easier means of throwing yourself off the end in order to end it early, which the first stage does not. Jeff getting through Act 1 and beginning Act 2 with our beautiful remixes by uh, T. Lopes for the game. All right, John, now midway through the fir the Act 1 mid-boss. I am starting it out. CJ just a little bit behind. All of our runners very close together, with Jeff about 20, 25 seconds ahead of the pack at the moment. So we'll see how this pans out. But yes, it would seem that uh, CJ and John's strategy, if they go into special stages, is just to wind down the clock, which did wind up taking less time. Uh, than actually getting the Chaos Emerald. As you can see, CJ exited his special stage at the same time I did, more or less, despite entering a little bit later. So, Jeff now grabbing some speed shoes to make it a little bit further along in the level. Yet everybody getting to our little S-bend of tunnels between myself and CJ. Jeff doing his best to keep his lead going. The speed shoes are definitely going to be helping him here. John with a fire shield as well. Also getting the speed shoes. That's going to give him a good opportunity to catch up to Jeff. Jeff navigating the uh, the rare underwater segment, uh, which did not exist in the original Green Hill Zone, but was added for Sonic Mania. As he reaches the first boss of the game, the Death Egg Robo from Sonic the Hedgehog 2 with a few modifications, of course. Now, Jeff they figured out an interesting strategy that I was not even aware of, which is that the legs are not hitboxes. I've been under the assumption the entire time that those are hitboxes. John also facing the boss as Jeff finishes it off, waiting for the egg prison to lower down. There we go. Jeff hits it. John is taking his time getting through a little bit more carefully. It's a good way to... Uh-oh taking some damage as I reach the egg, the Death Egg Robot. Uh, I will admit my strategy... Oh, CJ is also now joining as Jeff uh, encounters Eggman and 
the egg heavies is that their name i feel like i always get that a little bit a little bit wrong hard boiled heavies uh but so it might look like i'm doing an awful job at the bosses uh, at this boss and some bosses definitely give me a run for my money uh as jeff arrives in chemical plant zone uh my strategy for this was just to damage boost the absolute hell out of these bosses try and get it over more quickly rather than being precious with my rings we'll see how that pans out so john now arriving in chemical plant zone as well as jeff works to hang on to his lead here in act one cj and i basically neck and neck here i'm about oh five or six seconds ahead of cj but we're all a good 10 or 15 behind john and a good 30 or so behind jeff all right, John reaching an underwater segment as I and CJ both arrive in Act 1 of Chemical Plant Zone. Ooh, some damage on John there as well. All right, Jeff reaching one of our first little vertical segments. All righty, here we go. So we've got a lot of... Chemical Plant Zone is one of those early stages where there's a lot of different paths available, and it makes it a little hard to tell exactly who's where, but we'll see how this goes. Jeff working his way through the infamous vertical column from Chemical Plant Zone as CJ takes a spill down into the water? It's not Mega Mac, I don't think. The Mega Mac is the blue stuff, isn't it? Jeff nearly drowning for a second there. That was a little dangerous. All right. Moving on forward. As I reach the vertical platform, as Jeff takes a tumble back down, he's going to have to redo our little underwater segment here. We'll see if I can keep my lead over Jeff at this point. And again, it's a little hard to tell where John and I are in comparison to each other. Oh, and Jeff gets squashed. That's not going to be too good. That's going to be... That's actually, I believe, our first death of the game. Oh, my goodness. And gets crunched in a must-be frame-perfect death right there. That was, that was a little bit rough for sure. All right, John reaches the underwater segment as Jeff gets back there for a third attempt. And we'll see who can reach the top of there first. Well, as I reach the Act 1 mid-boss, which, from what we can tell, is primarily inspired by the mid-boss from Ice Cap. Oh, Jeff and John both getting to the top around the same time. Uh, mostly inspired by the mid-boss from Ice Cap Zone, Act 1, with a little hint of Metropolis Zone worked in there as well. All right, making quick work of that Act 1 mid-boss as John gets past the little vertical segment, turns around to get the speed boost, and Jeff just moments behind him as CJ gets to the vertical segment, trailing in fourth at the moment, but can do some work to get caught up. As I enter Act 2, I had debated going into this event whether I was going to refer to myself in the first or third person, but I realized that that was going to feel really awkward for a full-length speedrun commentating on myself in the third person. Sounds a little pretentious, don't you think? All right, John in the Act 1 mid-boss. Jeff just, oh, Jeff just moments behind him as John takes his first death. An opportunity for Jeff to claim back the second place position as they work on dealing with the mid-boss. Alrighty, let's see. Jeff taking some damage here. At time of recording, I haven't decided whether I'm going to add in some sound effects for, you know, damage taken or death, you know, deaths happening as John, oh, and Jeff, side by side, take down the mid-boss. And actually, because Jeff let the signpost fall first. It looks like he's probably going to get Act 2 started just a tiny bit ahead of John. Just uh, maybe even a second, maybe not even a full second. As CJ gets to the Act 1 mid-boss, and I am in the Portal 2 segment of Chemical Plant Zone, Act 2, with the multicolored goop and the bouncing and the whatnot. As CJ takes down the Act 1 mid-boss, and now everyone is together here in Chemical Plant Zone Act 2. This is a storied, storied series here on the D-pad. All of us racing against each other in Sonic games. And it seemed like an appropriate way to close out the games. 
All right, we've got John in the corkscrew segment. We've got a lot of varied... Again, these chemical plant zone levels are a little bit more sprawling and a little bit more uh, choose-your-own-adventure, so to speak. So it can be at times a little bit difficult to determine who is where in relation to one another. I'm pretty sure that so far I'm still in the lead, but it's hard to say. CJ looks like he's actually caught up to, to me pretty quickly there. Like he seems like he might actually be in a second. Though again, it's a little hard to tell for sure. All right. Got everyone making their way through the pipes. All right, we've got a bit of a segment that I think actually gave everyone a little bit of trouble. Uh, there's a section here that is just all sorts of goop. And there we go. You have to kind of reverse course a little bit in order to progress. All right, here we go. Things are continuing forward. We've got John going into our green goop segment. It's actually a solid wall. That's interesting. It doesn't look like one. All right. Corkscrew segment for Jeff, CJ. Oh, and as I arrive at the Puyo Puyo section, the fun little quirky minigame boss of Chemical Plant Zone. If uh, anyone watched our original Let's Play of this game back in, what, 2017, 2018? Uh... That was definitely one of the uh, the highlights of the overall game, something we did not see coming and was a really great surprise, especially having covered both uh, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, which this is clearly the more direct reference to, as well as, ooh, John getting knocked back into, into the little spiral segment there. And actually, it looks again like John and Jeff are basically neck and neck. They are literally on top of each other with John just getting a little bit of leeway over Jeff. Uh, and actually, it looks like CJ is just behind them as well. As I was saying before, we have covered Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, both the Genesis and Game Gear edition, since there are some differences between them, as well as Kirby's Avalanche, which is a port, a licensed port of a different Puyo Puyo game than uh, the Mean Bean Machine games. And there we go, Puyo Puyo cleared as we get through Chemical Plant Zone and make our way over to Studiopolis Zone, the first original zone of Sonic Mania, the first fully original zone. Let's not be unfair about that. So Studiopolis Zone, our lights, camera, action. There it is. Whoop, poor Jeff getting knocked. Oh, and CJ, both of them getting knocked into the bonus stage, the Blue Spheres. Goodness, same time, side by side. They got out of around the same time, too, while John takes on the Puyo Puyo boss of Chemical pl uh, chemical Plant Zone. I'm curious, intern sometimes internally these bosses have names. They're never really stated on screen, generally speaking, but sometimes files will, will name them or something. I'd be curious to know if this is literally just called Mean Bean Machine in the game's files. As CJ and Jeff also arrive at the Mean Bean Machine. Let's see which one gets out of it first. This is a rarity in the Sonic franchise where you do need to perform well at a puzzle in order to progress. John has uh, played, in fact, in a D-Pad Rivals episode. We did Kirby's Avalanche, myself versus him. So it is no surprise to me that John is quickly dispatching of Eggman. Just needs this one last drop. Oop. Almost. There it is. And John advances through to the egg prison to move on from a chemical plant zone. Jeff looking like he's getting fairly close as well. Got a lot of garbage blocks in there. CJ doesn't seem to be doing as well with the garbage blocks, but for some reason, Eggman has decided to stack the vast majority of his beans right on top of each other, making it very easy for that to... And again, CJ and Jeff practically on top of each other. That's incredible. Uh, as they pretty much hit the uh, the egg prison at the same time as well. They're going to be entering Studiopolis side by side as I get to the mid-boss of Studiopolis Zone Act 1. I say Studiopolis Zone. I feel like a lot of people say Studiopolis. But if you'll recall, in Sonic Adventure, there's a level that takes place in a casino-like setting that 
is spelled in a similar way. So here we've got studio and opolis, a, a suffix that has been used in a few zones in the Sonic franchise. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, Gigalopolis from Sonic, I think Sonic Chaos? It might have been Triple Trouble, but I think it was Sonic Chaos. I could be wrong. Uh, but Nat Game uses Casino and Opolis. And one might think, oh, ca casin Casinopolis? Casinopolis? Uh, but you do hear it in an audio line once in the game, and it is Casinopolis. Even though there is only one O, we'll live with it. But here, would this be Studioopolis? Or is it Studiopolis? It's a question for the ages. As we clear, as I clear, the first act mid boss as John, Jeff, and CJ continue through the first act on their way to that mid-boss. And as I make my way into act two, which has more of a broadcast news sort of vibe to it, though those curtains in the background are sure to be getting waterlogged. Someone someone really should go check on that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there's not too much of a musty mold sort of uh, problem there. I can see that being a bit of an issue otherwise. CJ in the popcorn machine, making his way up as John and Jeff are both exploring near some of the backstage areas. John seeming to have a bit of trouble navigating while CJ is warping around and Jeff is utilizing these little pom-pom balloon bouncer things. I, I was never entirely clear on what those were, if I'm, if I'm being super honest. All right, a little Robotnik, a little Robotnik monitor going on there on Jeff's side. CJ back in the popcorn machine as Jeff now uses the scissor lift director's chair and John advances to the act one mid boss. Now this one can be pretty tricky. Uh, it's actually, not, it's, it may look not too serious, but it can be really difficult, especially so right here John's got a bit of a tricky situation since two missiles move at different speeds. So that can be a little bit of a difficult thing if you hit it at the wrong time. Also, the hills come at not very easy to predict patterns. And as such, if you jump at the wrong time, you're going to have a very different trajectory from what you're expecting, which can cause you to land directly on the missile you're looking to avoid. Like that, just like that. And John runs through the second missile meaning he's going to have to loop around and try again. CJ using a spin dash to avoid another giant ring to avoid another special stage. Smart move that will save him a lot of time as I start working on the Studiopolis Zone boss fight. The weather machine, not an official name, it just feels right. And there we go, act two cleared. And it looks like I'm starting to get a bit of a serious lead over the other competitors who are all still in Act 1 of Studiopolis. Though John has an opportunity here to pick up the pace and get himself firmly into the second place slot for the foreseeable future if he can just get this one more missile to take down this guy. I was never very clear on the hard-boiled heavy names. Let's see. Let's see if I can find if I can find the name quickly and not distractingly. Probably not. I'm just gonna go with probably not. Heavy Gunner, that's the one. It always reminded me of like a police officer or something, but. And of course, as I turned away, John managed to have some trouble with the boss, the mid boss, of course. That's how it goes. But here we are with CJ, Jeff, and John all fighting the Heavy Gunner at the same time while I start working on Act 1 of Flying Battery Zone, this is going to be a bit tricky. Oh, Jeff taking the hit there, getting KO'd. Let's see if we can get through the Heavy Gunner. All right, John with two Egg Robos left. Jeff has three. CJ has two. All right, John gets it down to one. See if Jeff can make this one clean. And again, the missiles on top of each other really complicate thing on, things on Jeff's side. But he gets his hit. CJ gets his hit. There we go. Everyone's down to one now, I think. Jeff might have two left. Jeff has two left. All right. John trying to avoid the red missiles to hit the blue ones. Gets his hit. 
Jeff also trying to avoid the red missiles. Gets over that one. Reaches the blue, but loses his rings in the process. CJ also taking a hit. All right, so John is down to the last hit again on Heavy Gunner. Jeff has one more hit left to go beyond that. And CJ with no rings and not picking up any with a very unlucky ride is going to have to get this last hit. John clears the Studiopolis mid-boss as Jeff struggles with a combined missile zone, falls into one, and CJ takes the fall and will have to redo the mid-boss, as is Jeff. Oh, my goodness. As I was saying before, these this mid-boss can be a real pain. All right, Studiopolis zone act two for John. I apologize for not paying a lot of attention to my own run. Uh, it's... I've always been more interested in watching like everyone who's the closest together in a race, and so John, CJ, and Jeff on the uh, Studiopolis mid-boss just kind of drew my eye. And I'll be honest, even as John moves on to Act 2, my brain is like, man, this race between CJ and Jeff, this is where the heat is right now. As I'm working my way through Act 1 of Flying Battery Zone, ooh, awkward land on those spikes, as John works his way through Act 2 of Studiopolis Zone. All right, we have, oh, another unfortunate hit for Jeff, but he gets his hit in, leaving both CJ and Jeff with one more Egg Robo to take down before the Heavy Gunner. Oh, that's what I'm talking about, those jumps on the slopes. Oh, again for CJ. They really can mess you up. All right, so CJ now is down to the final hit. Jeff has no rings. Jo uh, CJ has no rings. And now they're both down to the last hit. This is gonna come down to the wire for the two of them as I reach the mid-boss of Flying Battery Zone, Act 1. Let's see if CJ and Jeff can do it. CJ, oh no! This is gonna be tight. Oh my goodness. All right, CJ gets the last hit. Is it gonna land in time? It does! CJ is clear. Jeff looking to close out this act. Currently trailing. Jumping for it, getting the fourth one, and we are clear. Jeff taking down the mid-boss. CJ getting through Act 1. Myself getting through Act 1 of Flying Battery Zone. As I enter Act 2, approaching being a full zone ahead. And we're going to see if I can keep up this lead. All right, as Studiopolis Act 2... Flying Battery Act 2, everyone's in an Act 2 right now. Everyone's looking for their bosses. Let's see how the race goes from here. All right. CJ has found the Gallop Lotto machine. Has to pump out those balls. Get a grip on those balls and let's see what you get. All right, 20 rings, not bad, not bad. Every little bit helps. In speaking with Jeff, he had decided that if he did wind up in any special or bonus stages, he was probably going to try to see about getting some extra lives just to help things out, make sure that he doesn't get a game over. And the game is a little bit a little bit uh, unclear, maybe? I, I don't know how to put it exactly, but in following the model set by the original games, uh, as John reaches the boss of Studiopolis Zone, uh, the counter on the bottom is your total number of lives. It's not your total number of extra lives. If it says Sonic times one, that's your last life. Lose that, and it's game over for you. So every life really does count. As John is struggling to make those hits, there we go. And he clears Studiopolis Zone and its boss. All right, as I'm making my way, continuing through Act 2 of Flying Battery Zone, where John is about to enter into Act 1. CJ and Jeff both dealing with the maze-like structure of Studiopolis Zone Act 2. There's a lot going on here. All right, here we go. John making his way, and CJ getting thrown into another blue sphere. My goodness. Those things are not forgiving, and they do take up... Thankfully, blue spheres are not the worst when it comes to... You only lose, you know, five or 10 seconds, which isn't great but it's doable. If you get stuck in a special stage, that can be a much bigger problem. CJ and Jeff practically neck and neck right now, literally the same segment of Studiopolis Zone Act 2 yet again. 
These two have been very close throughout this race. John holding on to second while I am losing all of my rings and making a terrible example of myself in Flying Battery Zone Act 2. Trying to find some rings so I don't... There we go. So I don't immediately die. All right. So let's see how this... Ooh, a nasty hit for Jeff, who also stated his intent to try and get extra lives as often as possible from rings, including perhaps diving a little bit off the beaten path to grab some extra ones when it was worthwhile. CJ as well, shooting for a couple extra rings to get a couple extra lives to make it a little bit less tense and not have to worry about game overs. All right, that rockin' tune, Flying Battery Zone Act 2. Hard to beat. Hard to beat those rockin' jams from Sonic 3. T. Lopes does an excellent job with his remixes and reinterpretations. And Flying Battery Zone is no exception. As CJ arrives at the Egg TV station for the boss of Studiopolis Zone. Doing a good job of making his way through there. And thankfully, he gets pretty lucky. And the first roll he gets is the Extreme Heat, which brings, uh, brings Eggman's ship down to you, making those jumps a little bit easier. And with no other real obstacles in the way, you can pretty much just sit there and dunk on him for a little while. John taking some risky maneuvers underneath some of these magnetized platforms and uh, obstacles. I don't entirely know what to call those. As Jeff arrives in the Studiopolis Zone boss as well, CJ making his way now to Flying Battery Zone. As John is nearing the end of Act 1, and I am nearing the end of Act 2. John doing a good job. Oh, here we are at the boss, in fact. John doing a good job of working to close that gap. All right, Jeff now clear of the Studiopolis Zone boss, which will now bring all of our racers to Flying Battery Zone, albeit perhaps a bit briefly. All right, now the Flying Battery Zone boss, infamous for creating or causing to be created. Ooh, nasty hit there. Causing to be created the uh, the sort of Fanon-esque character of Omelette due to a, a the way that the sprites kind of look to everyone upside down of Robotnik there. Oop, and I will admit, I was having quite a bit of trouble with some of these hits with this boss. I kept getting into an unfortunate position where I kept knocking this boss into the bottom corner just the tiniest bit too low to actually land the hit, or it would hit the floor a few feet in front. So this is a good opportunity for our other, rid our other riders, our other racers, to close this gap and catch up. Making a point of keeping my one ring to make life a little less horrible and not risk death. And again on the floor, as John inches ever closer to the end of Act 1 to continue closing this gap. And again, just short. There we go. That's a good hit, though. All right. John outside on deck, dropping down. Classic flying battery zone maneuver. Meanwhile, Jeff getting through one of the outdoor segments that's more reminiscent of Wing Fortress Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. CJ now navigating through the upside-down electrified area that was added for Sonic Mania. All right, as John arrives at the mid-boss for Flying Battery Zone. I'm starting to get my rhythm together on this boss. It will be enough to keep John from catching up even further. And John coming at it with the Lightning Shield, something that I did not have for mine and obviously makes that mid-boss a lot easier to deal with. I was actually uh, kind of bummed that I didn't have one to, uh, to make that a little bit simpler than it wound up being. The Lightning Shield, highly recommend for the Flying Battery Zone mid-boss. And there we go. The boss defeated for me in Flying Battery Zone just as John arrives in Act 2 himself. So John closing that gap... There was a point where I was nearly a full zone ahead, and now we're down to basically one act, so pretty good legwork on John. As I grab one of the hang gliders from Sky High Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Game Gear to move on to Press Garden. All right, let's see where things go from here. Now, we have these little uh, uh, treadmill segments 
in Press Garden that are a little bit interesting. Their physics are hard to describe. Basically, if you touch one, you will automatically be sent into a roll, but you will also bounce, and the direction of the treadmill will determine how hard you bounce left or right in addition to that. Or alternatively, if you try to go left or right, how much they'll be aided or hindered. So it's a very interesting bit of physics. You can also bounce. You can also use it as trampoline. So it's a very multifaceted piece of the level design. It's a very interesting, uh, interesting segment there. All right, as CJ is grabbing the electric shield as well, and not getting hit by the spikes like I did. Smart move. Pro tip: if you're running this marathon, don't get hit by those spikes. It's uh, it's better if you don't. John showing what happens if you do hit spikes. And Jeff also in the area next to the lightning shield, proving that he and CJ remain very close together. Now four zones into Sonic Mania. One third of the way, just about. All right, and they're making their way. They're getting close. CJ arriving at the mid boss with Jeff only moments behind. Although Jeff does not have a lightning shield. So more than likely, this is going to be CJ's first real opportunity to put some distance between him and Jeff. As I make my way through Press Garden Act 1, and John continues up a, uh, up atop, ooh, nearly dodging a giant ring there myself, while John navigates a segment of Flying Battery Zone that it seems to be kind of a fusion of Flying Battery and Wing Fortress and... Uh, sky Base Zone, as well as Wacky Workbench from Sonic CD. CJ arriving in Act 2, and Jeff doing a good job of taking down the Act 1 mid-boss quickly, making it easier for him to catch back up. He actually didn't lose all that much time there. That was some good mid-boss work on Jeff's side. So we'll see how long he starts before, but it's looking like it's going to be about 18 to 19 seconds. All right, about 21. That's close. Oh, sorry. The counter doesn't start until after the logo goes away. So it's more like 24 seconds, it looks like. Okay, not bad. Not too bad. Press Garden Zone also... Whoop, press Garden Zone also a little bit mazy in its design. You can get lost if you're not paying a lot of attention. And, of course, in Act 2, you'll have to try to get frozen at specific parts, but only some parts. If you get frozen in other parts, it actually slows you down. You have to learn... Which ones are good and which ones are not so good? All right, so John, CJ, and Jeff all in Flying Battery Zone Act 2. While I have moved on to Press Garden Zone Act 1, John should be approaching the boss fairly soon with CJ a little behind, now in the Wacky Workbench and Wing Fortress Zone-esque area with Jeff not far behind. Little puzzle segment there to get you some monitors. Doesn't look like CJ is going to be getting that today. As I reach the Act 1 mid boss of Press Garden Zone. Getting through that pretty quickly, but will John be able to get through the Flying Battery Zone boss faster than I did? My money's on yes. And let's be really honest. I did not do good. I did not do well. I didn't do good or well. This is a good or well nightmare. Something like that, probably. Whoop. Little dangerous maneuver there on my part, trying to deal with the buzzsaw arms of the mid-boss, but clinching it, clearing it, and moving on to Act 2. John moving through the... Ooh! Oh, no! John taking the dive during the Wacky Workbench segment outside. That's going to hurt him. He's going to need to really hustle to catch up now. As CJ and Jeff start closing in on him... We'll see who comes out of Flying Battery Zone first. CJ also doing, I have to say, a really good job of collecting extra lives. Granted, John and Jeff have both died a few times, but CJ has been doing an excellent job of not uh, taking too many falls. I don't know if he's actually died yet. And he's collected a handful of extra lives in the process, so he's feeling pretty healthy right now, working his way through Act 2 of Flying Battery Zone. All right, John, hustling hard, working hard. You know, I've never actually stopped in this little 
chair air? Those look like electric chairs. I've never actually gotten a good look at that before. That's a little haunting. Oh my goodness. As you can see in Press Garden Zone, we have arrived at one of those frozen areas where you have to get frozen to advance. CJ, Jeff making their way through the trash compactor segments of Flying Battery Zone. And once again, Jeff literally right behind CJ. Merely two, three seconds behind. They're practically on top of each other right now. Meanwhile, John fending off the Flying Battery Zone boss. Jeff being a little cautious about the electric segments here. But again, just barely behind CJ. It's actually incredible how tight the, the race between these two has been so far. Jeff turning around to grab more rings. And we'll see if he can catch back up to Siege. Jumping up to the spider. May the Sonic rise to meet your spider, as they say. It's a very common phrase here at the games. You'll see it on all the t-shirts, all the mugs and coasters, and the handful of bumper stickers, too. All right, we, uh, wacky work batch, uh, wacky work batch? Wacky, wacky waving inflatable arm flailing workbench segment for CJ. And Jeff, who again, right behind. And John is doing his best on the boss here, but also seems to be struggling. This is not going to help him do much in the way of catching up and moving up from second place. Let's see if he can take down this boss with some speed. If he doesn't, CJ and Jeff may actually catch up with him, which isn't great when you're in second place and looking to advance to first. Oh, and here we go. CJ has arrived at the boss as well. Huge boost for CJ, catching back up and encountering the boss that quickly. As I reach the heavy shinobi, the boss of Press Garden Zone, we now have three of our four racers up against a zone boss. CJ also seeming to have some difficulty with the corners. John also struggling with the corners. Jeff also arriving at the Flying Battery Zone boss. All four racers now fighting bosses as I clear mine in Press Garden Zone. Oh, while well John has to restart, sending him into fourth place during this race. Oh dear, oh dear. That is not so good. All right, well, this is an opportunity for CJ and Jeff to jump ahead as I get sent out of Press Garden Zone and into Stardust Speedway, marking more than a full zone of difference between myself and the other three runners who are all fighting the Flying Battery Zone boss, all in a position to grab onto second place right now and work to advance back up to first. CJ, the first one to take down the boss, now in second place. While John and Jeff continue to fight against this egg spider thing. Egg termite, maybe? I don't know how many legs a termite has. Like, it's not a spider, it's got six legs, but like, you know. Does a termite have six? Does a termite have eight? I don't know. Once again, Stardust Speedway, bit of a, not, not exactly a maze. The first act in particular is actually a pretty wide open level. Uh, but act two definitely has a few segments that are going to be tricky to navigate. Meanwhile, CJ working his way through Press Garden Zone Act One, now in a comfortable second place, while John and Jeff continue to struggle against the boss of Flying Battery Zone. This could be trouble. Oh, Jeff taking down the boss, putting him in third place while John has now slipped and died. Oh no. John now in an increasingly distant fourth place as CJ takes control of second and Jeff slips into third. CJ already in press garden zone, Jeff advancing to press garden zone, myself Midway through the first act of Stardust Speedway Zone, while John is going to take on the boss of Flying Battery Zone again. I believe this is his third attempt. All right, here we go. Now we're doing some damage. Two. That's good. Getting two on the... Oh, but no rings. That's going to be a bit of an issue. Oh, no. 
Oh dear. John getting a game over against the boss of Flying Battery Zone means that he is going to have to restart the entire zone. That is not good. That is definitely not good. John has a lot of ground to make up as now he is a full zone behind, more than technically, a full zone behind CJ and Jeff, who are each also a full zone behind me. That's going to be a bit of a problem. Those game overs are no joke, and if they happen against boss fights, you are in real trouble. That's going to be a difficult, difficult thing to overcome. John has a lot of work to do here. It's, it's, it's far too early to call it, but... It's not going to be easy, for sure. So let's see how it goes. John has a chance to catch up. He certainly has a chance for second or third. First place could be a little out of reach, but it's not impossible. Oof, and if he starts taking risks like those, it could be a bit of a problem. As I reach the Act 1 mid-boss of Stardust Speedway Zone, one of these little Firefly Lightning Bug-looking dudes, and work to take him out quickly. But yeah, we're going to have to see how this goes for John. He's going to have a lot, a lot to answer for and a lot to make up for in his race here. Oh, for the people of Ubechistan in order to make this work. CJ and Jeff still advancing through Act 1 as I'm making my way to Act 2 in the future. Kind of a weird sort of loophole, plot hole thing going on with... Uh, with this game. He goes to the future, but we never really see him come back afterwards. How far in the future is the future? How far in the past is the past? How does that work on Little Planet? Is it little Planet or Tiny Planet? I feel like I feel like I'm living in one of those uh, uh, Mandela Effect situations because I can never for the life of me remember whether it's Tiny Planet or Little Planet, and I don't know why I can't remember. I think it's Little Planet. And I don't know why I keep thinking Tiny Planet. Maybe because of Tiny Chow Garden. I, I don't know. Anyway, John making his way through Act 1 of Flying Battery Zone again. CJ and Jeff both competing, volleying for, jockeying rather, for position. A different sounding sport thing in Press Garden Zone Act 1. We're going to see how this thing goes from here. Here we go. Here we go. John taking a nasty hit on the spikes in Flying Battery Zone Act 1. As I do my best to rocket past most of the level uh, structure of Stardust Speedway Act 2, it does feel a little weird to refer to it as, as Stardust Speedway Zone, seeing as in Sonic CD, if you'll remember, the uh, overall umbrella term for a handful of levels was not actually, I don't think it was actually given a name, or at least it wasn't on screen. I think they're called rounds which is very weird. And then instead of calling them acts, the game would call them zones. So in Sonic CD, this level or the equivalent of it would be Stardust Speedway Zone 2. Here it is Stardust Speedway Zone Act 2. A little food for thought there as CJ fights the Act 1 mid-boss of Press Garden Zone, being a little more cautious, a little more protective of his rings, although at this point it's unlikely that he's going to get enough rings to get another extra life, though if the signpost lands in just the right way, it is, I suppose, a possibility. He takes down the mid-boss as I arrive at the boss of Stardust Speedway, the infamous Metal Sonic fight. This one's a doozy. This one can be quite difficult as it incorporates elements from the non-special, you know, non-Doomsday Zone final boss of Sonic the Hedgehog and, or Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic and Knuckles, really. But Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles as well. CJ advancing to Act 2, as I'm doing my best to not take a million hits. Using the drop dash to the best of my ability, we mentioned at the start that all of our racers needed to use Sonic only and the drop dash as John reaches the mid-boss of Flying Battery Zone. Doing a good job of catching up, make, uh, making up lost time against Jeff at the very least. We got some Silver Sonics from the Game Gear games showing up here as fodder for Metal Sonic. Ooh, missed on that one, but it came back around as we exit Phase 1 
of the boss fight of Stardust Speedway Zone as John gets through the mid-boss of Flying Battery Zone. Meanwhile, Jeff looking to get out of Act 1. He's been there for a while. And here we go. Metal Sonic with the Phantom Ruby. This monstrosity can be a bit difficult as it incorporates some of the more frustrating elements of, as you can see, Sonic and Knuckles' final boss. In a sense, I suppose. So in Sonic and Knuckles, when you're fighting the final, the final phase of the final boss, what tends to have, well, I guess the second to last phase, is a giant Death Egg robot. I, I don't know if that one has its own name. It might. But as you're fighting it, it is moving to the right, and it does have a cannon that it shoots, but it moves a lot slower. So it's a little bit less difficult to get knocked left and off the platform to your death. After you clear that phase, you're able to fight basically just a, a fleeing Eggman who's trying to do his best to get away. And then things speed up a bit as Jeff takes down the mid-boss for Press Garden Zone. CJ continuing through Act 2, myself dying yet again in the pit. John in Act 2 of Flying Battery Zone, a full zone behind. CJ and Jeff looking to catch up as we continue... Squaring off against, I, I believe this this version of Metal Sonic does have a name in the game's code. It might be Metal Sonic Kai, although I think that's just, I don't know. There's a lot of different, like, oh, taking another L. There's a lot of different, like, names for updated versions of Metal Sonic, and they, they tend to confuse me a bit. There's Metal Sonic Kai, there's Metal Sonic Mark II, there's Metal Sonic Neo, I think. I want to say Metal Sonic Neo is the version from uh, Sonic Heroes. But I could be wrong about that. Kai, I think, is the one from Knuckles Chaotix, who doesn't look noticeably different. And then the big red version technically isn't the Kai one. Regardless, I've taken down the boss of Stardust Speedway Zone, one Metal Sonic, marking the halfway point of the game. Six zones down, six more to go. Meanwhile, CJ taking on Heavy Shinobi to exit Press Garden Zone and move into Stardust Speedway Zone. Jeff working his way through Press Garden Zone Act 2. John working his way through Flying Battery Zone Act 2. And I am now entering Hydro City Zone Act 1, which is always a bit weird to, to like watch because it incorporates elements of Act 2 into Act 1 and vice versa, and we're obviously seeing little bits of Labyrinth Zone and uh, Aqua Planet Zone, I think, from Sonic Triple Trouble with the bubble and stuff. So there's a lot of different... This game does a really good job of blending elements together in order to get what it's going for. CJ still fighting a, uh, Heavy Shinobi. I was going to call him Egg Shinobi. There we go, clearing it, making his way out of Press Garden Zone and will be advancing on to Stardust Speedway. John getting knocked into another special stage. That's not good. John appears to be looking for anywhere that he can exit or it just is generally trying to wear down the clock. Unfortunately, shy of hitting obstacles, nothing is going to make your rings go away faster in a special stage. It is a bummer and a lot of lost time that he cannot afford to lose. CJ now entering Stardust Speedway Zone Act 1. While Jeff continues through Press Garden Zone Act 2, taking a lot of damage. Boy, I wish I had eight eyeballs so I could watch all four screens at the same time and give you a really good active report of everything that's going on. Doing what I can. I don't have a lot of sound cues. That might have been my mistake. I could have for the commentary left all of the uh, the, audio, the game audios in and then uh, taken them out in post. Might have made it a little bit easier to pay attention to everybody at once. Oh well, them's the breaks. That's how the internet works. You learn some stuff, you do some stuff, and then you get loves. Because you're older and a little bit incontinent and, you know. Anyway, back to the games. Making my way through Hyper City Act 1. John, back to... The fiery pillars here in Flying Battery Zone. 
Ooh, almost drowning there in Hydra City Zone. We're now about, we're approaching 50 minutes into our race. Continuing to make our way forward. All right, the estimated time that we all kind of were, were going in and expecting were varying, you know, varying amounts between two to three hours was kind of our, our assumed window for this game. And that's mostly going off of uh, previous Let's Plays, previous, I, I did a speed run of this, 100% um, speed run of this for Sonic Weekathon. But it's kind of hard to gauge how you would do speed-wise subtracting the special stages, but also subtracting Supersonic. It makes it a little hard to estimate without, you know, without something direct to compare it to. So we kind of went at this thing two to three hours. S uh, Jeff, having cleared Heavy Shinobi, is now also moving on to start a Speedway Zone Act 1, which now puts John more than a full zone behind CJ and Jeff, who are also a full zone behind me. This is starting to spread out. This race is starting to widen. We're starting to see a bit more separation from among our racers. All right, we're getting around to the Act 1 mid-boss for Hydro City Zone. As CJ should be starting to approach the Act 1 mid-boss of Stardust Speedway Zone. We've got a little segment, a little escape segment here that's sort of a combined version of Hydro City Zone's escape sequences and the Labyrinth Zone boss where you have to ascend a flooded segment in order to chase down Eggman, though technically you don't really have to chase him down. You can just, you know, not drown and you'll be good. Arriving in the Eggmobile to take on Eggman, CJ taking on the Act 1 mid-boss while Jeff continues to navigate the stage and John works his way through Flying Battery Zone, more than six minutes into the act. Really gonna need to pick up the pace in order to continue here. Getting his lightning shields from the electric chairs. Someone from the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention was a document, wasn't it? I mean, it was a meeting and then it was also a document. Like the name of the document that has resulted. Anyway, he's fighting the boss of Flying Battery Zone. We'll need someone from Switzerland, let's just say that come and uh, see what's going on in Eggman's uh, little ship there. With the lightning shield, John no longer has to worry about the electric blasts from the boss as CJ takes down the mid-boss. Ooh, well, so much for the lightning shield. Oh, uh, start a speedway zone as I continue to work on the mid-boss of Hydra City Zone. I believe actually the only mid-boss in the game that features Eggman. I could be wrong. I might be wrong, but I think it is the only mid-boss that Robotnik participates in in the entire game. All right, Jeff, low on rings. CJ, making it to Act 2. Myself, making it to Act 2 of Hydra City Zone. John, working his way through the boss of Flying Battery Zone. I'm gonna see how this goes from here. We'll see if the, lo if the lead will widen or not. It's CJ's game to make at this point. If he wants to take gold, he's going to have to work and grab it. He's going to have to hustle, ladies and gentlemen. And everyone in between and outside as well. Alright, CJ grabbing the rocket. A firm grip on that rocket is what you really need in order to blast off appropriately. Jeff doing some careful maneuvering on the platforms. John now over eight minutes into Flying Battery Zone Act 2, actually becoming a bit of a worry. There we go. I was about to say, in each of these acts in this game, you're only permitted 10 minutes before you time out. That would not be a good place to be. Titanic Monarch Zone is so huge for its second act that when you fight the boss, the timer actually resets. All right, John finally escaping Flying Battery Zone and making his... Excuse me, making his way to press Garden Zone. He needs to clear the entirety of this to reach Stardust Speedway Zone, where Jeff is in Act 1, CJ is in Act 2, and I am a full zone ahead of that in Hydro City Zone Act 2. We're starting to see our final positions firm up a little bit. 
as Jeff and CJ approach the halfway point of their runs. Jeff now arriving at the mid at the mid boss of Stardust Speedway Zone. We'll see how he handles this one. John making his way through, dealing with some of the buzz saws. Jeff dealing with our little lightning bugs, letting that one go to tell the tale. As CJ arrives at the boss of Stardust Speedway Zone, Metal Sonic. Let's see how he does as he has to race him first in a little segment reminiscent of the Stardust Speedway boss encounter. I wouldn't call it a boss fight exactly, but it's more of a boss encounter from Sonic CD. And once again, as with Stardust Speedway in Sonic CD, a lot of unfriendly terrain to slow you down as Jeff takes down the Act 1 mid-boss and CJ makes his way to the first phase of the actual battle against Metal Sonic. All right, Jeff is now headed to the future to join CJ in Act 2, though it will be a short-lived reunion as CJ should be dealing with this relatively quickly and moving on to Hydra City Zone. You gotta be careful how you defeat the Silver Sonics. If they're not curled up into a ball, when you hit them, they will explode into energy, which you can use to hit Metal Sonic, but the horizontal position that you want to do this is different than where you'd want to be if he curls up into a ball. If he's in a ball, you want to hit him more or less right in the center. Usually works. Every once in a while, it bounces off in a strange way. CJ having some interesting difficulties here. And if they're in the corner and not curled up, that is the correct space to do that. CJ having some real difficulty with the angles here. It's kind of confusing. Having done that run myself, obviously, I didn't have that be an issue. If they were curled up in the center, a quick spin dash was usually the solution there. All right, taking down the first phase of Stardust Speedway as I reach the boss, sort of the phase one, the prologue encounter for Hydro City Zone. Jeff making his way through Stardust Speedway Zone Act 2. John making his way through Press Garden Zone Act 1. And we will see how this continues from here. Some fun little blocks. It's funny, those are blocks from... Uh, those are little, those little like angry face looking bits are blocks. Oh, CJ taking the fall against Metal Sonic. Those blocks are actually from Hydro City Zone, but for some reason my brain always makes me think of the more owl looking. They look kind of like owls or angry faces, like angry man faces, I guess, from uh, Labyrinth Zone from Sonic 1. I'm actually a little surprised they didn't find a way to like mix and match those in here. But regardless, here we go. I have now reached the second, the real battle here as CJ continues his fight against Metal Sonic, playing it a bit safer than I did, and it seems to be working out generally for the best here. Oop, doing his best not to get knocked backwards, though he is gonna lose his rings. That's gonna make this a lot more tense of a fight from here on out. Oh, is he gonna do it? Yes! Oh my goodness, a frame-perfect jump from CJ in order to clear the boss. That was a close one, as Jeff arrives at the race with Metal Sonic. And I take down the boss from Hydra City Zone in order to advance to Mirage Saloon. All right. John continuing through Press Garden Zone Act 1. Still needing to make up a lot of space, and honestly, it is seeming like Jeff and CJ are starting to pull away from him. So he's got a lot of work to do in order to make this work. All right, Hydra City Zone Act 1 for CJ, Mirage Saloon Zone Act 1 for me. We're now moving on. If anyone watched the Sonic Weekathon race, you'll know that if you let the Caterkiller that hops out of Heavy Magician's hat hit you at the end of this stage, it will actually soft lock the game. The internal logic, as far as we can tell, assumes that the battle has begun because you took damage, and it won't actually generate the mid-boss itself. Instantiate, I feel, is the, is the better word than generate there. Jeff moving quickly through the first phase of the Metal Sonic fight. Doing a good job working to close that gap again between him and CJ. They got a little bit apart here, but he's got that lead down to only about two minutes. If Jeff can make his way through this, uh, through this boss fight with Metal Sonic quickly, then he stands a chance of really making up some lost time. John, now fighting the mid-boss of Press Garden Zone. Heading to the far right. 
So this saw-toothed dude will have his blades break if they hit these fully colored in boxes, the orange and green ones, but if he hits the light blue ones, it won't do anything. John now appears to be going for the damage boost maneuver, although it is not appearing to work out particularly well. You gotta use those damage boosts to your advantage. There we go, get in there, get some hits. All right, we got one. This could take a little while as Jeff gets through Metal Sonic real, real quick. Definitely helping him out here. Definitely giving him an opportunity to make up some lost ground and some lost time as I make my way to the train in Mirage Saloon Zone Act 1. All right. John still playing it careful here against the mid-boss of Act 1 of Press Garden Zone. I guess it's the mid-zone, the mid-boss of Press Garden. Less than of Act 1. I'll be honest, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen because this is a long race, but during CJ's run, we've discovered something fairly interesting. Uh, and it's only doable if you have the combi ring because it's the only way to have enough rings reclaimable. But in Sonic Mania, if you have more than 100 rings, there's John getting through the mid-boss as I reach the mid-boss of Mirage Saloon Zone as well. Uh, if you collect 100 rings, you will get an extra life. If you lose that 100 rings, you apparently can get 100 rings again to get an extra life. And more than that, if the combi ring... So the combi ring divides your rings into eight. So if you had 200 rings, you would get 25... You would have eight rings that fall out of you that are worth 25 rings apiece. If you have more than 100 rings and you lose them and collect them again with the combi ring, you will gain another extra life. The game resets your extra life counter when you hit zero rings. It's very interesting, did not know that. Anyway, John into act two of Press Garden Zone. I'm making my way into act two of Mirage Saloon Zone. Dropping that signpost on Heavy Magician's hat. She loves it, it's all part of the show. It's great, don't worry about it. CJ making his way through Hydra City Zone Act 1. Should be approaching the mid-boss fairly soon. Alrighty. And here we go. Mirage Saloon Zone Act 2. Jeff making his way through Act 1 of Hydra City Zone. Let's see how this goes. Alright, CJ in the bubble segments. John working to navigate the icy regions of Press Garden Zone Act 2. It's very dangerous out here, hard to get your footing, lots of frozen spikes, lots of frozen ice spikes that are not going to be very charitable to work with. Let's let's put it that way. You really don't want to be uh, messing with them too much. I love the ice bumpers, by the way, the way those just break and send you upwards. I'm not entirely sure what John is aiming for here. Because he needs to ascend out of this pit in order to continue. Have to jump on these platforms and keep moving. Nope. Still on the spikes. There you go. And he's out. He has made it. Continuing on in Press Garden Zone Act 2. Let's continue. I love the big cartoon guns in Mirage Saloon Zone. Though I'll admit, this segment had me a little bit stuck for a while. It wasn't 100% clear exactly where I was going. As CJ arrives at the mid-boss of Hydro City Zone with Jeff almost exactly two minutes behind him, at least on the clock. He entered Hydro City Zone two minutes behind CJ. We'll see if he can catch up, if he can make any up, uh, make up any of that lost ground as I still am just wandering around the same area of Mirage Saloon, deciding to go left and see if that'll do me any good, and it kind of does. Probably the wrong way to go, but ultimately, forward is forward. CJ now using the Egg Mobile against Eggman. Let's see how this goes. All right, and John getting frozen to make his way to the Heavy Shinobi. To his credit, John is making good progress here. He is actually doing a good job with these zones. I would have to look at the individual level splits to say for sure, but I would say that he's actually doing pretty well, given <coughs> given how, uh, how he is positioned in the race so far. CJ still fighting the mid-boss. 
kind of difficult to maneuver with the bombs that you drop, the bombs that Eggman drops. I've now arrived at the Act 2 boss of Mirage Saloon Zone. Getting to see some old fan favorites like Knack the Weasel, a.k.a. Fang the Sniper, as he's known in Japan. We get Bean the Dynamite. Slash Bean the Dynamite Duck is how I've always known him, but I think he's just Bean the Dynamite. We get Bark the Polar Bear. It's great to see some of these familiar faces. John struggling a little bit with the Heavy Shinobi. Gonna have to get those clean hits. There we go. In order to get through this quicker... But those thrown star enemies from Metropolis Zone of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 are not making his life any easier as he loses his rings and, oh no, Spike coming right for him. Kind of unavoidable at that point. I have beaten the boss of Mirage Saloon Zone Act 2. Moving on to Oil Ocean Zone as CJ clears the Act 1 mid-boss of Hydro City Zone. Moving on to Act 2. And here we go, my definitely not favorite zone of Sonic 2. Remixed into something a little bit better here in Sonic Mania. I have to give, this is probably, if I had to give a most improved award, it would go to Oil Ocean Zone here in Sonic Mania. It's a much more bearable version of the level. The music is better. Act 2 even adds in a little Sandopolis Zone flair to it that just blends so seamlessly. It's a really incredible, oh no, oh no, and there we go. I think that might be my, f no, it's not my first death. I died a whole bunch against Metal Sonic. Probably my first non-boss death, though. Getting crushed in those pipes here in Oil Ocean Zone is a real danger, and it's very easy to do with how they arrange the spikes around the pipes. It's very devious. John fighting still against Heavy Shinobi as Jeff arrives at the mid-boss fight. Hydra City Zone. Now, I'm not sure if John is aware, as I wasn't either at the time, these star enemies, when they're on the ground, can actually be defeated. You can, oh, taking the fall again. You actually can jump on them to defeat them once they're in the ground. Which is interesting because they are not defeatable normally in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, so it may not be the most obvious step to take. Jeff making his way now. He's beaten the Act 1 mid-boss, advancing to Act 2, while John struggles to deal with the mid-boss of Press Garden Zone. So he can head off to start a speedway zone before heading off to Hydro City Zone. He is now basically two zones behind CJ and Jeff, who are both now in Hydro City Zone Act 2, who are themselves almost two zones behind me up in, up in Oil Ocean Zone. So we're starting to get a pretty wide berth here. Uh, John in the fifth zone, myself in the eighth zone, is definitely becoming quite the, the gap to make up. John does it, though. He clears the boss of Press Garden Zone so he can finally advance to start a speedway as it is revisited from Sonic the Hedgehog CD. As you can see up top there, I'm starting to get a little bit antsy with my race and getting a little bit um, impatient, let's say. Oil Ocean Zone, like I said, has never been one of my favorites, so I'm getting a little bit frazzled trying to get there. And normally by this point in the game... We usually have Supersonic, which means that this boss is usually a complete joke. You don't have to work. You don't have to worry about getting damaged. You don't have to worry about the height of your jump. He also fades into the background during this. So you're just kind of trying to get out of the way there. There it is. Also trying not to get crushed. I don't think you actually can get crushed there. I think it's uh, it's a trick to get it so that if you jump, you take damage. But it's not so much a uh, uh, a crush worry. Getting through Act 1, moving on to Act 2, as John is making his way through the first act of, of Stardust Speedway Zone. And CJ getting ever closer to the boss of Hydro City Zone as Jeff works to catch up. He's fallen a little more behind. He's lost about 15 seconds on CJ, but that's not that's far from impossible to catch up. As I get to Oil Ocean Zone Act 2, which adds some elements from Sandopolis Zone Act 2. Sandopolis, another one with the Opolis ending on it, actually. Got Metropolis Zone, we've got Sandopolis Zone, Casinoopolis, Studiopolis Zone, Gigalopolis, we got a whole bunch of them. But yeah, adding the uh, the little pole switch, I don't entirely know what to call that, uh, from Sandopolis Zone Act 2. In Sandopolis Zone, the idea is it keeps you from being attacked by ghosts because that turns on the lights, I think, is how that works. Whereas here, it is... Getting rid of the pollutant smoke. 
I guess is the best way of putting that. If you if the smoke is allowed to fully appear, then you will start wicking away rings. It will not kill you, but you will steadily lose rings one by one. As CJ takes on the first phase of the Hydra City Zone boss, I make my way a little bit further in Oil Ocean Zone. Oil Ocean Zone Act 2. John making his way through Stardust Speedway. Getting hit by the spiked balls, not so good. You want your balls to be not spiked if you can. And if they are spiked, you probably don't want to run into them or run into things with them. It's not advised. Uh, the official doctors here at the games and John, oh dear. John learning right up close that those dash panels in Stardust Speedway Zone are bi-directional. As I take another death in Oil Ocean Zone and CJ faces the actual boss of Hydra City Zone. John entering the Donkey Kong Country barrel style segment of the level. Trying to avoid the spikes, but they really are all over the place in this stage. CJ working to finish off the boss of Hydra City Zone. Oh, and gets caught in the turbine again. So the boss here, the, the mid-boss from Act 1 is a is sort of an inverted version of the fight from Act 2 of normal Hydra City Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 3, whereas the boss of Hydra City Zone here is sort of a repurposed version of the mid-boss from Act 1 of Hydra City Zone, but it moves faster, and it gets the turbine started faster. I think the actual machine itself is larger, too, so it's just bigger in every way. CJ with a great little jump off the wall to hit the Egg Prison a little early, save himself some time as he is preparing to leave Hydra City Zone and make his way to Mirage Saloon Zone. All right. Here we go. I believe I'm actually coming up on the boss of Oil Ocean Zone. Nope. Every time I see that segment, I think it is because there's a lot of pipes in front of everything. As I'm thinking about the boat and decide against it, continuing forward. John moving through Stardust Speedway Zone. CJ now in Mirage Saloon Zone. Jeff getting close to the end here of Hydro City Zone, now facing the boss battle. Still doing a pretty decent job of keeping pace with CJ. He's only around two minutes behind. This boss, this boss battle might put him a little further behind than that. I'm getting aggressive on the boss of the of Oil Ocean Zone, deciding to throw caution to the wind. Diving in there. Seeing what we can do. Alright. We've got John up against the mid-boss of Stardust Speedway Zone. While I'm fighting the boss of Oil Ocean Zone. And Jeff is fighting the boss of Hydro City Zone. Which is a complicated sentence that wouldn't have made any sense prior to 2017. And we're clear of the Oil Ocean Zone boss. Which means that I will now be moving on to the last quarter of this game, entering Lava Reef Zone. John getting through Act 1 of Stardust Speedway Zone. He'll be moving on to Act 2 as Jeff gets ready to take on the boss of Outer City Zone. As CJ works through Mirage Saloon Zone, which is not only a level design send up to Sky Chase Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 2, but also, if you listen carefully, there's actually a motif from Sky Chase Zone that makes its way into the Act 1 theme of Mirage Saloon Zone. It's a very nice touch. Well crafted T Lopes. All right, John making his way through Act 2. Here in the future of Stardust Speedway. As I am getting through Lava Reef Zone Act 1, CJ approaching the end of Act 1 of Mirage Saloon Zone. And Jeff nearly... Ooh, those spikes for CJ. And Jeff nearly done with the boss. Oh, dear. That's going to cost him right there of Hydro City Zone. This one's a... This boss is definitely a lot harder. There we go. A lot harder without the Insta Shield. The Insta Shield makes this boss substantially easier to fight. Because you can Insta Shield and hit him through his little rocket spinning thing that he does there. You don't have to worry so much about damage. If you take damage, it's fine, because you can get a couple extra hits in there anyway. However, Jeff now making his way to Mirage Saloon Zone Act 1, as CJ is now fighting the mid boss of Mirage Saloon Zone. 
John continuing to make his way through Act 2 of Stardust Speedway as I am around a minute and a half into Lava Reef Zone, Act 1. All right, Jeff is a little under three minutes behind, but this mid-boss could make or break some of that difference. If you're not... If you're a little unlucky, which it seems like CJ is right here, this worm is just going to keep diving into the background and the foreground and not make any lateral moves. And that can make it a lot trickier. The timing on there is, uh, is definitely more difficult than when he moves left or right across the entire screen. It does make the mid-boss fight a bit chunkier of an experience. That is absolutely the case. All right. So let's see. John has now arrived at the Stardust Speedway Zone boss. Oh, as Jeff takes an unfortunate dive in Mirage Saloon's on Act 1, that's probably going to erase the time that he had a chance to catch up here as CJ fights the mid-boss. It's not impossible for him to catch up, but that is going to hurt his chances quite a bit as CJ takes down the mid-boss. Oh, as Jeff takes an unlucky kill again against one of our little Aztec Eagle situations there, which now puts CJ pretty firmly and a full act ahead of Jeff. John continuing to deal with Metal Sonic, but seems to be trying to fight him directly. Oh, that's not how it works, John. No, keep moving. Do not engage. You're going to fight him later. You don't want to fight him yet. CJ, oh, geez. Oh, boy. Dash panel not doing him any favors once again. CJ now arriving in Act 2 of Mirage Saloon as Jeff is working to avoid the Eagles and the little droppy boys, whatever you want to call them. John amazingly does make it up to the first phase battle. I was really worried that an errant dash from Metal Sonic was going to do him in there, but he actually makes it through with some skillful platforming at the zero hour. But he is going to have to deal with the Silver Sonics in order to advance. As I make my way to the first act mid-boss, oh, and Jeff restarting Act 1 again. These restarts are really going to cost him. I'm working on the Act 1 mid-boss for Lava Reef Zone, which is a repurposed version of the mid-boss of Lava Reef Zone itself. Actually, even as I say that, is that even true? I don't think... I think you see that thing in the stages, but do you ever actually fight it for real? Because the actual mid-boss is... Oh, no, and John gets no gets knocked out as well. Oh, and he has to redo the race segment, too. That's not going to be good. The, uh, the mid-boss of Lava Reef Zone in Sonic and Knuckles is the two big wiggly knobs that we saw already in Oil Ocean Zone, along with the hand that will make a comeback for the Death Egg Zone boss. But I don't think the little the little spiky dude, because he falls into the lava and, uh, and gets destroyed, I think. Anyway, Lava Reef Zone Act 2... We're now beginning this as Jeff is working to make his way past his best spot in Mirage Saloon Zone Act 1. CJ making his way through Mirage Saloon Zone Act 2. Moving very quickly, in fact. John looking to make his way out of this battle with Metal Sonic. It's given everyone a bit of a hard time in this run. Oh dear, Jeff out of rings again. Gonna need to pick up something before somebody... There we go. Gets a hold of you. All right. John still struggling a bit with the fight here. He's gonna need to figure out the mechanics quickly if he wants to have a chance of taking down Metal Sonic. I don't know if he's noticing that he's not doing any real significant damage here. That's not gonna be very good for him. Sooner or later, he is going to have to figure out how the energy balls work. As CJ, fighting the boss of Mirage Saloon Zone, making his way through there, up against Heavy Magician, taking on fan favorites, who, uh, alongside Mighty, the Armadillo, and Ray the Flying Squirrel, were seen on missing posters in Sonic Generations. Mighty and Ray, of course, being added back into the fray as playable characters in Sonic Mania Plus, as John is going to have to take on Metal Sonic again, now with his last life. This is getting very dangerous. John already has a game over under his belt, 
that has caused him to fall significantly behind. He is two, at this point, essentially two zones behind. He's a, he's a zone and a half behind Jeff as they're both in their boss fight. CJ has finished his boss fight from Mirage Saloon Zone, so he's going to be moving on to Oil Ocean Zone, so he's now more than two zones ahead of John. So once again, we're seeing our first, second, third, and fourth place runners all spreading out, but holding on to their positions. CJ has managed to pull ahead of Jeff by a pretty significant margin at this point, and it's only going to get harder as the race goes on to keep that lead, or sorry, to, to make up that difference between them and take down CJ's lead. John still, there we go, starting to at least work the energy balls. Though it doesn't seem that he's figured out the spin dash variant of this attack. Still just trying to jump on them right away. I don't think he's quite noticing the correct maneuver here. It's not looking great. Jeff making his way through, uh, making his way through. Oh, John, very, very lucky with that. That could have been much, much worse. He's still going for the jumps. Jeff making his way through the act one mid boss of Mirage Saloon Zone. Oh boy, this is getting tight. John is gonna have to be incredibly careful with the boss here. Ooh, CJ narrowly missing getting squashed in Oil Ocean Zone. The old fire pipe trap. Jeff starting Mirage Saloon Zone Act 2 as John collects some rings and advances on to the actual boss fight of Stardust Speedway Zone. And he's only got one chance, so he had better be on his game. Let's see how it goes. Immediate damage up against the Giant Metal Sonic as I start taking on the boss of... Oof, the boss of Lava Reef Zone. John struggling there. I do appreciate that the boss of Lava Reef Zone... That fight takes place in, essentially, Hidden Palace Zone. Perhaps not in name, but oh no, John! Taking the dive behind Metal Sonic, causing him to get a second game over. This is looking pretty grim for John. Definitely not good. As he enters back in, he will have to restart Stardust Speedway as CJ once again manages to just barely dodge getting crushed in the fire pipe trap as I take down Lava Reef Zone's boss and advance to Metallic Madness Zone. Anyone watching the Sonic CD run of Sonic Weekathon will know how I feel about Metallic Madness Zone, at least in terms of its finishability in certain circumstances. CJ up against the mid-boss of Oil Ocean Zone while I enter Metallic Madness, the second to last, the penultimate level of this game. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. Becky, look at her butt. But CJ moving on to Oil Ocean Zone Act 2 as Jeff arrives at the boss of Mirage Saloon Zone himself. Jeff doing a solid job of keeping up. It would be easy to start falling further and further behind but honestly, Jeff is doing a pretty good job here, keeping pace and generally doing okay. The deaths have been hurting him, but he hasn't been falling apart. John really struggling to keep up at this point, which is perhaps one of the bigger surprises of the games. Uh, if I had to put my money down, I would have thought that him and that him and CJ would have been much closer in the overall race. All right, as CJ. Jumping into one of our submarines, the exter the the exterior being designed after the subs of Marina Madness in Knuckles Chaotix, a rare Knuckles Chaotix reference here. There's that. There is the combi ring, and of course, Mighty the Armadillo as well in Sonic Mania Plus. Jeff continuing to take on the boss and defeating her, clearing Mirage Saloon Zone, moving on to Oil Ocean Zone. Jeff and CJ both about to be in Zone 9 of 12, making it interesting, making it very, very interesting. Let's see how this goes. All right. 
Here we go, here we go. Working our way through Metallic Madness Zone. I, I really... I'm not a big fan, generally, of Sonic CD's level design. I think it's very messy, and it doesn't really give you a clear idea of directionality. Nothing to the extent of Knuckles Chaotix, obviously, but it's still a little rough. There's a lot of diagonal edges that make things a little awkward. Uh, so level design, I've never been all that huge on with Sonic CD. But Metallic Madness generally stands out, apart from all of the other levels in my mind, as one that is actually very well done, very tightly put together, some fun gimmicks. Sonic Mania builds on that and creates some really interesting things. I love that we're going into the background. I love that we're going that we will eventually be shrinking, and it's a different kind of scenario. They're, they kind of play the same way, basically, but it's just a little fun bit of flair. How can you how can you hate that? John fighting once again with the mid-boss of Stardust Speedway Zone as CJ finds himself struggling with the fog, the pollution in Oil Ocean Zone Act 2 as he gets to the final sub as I reach the final zone pylons here in Metallic Madness Zone Act 1. John clearing the mid-boss once again for Stardust Speedway as I am taking on the mid-boss of Metallic Madness. Jeff making his way through Oil Ocean Zone, discovering firsthand the weirdness of Oil Ocean Zone just in general. All right. John arriving in Act 2 of Stardust Speedway once again. This is going to be a bit of a rough ride if you cannot pick up the pace in a serious way. Now, this is an any percent race, which generally means you don't really want to waste time doing things like getting Chaos Emeralds. It's not against the rules. If anyone wanted to go for Chaos Emeralds, they were more than welcome to. However, I can't speak for the others, but my mental math on this was Sonic 2, those special stages are usually around like three minutes long, maybe. Sonic 3, like two, maybe three minutes, and it really depends on the, on the, the level. They're quick, and if you and if you played them enough times, you start to get you know comfortable with them, and you can kind of oh, John going into a uh, bonus stage. Actually, speaking of the uh, special stages, blue spheres, as I get through the mid boss of metallic madness zone. Uh, if you have those more or less memorized, or at least have played them enough times, you're gonna have a, a just sort of a natural feel for you know how to get through them very quickly. Sonic Mania, on the other hand, there's a lot of mitigating factors that can really slow you down, and those can last for upwards of five or six minutes if you're not careful. So doing that seven times, you know, that could give you an extra 40 minutes of runtime if you're not very careful. And while it will give you access to Super Sonic, which will make you faster, the question is, is it going to make you 40 minutes faster? My assumption there is a pretty strong no. Unless you got, like, the first seven special stages, you're probably not going to make up too much time by getting Super Sonic. So I opted not to go for Chaos Emeralds. It looks like nobody else went for them as well. And we'll see how the rest of this turns out as CJ is up against the boss of Oil Ocean Zone. Jeff up against the mid-boss of Oil Ocean Zone, taking him down making his way to Act 2, still holding tight at only being roughly an act behind CJ. Doing pretty good of keeping the pace up, especially given, I mean, historically speaking, John and CJ and I are all, you know, lifelong Sonic players, and we've been doing this whole Sonic series. Jeff, not as immediately accustomed to the game. I'm sure he's played a bit here and there, but I don't believe he's played to the extent of that the other three of us have. So he's doing an exemplary job here, especially keeping tight with CJ. Unfortunate death right there as CJ makes his way into Lava Reef Zone. As I'm working my way through the drop spikes of Metallic Madness Zone. All right, as John arrives once again at the Metal Madness fight. Sorry, not Metal Madness, the Metal Sonic fight of Stardust Speedway. See if he can keep things going. Here we go, John. You can do it. I believe in you. All right, Jeff. Learning the effects of the smoke. Watching his rings tick down one by one. 
Shields don't help you. And in fact, I believe even with Supersonic, your rings will go down faster in the smoke. I may be wrong on that, but I, but I seem to remember that being the case. John taking the energy beam approach to fighting Metal Sonic. Still going for him right in the middle. I'm very surprised that he's still going with that tactic. Now I am up against the boss of Metallic Madness Zone, which is a neat little uh, uh, coin-op variant on the Metropolis Zone boss from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. I think it's a cute little thing there. And a, and a couple Amy dolls thrown in the mix for extra flavor. I think that's kind of adorable. And there we go. Once you get all eight of the toys knocked out of there, Eggman goes away, and it's up to you to clear out the rest of the Riff Raff. Whoop. Having some trouble there with the Eggmobile from Emerald Hill Zone. We got rid of the Marble Zone ones pretty quickly. All right, CJ working his way through Lava Reef Zone Act 1. John making his way pretty cleanly to the second phase of the Boss of Stardust Speedway Zone. All right, here we go. We'll have to see how this goes. Jeff still struggling with the Smoke and Oil Ocean Zone. That's going to be a problem if he doesn't keep an eye on it. All right, John doing... Oh, dear. I was about to say he's doing much better this time, but unfortunately, looks like he's going to have to take on that second phase again for Stardust Speedway Zone as I make my way to the final level. It's actually interesting that we've got Stardust Speedway Zone where we're seeing it in one spot and we're seeing it from another angle for Metallic Madness Zone. That's kind of cute. It actually does make sense within the game as the Titanic Monarch is being built on the little planet. And here we go. Titanic Monarch Zone, the final level of the game for me with a pretty hefty lead, if I do say so myself. Over CJ in second, making his way through Lava Reef Zone Act 1. Jeff in Oil Ocean Zone Act 2. John has defeated Metal Sonic and has cleared the halfway point of the game. Currently in fourth place. At this point, it may not be skill that gets him back to third, but it would need to require Jeff making some pretty significant missteps in order to allow Jeff to make up the time needed as he is currently nearly three full zones behind Jeff, who is about an axe behind CJ, who is about two zones behind myself. So there is a lot of work to be done here on John's side if he wants to have any chance of catching up. All right, Titanic Monarch Zone, of course, being notorious for being an exceptionally long set of acts in Sonic Mania. Even in Sonic Mania, where all of the stages routinely take several minutes, if you played, you know, the Genesis games, a lot of those levels can be cleared in under a minute or so if you really know your way through. Sonic Mania, it's doable for some, but honestly, a lot of the levels can take three, four, five minutes apiece. Titanic Monarch Zone is perhaps the one zone in the game where you run the serious risk of getting a time out, even if you're playing relatively quickly. So it's something to watch out for, for sure. It's nice that they uh, that they make sure that your time resets for the boss battle. That's all I'm saying. CJ up against the mid-boss of Lava Reef Zone. Jeff getting closer to the boss of Oil Ocean Zone. Still dealing with the smoke. Still dealing with the smoke. All right, John working the boats in Hydra City Zone. It's probably, Hydra City Zone must feel like a bit of a comfort after Stardust Speedway, where John spent a pretty significant amount of time. Again, I don't have the splits in front of me, but I wouldn't be entirely surprised if it was about 20 to 30 minutes just in Stardust Speedway Zone. We're now a little over an hour and a half in. We're approximately 93 minutes into this run. Actually, yeah, no, that's about right, 93 minutes. I almost counted off of my audio, which would have included my little introduction there, so that wouldn't have been right. All right. So John doing what I think all of us tried to do, which is like, oh, do the, do the little uh, spinny blades actually work here? It's like, well, they do, but not enough to be helpful here. Jeff taking a hard hit in Oil Ocean Zone. The submarines, I think you can avoid all of them. I'm not entirely positive. You can avoid most of them. You may only have to do one of them to actually get through the entire zone. CJ making great time through Lava Reef Zone. Like the back of his hand. He's doing really well here. Jeff making solid time with Oil Ocean Zone. John moving quickly through Hydra City Zone as well. He's going to need to really rock it 
to stand a chance of catching up, even if Jeff begins making mistakes. As I continue working my way through Act 1, even still, at three, almost three and a half minutes in, I'm really still a decent ways away from the mid-boss, if memory serves. I think I still got a ways to go here. So, strap in, folks, because it ain't over yet. Not to mention, Titan Titanic Monarch can be kind of a bastard also, and the final boss uh, can be a bit of a pain. Some of the, you have to fight Eggman while dealing with the hard-boiled heavies at the same time, and some of them, like uh, Heavy Shinobi, are a serious pain in the ass to deal with. It's a little bit, CJ actually figured out an interesting, an interesting trick that you'll probably be seeing later in this run. We'll have to see. Jeff now arriving at the boss fight of Oil Ocean Zone, getting some good, clean hits right away. That's a great way to start that fight. CJ making his way through the second act of Lava Reef Zone. Moving smoothly, John navigating the underwater passages of Hydro City Zone, Act 1. We'll see if he can make up any time on his way through what remains of the game as I get to the mid-boss of... Titanic Monarch Zone, a repurposed version of the mid-boss from Death Egg Zone in Sonic and Knuckles. I am just dam damage boosting like a fiend here. Take the hit, keep moving. Jeff, now finished with Oil Ocean Zone, about to enter Lava Reef Zone. Just a few minutes behind CJ. As I am working on dealing with the mid-boss of Titanic Monarch. All right, Jeff arrives by crashing into Lava Reef Zone. Got to get moving before that sub sinks, and you lose those six rings you start with. I've cleared the mid-boss. Moving on to the final act of the game. John inching closer to the mid-boss of Hydra City Zone. Jeff playing around with the big metal legs. I do like the big metal legs. I believe those actually originate from... Oh boy, Wacky Workbench? I think those are a Sonic CD thing, aren't they? I could be wrong. They, they remind me of Sonic CD. And now for the infamous, as John gets to the mid-boss of Hydra City Zone, I reach the infamous Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2, where after a very short introduction, we will quickly be finding ourselves in a sort of choose-your-own-path-through-the-level style deal. By choose your own path, I guess I more mean choose your own order. As we get here, there are four different areas that must be cleared in order to approach the final boss. You cannot get to the final boss until you've cleared each of these four segments, which can be played in any order. There does not seem to be a meaningful difference to any of them, depending on the order you do them in, so it's really dealer's choice. CJ now approaching the boss of Lava Reef Zone as Jeff is still in the active volcanic portion of the zone. John making his way through the auto-scrolling segment to make his way to Robotnik's sole mid-boss appearance in the game. Here we go, he's gonna have to move, there we go. Very close, no pinchy da Vinci, not today. I'm having a bit of a struggle here with the infinite looping pit. I'm getting, as you can see again, a little bit impatient. Probably should be a little more careful here if, uh, if I say so myself. There we go. I've also, at this point, hit the uh, hit the checkpoint, so I don't know what I'm, what I'm being so nervous about. All right, moving forward. John fighting against Eggman. CJ fighting against, what is that, Heavy Rider? The boss of Lava Reef Zone. Jeff in the segment of Lava Reef Zone that's got a little bit of Chrome, or sorry, not Chrome Gadget, Endless Mine worked in which was itself a level whose design was based on Lava Reef Zone in the first place. All right, we are continuing to push on through. Here we go. Making our way through CJ, taking down the boss of Lava Reef Zone and advancing to Metallic Madness Zone. There we go. All right, I am now, I believe, two segments into Titanic Monarch Zone, Act 2, halfway through, two more to go before I can fight the final boss and end my run of Sonic Mania. Here we go, as CJ enters Metallic Madness Zone, we'll see how well it treats him moving forward 
from here. John struggling a bit with the Hydra City Zone mid-boss, though really, who among us has not struggled with his boss? It is a pain, and it's a little bit awkward to time. And if you can't get the bomb strategy down properly, it's just kind of going to be like a, a whole thing. All right, here we go. You can do it, John. I believe in you. The problem, as you can see, is that the bombs, when they get sucked up by the vortex, actually climb the water faster than Eggman does. It almost seems like he's trying to hit Eggman with his own bombs, which is an interesting strategy. Nope, it's not really working out super well for him, though. CJ continuing to worry to work his way through Metallic Madness Zone. Oh, I'd only made it through one segment. Now I'm two segments into Titanic Monarch Zone. Here we go. Jeff stomping his way through Lava Reef Zone. I love those metal legs. I really do. Those things are so sweet. I think that's the, that's the spot where they are forced to end. Though if you let them sink too far, they will become unusable. Now reaching a climbing segment in Lava Reef Zone that I didn't even know existed until today. Until this run. I had no idea that there was an auto, like that there was a scrolling danger floor segment in Lava Reef Zone in Sonic Mania. That's incredible. It's great. John now up against the mid boss again of Hydro City Zone. As I'm racking up some rings, getting some extra lives. You never know when you're going to need them. Into the fourth and final leg of Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2. Inching closer to victory and the final gold medal. All right, here we go. John trying to deal with the bombs here. Not being very aggressive on Eggman. Not noticing perhaps that it is a little difficult to aim. I will give him that. It was a struggle for me as well. And if they happen to hit Eggman, they thud and disappear regardless of whether there was a bomb below it or not. Jeff now fighting the mid-boss of Lava Reef Zone, continuing to make his march forward. At this point, about a full zone, a little under a full zone behind CJ, so he is slipping a little more behind, but frankly, keeping a pretty good pace, all things considered. John working on his mid-boss here. Let's see how CJ does against the mid-boss of Metallic Madness Zone, our repurposed final zone pylon pillar thing Mark II. Jeff taking a dangerous, dangerous attempt there, but it succeeds getting him through Act 1 and into the second act as I make my way to the final boss of Sonic Mania. Jeff entering... Lava Reef Zone Act 2 through a kind of, like, hard-to-not-notice transition there that was a little bit weird. That was not there in Sonic and Knuckles. It was actually much smoother in that game. It's one of the rare moments of, like, huh, I feel like they could have done that better. John clearing the mid-boss of Hydra City Zone. Me, thankfully, having the Lightning Shield is making dealing with uh, these Lightning Arms a lot, a lot easier. And unfortunately, losing it there means I'm going to have to be more careful for the remainder of this fight. Now, unlike nearly every boss battle or even final boss in the Genesis games, the final boss here will take 16 hits to clear, four for each of his four arms. CJ getting through the mid-boss of Metallic Madness Zone. And now, I'm making my way, whoop, not quite done with the third arm. Getting close, though. All right, holding on to my last ring. All right, only four hits to go. Maybe three. I think it's four. The best thing to do when the hands come out is to jump directly into them. They will get you. As far as I'm aware, there is no way to avoid those. And there is, as it turns out, an interesting way to avoid the Egg Shinobi. But it's a little bit unexpected. Now I'm in real trouble as I have no ring. There we go. Get that back before things go south. All right. We got baby Andrew Sonic on CJ's screen. And here we go. I'm trying to see if I can finish this off. Where are we at? 
Oh, one more hit separates me from victory. Here we go. Oh, there it is. For the gold, with a time of one hour, 44 minutes, and 11.1 seconds. Bringing home the final gold for Imperium Ludum. Sonic and Knuckles will now be escaping with their lives as CJ takes a fall shortly after Jeff here in Lava Reef Zone Act 2. As we now transition over to CJ's audio with him being our second place runner, let's continue. Now we've got John racing through Hydro City Zone Act 2, trying to make up space. Jeff working his way through Lava Reef Zone, still keeping no more than a zone, I guess a little more than a zone, but basically no more than a zone behind CJ, who is coming down to the end of Metallic Madness Zone and will soon be in Titanic Monarch Zone, the final level of the game, looking to secure a silver medal for the final event, the Marathon. Here in Sonic Mania, here at the games, it's exciting. Get pumped. Get ready. Where else are you going to get four games of Sonic Mania in two hours? Exactly. I do like in Hydra City Zone, where John's at right now, that Sonic Mania actually kind of mixed in a little bit of stuff. Normally when you have the little spinning, um, oh, what do they call those in, in ancient Greek architecture? Those, those pillars, basically. Uh, normally, when you're dealing with those in the spikes, they just spin and move horizontally, and you kind of have to jump over them. It's a little bit of a stiff sort of platforming challenge. I like that they added some vertical ones here, too. I think that does a lot to uh, to make it more interesting, I guess, than it would have been otherwise. Speaking of, though, John is here against the Hydra City Zone boss, and CJ has just arrived at the Metallic Madness Zone boss. Our little Tinker Toy Parade here. It's interesting that they went with Marble Zone for the Sonic 1 representative. I guess, ironically, despite the fact that so much of this game is kind of a send-up to the classics, including the ones that always get attention, Green Hill Zone and, oh, Amy Doll grabbing CJ. Having Marble Zone get some representation for once is kind of a nice change. I'll, I'll put it that way. See, uh, Jeff slipping into a special stage and deciding to go for trying to get a bunch of rings, not so much for the sake of beating the special stage as much as, I believe, trying to secure some extra lives, continues, what have you. I don't even remember if there are continues in this game. I don't remember. It would be worth some extra lives, presumably, but John taking a nasty hit from the Hydra City Zone boss. Jeff getting stuck in the special stage. CJ, no rings but so close to beating the Metallic Madness. Oh, no, and the Amy Doll gets him. Oh, that one hurts. That one really hurts. The Amy Doll, for what it's worth, there are a few ways to deal with it. Uh, in my experience, the best way to do it is to just spin dash. Uh, you don't have to risk, because it'll move as you get close to it. It's it, uh, it's like a dinosaur, you see. It's uh, It's got all this motion-based vision. And if you get close to it, that's when it activates. But if you get far enough away, it'll just kind of ignore you. So we have John still pushing on the Hydra City boss, but still standing his last life. Jeff actually securing the Chaos Emerald, hoping to get a little bonus there. CJ is just swarmed right now. Oh my goodness. John trying to keep himself from a third game over. You can just hang on to a couple rings, a couple more hits. He should. There it is. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Excellent job from John. Getting out of Hydra City Zone. Oh dear. CJ with no rings and one Amy doll. Can he do it? Yes, he can. All he's got to do now is knock Eggman out of his little. There's a name for that. The Oh, no! Oh, God. One of the little energy balls got him. Whoa, wow. Near simultaneous stage starts there from John and CJ. John entering into Mirage Saloon Zone. While I feel like Mirage Saloon is like a really difficult to say phrase quickly with good enunciation. While CJ re-enters Metallic Madness Zone Act 2 to re-fight the boss. 
Jeff pushing his way through Lava Reef Zone, hoping, hoping, hoping to close the gap between himself and CJ. We'll have to see how it goes. Usually, Lava Reef Zone Act 2 is actually, I mean, in my experience anyway, it feels like Lava Reef Zone Act 2 is usually a bit more forgiving than Act 1. Oof, that section always, like, makes me cringe. Makes me feel like you're never going to make it through there, but I don't know if I've ever actually seen anyone get killed there, so must be all in my head. I don't know. Uh, but it always feels like Act 2, maybe it's because usually by that point, I, I usually have Supersonic, so, like, with Supersonic, Lava Reef Zone... Act 2 especially is just kind of a joke. Like, there's almost nothing that can really hurt you there. In, in Act 1, there's a lot of stuff that can crush you. Act 2 doesn't have much of that, if anything. It's great for the boss battle, too. In uh, in Sonic & Knuckles, that is. In this game, I think it's a little bit different. Like, Act 2 is definitely more fleshed out in a big way. CJ looking to close it, and there we go. Gets it done. Gets through... Metallic Madness. Excellently done. CJ is now moving on to the final zone. Titanic Monarch Zone. Not to be confused with Final Zone. Its own Final Zone. Especially since we already got Final Zone as part of the, the mid-boss encounter there. Actually, hey, there we go. For Oh! Jeff getting nailed there. That's an unfortunate one. Big oof. And actually, yeah, so I would mentioned before that Hydra City Zone felt seemed to be the only mid-boss where uh, Eggman got involved in a Metallic Madness he does too because he's got the Final Zone uh, machine. I don't, know, I don't really know what to call that. So it's interesting that the two times that Eggman shows up as a mid-boss battle in this game, it's because of callbacks to boss battles specifically that existed in... Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic the Hedgehog 1. I, I guess the specific games don't really matter for where it came from, but just kinda, it's just kind of interesting to me that they do that. And I guess it would make sense, too, that Eggman would show up as remixed boss fights from other games. Just, I don't know, it's just sort of interesting to me. Because there's other remixed boss ones, and even in Hydra City Zone, he showed, his boss battle is a remixed mid-boss fight, so... I don't know. Food for thought in many different flavors. CJ pushing his way through Titanic Monarch Zone. Making his way through. John doing his best. There we go. Getting through the mid boss of Mirage Saloon Zone. Signpost should be coming down shortly. And they'll be moving on to crashing his plane and getting into Act 2. Jeff, I think, is getting... Yeah, there we go. Jeff is right at the brink of the boss fight for Lava Reef Zone. And he'll be moving on to... Uh, excuse me, not Mirage Saloon. Uh, Metallic Madness following that. All right, here we go. Let's see how this goes for Jeff. All right, nice clean hit to start it off. And another. He's doing a pretty good job of getting these nice little clean ones in there. The fire shield obviously helps for these little fire spitters that are going on up top. All right, more clean hits. This is all pretty solid. No real mistakes halfway through the fight. CJ working his way through Titanic Monarch Zone Act 1. John making his way through Mirage Saloon. Oh, and there's a hit on Jeff. That's going to make this a little... Oh, no, and another one, too. It's going to make it a little bit tougher to deal with anything going on in the middle of the stage. Oh, these hits are not going to be helping him out. He needs to make up ground. It's not impossible to come back from behind and get the silver, but he's going to need some perfection out of his gameplay to make it happen. And to be to be frank, CJ will probably need to make a few huge mistakes here in order to buy Jeff the time he needs to strike. All right. So Jeff clearing the boss fight. For Lava Reef Zone, he'll be moving on to Metallic Madness. What is normally the final zone in Sonic CD, I believe. Right? Is there is there a separate final zone there? Why am I suddenly struggling with this? I don't know why all of a sudden it's just like, wait, I'm second-guessing myself. This is not good. 
do 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 do. Yeah, it's the final. It's the final one. Okay, I'm not insane. Just making sure. All right, so Jeff now making his way through Metallic Madness Zone. CJ continuing through the long and treacherous Titanic Monarch Zone. John about to hit the mid boss. Uh, excuse me, the boss fight from Mirage Saloon. Making pretty good time. He got here in less than two minutes. That's actually pretty solid. I think, unfortunately, at this point, it is probably too late. Oh, there's CJ getting his second. I, we talked about this earlier. The get 100, lose them, get the 100 back, and it counts as another extra life thing. Whatever that would be called. The, the re-life. I, I don't know. Uh, but there it was in action. Having a lot of damage taken on all fronts here. Everybody needs to get a little bit more tight with their ooh, with their controls there. Jeff taking a risky, risky jump through the saw blade. There's a lot of stuff that's ready to cut and squash you here in Metallic Madness Zone. John almost done with the Mirage Saloon boss. Ooh, CJ again taking more hits. This is really going to be a little bit difficult for him. If he can't tighten up his gameplay, like we were saying before. So far, I mean, he does have 21 extra lives. I'm not, like, worried that he's going to gain a game over. But the problem is, if he loses any lives at some really important parts... Ooh, that was close there. If he loses any lives at important parts, that could give Jeff an opportunity to strike... CJ does have a pretty healthy lead, so it ultimately it may not make much of a difference if he does die a couple times. It is CJ's game to lose at this point as we reach the mid-boss of Titanic Monarch Zone. And as John makes it to Oil Ocean Zone. Flew through that boss. Got it done. Not bad. All right. CJ going for a careful approach here. One strike per... Per round, per drop of the balls, if you will. Meanwhile, Jeff is pretty steadily making his way through Metallic Madness Zone. Nothing to... Oof. Well, you know, commentator's curse. Right as I say it, we have some trouble there. Good use of the drop dash to get up that slanted um, platform. That definitely was a good call there. CJ now in the second phase of the Titanic Monarch Zone mid-boss fight. This one I think is really fun. I'm actually a big fan of, of this. The little gravity effects are really cool. And if you jump just as the gravity changes, you can get a little boost from, from some of the different things there. It's all really well thought out, honestly. I, I like it quite a bit. All right, Jeff looking for an exit from this little section here while John slip and slides around in Oil Ocean. CJ making it to the final act of the game. Here at the games, do you see what I did there with the words coming from my mooth? Jeff arriving at the Metallic Madness Zone mid-boss, featuring one Dr. Chauncey Eggman. I think that's his name. I'm pretty sure that's his name. Born and raised in, uh, in Topeka. Grew up in an eggplant farm. Pretty sure that's him. He look. It looks like him. If I ask him later, maybe he'll he'll you know. I just want to know if he knows a guy. That's all. It's not a bit. It's not like a big deal. It does. It doesn't matter for this. Anyway, CJ is in Act Two, Titanic Monarch Zone. Just a few seconds in, and he's about to hit the hub area between the four segments, the four legs that he has to clear. Jeff having some bad luck with the final zone pylons. There we go. The trick is if they're if there is any space between the two that are going to move, you want to be in between them because it will give you a free shot on all sides. Also, I'm pretty sure that Eggman will appear in every fourth pylon that moves in this second phase. I'm relatively sure that's how this works, but I don't know for certain. It seems to be holding so far, so it's a good sign. All right, there we go. Jeff, now halfway through Metallic Madness Zone making his way to Act 2 as CJ makes his way to the end, I believe, of the first leg. Mm, I 
thought it was right around here. Maybe I, I could be mistaken. I guess not. I thought that was right basically the end of the first segment. But it would seem that's not the case. Oh, slipping backwards through the teleport gas. Gotta watch out for that. John at the Oil Ocean Zone mid-boss. Having some trouble. Ooh, ooh! All right, maybe it can crush, crush you. Yikes. That's unfortunate. That's a that's a, that's a bummer of a place to, to die. All right. And CJ continuing his ascent. Jeff continuing his right scent. I don't know how to describe moving to the right in a way that is comparable to ascent. I don't know. Pro Procent? Like, proceed or progress? All right, John trying to be a bit more careful this time. Ooh, taking the wrench to the face, though. All right, back to the middle again. Good call, good call. Struggling to land these hits. There it is. All right, John making it through Act 1. On his way to Act 2 as CJ clears out the first of four legs in Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2. Jeff continuing through Metallic Madness Zone Act 2. And John now entering Oil Ocean Zone Act 2. All right, Jeff now experiencing the joy of Baby Andrew Sonic. The long lost friend of Baby Andrew Knuckles. All right, they're continuing through a bunch of squishy squish zones. Doing their best. Oh, and they got squishy squished. That is very unfortunate. CJ trying to get. There we go. A little bumper. Ooh, a little bumper action, but not getting much love from our Jacob's Ladders all over the sides there. All right. John, I was going to call him Jeff. John riding the sub down and taking a bullet directly to the face. You hate to see it. All right. Ooh, and again, diving directly into that bullet. Not so good. Not so good. Jeff trying again at the little squishy squish section. Trying this time not to get squishy squished. Let's see how he does. And he successfully does not get squishy squished. At least not entirely. Perfect. All right. CJ progressing through another of the legs. John at risk of starting to lose his rings one by one if he doesn't get a switch pulled very shortly. Which is an even more dangerous thing right now since he has no extra lives. You do not want to be taking unnecessary risks in this game if you don't have an extra life handy which John does not. He skips by the checkpoint entirely, perhaps realizing that if he dies, it doesn't entirely matter. Granted, there could be extra lives on the way, so who knows? Oof, taking the shortest path he possibly can, though he's missing out on a couple monitors and rings, and this could bite him in the ass if he's not careful. Lots of smoke. Good use of a spin dash jump, but unfortunately... Ooh, oh dear. There it is, a third game over for John. I think I think this is where we put the fork in it, honestly, but all of these runs, for what it's worth, were run uh, independently of each other. Nobody, nobody was running side by side with one another. Uh, not for like like any any like rules based purposes, mostly just from a technical standpoint, there wasn't a realistic way for us to do that. Um, especially not to get like good crisp footage of all of the, uh, the, excuse me, of all the runners. Jeff now arriving at the boss to Metallic Madness Zone. Let's see if he can get into Titanic Monarch Zone before CJ finishes his run. It's actually looking pretty good so far. The, the final boss takes a little while. Jeff is, uh, just kind of hanging out, looking up, looking down, looking around. Not sure if he's quite noticed. He might now realize that he is the one who is in control of uh, the enemies approaching. Don't know if he's sure if he's aware that you can actually send multiple enemies. Oh, he actually got away from that Amy doll before it did any damage to him. That was impressive. I didn't realize you could actually do that. All right, CJ, now entering the final boss fight. This is. Probably going to be it for CJ. 
sealing up a silver medal for the Daisy Baby Bitch territory. 16 hits is what it takes. Let's see if he's got, he's got a lightning shield, which is great for this fight. Although it doesn't look like he is sure whether it will actually protect him from the electrified arms. Oh, and he loses it also. All right, one arm down. Second one is half done. Jeff finishing off the boss for Metallic Madness Zone. So it looks like he will indeed be reaching Titanic Monarch just in time for CJ to finish the game. John still very much behind at this point. Uh, he is a full two zones behind, actually two and a half really, behind uh, Jeff, who is the better part of a zone behind CJ at this point. Oh dear, John narrowly missing getting pinched. Getting them pinchy no Da Vinci. Up against his favorite mechanic, Dave. Can he get the clean finish? There it is, all right. Getting through act one while Jeff gets into Titanic Monarch Zone, act one, while CJ is down to the end of the final boss fight that will end his run and should secure the silver for his country. Now, CJ has figured out that if you stand right in the center here, you will never be bothered by Heavy Shinobi. Absolutely brilliant. All right, here we go. John already taking a death in Oil Ocean Zone Act 2. Not a good place to be. CJ now down to three hits left to finish his run. Can he clean it right here? One, two, there it is, CJ with the time of two hours, five minutes, 57.8 seconds, netting Daisy Baby Bitch territory, the silver. All right, great job from CJ, excellent run. 205, sub 206, that's a solid time. Pretty damn good, not bad at all, my dude. Jeff now in the early portion of Titanic Monarch Zone looking to net a bronze for Tierra de los Hermanos Hook, while John races through Oil Ocean Zone in an attempt to swing it from behind for the country of Ubechistan. It's not looking good. If I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about his chances here. But we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep at it. We're gonna see how it goes. Anything could happen. A late game over from Jeff up against the final boss, for example, could give John a full 20 minutes of time back that he doesn't have right now. And anything could happen from there. So we need to see some real action out of John. And we need to see Jeff seal his third place standings for his own team. Extra life for Jeff, making that game over further and further away. John watching his hopes for a bronze medal in this event start to dwindle. All right, making our way up here. It's interesting, now we've got all the action on the right side of the screen. The left is all kind of just hanging out now. But alas, here we are. This is how things go sometimes at the games. All right, Jeff dealing with a vertical jump segment a la Metropolis Zone Act 2. I have no shame in admitting as a child that section always got me. It was a couple years, I think, until, ooh, oh, gnarly hit on Jeff. Taking him back as John gets to the boss of Oil Ocean Zone. What I was saying before, oh no, another one. Oh, Jeff. Oh, while John also takes the dive. Yikes. Is the pressure starting to get to them? These athletes have been at it for two hours, eight and a half minutes. They really are starting to feel that time working against them. Oop, Jeff taking a little interesting damage boost to get the platforming segment taken care of. As I was saying before, in Metropolis, as a child, Metropolis Zone Act 2 has a segment where you need to 
uh, run up a wall to your left and then jump off of it in order to reach a platform. And that was a technique that I literally hadn't even considered a possibility until well after I had beaten Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Just never occurred to me. And then one day I got it and I felt like the biggest dumb dummy dum dum in the world. All right, John with no rings. He's gonna need this to be extremely clean. Oh, God, no. John, his fourth game over, his second game over in Oil Ocean Zone alone. Oh, God, the, the humanity, the tragedy, right at the boss, right at the boss. John taking a second to collect himself before diving back in. John now a full three zones behind Jeff. It would take a miracle at this point. Oh, God, and John getting pinched in the fire pipe. Oof. Not a good way to go. They pinch you, and they leave you to burn. The horror. Jeff going for a pretty complicated maneuver here. Not sure where he's going for, as it looks like that's an exit pipe. Though perhaps there may be a shortcut if you can get through it to the other side. John rocketing through, though as is usually the case with Oil Ocean Zone, there are spikes everywhere, just waiting to take out anyone impatient enough to not look before they cross the street. Jeff making his way through the gymnastics portion of this routine before getting up to, oh, oh dear. Before getting to the oh no vault. All right, ooh, sneaky little segment there. The invincibility helps quite a bit. John taking another death. He is once again, no extra lives in oil ocean zone. John seems to be considering just wallowing in the oil, but he has opted to continue Oh, boy. Very lucky that there were not spikes right there. That's a very... Oh, my goodness. Yet another very close call with the fire pipes. John just taking the most terrifying route through this zone. But he's got rings again. He's not on death's door. He has a chance to get through this at last. Let's see how he does. Because not only does he have Act 1, but he does have Act 2... Yet again, oof, running into the big spiky uh, bracelets. I've never been entirely clear on what those are or what shape they're even supposed to be. They look kind of like bracelets, I guess, as Jeff arrives at the mid-boss of Titanic Monarch Zone. All right, here we go. Taking an early hit as he goes in for the damage, using the damage boost to his advantage. John up against... Dave the Mechanic, once again. Jeff trying to hang on to at least one ring so that he is not on death's door for this entire battle. And let's be real, this one is a kind of a tricky battle to not take damage in, so... Worth doing, for sure. John making it back into Oil Ocean Zone Act 2 for the third time. Hopefully, third is the Magic Fraction. That gives him the action and a little compaction. Because that is what we all need. Oof, Jeff taking a nasty little hit there as the gravity suddenly changes on him. Ooh, misses with the spin dash, almost gets hit with a beam. And looking at the time, we're already almost at eight minutes from Jeff here. This is... Definitely a long stretch here. He's gonna have to hustle to get through Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2 as that level is longer and you do have to get through the stage in 10 minutes. Now, I believe... There we go. Just shy of 8 minutes. And I believe when you time out in a Sonic level... It's been... I would have to double check on this. I believe what happens is you go back to... Like, it just counts as a death and you go back to the last checkpoint where the time resets, I think? I don't think they make you redo the entire stage. I'm not positive on that, but I'm pretty sure that's how that works. Anyway, Jeff 
clearing out the mid boss, making his way to the final act of the game. Taking a look off to the left. What you doing over there? Are you a little stage, stage fright? There you go. There you go. You good? You good? You good? You got it. Heading on into the final act of the game. The final act of the games, in fact, since this is our last event. Getting through some gears, very reminiscent of uh, Metropolis Zone. Were there gears in Final Zone? I don't think there were. Jeff arrives at the hub, opts to go with the bottom left path first, which I think is the one I did first as well. I don't recall. I think CJ went up left first. Jeff just kind of hanging out, checking out the sights. Getting himself thrown into some pits. John just living with the smoke. But once again, on his last life, it is very dangerous to be leaving that smoke alone here. Oh my goodness, the seahorse is not grabbing rings. If he doesn't get rid of the smoke, he's going to be in some real danger. Oh boy, there we go. He managed to get to the boss with rings. If he got here with zero rings, I fear that we would be seeing a fifth game over from John and the third of Oil Ocean Zone, but it has not happened. It has not happened, at least not yet, but I don't think it's going to happen. If I know John, he's going to buckle down and get the job done here. Oh, dear. Well, that is going to... Oh, he got a ring. <sighs> that was a close one. But he managed to scoop one up from the disgusting muck. Keeps himself alive with an extra ring. That is a game changer for this boss fight. All right, getting some more hits in. Trying to dodge the bullets and gets hit again. This time, oh, he still got the ring. They do hang out a little bit under the surface. Oh, getting dropped again, but still picks up the ring. John just trying to clear Oil Ocean Zone at long last. Can he do it? All right. Oh, getting stuck inside the boss, but he finishes it. Holy cow. John clearing Oil Ocean Zone at long last. And he will be headed to the last quarter of this game. Jeff. Working his way through Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2 with a lightning shield in hand. Never mind. He will probably be pretty safe in keeping his lead going, barring some truly tragic circumstances. Now, again, at this point, Titanic Monarch Zone is a very long zone. It is not unusual at all for the zone to take upwards of 20 minutes between Act 1, Act 2, and the boss, which resets the clock. So if... Ooh! Ooh, my goodness. If Jeff were to game over, especially near the end, that may give John the chance he needs in order to catch back up. And unfortunately for John, I think that is the only way that it's going to happen at this point. A game over right near the end, it would at least guarantee a good 10, 15 minutes. And Lava Reef Zone isn't too terrible. Metallic Madness can get a little beefy. But that's what he would probably need in order to actually catch up at this rate. He's now behind by two and a half zones. That's less him catching up and more Titanic Monarch Zone just being longer. John working his way past our eventual mini-boss in his early stages, grabbing some rings, continuing onward, grabbing the button. In we go, through the weird mud door. We don't talk about the mud door. Jeff dealing with those terrible pig things from, from uh, Scrap Brain Zone. Ooh, sneaky, sneaky spikes on Jeff. All right, Jeff taking it, taking it nice and easy here. Moving forward. And dropping down. Got some electricity to watch out for. Whoop. A little shy on the rings. There it is. 
and he is headed down. All right. John is in an interesting spot here, as this segment is pretty reminiscent of a similar one in the Sonic and Knuckles version of Lava Reef Zone, where there's actually normally a, uh, a, a giant ring hidden in an area right there. There's a room full of rings, and then I believe nearby is a giant ring. Uh, and that is not there in this game. And Jeff continuing his march through Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2. John pushing hard, trying to get through, making his way to the mid-boss of Lava Reef Zone. This little segment's a little complicated as you actually want to be going not that high, not that fast, because you want to get into that little tunnel on the right and it's a little tough, because if you go too high, you grab that pole and spin around it. There you go. And we made it. John, using the metal legs. They're so sexy. It's too sexy for its legs. All right. Jeff racing around at the speed of sound. Somebody's nearby, though, and takes a pot shot, knocking his rings away. As he keeps moving... And he should be coming up on the end of his leg fairly shortly, I believe. Did not around this bend. Am I misremembering? Oh, I remember this section. It's one of those... There's a lot of zones in Sonic that have these reversal sections. Launch base zone in particular comes to mind for one like this. I like the fact that we got one of those gravity wells as a part of the switchback maneuver here. I think that's really cool. John also going for the advancing lava pool... Jeff into heading into his fourth and final leg of Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2 as John continues to push hard through Lava Reef Zone. Though it looks like this is just about sealed up. Again, not impossible, just very unlikely. Ooh! Commentator's curse. I speak it. And then it happens. Jeff pushing to get up to the top here while John is making his way down into another section that is pretty much ripped directly from Sonic and Knuckles as he hits the mid-boss, our little armored pincer guy. A few of our racers have been trying to attack it directly, but it cannot be harmed until its armor has been melted off using the lava. It takes three hits from the lava. As you can see, it's had two hits now, and on the next hit, the armor will fall off. However, you do need to land on rock for it to try to mine it in order to set off the little lava eruption that weakens its armor. Jeff struggling with the little platforming section here in the gravity wells as John continues to work on... Ooh! Ouch! As John continues to work on the mid-boss... Of Lava Reef Zone. A couple more hits at this point should do it, because now we can actually do damage. I'm not positive if the lava does damage to this thing after... I'd have to take a look at the exact number of hits there, but it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, that the lava does one or two hits worth of damage to the mid-boss. And now Jeff making his way to the final boss. Three lives in hand. This is the final countdown for the bronze medal as John descends into Lava Reef Zone Act 2. Let's see if he's got what it takes. All right. And the timer has been reset. Jeff versus Eggman and the hard-boiled heavies. Well, four of them anyway. Taking hits right away off the electrified arms. We got our own little Dr. Octopus situation here. Got missiles, very narrowly dodges one, but still takes a hit from the electrified arms anyway. And it's time for the hands. Heading on in. There we go, we've got our heavy gunner firing away as Jeff picks a couple missiles to fire back. Now I believe you can actually damage the hard-boiled heavies enough such that they will go away for good. John dodging a giant ring, very smart move. Uh, however, the final battle generally doesn't last long enough for that to be a meaningful thing to do. If you're if you're efficient with your hits on Eggman, you really don't need to worry about the hard-boiled heavies uh, in in that regard. 
because you're not going to see them often enough. Jeff now one arm down. Three to go. Heavy Shinobi now in play, throwing his blades all over the plates. And taking a hit, as he usually does on, you know, most everybody. Whoop, grab those rings. It'll be a bad time to be losing them now. All right, about two hours, 24 minutes. Jeff looking to seal it up here, giving his country the bronze. Their third bronze, if they get it. Working on that second arm still. John pushing his way through Lava Reef Zone. Can he get through Lava Reef Zone before Jeff finishes off the final boss? Jeff is taking it nice and easy for the final boss. We haven't seen, I believe this is Heavy Magician, yes. We haven't seen her in my or CJ's run so far. I don't recall if, uh, if they are always in order, but I believe that was the order that... The first two were before. John struggling with the barrel drum for Lava Reef Zone. Cannot seem to get his height. He's throwing himself a little too late, I believe. You want to get it when Sonic's... There we go. More or less at the center of the barrel. Continuing on. Jeff still has three arms to go. Struggling to land hits. This is going to be quite the endurance test. And now Jeff against the one I don't know the name of. Heavy Rider, probably? I hope we get to see this motobug again in the, ooh, in the presumably inevitable Sonic Mania sequel. Jeff, very lucky to have not gotten crushed there by those spikes. All right. John flipping some switches, switching around some conveyor belts. Jeff still being very cautious with our final boss here. Second arm destroyed, eight hits separate him from his bronze medal. Down to seven. All right, and we're going back for the hands. Catch these hands. Let's see how it goes. Can he do it? He's gonna have to be quick because Heavy Shinobi is coming back. And that thing is a killer. John struggling to keep a handle on his rings. Lava Reef Zone is, oof, is running him through the ringer, as it were. Abandons his ring to continue onward. At this point, he has plenty of extra lives. So he, oof, geez. So he is not in the same danger he was for a good portion of Oil Ocean Zone. All right, and he continues forward. One arm left for Jeff. John lining up his shots. There we go. All right, Jeff looking to dodge damage here. Oh dear, hits the bumper and takes the hit. And gives one back too. All right, and we're back into it. Jeff on the final hits. All he's gotta do is land right here what he needs and we'll be done. So close, so close. Jeff. Close it now. There it is. Bronze medal for Jeff of Tierra de los Hermanos Hook at two hours, 27 minutes, 28.6 seconds. Seeing that final cutscene as John enters Lava Reef Zone's boss. At this point, all of the medals for the event have been claimed, but now John is going to continue onward for the honor of Ubechistan. Looking for that fourth place. Looking to at least give them a clean finish. I don't have a good idea what time you'd be shooting for at this point, but as we're coming up on two and a half hours with Metallic Madness Zone and Titanic Monarch Zone left to go, I would say shooting for around 250, 255 would be an ideal spot. I think that's going to be where he's going to have to aim. Somewhere in that ballpark, just off of Metallic Madness, probably a good 
I don't know, 10 minutes and and uh, Titanic Monarch, probably at least 15, probably closer to 20. So we'll have to see how this goes. John, at this point, deferring to the damage boosts where need be, recollecting his ring. Not getting many hits. Not getting many hits on this hard-boiled heavy. There we go. And we are out of Lava Reef Zone as John moves on to Metallic Madness. There we go. Getting that egg prison open. Sonic does a happy dance. He's surrounded by cock. Anyway, moving on to Metallic Madness Zone. Love that art. So good. Metallic Madness Zone Act 1. John racing through. Now, none of our racers were informed of anyone else's times if they were going second or third or fourth. Obviously, whoever, the one that went first had no times to compare to in the first place. But no one was told what the times of the other racers were as in an ideal position. Everyone would be doing this at the same time. And no one would know ahead of time what their target time is. So John, at this moment, is not aware of anyone else's times or whether they have finished. So John is still racing through with the intent of at least catching up, though at this point that is in the bag or out of the bag, I guess, because it's not in the bag. It's the opposite. It's it's in a hole in the bag, out a hole in the bag. There we go. We're figuring out phrases here today. It's fine. I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, John marching through, getting past those awful bomb enemies from Starlight Zone. A level I generally love, but those bombs, they are cruel. The cruel mistress of the mechanized future. I call it... Bombus. A little, ba -na -ba -na -ba -na -na, little Ghostbusters action in there. Did you know that Ghostbusters was inspired by Metallic Madness Zone? This is them paying tribute back. I think it's a cute little reference. T. Lopes is with it, man. All right, John looking to grab some rings, make his journey through Metallic Madness a little less mad and a little more straightforward. Let's see how he does here. All right, up top side, coming back to the foreground, dropping down, dropping it like it is hot. Pretty sure that's how the song goes, right? Dropping it like it is hot, dropping it like it is hot. All right, that would actually make kind of an interesting little... Get a little something... Ooh, John and Jeff both, but John especially with the Game Overs has been plagued by getting crushed randomly between moving platforms, so makes me a little nervous anytime I see him approaching one at uh, fast speed. All right, John making some clean platforming in the background here, continuing to make his move. All right. Here we go, final zone time. Don't get crushed. No pinchy Da Vinci. First name Leonardo. Like the turtle. Did you know Le Leonardo da Vinci was actually named after uh, the Ninja Turtle? And then the cartoons decided to pay that back. Oh no! John, in a mad dash to get his rings, gets crushed in the rightmost pylon of the final zone mid boss. Oh, going at it with no rings. Daring. Daring. Can we make the word for zero day? Because that is day ring. Fighter of the Night Ring. Here we go. Okay. Getting some hits in. The trick is, honestly, as it was with Final Zone, the trick is usually to find the biggest gap between those as they're up top. Stand between them. It's John's basically got it here. Stand between them and then jump. Uh, if you can get to the side, that's great. But if you can't, honestly, if you jump just before it's at Sonic's height, you'll be able to... Uh, avoid the period of time where the electric balls are at their pinchiest because you'll be up in the air. Like, duh, I guess. It's a nice little technique. It, it goes far. All right, there we go. John taking down the mid-boss. 
of Metallic Madness Zone. Moving on to Act 2. Only three acts remain between now and victory. They say in a marathon, it doesn't matter if it takes you three hours or 30 hours. It's just a matter of crossing that finish line. Here we go. John making his moves, making his way downtown, underground. In this round, it's a zone now. Do 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 All right, we got our little baby boy doing his thing, doing his best, going for the Ubechistani people, all cheering for him from the crowd. Their hearts are with him tonight. Here we go. Moving up over here. He's got plenty of rings. He doesn't have to worry about getting, you know, randomly killed unless he gets squished, which is a constant kind of thing to be aware of, especially here. There's a lot of that here in Metallic Madness Zone. But John seems to have a pretty good grip on it so far. Metallic Madness Zone has actually been a lot kinder to him. He's been handling it a lot better than he has the last couple zones. I'd say L Lava Reef Zone, I think he did generally fine. Oil Ocean Zone was really the, the most difficult portion of the overall. Oh, speak of the devil, but he did hit his checkpoint immediately before. I want to say Jeff might have actually had the same issue there. Jeff might, either Jeff or, or CJ, I believe, also got pinched right there. Actually, no, that might have been me. I have to go back and check the tapes, but I can't because I'm right here in the booth bringing you all the action like a local news channel that for some reason wants to feel like a, like, oh, just you wait. I love the tiny little fire shield. I don't know if we've ever had a shield on little baby Andrew Sonic before. Yep, you got to watch out for that. You got to watch out for that. Well, this is why we get extra lives, folks. John using that cushion to get it done. Getting through the drop spike section. Moving through. Ducking, weaving, crocheting his way to the top. Giving it his all, no matter what. Although at this point, he could go for the bumper. He seems to be content with riding out the storm. And here we go. Continuing forward. I don't know how those enemies work. They confuse the hell out of me. All right, John in one of the pits down here that I think got basically all of us. All right, heading into the background. There's a lot of background foreground play. A lot of back and forth play here in this zone. If you catch my, if you catch my drizzle. Oof. Here we go. Another little baby Sonic time. John making his way up, trying not to hit the Robotnik monitor. Continuing forward, he should be close. There we go, to the boss fight of Metallic Madness Zone. Let's see how it treats him. Ooh, good little boost right there. Getting Amy Doll taken care of. All right, some really good bouncing. John is doing a great job of chaining his attacks together here. Just pinballing around. He's pinballing around so much, I hear Jeff from Tierra de los Hermanos Hook in his locker room is sweating and staring at the ceiling, not knowing why. He's muttering something about ball bearings, but we, we haven't been able to figure out exactly what the deal is. Interestingly, John is able to pinball back and forth very easily, but it was struggling a little bit with the actual just jumps. And here we go. John with a super clean finish. I spoke too soon. There we go. There it is. All in all, pretty clean run of the Metallic Madness Zone boss. John seems to have found his rhythm. It turns out the way that John works best is if no one else is doing anything. Then he is at A plus athleticism and he's ready to ride. As we enter Titanic Monarch Zone, the final zone of the game of the games. Here we go. Two hours, 38 minutes. 30 seconds, we are here. 
at the end. Let's do this. Here we go. Titanic Monarch Zone Act 1. All right, right away, deal with our little laser bastards. Doing their thing as they are wont to do. John diving forward, making his way through. All right. Working with the gravity wells, struggling a little bit with the timing on these launch, uh, these like launch mechanics and physics. It's been getting him a couple times today, but thankfully he won't have to deal with them for very long anymore. Ooh, taking a nasty hit right there from the Jacob's ladder. I sure hope that is the right thing for the thing. I mean, I know it's not a Tesla coil. And I know it's not a Faraday cage. Pretty sure it's a Jacob's Ladder. I might be wrong. Not to be confused with the film Jacob's Ladder, which is a movie. Uh, I, do, I, I really don't know how much more I can say than that, really. It's an experience like no other. We'll go with that. That seems like a safe one to go with, yeah. That seems like something I can, I can say and have it be true and also... Uh, you know, leave it nice and simple. Which seems like the way to go, honestly. Anyway, John rocketing around, doing a pretty good job of making his way through. Whoop, Titanic Monarch Zone. A little pause there for a second. He might have been waiting, assuming that it was going to launch him out. All right, here we go. Here we go. John moving on up. Making his way. Here we go. Oh, dear. All right. Jumping on up. Getting our little bumpers on. Going through there. This would have been an interesting event to have a co-commentator for. I think this might have been neat as a two, as a two-way commentary. Four eyeballs are better than two for catching stuff to look at. At this point, it, it wouldn't make an, a huge difference other than keeping some conversation going. But definitely during the like meat of this run, there were definitely times where I, I regretted the fact that I couldn't easily keep track of... Ooh, sneaky little ladder. Uh, that I couldn't easily keep track of all four runs for the more interesting segments. Let's keep this going. Here we go, John. Continuing to push on through. Still getting hit with those electric bolts. Oh, and again with the Metropolis jump. Oh, you gotta stay on the wall and jump. There we go. You can do it. A little more. It seems like he's pressing left when he gets to the top, which is not what you wanna do. You wanna keep pressing right, because that's how. Ooh, hoo hoo. Narrowly dodged a Jeff Squish. Oop. You want to take him out? No? Okay. Just move quickly. There you go. All right. We should be continuing on here. Whoops. I don't think we're quite to the point where we can be ready for uh, the mid-boss just yet. But we are making our way through. Bunch of hidden Eggman faces like it's Disney World. I do like the idea of the entire level being a giant mech. I don't know if that's ever really been done in a Sonic game before. And it's doubly fitting for these classic Sonic games where that was kind of the constant thing. Where Eggman was constantly building these giant robots. As opposed to the modern Sonic games where it's usually some kind of airship. Or some kind of fleet of, of robots. Oof. Bad beat on the spikes. Continuing to... Ooh, another bad one right there, though there's an extra life waiting for him if he lands it correctly. There we go. Back to three. That's going to be some good cushion for the push-in. And we're pushing through this last zone with all we got. John trying to make his last stand. Also going for that little midsection there for, for at least a little bit. Ooh. God bless those bumpers. All right, and off we go. Upwards, onwards, beyondwards, and through. 
All right, we know this section. Our, ooh, good little skip there. Yeah, very good little skip. Not bad at all. All right. Let's see if John can continue. Whoop. Continue his good fortune here. Oh, continuing to do little skips here and there. Skipping whole mechanics of the level and probably the cleanest bumper bounce we got out of anyone for that as John reaches the mid boss of Titanic Monarch Zone. Immediately losing all of his rings, but that's okay. Oh dear. Okay, you're going to want at least a few of them, I think. At this point, caution to the wind. It's D Boost Town. There we go. Get that ring back. You're going to want at least one. There you go. Uh oh. Ooh, good catch. Whoop. Grab that back. And we're into phase two. Here we go. All that stands between him and the final act is this guy hailing from Death Egg Zone with a few modifications. And another six hits, I think. About six hits. All right. Oof, dangerous position there. Whoop. Oh, no. Dangerous. Oh, boy, we're out. Oh, John. Oh, no. Ooh, that's a harsh one right there. As we hit two hours, 45 minutes, that is going to be a bit of a rough one to recover from. He's got two lives. Wow, the last 20 minutes have kind of flown by, haven't they? Holy cow. It only felt like five or ten when I was saying... My, my estimates for how long John would need to get through the rest of this, and they seem fairly accurate, I'll be honest. We're at 245 and change right now. We're almost at 246, and I was saying 250, 255. Most folks get through Titanic Monarch Act 2, and, you know, a lot of folks are doing it like seven, eight minutes. Oof, bad spot to stand. Got to get that pattern recognition down. Get those hits in. Get those hits in. Oof. Some bad luck with the with the positioning and the placement here. As we're up at six minutes on the timer in game. So he got through the axe pretty quickly overall. He got through it faster, I think, than Jeff did. Might have been faster than CJ as well. I'd be very curious to look at the splits afterwards. Oh, John, once again, down to no rings. Needs to be very careful with how the rest of this goes. There we go. 2.46.30 as we get through Act 1 of Titanic Monarch Zone. John has just one act left to finish this game. Can he do it? Here we go. Up the elevator. On to the final challenge. For you betcha stands, John. Here we go. Let's see how he does. As we tick over to 247, John launches himself over into the little roller coaster where he will be headed off to our hub zone very shortly with four segments standing between him and victory. Some good jumps. It feels like he's more familiar with Titanic Monarch Zone than he is with some of the other levels of the game, which is interesting. I feel like Titanic Monarch Zone is usually the one most people are least familiar with. But let's see how that holds for the rest of this act through to the end of the game. Here we go. Going for a spin dash instead of the, instead of the bumper, although the retractable bumper was hidden a little bit there, so it might not have been super obvious to him. Oh, a very clean jump. Super clean into that tunnel. Beautiful, beautiful job. John's had some actually really good gameplay, generally speaking, here in Titanic Monarch Zone. I don't know if it was the pressure that got to him or something else, but he could have definitely clinched this a little bit better. I think he had even said that this was a run that he was not particularly proud of overall and definitely not one of his best. But that's how the cookie crumbles. I've heard stories of sports where equipment or animals that you worked with were chosen completely at random, and even that can have an effect on your day. So, you know, who knows? 
John continuing forward, making his way through. One area down, three more to go. He's got this. Let's roll. He is going to have to straighten himself out, though, in order to actually progress there. That is the trick. He does not seem to have noticed, there we go, that these actually drop by two and not by one on each side, so he could have waited a little bit longer to advance a little further. Oof. Dives a little bit late there to the left. There is a bumper just on the right side of those spikes, but you have to either very carefully jump over them or you need to, there we go, just carefully get to the side of it to make the platforming happen. All right, John continuing forward. Moving upward. There we go, up the platform. Managed to take damage there, though I didn't see the little cannonball. It might have been just a one frame thing or something. I, I don't know for sure. John making it through the second leg. Heading off to the third as we approach two hours, 50 minutes. Let's see if he can, if he can seal this one up. Let's go. All right. Two hours 50 ticking over right there. As we continue. Ooh! Oh, boy. That's an incredibly unlucky crunch. John now left with no extra lives. You can see that he's taking a minute to just collect himself after that really unfortunate death. Any... Wrong movement at this point could spell the difference between a 2 hour 55 run and a 3 hour 15 run. Let's see if he can make it through. Abandoning his, oof, very risky move. Nearly abandoning his rings. He only had two of them. I think if he saw this ring box, he would have left them behind. As we're advancing upward and onward. Oh, my goodness. Almost getting crushed again. John with some very, very dangerous. Oh, my God. Incredibly dangerous maneuvers here. I don't know if it's if it's sunk in that both sides will move up and down two platforms. So those risky high speed jumps ooh, were not necessary. But we're continuing on. John is still pushing through. Doing his best. Ooh. I'm pretty sure in Metropolis Zone there are a few situations like that that will just kill you. All right, John. Still going down this way. Trying to avoid the bumpers that will send him back into the pit. And now we are headed upwards. Continuing through the zone. Now this has been a dangerous spot for a lot of people. Ooh. All right. A lot of folks getting crushed in that section, but John managed to make it out unscathed. Well, not unscathed, but, you know, uncrushed, which is pretty good, all things considered. Now up to 252 as John is looking to seal this thing off for good. Riding this cart. What happened there? Oh, my God. I think he got hit by a stray bullet. <laughs> Well, that is really unfortunate. All right, he's got one segment left to go. I want to grab those rings on the way in. There you go. All right, one more leg, and we are done. Well, we're not done. Then we have the final boss, and John has only this life to do it unless he finds another one. He's got to find a way to navigate through this area. There we go. Moving on. Through Act 2. Here we go. We can do it. This segment is the one that got me earlier. If you get impatient, it's very easy to get stuck in a loop. And then, this little guy with the laser sight can become a bit of a problem. Oh, my goodness. All right. I think he actually managed to kill the enemy. So, Oh, no, he didn't. It's just right there. There we go. Good job. All right. All right, we're going up and through, and over, and progressing. All right. John pushing hard, pushing through. 
I did some football in high school, and we were always told you never stop until the whistle blows. Doesn't matter if you think the play is over, you keep going until someone tells you to stop. Here we go, John, continuing through Titanic Monarch Zone Act 2, continuing his ascent, surely battling a significant amount of stress at this point, nearly three hours in. That is some stress that will get to anyone. John looking to finish things off, looking for a place to go. Not finding it. All right. Abandoning the right area, heading left, though it looks like there's bumpers right there that he would want to use. And again, the gravity well is giving him some significant trouble in this game. Not sure. There we go. Wasn't sure entirely where it was going. All right. John once again checking the same area. Whoop, getting kind of stuck in the little armpit zone there. Nope. All right. Perhaps to the upper left would be the way to go. There we go. As we hit two hours, 55 minutes, John exits the fourth leg and moves on to the final boss of Sonic Mania. All he's got to do here is land those 16 hits without dying, and this one is in the bag. All right, here we go, John. You can do this. It's tricky. It is definitely a very hard final boss. Harder than final zone for sure. I would say harder, harder than death egg zone. I would also probably say harder than... It would certainly harder than death egg zone in Sonic 3... Probably, I wouldn't say this is as hard as the Doomsday Zone, but that feels like an unfair comparison. Especially since Egg Reverie Zone is definitely harder than the Doomsday Zone, in my opinion. All right. John got a couple hits in. Struggling to keep his rings, though. He's got, his ha he's got a handle on two of them. He's got four. All right. He has yet to take away any of the arms, but the hardest part is definitely... As you're getting the first two arms taken care of. There's arm number one. Four hits down. Twelve to go. Oh, he's going to need to get that ring back. All right. All right. Three hits on the second arm. That leaves him with nine hits between here and victory. Can he do it? Oh, no! Oh, that's a very not good time. There we go, to be losing that ring. Also, not a great time to be very aggressive here. Oh, no! Oh, dear. Oh, no! And a game over for John in the middle of the final boss in Titanic Monarch Zone. And I'm sorry to say... John opted at this point to forfeit rather than rerun Titanic Monarch Zone, which means that we have our final times for this race. In first place for the gold medal is me, actually, at 1 hour, 44 minutes, 11.1 seconds. In second place, taking home the silver is CJ with 2 hours, 5 minutes, 57.8 seconds. In third, taking the bronze is Jeff with 2 hours, 27 minutes, 28 seconds, point six. And John not going home with a medal and not completing the run. And that brings us to our final medal counts. Tierra de los Hermanos Hook walks home as the medal winning country with 8 gold, 2 silver, and 3 bronze. Imperium Ludum goes home as the second most decorated, at least in terms of gold, with six gold, two silver, and five bronze. You Betcha Stan goes home with one gold, nine silver. That's silver in the majority of events at the games. And three bronze. And Daisy Baby Bitch Territory, here for a good time, with one gold, three silver, and five bronze. 
Notably, Terra de los Hermanos Hook, Imperium, Ludum, and Ubechistan all going home with the same number of medals, 13 apiece. That's pretty interesting. As for the individual medal counts, we have myself with six golds, two silvers, and one bronze. Dave with five golds in five events. Myself and Dave meddling in all of our events. Jose with two golds and one silver. John with one gold, four silvers, and one bronze. We've got Jeff also meddling in all events. One gold, one silver, two bronze. Lindsay with a gold and two bronzes, one of which was shared with CJ. Dustin, four silver medals, very cool. CJ with three silvers, three bronzes. Ian with one silver and two bronzes, also meddling in every event. We've got Sarah with three bronzes. We've got Beeble with one bronze, though it is the one event he was in, so technically also meddled in every event he was in. Felice with one bronze and Peter with one bronze. Guys, I could not thank you enough for taking part in watching. I guess that was a weird way to put that. Thank you so much for watching the games. This has been a an amazing journey. This is something I've wanted to do for years. There was actually someone that I wanted to try to have on for commentator. It didn't work out uh, for, for this, but who knows down the line, uh, where I discovered scrolling through our, our message history that I had messaged them about basically the same idea five years ago. So this has been a thing that's been on my mind for a very long time, and I'm so proud of finally being able to have brought it to fruition. I cannot thank you guys enough for sticking around for this. This was wild. It was a really great time. I want to thank uh, all of the participants in the games. I want to thank Sarah and Beeble. I want to thank Jeff and his team, Dave, Jose, Peter. I want to thank John, his team, Ian and Dustin. I want to thank CJ, Felice, Lindsay, everybody that participated in this. It was total chaos to organize, but it's been a blast. I think everybody had a pretty good time with it, and I hope you guys did too. I especially double, triple, quadruple want to thank our commentators for this series. It was a lot to ask of them, usually on incredibly short notice, and I could not be happier with the result. Everyone that commentated was incredible. Retro Trigger, Tori, Lady Sela, Sea Dude, Hyper Mode, Ween and Squishy of Ape Arcade, Retro Roulette's very own Anthony, Sam and Photogenic Justin, Teddy, aka Evil Hippie, Max and Lynn of Game Face, Ian from Born Losers Gaming, and of course, Caitlin Bairstow and Ian Hanlon. All of you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I owe all of you so many favors as a result of this. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And, oh, I'm getting word now that we need to cut live to our closing ceremonies. Oh, they're here? Oh. Um. <coughs> we ran out of budget. We, um... We blew it on all the commentators, and we we kind of just paid them an exposure, so. <coughs> Bye.